The Final Evolution, Book 15 of the Everin Chronicles, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Wolfe. The Story So Far In the Arrival, the Everin Chronicles prequel, a space and time traveling being known as Everin rescues Jake Melkins and Kathy from a Seselter slaver named Grecho. It is Everin's first adventure in the Milky Way galaxy and introduces him to Earth. In the Awakening, Book One of the Everin Chronicles, Dr. Albert Snowden and his niece, Emily Snowden, are abducted by an alien race known as the Crotovore. They are rescued by Everin and V, Everin's trusty mobile artificial intelligence, who drops them back off on Earth. In the Fredorian Destiny, Book Two of the Everin Chronicles, Everin returns to check on Dr. Snowden and Emily, and they ask to travel with him. Everin accepts. They then help Fredoria, a planet of human ex-slaves, become a full trade partner with the Kriegan Star Empire, the local galactic superpower in Earth's region of the galaxy. Hampered by the industrialist Ceros and bounty hunters, they secure the Archeron, a Kriegan relic for the Fredorians to give to the Kriegan Emperor. In the Purification, Book 3 of the Everin Chronicles, Everin and the gang fight the timeline invaders known as the Purifiers, a human supremacist group led by the Overlord that tries to change Earth's history. In The Time Refugee, Book 4 of the Everin Chronicles, they tangle with Bilazine, a rogue time traveler, while helping Jane Trellis, a time refugee who is pulled out of her timeline. In The Everin Origin, Book 5 of the Everin Chronicles, they discover Everin's origin and meet Leverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, while fighting the Time Wardens, a timeline void race that hunts rift travelers. In the Shadow Connection, Book 6 of the Everin Chronicles, they group up with Jake Melkins and the non-human community to defend Earth from the ambitions of Cal Taurus, a dimensional being that rules over a vast empire encompassing worlds in many dimensions. In The Human Factor, Book 7 of the Everin Chronicles, they head to A.D. 10105 and deal with a ruthless A.I. known as Salazar, in addition to fixing the timeline. In The Cosmic Parallel, Book 8 of the Everin Chronicles, they leap from parallel timeline to timeline in a trap designed by the Mortani, plain refugees who blame Everin for their situation. In The Unification, Book 9 of the Everin Chronicles, they travel to A.D. 514-723 to unify humanity while dealing with an extra-dimensional threat. In the Portal Effect, Book 10 of the Everin Chronicles, they deal with a rogue time traveler who enjoys zapping people to the past and altering timelines. In the Time Cube, Book 11 of the Everin Chronicles, they meet Dalton Kingston as they travel to the Horologium Reticulum Supercluster to deal with the ruthless Tenegrin hegemony. In the Everin Impact, Book 12 of the Everin Chronicles, they meet Siverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, in another universe and help him deal with Wardax, a cosmic threat. In the Cosmic Artifact, Book 13 of the Everin Chronicles, the gang encounters the Gothlic Lords as they meet with the Palison beings known as the Eight. The gang also gets help in the form of Murukan's team, an investigative group. In The Cult of Everin, Book 14 of the Everin Chronicles, the gang deals with a cult that has strayed away from Everin's principles. The gang is aided by Dravail Zage and Zasrissa Mortaka, Torvata's Chosen, a Torvata AI known as Seer, and a cosmic cloth known as CC. This book continues their adventures. Everin's Technology Torvata, his disc-shaped ship that can travel through time and space. It is roughly 15 feet tall by 30 feet wide. The interior contains six-dimensional rooms, an open area with a semi-transparent floor and sides, and a roof that can be transformed by hard holograms. A shielding surrounding the Torvata prevents most matter from entering. Universal Interface Card, UIC, a credit card-sized device carried on his belt that allows access to most technological systems that do not have an artificial intelligence in them, it can also view limited information on biological systems. Augmented Reality Interface, ARI, an interface that only he can see around him. Utility Handle, a hilt-like device carried on his belt that can extend morphable matter in any shape 
typically a baton or staff, can also fire repulsion, grappling, heat, mist, sticky globules, and stun beams. Illumination orbs, small orbs on his belt that provide lighting and can hover. Projection orb, an orb that allows projections to be sent to it from remote sources, such as Everin's ring or the Toravada. Ring, a ring that can provide holographic projection and scan. Prologue Ciro's 542 hated that he could not go back to the timeline headquarters built by him and other versions of himself. Thanks to Everin and his team's destructive tendencies, the headquarters were lost in a dimension somewhere. Ciro's 542 swore he would reconnect, and to that end, he dedicated every resource. Despite being stranded, he had made the most of it. It was a quiet day at the headquarters he had built to centralize his command. He ran his fair-skinned hand through his silver hair. Although he had initially started with one planet in this timeline, he had expanded to several other planetary systems. Some of his species, the Antigulans, had come with him. Alongside an army of cyborgs, robots, androids, and AIs, Ciro's 542 had everything he needed. He liked to relax alone with his thoughts in a room at the highest point of the largest tower in the compound. As he stood with his hands behind his white robe, segmented by a metallic belt, he peered out over the city he had built. Transparent walls and ceiling surrounded him. He had replicated the smell of a sweet melon to fill the air, and with a light breeze allowed to pass through, it would be a good time to take a nap. A shrill beep blasted the silence. Ciro's 542 sighed as he tapped at the thin black mesh on his hand. He spun around to focus on the hologram of an officer in a two-piece white suit. Sir, the portal's opening, said the man. Ciro's 542's eyes narrowed. I take it there's been no signal from one of our reconnaissance teams requesting it to be open? The officer shook his head. I see. Lock down the area and deploy security. Yes, sir. The hologram dissipated. Ciro's 542 hustled to an elevator, then went down. He was not sure what could open the only portal he knew in his timeline. It could connect to many places, and he had beefed up security after receiving information on the Everin incident. Although the connection to the multi-timeline headquarters had been lost, they had been able to send a final transmission. Domed shielding covered the portal area and gave him time to get down to a nearby command center. He had his species with him, but he still felt alone without his other versions to confer with. They were the only ones who could talk at his level. Dealing with anyone else was like talking to a youngling. He had conversed with AIs and androids, but they were difficult to talk to, especially in regard to anything creative. After the elevator stopped, he exited and rushed to the nearest command center. Once there, he studied the various screens showing the portal room. The domed shield was active, and a ten-foot-tall, dark-blue-skinned being wearing a form-fitting silver one-piece suit stood silently looking around. The being resembled a human, a species Ciro's 542 associated with Everin's team. Light blue glowing lines segmented his suit, and his golden eyes glowed on his bald head. Every step he took had some impact. Ciro's 542 went to a nearby communication booth that projected the portal room around him, making it seem as if he was there. His hologram would appear outside the dome shielding in the room. He verified that the universal translator was running and that the other security features, like wall turrets, spider bots, and the upgraded robots in the wall were ready to burst out. The area was spacious and allowed his projection to walk up to the portal. Who are you? asked Ciro's 542. 
The being had been looking around, but then stared at him. The silent type, said Ciro's 542. You're apparently powerful enough to open this portal and stroll on through, but this is not some place you want to do that. The being walked to the shielding and touched it. He stuck a finger through, then drew a circle, creating an opening. After stretching the hole, he stepped through and stood face to face with Ciro's 542's projection, then moved a hand through it. Ciro's 542's stomach churned. This being went through a powerful shielding system like it was not there. He was getting Everin level vibes from this being. He stepped back. Who are you? And what do you want? He asked. The being stared at him again. Species. Antigulin. You're not a threat. Ciro's 542 shivered. The voice was deep, almost digital-like, with a slight echo. You speak. I ask again. Who are you? He asked. Your primitive mind may call me Antion. Ciro's 542 did not like where this was going. What do you want? Antion looked around, then stared back at him. I seek ones named Everin. Ciro's 542 relaxed. Is that all? Yes. Have you encountered any of them? I've not personally encountered them. But I know of those who have met one. Ciro's 542 scowled. That Everin stranded me here. Antion walked through Ciro's 542's hologram. Where are you going? asked Ciro's 542. To retrieve your knowledge. Ciro's 542 scoffed. I was hoping we could do an exchange of knowledge. It's obvious you have some power, and I thought we could come to an understanding. Antion paused, then turned around. I do have power, more than you can comprehend. I would never share that with a lesser being unless it was to my advantage. It's not in this situation. You have knowledge, and I'll take it. I don't think so, said Ciro's 542. He activated the defenses. The wall turrets came alive and fired on Antion, to no avail. Ciro's 542's eyes widened when Antion moved like a blur and jumped the height of the room to smash all the turrets. The gas released seemed to have no effect. Ciro's 542 activated the defense robots. Side panels rose up along the walls, and an army of liquid metallic robots surged out. Antion strolled around, casually tossing and smashing everyone he encountered. Ciro's 542 ordered a heavy unit into the room. Antion grabbed the large, teardrop-shaped machine that had stepped in and used it as a hammer to smash the incoming cyborg guards in heavy armor. Silence fell. Antion walked through the mist and faced Ciro's 542. I will take your knowledge now. Wait, said Ciro's 542. There's no need to destroy my base. I'll have everything we have on Everin delivered to you. I don't want to be involved in whatever feud you have with him. No. Your mind will give me everything I need. Ciro's 542's blood chilled. I need that to live. Irrelevant. Ciro's 542 ended the projection. He had to escape. After seeing what Antion could do, there would be nothing in the compound to stop him. 
Ciro's 542 had every security detail assigned to stopping Antion, but he knew they would not be able to. They would at least buy him some time. He exited the room and paused to look at the video feed, where Antion marched through defense forces as if they were not there. Ciro's 542 wondered if that was how Ciro's 1 felt when Everin had done the same thing to the multi-timeline headquarters. Ciro's 542 was not going to stick around to find out. Chapter 1 Dr. Snowden had always wanted to visit New York City on July 6, 1911, where Walter Snowden, his great-grandfather, ran a globe shop. An image of the storefront would be taken later that day. It was said Walter had been inspired to do so. Dr. Snowden had roped his niece, Emily Snowden, Everin, V, an artificial intelligence, Kess, who was Dr. Snowden's girlfriend, and Jelton Stollerin, Emily's boyfriend, into going. V had parked Everin's ship, the Toravada, in a safe place, and the group had spent the day strolling around the city. However, the real excitement was that Dr. Snowden would get to meet one of his ancestors. As they walked, he took in the environment. Men wore dark suits with white t-shirts and a variety of colored ties, but it was the hats that stuck out. He liked the look of them, and lamented how unusual it would be to wear one in his time. Some women had dresses while others had dark skirts with light-colored tops. Some had hats as well. It was probably uncomfortable, given the heat. They had left from 12-14-2013, 1 o'clock p.m., a Saturday, and it had been windy and cold in Columbus, Ohio. New York City in the summer, climate-wise, was the opposite of that. One thing he had read was that foul odors were the norm. His nose had not been ready for the assault of scents that ranged from fecal to some type of oil. There were also other rancid smells, as if someone was butchering animals in the open. Although he had his survival suit on, he could not raise his helmet. Emily's constant grimacing could not hide her disdain. The others seemed to have no concerns about the smell. They kept to the sides of the street since it was chaotic in the middle. Early Ford model cars drove along, mixed in with horse carriages and trolleys. People wandered around with barely an eye for safety. Dr. Snowden cringed half the time, expecting someone to get hit, only for them to step away at the last moment. It was noisy, but that was to be expected. The sheer amount of people was more than Dr. Snowden was used to seeing in the street. Groups would stop and chat in the middle of a busy path as others pushed or sidestepped them. It surprised him that there were no altercations, despite hustle and bustle being the norm. The presence of a few outsiders and daydrolls caught Dr. Snowden's attention. Although he knew they had been around for a long time, he had always viewed photos of the past as human only. It made sense that there were non-humans in the city, and the few he had detected had stared at the gang, then taken off. They probably wanted nothing to do with a group of cosmic beings. Kess squeezed his hand. If you don't watch it, you're going to get run over by a horse. Analysis. I would save him, said V. I know you would, she said, high-fiving him. Emily motioned ahead. We're almost at Snowden's Globes. Let's hope it smells better there. I can't wait to meet my great-grandfather, said Dr. Snowden. He glanced at Everin. Thank you for allowing this. I know it's risky. Everin raised a finger. You are well aware of the impacts of meeting your ancestor, and I trust you. We all do, my friend, said Jelton, laying a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. If you begin to make a mistake, I'm sure Kess will step in. You know I will, she said, raising her hand in the air and snapping. Dr. Snowden did not mind the teasing as everyone laughed. The gang knew he was good-natured, and he saw the ribbing as a sign of trust. He was already floating on a cloud, and Kess's presence made everything better. His heartbeat accelerated as he examined the street they had to cross. He deftly followed Everin as he weaved his way across the street to reach the Snowden's Globes store.
There were a few moments where Dr. Snowden had thought a car would hit him, and Kess had yanked him out of stepping into a massive pile of horse manure. Emily and Jelton had no issues as they slid around obstacles with ease. The store resembled the pictures he had seen, and he enjoyed seeing it physically versus in a black-and-white photo. He was not sure who had taken the picture, but whoever they were, he was thankful they had. The group entered. Dr. Snowden grinned as the odor switched away from what was in the street to a strong glue smell. Shelves on the sides contained globes of varying sizes. The artwork was superb. And although most had the standard display of the seven continents, there were a few with fantasy worlds. However, it was the fair-skinned man in his forties in black slacks and a white shirt held up by suspenders that everyone focused on. Dr. Snowden knew who it was immediately. It was his great-grandfather, Walter Snowden. His slick hair and mustache were just as Dr. Snowden had remembered from a photo. Walter stepped from behind a counter and smiled at the group. Take a look around, and if something catches your eye, let me know. Dr. Snowden licked his lips, then extended a hand. Thank you. I'm Dr. Albert Snowden. Walter returned the handshake. We have the same last name. How about that? And you're a doctor. Oh, a uh, academic title. Walter tilted his head. Emily piped in. It's a new thing, mainly from the Midwest and Northwest colleges. It just means he's done a lot of research. I'm Emily Snowden. Oh, he grinned. Another Snowden. You can just call me Albert, said Dr. Snowden. Walter sized them up. Albert, you're the spitting image of my Uncle George. He examined Emily. And you're Aunt Susan's duplicate. He beamed big. Maybe we're related. Dr. Snowden cast a sidelong glance at Emily. Who knows? Oh, almost forgot. With me are Everin, V, Kess, and Jelton Stolrin. Walter studied the group. Such unusual names. But I'm glad to meet you all. He waved a hand around. Was there a particular globe you were interested in? We just wanted to check out the store, but yeah, we'll look around. It's a very nice store, my friend, said Jelton. Indeed, said Everin. Walter placed his hands on his suspenders and puffed his chest out some. Thank you. A kid popped out from the back. Gerald. We have customers, said Walter. Gerald bowed slightly, then scrambled away. Dr. Snowden had heard many stories from his grandfather about the Globe Store, and to see him as a kid was exhilarating. Everin gestured at one of the Globes with custom artwork. You have a strong imagination. Walter walked over to the Globe and sighed. I like to think so. His eyes softened. Imagine what's out there. Beyond this world. Even this world has mysterious places to see. I may not be able to visit them, but my mind can. You are an adventurer at heart. Perhaps so, but I travel by mind, and my body is a storekeeper. The group chuckled. Walter rubbed his chin as he examined the gang. Is everything okay? asked V. Yeah, yeah, I, I just, I don't mean to be out of line by saying this, but I feel like I've known you all for a very long time. I'm very comfortable around you. Cass shrugged. We can have that effect. Apparently so, said Walter. As my dad always said, learn, adapt. Evolve. I love it. It's a great creed, said Dr. Snowden. He soaked in the experience.
He wanted to spend the whole day talking about what was out there, but he knew he could not. It would be amazing to take Walter to see Earth from space or even to an alien world. Dr. Snowden wished he had more time to truly get to know him, but even visiting was risky as it was. It would also be fun to chat with his grandfather as a kid. Maybe their strong imagination was a Snowden thing. Dr. Snowden suspected it was Walter who took the store photo later on, and he may have been inspired due to this visit. That picture would then make Dr. Snowden want to visit on this day. A time loop. Nothing out of the ordinary when traveling with Everin. Emily had loved getting to meet Walter Snowden over the previous few hours. It put into perspective the stories she had heard from her dad and Dr. Snowden about Gerald, her grandfather, and Walter's son. Unfortunately, Gerald had died before she had been born. V had gotten notice of a summons and alerted the team, so they had said their goodbyes to Walter, then exited the store. That was fantastic, said Dr. Snowden. Kess put a finger under his chin. I had to close your mouth half the time. He eyed her. It's not every day you meet an ancestor. It definitely puts into perspective all the interactions I had with Gerald growing up. I am glad we got to meet him, said Everin. Yeah, me too. Emily scrunched her face. I do wonder if he noticed us. Well, Uncle Albert, as he grew up. If he did, he never said anything to me, said Dr. Snowden. Jelton wagged a finger. Perhaps he didn't want others to think he was imagining things. Possibly. Now, what's this summons about? Asked Dr. Snowden. Analysis. It is to retrieve a cosmic shard and transport it to a different planet. That's it? V tilted his head at Dr. Snowden. Yes. We are to pick it up in what you would know as the NGC 4696 galaxy in the Centaurus Cluster, a part of the Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. The time index is 6,344,801,742 BC. Once we have procured it, we will move it to another planet in the same galaxy, but in 4,805,333,713 BC. Dr. Snowden drew his head back. Whoa, really? Both are far away, both in space and time. Acknowledged. Emily noticed a cosmic energy spike not only in Everin, but also in Jelton. The last shard, which was not a cosmic artifact, had involved Everin trying to sacrifice himself to remove it. I am not sure why we are moving it instead of banishing it, said Everin. Let us go to the Toravada. I can drop you all off wherever you need to go. Then V and I will investigate. I'm going with you, said Dr. Snowden. Same, said Emily. She swatted Everin's arm, always trying to offload us. Everin half smiled. It could be dangerous given our history with cosmic shards. Oh, I know, said Jelton. He squeezed Emily's hand. I go where she goes, and it would be good to travel with the gang again. Kess latched on to Dr. Snowden's arm. Yeah, I'm going to. Someone has to watch over Albert. Analysis. I think we have been outvoted. Indeed so, said Everin. Very well. Emily's heartbeat accelerated as she thought of doing a summons with Jelton and Kess. This would be the first summons they were doing together, and she would get to spend more time with Jelton. The Cosmic Shard's involvement bothered her, but the fact that the Torvada wanted it moved meant that this shard should not require a sacrifice. However, when dealing with anything cosmic, unpredictability reigned supreme. The trip back was uneventful. V had slipped into an alley, then stealthed and flown to get the Toravada. It was a matter of finding a remote spot and boarding. The somewhat sterile smell of the command area relieved her nose, 
and the silence outside of everyone getting settled in was a nice change from the loud streets. She sat with Jelton on the left while Dr. Snowden and Kess were on the other side. V was at the podium, as he always was, and Everin sat in his command chair. V, take us to the summons location, said Everin. Acknowledged. Although Emily was tired from the 1911 trip, she was eager to see their destination. After 20 minutes, they had ascended to low orbit. She never got tired of seeing the Torvada open a portal and fly through, then having everything outside fade in and ease back in when they jumped in time. Analysis We have arrived on November 7th. 6,344,801,742 B.C. at 10.32 a.m. Emily studied the blue and green planet. It resembled Earth from this view, but the land masses had a very different configuration. A red dot indicated where they needed to go, and the Torvada had already begun its descent. So this is just a transport summons, asked Kess. I suspect there is more to it, said Everin. However, we are one of the few crews able to move a cosmic shard. Kess smirked. Yeah, not everyone has a Torvada lying around. Jelton pointed at some of the atmospheric labels. Looks like a similar atmosphere to Earth. Maybe a bit warmer. Does this planet have a name? Analysis. It does not. Perhaps we can call it Snow Kess. Oh, I like that, said Kess, raising her hand in the air and snapping. Dr. Snowden nudged her. You would. It's a fine planet name, my friend, said Jelton. Emily liked that she would be able to open her helmet, although other conditions might make her close it. She examined the readings from the surface when they broke cloud cover. Pockets and trails of reddish-brown environment pockmarked an otherwise lush green world. A zoom into one of the areas made her skin crawl. A large hole was in the center, and a massive worm-like creature lay nearby. She could never escape bugs. Surrounding the area were creatures resembling Utah raptors in various configurations, except these all had segmented plates on their back. It reminded her of the drog brood on the ship that Everin had rescued her and Dr. Snowden from long ago. What is that? she asked with wide eyes. Unknown for the moment, said Everin. V. Pass by one of those areas and perform deep scans. Acknowledged. Emily's eyes were glued to the various data labels that popped up when the Torvada was low enough it surprised her that the creatures had a dimensional signature. However, no portal had been detected. Although she had initially seen brutal-looking monsters, there were others that were more bizarre. One was like a walking sphere that munched on vegetation and spewed some type of mist out its back. Another walked around, spiking the ground. There were also smaller worms that had burrowed into greener areas. That's an interesting array of creatures, said Jelton. Everin's eyes narrowed. They are terraforming and destroying anything that gets in their way. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger at Everin. Ah, that makes sense. That would explain why they're not roaming loose, but instead staying close to their area. I noticed those things are dimensional. They are and I suspect their portals are underground. A large worm burrows up, then the terraforming begins. Perhaps it is a part of their natural cycle, Emily grimaced. They act like big, armored, and organized bugs. An apt analogy, said Everin. The Torvada continued on toward the red dot for the summons. Emily took in the environment as they passed over it. She had moved to the front to peer down and Jelton had joined her. She reached out and held his hand as she surveyed everything. She was glad she was there with him. The scene below mirrored what she had seen at a higher altitude. The dimensional invaders were slowly turning this planet into their own, and they had the muscle to do it. After twenty minutes, the Torvada approached a mountainous ridge with a forest in front of it. 
Emily wrinkled her brow when the red dot registered as being inside the mountain. She had wondered how they would get in there. But the cleared area before a large set of steps into the mountain provided a clue, as did the several hundred life signs inside. The stairs led to a platform with pillars and a huge open entrance. So we're going inside, I'm guessing, she said. It would appear so, said Everin. The registered life signs here are different. Dr. Snowden crooked a thumb at V. Should he investigate in stealth mode before we go in to see what we're dealing with? Everin paused, then highlighted a mass of creatures moving toward the massive stairs. Perhaps. But there is another way to introduce ourselves. I suspect these creatures are en route to attack the mountain based on the doors at the top of the stairs closing. Fighting time, said Jelton. Yes but we can see if that is the creature's intent. If so, we will repel them. Everin zoomed in a view to the doors. Note the small holes spread throughout. They would allow defenders to poke or shoot through, depending on the group's technological level. Kess smirked. Given what we've seen, I don't think this group is advanced. Maybe so. Let us watch to see if we need to intervene. If we do... Dr. Snowden can manage the Toravata's stun weapons, and V will go in body mode and join us. Emily's pulse quickened. It was a waiting game now to see what the monsters did. Whoever was in the mountain did not want to let the creatures in. Given what she had seen of them, she would not either. Then again, the defenders might be even rougher. There were a lot of unknowns, but one thing was certain. The cosmic shard was coming out. Chapter 2 Jelton sensed the uptick in everyone's energy fluctuations, except for Kess's. However, her staring at the display like everyone else indicated she was alert. It felt natural to travel with Everin and the gang, and it was something Jelton had missed. He had been able to establish a Rift Guardian colony, and with the Revaw, the fighting group he was a part of, and advanced weaponry and defenses in place, it was self-sustaining. An influx of rift denizens bolstered the colony, and it was well on its way to becoming a large city. The Time Wardens had finally been removed from the galactic region, giving the rift guardians time to build. Now that they were established, they would enforce their will on the Time Wardens. Jelton had no desire to see any more of them. This was a good event for him to take some time for himself, and this was where he wanted to be, even if the summons took a long while, he could always return on schedule back to Rift Guardian headquarters, a perk of traveling in the Toravada. He gazed at the creatures surging toward the stairs. They moved fast, and the smaller ones deftly avoided the trees. The larger monsters bowled over anything in their way. One thing they all had in common was that they were bent forward so that from their head to tail formed a horizontal plane— powerful legs propelled them, and outside of that, the arms and size and head shape were what remained different. The medium-sized creatures had four arms with sharp claws and thick plates, but the fifteen-foot-tall abominations had even thicker armor, but only two arms. The smallest had tentacles flowing behind them. That's a nasty bunch, said Emily. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Fangs, armor, claws, like a living armada. Jelton shared their thoughts. He scrutinized the creatures bounding up the steps and slamming into the door. Sharp spears shot out and pierced some of the softer underbellies. Other attackers ripped the wounded ones away and tossed them to the side so they could get in to attack the solid door, which stood strong under pressure. He held his breath when one of the larger monsters rushed into the door. It fell back down the stairs. That big one took a hard fall, said Kess. She glanced at Everin. Are we going in now? Everin stood. Indeed. Dr. Snowden, fire the Toravada's stun beams in the area before the doors. Once you have enough space, land the Toravada there and prevent anything from getting by. Everyone else, to the ramp. Jelton followed Everin and the others. This could be a rough fight, but Jelton trusted the gang 
He already had his suit and weapons on, and Emily was in her survival suit. With her pen-shaped personal support device, or PSD, she could form a multitude of weapons. Kess had on a sturdy outfit, but her main ability was the nanoswarm she controlled. Everin was in his custom suit, as he always was, while V had arrived in body mode with a new, impervious, juggernaut robot form. Dr. Snowden, drop us off behind the creatures, then hover between the door and the top of the stairs, said Everin over comms. Got it, said Dr. Snowden. Jelton's heartbeat ramped up as the Torvada cruised over and landed in an empty area to the side of the streaming horde of monsters. A quick glance around the group showed everyone to be focused, with few signs of anxiety. That was the gang he knew. Everin spawned his left forearm energy shield and morphed his utility handle into a staff, then exited the Torvada. Emily followed him with her energy shield on her left forearm and her stun baton in her right hand. Kess had pulled out a pistol, leaving her other hand free, but it was her strong shielding that surprised Jelton. It was not quite at V's level, but it was impressive. V marched on fearlessly, something that Jelton admired. A part of the monsters rushing by redirected toward the group. I will take the big one, said Everin. Everyone else, concentrate on the others and sending them away or disabling them. Jelton waited until Emily had spewed forth a cloud mist, catching several creatures in it. He lit it up with a shot from his stun pistol downing everything inside the mist. The large monster pushed several smaller ones out of the way and barged toward Everin, who was on his way to it. When they met, he shot a grappling beam at the creature's legs, then sidestepped the charge and yanked, causing the creature to crash to the ground. Jelton's eyes widened when the attackers paused to focus on Everin and his opponent. It was like they could not believe what they were seeing but he was not sure he would ascribe that type of thought to them. However, it did seem like they acknowledged that their most fearsome member had just been taken down. The reaction was immediate as every available monster swarmed their way. It also helped that the Torvada had begun firing multiple stun beams at those in front of the temple doors. Between that and the large abomination going down, the attackers were being funneled to the group. Get ready! said Emily as she fired non-stop beams. Kess took to the air and used her large nanoswarm hand she had formed to toss enemies up, where she stunned them with a shot. She also pushed them into the cloud, which allowed Jelton to light it up. Dr. Snowden continued to move the Torvada down the stairs, hurting the swarm away. Everin surged into action at the bottom of the steps and was a whirlwind. Every brief moment he stopped, something was either tossed away or stunned. Even with Jelton's advanced senses, he could barely see Everin when he moved this fast. Jelton had never been able to determine what fighting style Everin displayed, but Emily had referred to it as a mix of martial arts from Earth, in particular, Shaolin. There was also a variety of other alien styles of combat there, but the end result was that Everin was always in a position for the next move at the end of his current one, and he used his opponents against themselves when he could. V marched everywhere, holding multiple monsters at bay while point-blank hitting them with stun blasts with the segmented arms that popped out from his shoulders. The creature's claws and bites could not penetrate his shielding, and with his density control ratcheted up, he could not be pushed back. Some of the smaller monsters had broken through, scampered past V, then attacked Emily. Despite her speed and strength, they had gotten her to the ground and attempted to claw and bite her. Jelton burst into action and tackled an attacker off her, while Kess grabbed another and tossed it away, then assisted in helping Emily up. Her cosmic nanobots had swirled out in various places, and she bled from a slash mark on her side and a bite wound on her upper arm. Jelton went into overdrive keeping anything that got close to her away, and V had inserted himself between her and the horde. After most of the medium-sized attackers had been downed or routed, the others took off back into the forest. Analysis. You are hurt, said V. Emily shrugged and winked at Kess. Who doesn't want to bite me? I do not, said V. The group laughed.
Dr. Snowden landed the Toravada at the base of the stairs, then rushed out to Emily. Sorry I didn't get to them before they got to you. It's okay, said Emily. I was slightly distracted by what felt like a cosmic tug. That would be the cosmic shard, said Everin. I can sense it as well. He gestured at the doors at the top of the stairs opening. I believe our interference has shown whoever in the mountain that we are not enemies. Then it's time for a meet and greet, said Emily. Jelton loved that she was so tough. One moment she was fighting and getting damaged, the next she was ready for a diplomatic session. It angered him that he had let anything get to her. He had felt the cosmic tug too, and for a brief moment he had searched in that direction. It was a familiar feeling, and he had died the last time he had touched one. He was not eager to repeat that experience. What should we do with the Torvata? asked Dr. Snowden. We will keep it where it is, but allow those we are about to meet to see it. Afterward, join us, and we can proceed to introduce ourselves to the people of the mountain. Acknowledged, said Dr. Snowden, swatting V's arm. V tilted his head as the group chuckled. Jelton made sure he was presentable, or as much as he could be, as the Torvada showed itself. Dr. Snowden joined the others. Everin motioned up the stairs. Let us go. Kess scrutinized the strange aliens that had gathered at the top of the stairs. They were a furry humanoid species with digitigrade legs. Their armor indicated they had some knowledge of craftsmanship, and their elegant swords, pikes, and bows showcased their attention to detail. Their faces resembled what Dr. Snowden would probably call a rabbit, and their ears stood straight up. Their fur color varied, as did the patterns on it. The genders were unclear, but one group was substantially larger than the others. A small alien stood prominently in front. Its face had scars, and Kess assumed it was male. His hand rested on his sword holster. The aliens surrounding him had their weapons drawn, but stood by as if not sure what the gang's intentions were. Kess hoped the aliens understood that they shared a common enemy— However, she knew that once Everin was within ten feet of them, his cosmic aura would relax them some. The walk up the stairs was silent, and although she was no expert on the aliens, it was obvious they were alert as they watched every step the gang took. Everin tossed his translation orb off to the side, where it hovered, then half-smiled at Dr. Snowden. Since I know you will ask... This alien species has two special structures in their mouths, per the Toravada scans. The aliens generate a combined sound using their voice and these structures. As we cannot replicate that, the orb is needed. You read my mind, said Dr. Snowden. Kess motioned at the orb. It'll also help establish that it's a part of the group, as opposed to whipping it out when we get there. I don't think we need anyone whipping anything out when we meet them, said Emily, laughing. Dr. Snowden and Everin eyed her. Kess loved Emily's playfulness. She had been wounded, but it did not dampen her spirit. It probably also helped that Jelton was with her. Besides, these aliens look like rabbit humanoids, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, they do, said Emily. If that tracks, then the one that the others are clustering around is most likely female, as they tend to be dominant. But this all is based on if they're like the rabbits we know. These aliens are probably very different. Huh. I thought the lead one was male, said Kess. Guess we'll find out. The aliens cleared a spot at the top of the stairs and had fanned out in a half circle with their weapons aimed at the gang when they arrived. Everin slightly bowed with his left arm across his stomach. We mean you no harm. I am Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Kess, Jelton Stollerin, and V. The translation orb next to me allows us to communicate. With whom are we speaking? The aliens talked among themselves as the lead alien stepped forward and swept its gaze across the gang. I'm Alligan, queen of the Shilkrins and protector of the God Shard. Kess understood now why the orb was needed. 
Oligan sounded like she was tapping her teeth together with every other word. That would be difficult to replicate with a human, Riven or Orion mouth. Your orb is powerful. What magic allows it to stay in place like that and allow us to talk? Asked Oligan. It is technology, just more advanced than what you may have seen before, said Everin. Think of the tools you use to craft your armor and weapons. The orb is a similar tool, but more complex. I see. Oligan extended a hand to the side, causing the other Shelkrins to lower their weapons. She inspected the Toravata. Then what is that? What is responsible for the beams of blue light that took down these infernal creatures? It was, and it is, the Toravata, my ship. We arrived to retrieve an item that is located inside the mountain, then saw this place was under assault. We wanted to show goodwill towards your group by removing the attackers. Oligan studied him, then the others. And you did. Most impressively. Where did you come from? You're not Shilkrin. Everin pointed up. From there, and far away. The Shilkrins murmured among themselves as they looked up. And what item were you wanting to retrieve? Asked Oligan. We do not know what it looks like but it is most likely a crystal and one that cannot be moved by normal means, said Everin. The Shilkrins went silent. Why do you want it? asked Oligan, raising her head. Everin raised a finger. It is a cosmic shard, and it needs to be moved. You might not be aware of this, but it acts like a beacon to powerful entities— Oligan growled. We are the protectors of the god shard and the last of our kind. I understand, said Everin. He gazed out into the forest. We scanned your environment prior to coming here. This temple appears to be the final holdout, unless there are others of your kind spread out somewhere. Oligan sighed. No, they're all dead, except for the ones here. This is the last bastion of the Shilkrins. The god crystal infuses our armor, which helps against the monsters, and they seem to have noticed that and are drawn to us. Everin faced her. I see. Perhaps, then, we can make a deal. In exchange for allowing us to move the crystal, we can take your people to this same planet, but in a different place. What do you mean? she asked. Kes could almost see the wheels turning in Oligan's head. Everin extended a hand. I will emit an image from the ring. Do not be alarmed. Before I do, though, what do you call this world? Hagraza. Thank you. The Shalkrin stepped back when a projection shot up, showing a vertical line with a hollow circle over it in the middle. Everin nodded at Oligan, and she hesitated before sweeping a clawed finger through... A picture made of light, she said. Yes, said Everin. The line under the circle represents your history, everything that has led us to this point. The circle represents the present. The line above the circle is your future. As in tomorrow? Yes, and everything you will do. All together, the past, present, and future are one timeline, as you see here. Now imagine that we can make copies of that timeline. The projection added two copies of the timeline off to the right. Everin highlighted the first new image. In this one, Hagraza has no invaders. Oligrin stared intently at the display. This is similar to our concept of Ilmagora, where the original reality was split into many parts, and we're in one. In your example... Would there be other versions of the Shilkrins? In some, yes, said Everin. Your concept of Ilmagura is very similar. Oligan's eyes narrowed. Only the gods could verify this. The projection added ten more timelines, causing the Shilkrins to talk among themselves. She walked alongside the other timelines. And one of these timelines 
has a Hagratza without other versions of ourselves or these monsters? Yes, and we can take you there, said Everin. You would be able to start over without the threat of extinction. And how would we get there? asked Oligan. She extended a paw toward the Toravada. In that tiny thing? It's much bigger than you might think, said Kess. Oligan examined her. I see. What species are you? I'm an Orion, she said. She singled Jelton out. He's a Riven, and Dr. Snowden and Emily are humans. V is an artificial intelligence, or AI, and that's less a species and more of a what. Everin is just unique. Oligan paused as two other Shilkrins whispered in her ear. She grunted. You all appear to look similar. Her nose flared. We'll accept your offer only if you pass the god test. What's that? asked Emily. If you can move the crystal, even slightly, then that means you were meant to move it. Nothing we possess can do that. Everin bowed. I accept this test. Then you and your group may enter, said Oligan. Whether you fail or succeed, I would like to look inside your Tuarvata. Of course. Kess had noticed the Shilkrins throughout the discussion. While they appeared highly wound up initially, they were much more relaxed now, based on their stances and body and facial cues. They no longer had death grips on their weapons, and their ears had drooped some. Their black noses had been flared before, but they had returned to a neutral state. While the holographic images had startled them, they had adjusted fast after observing Oligan. She was their rock. Kess followed the others as they walked toward the open doors. Oligan led the group, and to the sides of the gang were Shilkrin guards. Although Oligan might have extended some trust, the guards had shifted to high alert as the group moved. It surprised Kess that Oligan even considered allowing the Cosmic Shard to leave her hands, but perhaps the threat of extinction was a major motivator. It would have been only a matter of time until the Shilkrins were overwhelmed, and Kess suspected Oligan knew that. Dr. Snowden reached out and squeezed her hand. She smiled at him. Once again, they were in unfamiliar territory, but his presence made everything better. She wished she could permanently travel with him, but her duties would interfere with that too much. Although she could always go on adventures, then come back a minute later when she had left, it would be hard to focus on the galactic empire she helped manage. She would enjoy the moment for now, even if it was to test moving a cosmic shard. Chapter 3 Dr. Snowden surveyed as much as he could as Oligan led them into the temple. The elaborate art on the stone walls sings. It was obvious that art was important to the Shilkrins. Even Oligan's armor had beautiful designs. Although they would be considered primitive by an advanced society, it impressed him that they had the concept of multiple realities via Ilmagora. It saddened him that he would probably not get to spend much time learning about their culture and history. Compared to their previous summonses, this one was a walk in the park. But he also understood how fast things could change. Emily almost bounced as she walked alongside Jelton. It bothered Dr. Snowden that she had been hurt in the fight, but she was tough and had handled it with ease. It was also obvious what Jelton's presence did for her. She had said before that it would be perfect if Jelton and Kess could come along for a summons, and here they were. Jelton was his usual self that Dr. Snowden had come to know. Jelton was calm and collected, and quick to step in and assist as needed. Dr. Snowden had learned a lot about the Rift Guardians, and Jelton was a prime example of one. His noble nature was similar to Everin's. Dr. Snowden's pulse quickened in Kess's presence. She was his rock, and when he had been at his lowest, it was her place that he had traveled to in order to heal. She was the puzzle piece of his life that he had been missing and everything was better with her around. Another facet that he did not discuss often was that she ignited a physical desire for pleasure. 
Everin was his usual self as he strolled with his hands behind his back. He walked with no fear, and his cosmic aura had a visibly noticeable impact on the Shilkrins that the group passed. Oligan even smiled a lot, assuming that was what a smile was among the Shilkrins. That was what Everin's presence did wherever he went, and sometimes Dr. Snowden took a step back to admire it at a higher level. V tilted his head in every direction. It reminded Dr. Snowden of a dog trying to hear better, but V was a brother to Dr. Snowden. His curious nature was something Dr. Snowden related to, and together they had spent a lot of time researching and studying things. He often found himself assisting V in his organic interaction simulations. Now they were once again learning about a new culture on the fly, and Dr. Snowden would not want it any other way. Kess grabbed his arm. You thinking hard? Dr. Snowden cleared his throat after realizing he had almost walked into a wall. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, I do know, mister. They chuckled. He focused back on the twists and turns their path through the temple took. This was one time when they were going up ramps versus deeper underground. The cosmic shard's presence became stronger and he knew where it was even through all the rock. How the Shilkrins had come to find it, then build something around it, remained a mystery. They called it a god crystal, which implied they must have some belief that a god or gods had placed the crystal there. He had noticed some statues carved into the walls at various points that might represent a pantheon of gods. The torches made the statues' shadows appear to move, the hallways had a strong odor of something being cooked, mixed with a smell that reminded him of a wet dog. They were probably close to some type of living area. After twenty minutes, they reached a large room that had pinholes carved into the wall and on the ceilings, which allowed light in. Dr. Snowden examined the large, vertical, diamond-like crystal in the center of the room. It hung in the air and irradiated a white halo. He shuddered as he remembered the last time he had seen a cosmic shard. Experiencing a near-death situation was not high on his list of things to do. Oh, yeah, that's the cosmic shard, said Emily. Jelton's nose flared. I don't have fond memories of seeing one. Everin swept his gaze across the group. There is nothing to fear here. While this shard is similar to the other one, no one will be sacrificing themselves to release the cosmic energy in it. We are only moving it. Yeah, but touching it has bad consequences, said Dr. Snowden. Only if you allow it to be used that way, said Everin. The group assembled around the shard. Oligan gazed at it. Only the gods can move this. Prove you are one, and we won't stand in your way. Everin stood next to it. We are not gods, but we can move it. His eyes glowed when he pressed his hand against the shard, and it moved slightly. The Shilkrins gasped and immediately dropped to the ground with their heads bowed. Please rise, said Everin. As I mentioned before, we are not gods, but we do possess similar energy to your god crystal, which is really a cosmic shard. Oligan stayed down. You've come to deliver us from this nightmare. Everin knelt next to her and placed a hand on her shoulder. We would have done so even without the crystal's presence. She peered up at him with misted eyes. We will do whatever you ask of us. He stood. Then I want everyone to rise. After the Shilkrins complied, Everin motioned at Dr. Snowden. To prove my point from before about touching the shard, place your hand on it and push, while thinking of moving it. Dr. Snowden licked his lips. All right. He tensed up as he slowly moved his hand toward the shard. While he had not planned on doing so, it would alleviate his concerns. Everin must have sensed everyone's apprehension and deemed this an opportunity to address it. When Dr. Snowden's hand touched the shard... He recalled that feeling that had ripped through him before, but instead of focusing on saving Everin, this time he concentrated on moving. The cosmic shard moved. Well, how about that? asked Dr. Snowden, pulling his hand away. 
Everett motioned at Emily, then Jelton. Dr. Snowden watched her tentatively place her hand on the shard and close her eyes. It moved, causing her to yank her hand away. Her relieved sigh afterward mirrored how he had felt earlier. Jelton was next, and it took him a moment before he reached out. He had died the last time he had touched a shard, so his hesitation was understandable. He stared intently at the shard and placed his hand on it. After it moved, he snapped his hand back. V was the next up, and although Everin had not indicated for him to do so, V had taken on it himself to move it. He moved the shard with ease. Oligan glanced at Kess. Can you move the shard, too? She shook her head. I have no cosmic energy in me, so I can't. I see, said Oligan. It's evident you all have power that rivals that of the gods. We prayed for salvation, and your group has arrived. Everin gestured at her. We should begin preparations for moving your people into the Torvata. How much can we bring? she asked. However much you want. Olgan's ears twitched. I don't mean to offend, and Kess mentioned your transport is bigger than it looks, but I don't see how it can support more than a pawful. Everin's eyes glowed, causing some of the Shilkrins to step back. The Torvata is advanced, and can expand internally to whatever is needed. Oligan dipped her head. We believe you. She addressed several Shilkrins. Prepare for evacuation. The Shilkrins bowed and exited the room. Come, let us show you the Torvata, said Everin. Dr. Snowden figured it would take some time to load everyone, while the living quarters could scale with ease. The entry to them and the Torvata would be a choke point. Once they were in the living quarters, they would need to be directed to their individual rooms. On top of that, some might need medical assistance, so the med lab would be in play. He did not imagine they would be going to the hollow, conference, or maintenance dimensional rooms. Emily and Jelton eagerly discussed touching the shard. Dr. Snowden understood their sense of relief and how it made the shard less threatening. Why it needed to be moved still remained a mystery, as did how it had even come to be where it was. Perhaps that was something they could discuss after everyone was on the Toravata. Kess swatted his arm. You coming or hanging around here? Like Jelton said, I go where you go. You better, she said while winking and laughing. Jelton grinned as he watched the facial reactions of Oligan and the chosen Shilkrins she had brought with her to the Toravata. With any technologically primitive species, the Torvato would seem like a chariot of the gods. It intrigued him that Oligan had adjusted to the concept of dimensional mechanics with ease, and when Everin had extended the living quarter's main area for as far as the eye could see, she had merely studied the sides, which had two levels, each with an array of doors. The medical lab had intrigued the Shilkrins. They probably did not know what most of the stuff did, but they were amused when V did a body scan of Oligan, causing multiple data labels to pop off to the side. In the conference room, the Shilkrins had been enthralled with the matter replicators. There were no patterns for them to make food yet, but they could make a glass of water. Their eyes had lit up when Everin had said he would scan their food items to allow them to be replicated. However, it was the personal rooms of the living quarters that Oligan had shown the most interest in. She wanted to ensure that each room had the basic support for a Shilkrin. When Everin had customized a room on the fly, Jelton had heard Oligan's heartbeat surge. He suspected that she was beginning to truly understand how special the Torvato was, as well as the gang that crewed it. Jelton had thought they might have recreated the mountain in the hollow room for familiarity, and when he had asked about it, Oligan said their present conditions were horrible. What she had seen in the living quarters was a massive upgrade. Apparently, the bathrooms and matter replicators, along with custom bedding, were the most important aspects. One concern had been with housing the children, and she had been thrilled to see that each room could add more with a simple hollow menu. Jelton suspected there would be a learning curve, and he wondered if any of them would want to leave after arriving at a new place. He smiled at Emily as they walked back to the cosmic shard, 
Everin and V continued to show Oligan around. Dr. Snowden and Kess had gone to scan food and drink items for the matter replicator. They were escorted by one of the Queen's guards, and they had taken a translation or belong. None of the Shilkrins had boarded yet, but there were signs of mobilization in every hallway Jelton and Emily went through. He had peeked into a few rooms and saw Shilkrins busy packing everything they could get into containers. There was a silent urgency to their actions, and he suspected that conditions in the temple were far worse than Oligan let on. He had also brought one of the Torvada's translation orbs with him, and he overheard several conversations. The biggest topic covered the matter replicators and the food and drink items that could be made. The living quarters were also a hot discussion point. Some Shilkrins had paused to face them and bow slightly. He was not sure what they had been told, but word must have spread fast as to what was going on. He paused when they arrived at the Cosmic Shard Room. Although he had touched it earlier, it still made him nervous. It represented death to him, and his opinion would most likely never change in that regard. Emily strode up to the shard and tipped it over so it was horizontal, then pushed it down to her hip level. She then got behind it and used her palm to push it forward. I can move this, she said. You can be my support. He went over and slid his arm around her waist. Whatever you want. They both paused when several Shilkin children giggled, then ran out of the room. He caught Emily looking wistfully at them. Although it had never been a deeply discussed topic, she had thought about kids before. There was the cross-species concern, but that was less of an issue when you add Everin and the Toravada. If he did have kids, he knew she would be a great mother. That might be something they pursued after their traveling days in the Toravada were over. Halfway to the Toravada, V spoke over comms. Analysis. A large group of the creatures we encountered earlier are on their way. How many? Asked Emily. Around six times bigger than the group we fought previously. Jelton's eyes widened as he viewed the aerial footage V displayed. Each column that advanced was huge, with a lot more big creatures. Jelton wondered if the beating the monsters had taken earlier made them think there was a serious threat that needed to be removed, or if they sensed the cosmic shard and wanted it. They would already have known of the shard from before, and from what Oligan had mentioned while she was in the Toravada, the number of creatures had always been roughly the same. What's the plan? asked Jelton. Everin moved the Toravada to the end of the hallway just inside the temple, which has sealed its doors, said V. Dr. Snowden and Kess are coordinating with Oligan and others in boarding the other Shilkrins. Everin is outside and will serve as a distraction. I will assist him in orb mode and provide a tactical overview of the situation. Emily scrunched her face. Are you nuts? Everin's going to solo all that? Jelton and I can help. Everin wants you and Jelton to secure the cosmic shard in the research lab, then help get the Shilkrins boarded. If the temple doors are breached, you are to serve along with him as a line of defense. Dr. Snowden will control the Toravada's defenses, and Kess will scour the rest of the temple to ensure that everyone was retrieved. Emily sighed. Fine. I still don't like him out there by himself. I want to see the view from you when those things come. Acknowledged. Jelton's nostrils flared. It did not surprise him that Everin would take on an army by himself if it gave the Shilkrins more time to escape to the Toravada. However, Jelton had the utmost trust that Everin knew what he was doing. Having Dr. Snowden handle the Toravada's defenses while keeping an eye on the boarding was smart, and as Kess could fly fast... She could help stragglers or those who might have issues being moved. That left Jelton and Emily to provide defense if need be, and he was okay with that. The logjam on board the Torvada made itself known as Jelton and Emily arrived. Although the guards kept the flow steady, some Shilkrins panicked. When the entry was temporarily halted so Emily and Jelton could enter, the anxiety of the crowd accelerated. 
Jelton was glad to get the cosmic shard into the research lab, and a quick peek in the living quarters showed the hard work going into directing Shilkrins to their rooms. He checked in with Dr. Snowden, who stared at a map of the mountain and Kess's location. His concern was evident from the constant furrowing of his brow. Jelton squeezed his arm, which seemed to relax him some. She'll be okay, my friend, said Jelton. Dr. Snowden took a measured breath. I know. Just wish we had more time to do this. We'll get everyone boarded in time, said Emily. He half smiled at her and turned back to the map. Let's get out front, said Emily. Jelton slapped Dr. Snowden on the back and followed Emily on her way out. Oligan stood outside the living quarters' dimensional door and took everything in. Jelton wondered what her thoughts must be on everything. As inquisitive as she had been earlier, her focus was now on her people streaming in. There were signs of visible relief from those coming in and seeing her directing things. It was probably unsettling for them to see a tiny ship and everyone moving into it. Jelton stood next to Emily in front of the Torvada. There was a stretch of empty hallway up to the sealed temple doors, and the noise of everyone boarding echoed around. He had gotten a look at the line, and it stretched to another open room that had multiple hallways. He was thankful that he could see V's aerial view. Everin stood silently with his staff and shield out at the base of the stairs. He would do his best to buy some time. Although Jelton wanted to rush out and assist, and he was sure Emily felt the same way, Everin had them defending when the doors got breached. Between Dr. Snowden manning the Toravada's stun beams, Jelton and Emily providing a middle line of defense, and Everin slowing everything down outside, that should give enough time to get all the Shilkrins boarded. Jelton ran his hand over Emily's back. You ready for this? Let's do this. Chapter 4 Emily hated that she was not out with Everin and V, but she understood that she and Jelton, along with Dr. Snowden manning the Torvada's stun beams, were the last line of defense. If the creatures got past that, it would be close quarters combat as the Shilkrins were trying to board. She went to the side of the Torvada and observed them hustling. They apparently knew what was coming, and the guards formed a corridor that kept the group moving. How many more Shilkrins are there? asked Emily over comms. Still quite a few, said Kess. I've mapped out every area, and the Torvada should be able to show you where they're at. Emily used her ARI to pull up the temple. She examined the maze of tunnels and open areas. The Shilkrins showed up as red dots, and although they flowed toward the Torvada, Kess had been right that there were quite a few still out there. She appeared as a blue dot and flew around fast to places where there were holdups. It made Emily wonder if some refused to go. At least Kess had a translation orb with her so she could communicate with them, and her diplomatic skills would be put to good use. Jelton tapped her arm. The enemy approaches. Emily surveyed the aerial view from V. He had flown high enough that she could see for miles in the direction of the monsters. The six groups would converge at the temple. She had seen most of the large, medium, and smaller creatures before, but there was a larger variety of monsters this time around. The bigger ones had humanoids with spiked clubs and bone armor. Their faces reminded her of an ant's, with long mandibles. Each column also had a massive, worm-like creature that was being escorted. The number of smaller creatures made her skin crawl. It was like every insect she could imagine was buffed with armor and hopped, flew, and scurried around. The medium-sized monsters had a more humanoid version that also wore bone armor with some type of skull helmet while carrying thick, blunt weapons. That, that's a force, said Dr. Snowden over comms. Everin, you sure about this plan? I am said Everin. The goal is not to defeat them, but to slow them down. Kess, based on what you are seeing, how much longer until everyone is aboard? At least an hour at this rate, she said. Emily's stomach churned. That was probably a minimal estimate. The rate at which the monsters moved meant they would be on Everin in fifteen minutes. 
he had to buy 45. Even then, if the attackers came to the door, Emily, Jelton, and Dr. Snowden would have to hold back the horde and hope the Shilkrins could be evacuated in time. After 15 minutes, she stared at a projection the Torvata shot out of the view from V. Oligan and some of her security had joined Emily and Jelton out front. Everin had migrated to the center of the open area before the stairs, and the smaller creatures were the first to arrive. He opened with spinning a grapple beam that ended in a chunk of metal. As he moved around, the wide circle of destruction knocked back the abominations. Some had ducked or flown over, but he was able to hit or kick them away. The medium-sized humanoids were the next to come. Everin marched into them while increasing and decreasing the angle of the swinging hammer. Although the heavier armor slowed down his advance, the horde kept coming. It was not until a large humanoid with a spiked club arrived that Everin switched to using his staff. He got mobbed but moved around, jumping off the large creatures into specific areas, then doing a 360-degree sweep. His speed was on display as he worked in a circle, knocking back enemies and stunning others. When a big abomination would come over, he would trip it, then move into a new area. V assisted from above. The Torvada's projection showed how V targeted the Horde, and his mist and stun beams helped keep Everin from being completely swarmed, although that tactic did not work on the larger attackers or on some of the medium ones, it devastated the smaller ones. He kept areas that Everin moved to as free as possible. Emily knew that V probably wished he was in body mode out there, but his tactical overview helped Everin to determine where to go. When all six columns had converged, it was chaos. Everin had picked up a large monster and tossed it like a bowling ball, but any empty space that had opened up had already been filled. Even V's mist and stun combo barely created an opening. There were simply too many creatures. Everin had backed up to the stairs and fought as hard as he could, but monsters were able to get around him. Emily's heart thumped when the temple doors were pounded on. She faced Oligan and pointed at the Toravada. Go! The pounding increased. Emily was not sure how long they would hold, but Everin and V had gone up the stairs while fighting and were in front of the door. V doused the steps and clearing at the base with sticky globules, making it harder for the enemies to move. She licked her lips at the sight of a carpet of monsters rushing forward. Everin used his repulsion beams, then missed ones, which V lit up. While it did keep the attackers at bay for a short while, the bigger ones were approaching fast. After a few minutes, Everin had resorted to knocking away creatures like bowling balls down the stairs. He's not going to be able to hold on for much longer, said Jelton. Emily growled, and we still have half an hour at least on the evacuation. Jelton wagged a finger. I thought the Torvata could extend its shields. That would lift it off the ground. While it can shape itself in a small area around the Torvada, the major extension is in bubble form. Ah. Emily liked Jelton's thought, but she had also considered that. The hallway the evacuees were coming from was too tall for a custom shield shape. Even then, the creatures could bash away the walls around it to get at the Shilkrins. She continued to watch V's effort at laying down a sticky mess. The monsters kept running into each other and the smaller ones could not extract themselves. The medium-sized attackers were stacking up, causing a jam at the bottom of the stairs. Everin, I have an idea, she said. Those things will probably break through the doors, but when they do, we do what V is doing and plug up the entrance. An intriguing thought, he said. V could continue to fire from the outside. We might want to open the doors now, since the big ones cannot get up the stairs effectively, but I could let the others pass through to get stuck. Now we're talking, said Emily. Uncle Albert, you get all that? Yep, and Oligan is aware of it as well, said Dr. Snowden. All right, said Everin. Emily, you and Jelton open the doors. V, assist in stunning and creating a mess. When the Torvada is ready for evacuation, melt through and I will grapple up. Jelton glanced at Emily. You ready? Let's do this, she said. Emily went to a wheel that turned. 
Jelton was on the other side, and with some effort, they were able to open the doors. Her pulse quickened when she moved to the center with Jelton, then moved back. Everin was out front, batting away anything that got close. V flew around and rained globules and stuns. I will now let some through, said Everin. Got it, said Emily. The first few creatures to slip through were small, and they were easily stunned at the entrance. A dose of globules covered them. Some medium-sized monsters arrived and added to the growing wall. Jelton helped move them into a better formation to block the entrance. After fifteen minutes, a sizable barrier had been built. V did his part, and as the monsters tried to scale it, he added them to the barrier. However, there were so many incoming that Everin was running out of space to operate. Emily relaxed as the cadence of stunning and shooting globules became predictable. The effort worked, but Everin had already noted that the larger monsters were climbing even closer. They would reach the top of the stairs at some point, and they might even be able to break through. She would be ready, and with Jelton at her side and Everin and V on the other, nothing would get to the Torvata. Kess rushed around the furthest parts of the temple. She listened in on the rapid-fire conversations going on over group comms and wished she was there to help. However, she could move others while the rest of the gang fought. At least Dr. Snowden was safe in the Torvata. She had observed that he preferred that over being in battle. The temple had several distinct areas, and while the front was polished, with pillars and clean walls, the other parts had rooms cut out of the rock. Although she was no Shilkrin expert, she could smell which places dealt with waste. The cramped living areas were barely enough for two or three Shilkrins. She suspected that the temple had never been designed to house anyone, but the pressure of the monsters outside had forced them to flee to this place. Thankfully, the Torvada, with its pulse scanning, gave her a good layout and showed where everyone was. She used her nano swarm to widen some areas so the Shilkrins in line could move faster. In what resembled a medical ward, she had crafted four casters from the rock wall, then attached them to the underside of a metal slab's corners. She made a few more, and the staff used them with no hesitation. The translation orb worked well, and most Shilkrins were surprised to see her. A few words of encouragement and an update on the status went a long way with them. They knew who she was, and some had run their paws along her arm. Perhaps that was a sign of trust. They came in a variety of colors and ages, and her heart warmed when she saw the younger ones playing, blissfully unaware that outside the doors were creatures that would rend their flesh from their bones. Between the support she provided, she kept her eye on what was going on from Emily and V's view. The wall of glued monsters was a smart tactic and would slow down any breaching, Everin was a machine as he batted enemies away with ease. Kess figured she would join in the defense once the final Shilkrins were aboard the Toravada. The last place she had to assist was filled with elderly Shilkrins. Although most had been moved, there were some who would need to be carried. They should have been the first to evacuate, but there was a small group of younger Shilkrins that were making trips to move the older ones. A quick survey of the scene showed there to be twenty-one elders to transport, she singled out a Shilkrin woman with a panicked look who acted as if she was in charge. Hello, my name is Kess, and I'm here to help with the evacuation. I'm Junior, she said with a slight bow. We appreciate your help in this situation. Kess smiled. I'm just glad we can. She inspected the room. I saw a group moving some of the elderly on some type of platform they had to carry on both ends, but I only saw six being moved. At that rate, we'll run out of time. Junra frowned. I don't know what we can do. Kess walked around and inspected the elderly, who were in a variety of beds. Their fur was splotchy and their faces had patches of white. Some gave her quizzical looks as she passed. She figured she could use the same approach as the medical ward, but instead of creating individual ones, she could create a bunk bed-like version that carried three at a time. I have an idea but I'll need your help, said Kess. Anything, said Junra. Kess went to the back of the room, which was just a rock wall. 
She focused her nanoswarm to carve some of it out and create a slab with bigger casters than the ones used in the medical ward. She then made two more slabs that stacked on top of the bottommost one, with ample space between each slab. This is the first, but I'll make six more. Use bedding on each layer and then you can move the elderly. She waved her finger around the room. Let's get them loaded, and as each transport fills up, move them out. Junora's eyes widened. How, how did you create that from rock? Advanced technology. These transports are crude, but they'll work for what we need, said Kess. Junor's group got the first transport loaded with three Shilkrins, then one of the group moved it out. Kess concentrated and created six more transportation units, taking a break between each one. The process wore her down, but she would worry about that later. After ten minutes, the room was empty. She closed her eyes and took several deep breaths. Her arm hurt and she had a slight headache. After opening her eyes, she checked on the temple's layout. Almost all the Shilkrins were boarded. It was time for her to go. As she hustled back, she checked in on the group. Despite Everin's toughness, he was also taking a beating. Several times he had been swarmed and come out, but he moved a bit slower. He was currently fighting two large creatures that had crawled over the other stuck monsters on the stairs. Another large monster was slamming into the glued mass in the entrance. The horde was about to break through. Emily and Jelton went into action when the glued mass came undone. The large beast that broke through was yanked back out by Everin using a grapple beam. However, a swarm of attackers rushed in. Dr. Snowden had extended the Toravada's stun weapons from the black mesh panels and opened fire. When Kess arrived, she flew over the short line of Shilkrins that were quickly boarding. Then she hovered above the Toravada. As skilled as Emily and Jelton were, they were unable to completely stop the horde. She formed large hands with her nano swarm and tossed anything that approached, but she still monitored the boarding process. Jelton had taken a nasty hit from several medium-sized monsters that had rushed him, but Emily had cleared them out. It was going to be too much for them to handle. Last Shilkrin board it. Let's go, said Kess. Dr. Snowden had spun the Toravada in place so that its entrance was oriented toward Emily and Jelton. Kess flew forward and created a wall of vibrating nanobots while Emily and Jelton rushed past her. Once they were safely on board, she followed suit. They had already taken their place in the command area. V was at the front podium, and Oligan and her team stood next to him while staring outside. Kess took her seat as the Toravada hovered while its shielding heated up. The Toravada surged out of the temple. Everin fired a grappling beam when they flew past him, and he reeled himself in and onto the ramp. A moment later, he was in the command chair. Kess observed that Oligan was shaken at what she was viewing below. Despite Everin's best efforts, the horde continued into the temple. Outside of that were the monsters now coming from every direction. Kess was also sure that flying and being able to view the true extent of what the Shilkrins were up against was another shocking thing for Oligan. We would have been gone, said Oligan, her ears drooping. Kess ran the back of her hand along Oligan's arm. But you're not. Oligan's ears perked up as she smiled at her. Then Everin, you all came at the exact time we needed you. The Torvada is what sent us, said Everin, moving his hand in an arc. And it knew about the god crystal, or a cosmic shard, as you call it, said Oligan. She gazed about the room, then touched the side of the front podium. The Torvata is a god, and you, its attendants. Kess had never thought about it that way, but she could see how someone could come to that conclusion. The Torvada had known to arrive at the exact point in time and space to save the Shilkrins, and it needed the gang to actually interact. Everin half smiled. I do not believe the Torvada views itself as a god, or us as its attendants, but it does have a unique ability to find things in time and space that need attending to. The look in Oligan's eyes showed Kess that Oligan was not going to change her mind, not after witnessing her people saved due to the Toravada bringing a group to save her species. 
If the Shilkrins were a more advanced society, they would probably just view the Toravada and Everin as powerful entities, but not gods. It is time for us to take you to your new home, said Everin. V. I have selected various timelines that I think will work. Let us begin the search. Acknowledged. Kess motioned for Algin to have a seat, and she took one next to Kess while the other Shilkrins stood nearby. She shuddered as she thought about what would have happened if they had not come. The Torvada could have decided on the summons after the monsters had cleared out the temple, and they might have built a stronghold around the Cosmic Shard. How the Torvada knew to create summons still baffled Kess. The next step would be more relaxing, but there was a new world to find. Chapter 5 Dr. Snowden had sat with Kess and Oligan after V had taken over the front podium. A data window of the various timelines had popped up, but they had a naming structure he was not familiar with. Although he knew each timeline had a Planner Unique Identifier, or PUID, the names shown looked more friendly. After the Torvada reached low orbit, it flew through a portal to the first highlighted timeline— Oligan's reaction to flying had been intriguing. She had gripped the seating while staring intently at the front screen. When they had achieved low orbit, she and the other Shilkrins had rushed forward. Kess had joined them, and she and Oligan had alternated running their hands and paws along each other's arms. Dr. Snowden was not sure what the significance of that was, but it was obvious that Oligan favored Kess some. Several more of Oligan's most trusted had stepped outside the living quarters and paused at the entrance. Their widened eyes and silence told Dr. Snowden everything he needed to know about what they thought. To go from a technologically primitive society to flying to low orbit and seeing the world for the first time would be a mesmerizing moment. The first parallel planet they exited to had data labels and it was not hard to see that the water world would not be worthy. So much water, said Oligan. She peeked back at Everin. The blue indicates that, and one of your windows said it was water. You are correct, said Everin. We will fly around the planet to make sure of that, but this seems like an unlikely candidate. Dr. Snowden examined the results after the Torvada had flown around. There were a few scattered islands— but it was no place for the Shilkrins. Everin gestured at Oligan. We can go to the next world, unless you wish to investigate one of those islands. Oligan's ears twitched. Let's see some others. We can always come back here, right? Indeed. V. Take us to the next one. Acknowledged. The next world was harsh. The temperature alone would have cooked the Shilkrins, but a part of that was due to the sun being much more powerful, and the planet was outside the Goldilocks zone, where life as he knew it could survive. Oligan had no desire to investigate, so they moved on to the next timeline on the list. The new planet mirrored Oligan's almost perfectly. The sun was the right age, and the planet was the correct distance. There was no sign of dimensional activity or aliens within a ten-light-year radius— more importantly, there were no satellites or signs of an advanced society. Take us down, said Everin. Oligan stared forward with hopeful eyes as they entered the atmosphere. It looks like our world. Are we going back to the mountain? Yes, but we can go anywhere you like, said Everin. Oligan's ears twitched. The mountain is a good place to start. But our home was in a clearing not too far from there. Then we will check that out as well. Oligan's nervousness, as far as Dr. Snowden could tell, did not surprise him. Even though she was in a safe place, her decision on where to start off would have major implications. The Shilkrins that had come from the living quarters joined the others already up front, and they all gazed out as a group. Oligan faced Everin. We don't have many supplies for when we land. Can the Torvata make some for us? It can he said. However, we can do better. A matter replicator will be given to you. It is self-powered and can replicate anything you need. After twenty years, it will disassemble itself. That should give you enough time to establish yourselves. 
Also, we can recreate your mountain temple as it was on your planet, unless you want to restart in the clearing you mentioned before. You... you can do all that? Of course. One of the Shilkrins whispered in Oligan's ear. We'd prefer the mountain if we can adjust how it's created, she said. Everin interacted with his command chair, and a 3D projection of the temple materialized before him. You can touch any of the rooms and adjust them by grabbing a line to pull or push it. Oligan went right to the living areas and expanded a room by pulling a bottom line. This is amazing! We like the rooms here. Is it possible to create that? The physical dimensions can be replicated, but not the holographic interface there. However, the waste system can tie into the matter replicator. A swarm of nanobots, which are small machines, will keep the connections clear. Your temple also had a waterfall that provided clean water. I suspect that is here as well, and that will connect to your waste system. A plumbing system, said Dr. Snowden. Yes, but only for twenty years. However, where waste goes can be redirected at that time, and we will show you how to recycle it. It is the least we can do after uprooting the group. Everin tapped at his ARI, and the projection showed the new room sizes. He added another large space with big doors. We can also add twenty years of supplies into this place. There is no need for you to replicate it. That should allow you to use the replicator for other things. Oligan stared at the display. This is more than we could have ever asked for. Dr. Snowden enjoyed watching the Shilkrin's enthusiasm. It jumped even higher when the Toravada landed, then emitted a nanoswarm from its side panels that began the work of creating the temple. After the stairs had been created, the projection updated and showed a percentage completed. He had not known that the Toravada could do that, but it made sense that it would have essentially unlimited nanoswarms and material to work with. Two more Shilkrins came out bringing the number to seven in the command area. Every one of them examined the display, occasionally pausing to look out. This must be like magic to them. Dr. Snowden detected their elevated heartbeats and increased breathing. It surprised him that Everin would allow for this much advanced technology to be given to a society, but they were giving up a cosmic shard and had endured an extinction event. This was an exception to the knowledge pollution rule and more importantly, it was outside the main timeline. The nanoswarms made good progress, and after only ten minutes, fifteen percent of the temple was done. V had gone to the research lab and wheeled out a rectangular object that stood about six feet tall. It was a matter replicator. The back could be pulled out to put matter in, and the front panel extended out to replicate whatever was asked for. A Shilkrin hologram popped out from the replicator, causing the Shilkrins to jump. That was not something Dr. Snowden had expected. Analysis. Do not be alarmed. This is a virtual intelligence attached to the matter replicator. She can answer any questions you may have on how to operate it. Also, she can add any item to the list of things you can make. Oligan raised her head, ears straight up, and walked over to the replicator. She pulled out a nut from her belt pouch and held it up to the V.I. "'What do I say to get her to recognize this?' asked Oligan. "'Tell her to scan,' said V. Oligan complied, and a beam shot out from the replicator, making Oligan drop the nut. As she went to pick it up, she stared at the one that had been created. She picked it up and held them side by side, then tasted the new nut— it's... it's the same. Indeed, said Everin, joining the other Shilkrins as they assembled around the replicator. You can give the VI a name before we go, and we will set that, but you can change it at any time. You merely need to ask her. Oligan scrutinized the VI. I'd like to call you Kess. Name accepted. You may say my name any time to activate me. Kess had a surprised look on her face. She had made an impact on the Shilkrins in her brief time with them. 
Dr. Snowden cracked up at the other Shilkrins getting things scanned and asking for various items, ranging from medical herbs to dishes that had been scanned when Kess had helped the Shilkrins. All they had to do was wait now for the temple to be completed, then put in the matter replicator, house the Shilkrins, and pack the new large temple room with supplies. Kess liked seeing Oligan and the other Shilkrins excited over their new home and the matter replicator. The living arrangements she had seen in the old temple had left a lot to be desired. The rooms were cramped, and there was a communal bathroom that was nothing more than a deep hole. Not only was the place unhygienic, it was dangerous, as the only thing preventing a drop-in were two side rails. It would be disastrous if a child fell in. The new rooms were a massive upgrade, and with the bathroom in there, along with a bathtub, they would have some privacy. It intrigued her that the Shilakrins did not use showers. That was probably a cultural thing. For eating, they would all still need to go to the central kitchen area. There was nothing in their rooms for food preparation, but there was storage space for non-perishable items. The Shilkrins had quickly adapted to the Toravada's rooms, and the three-bedroom living units, which had a large open area as well, were a big hit. The Torvada would replicate the living quarters exactly and assign a number that would link them up to their old rooms in the temple. This allowed those with a larger family unit that had special configurations to have their custom rooms in the temple. The Torvada's nanoswarms had taken roughly three hours to complete everything, the gang, along with Oligan and a few leaders, was now in the big storage place near the front where V had parked the matter replicator. Massive shelves with ladders ringed the sides, and the center area had large structures to hold items. Shilkrin workers moved supplies in under V's guidance while Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Jelton assisted in guiding them to their new living areas. Oligan had wanted Kess and Everin to escort her, Kess had gotten a few arm rubs from passing Shilkrins, as had Everin. She had noticed that the rest of the gang had as well. The Shilkrins rescue had erased any apprehension about what would be strange aliens helping them. They assembled around the matter replicator. Kess, said Oligan. The VI spawned. Yes. I thought you were asking for me, said Kess, winking. The group chuckled. It'll take some time to get used to this light being, but she has been helpful so far, said Oligan. I'll make sure everything we need is scanned. Everin nodded. I hope your expansion into the world is good, and this temple serves as a safe haven while you do so. Oligan extended a paw toward the entrance. It will. With the supplies and this replicator and Kess, of course, we'll be able to explore a brand new world. Oh, before we forget, you can ask Kess about human food. She has all the patterns and can show you what they are. I think you'll like tacos and pizza, said Kess. I'll make sure to look it up, said Oligan. She looked at Everin. Will we ever see you or the others again? Everin sighed. Most likely not. I do not typically interfere this much. But when something as dangerous as the Cosmic Shard is present, exceptions can be made. However, I still strive to minimize our impact. I understand. The Torvata and its attendants came to claim their crystal, and in doing so, saved us, said Oligan as she slowly blinked. Our intent was not to shake up your natural evolution. Perhaps not, but you did, and this will not be forgotten said Oligan. Kess flung her hand in the air and snapped. Then just think of us as powerful friends. Oligan ran her paw up and down Everin and Kess's arms. We'll do so. I'm saddened we won't see you again. But I understand you probably have many things to do. Our future is secured, unless those monsters come back. That was a rare event, said Everin. However, if they do show up, Kess, the hologram, has an emergency feature. There are two shield generators by your entrance that will create a bubble shield that enemies cannot penetrate. It, too, shall be disassembled after twenty years. Although I would normally say not to put a focus on defending yourself, it may be wise to do. 
we plan to, said Oligan. Every capable Shilkrin will learn to fight, and with the replicator making weapons, we'll have enough to defend ourselves. We plan to place a heavy focus on archery. Kess saw the defiance in Oligan's eyes. The bubble shield and archers would provide a formidable offense. Everin pointed up. There is a terrace up higher that can assist you in that as needed. It has a shield generator that can be lowered to shoot if need be. You've already planned our defense, said Oligan. I just want to ensure you feel safe, said Everin. Kess sensed the good mood of Oligan and the other Shilkrins working. For the next several hours, Kess checked out the enhancements to the temple with Dr. Snowden. She cracked up when he jumped every time a Shilkrin approached and rubbed his arm. He had been so focused on the new changes that he did not register the Shilkrins walking around him. After another few hours, they assembled outside the Toravada. Oligan and her council had come to say goodbye, and the hall behind them was packed with other Shilkrins. I wish you all didn't have to leave, said Oligan with drooped ears. Everin ran his hand over her arm. Perhaps you will see us again. I hope your group has the chance to enjoy life as you were meant to. Oligan repeated Everin's action on the others. You all have shown us that there is a force of good in nature, and for that we are thankful. She high-fived V. Kess felt like she had bonded with Oligan and the Shilkrins, and the sad eyes behind the Shilkrin delegation were hard to miss. As a galactic diplomat, she loved to see others being helped, and was happy that Everin had allowed as much help to occur as he did. She did a slight bow when the others did, then followed them. After everyone took their seats, the Toravada hovered. Kess smiled as the Shilkrins did a single wave, almost in unison. However, there was another issue to deal with. As they ascended to low orbit, she asked, So where is the Cosmic Shard going? Everin interacted with his command chair console. We are to take it to a planet that is 48 million light years away, and also move forward in time to 4,805,333,713 BC. The times and places the Torvada travels to are always amazing, said Jelton. Indeed. Once they reached low orbit, it opened a portal and flew through, then jumped forward in time. Kess scrutinized the fiery red planet. That looks like a very hostile world. The readings support that, said Dr. Snowden. Emily singled out a red dot. We have our location. Hard to see it with so much red on the planet. V, take us down, said Everin. Acknowledged. Kess grimaced as the Toravada descended. This was a fire planet, and she had seen many like it. What surprised her was that there were almost always some exotic life forms present, but none had been detected. She had caught Emily and Dr. Snowden sneaking peeks at Everin, which usually meant he was disturbed about something. Jelton appeared calm despite having had a shard kill him in the past. The Torvada reached the top of an active volcano with a sea of lava in its caldera. Emily drew her head back. We're going in there? It would seem so, said Everin. I am assuming that millions, maybe billions of years in the future, this volcano will be gone, or maybe the planet, and the cosmic shard could be found by a specific group. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. That sounds like a pretty specific guess. I could see it, said Jelton. He wagged a finger. Imagine if, in that time, the Shilkrins advance enough to get to space, and they actively search for the shard. That would be interesting, said Kess. I don't think they could move it, though. Emily narrowed her eyes, unless another cosmic being helped them. All good possibilities, said Everin. For our part, we can only speculate and drop off the shard. Kess shuddered as the Torvada dove through molten lava, Although she knew she was safe, it still unsettled her to be in something that would instantly kill her if she was exposed. When they got to the point where the shard was to be dropped off, she joined the others on the ramp. 
Everin and V had brought the cosmic shard to the edge. Jelton poked in the air. Lava isn't going to come through a hole in the shielding, is it? It will not, said Everin. Kess stood back when the others did. Although she believed him, she also saw Jelton's concern. Everin pushed the cosmic shard into the lava. When it was almost fully in, he shoved it hard, causing it to coast out. Kess had expected there to be some reaction, but there was none. The shard hovered as if everything was normal. These shards are weird, said Emily. Yeah, and I guess with that, this summons is done, said Dr. Snowden. V tilted his head. Another one has activated in relation to the cosmic shard. Wow, when and where? asked Kess. Analysis. It is to a city ship in the year 3,106,942,526,718 A.D. Although we will check it out, it is 11 o'clock p.m., Earth time. Perhaps you should all rest and we can attend to this in the morning, said Everin. Dr. Snowden rubbed his eyes. Come to think of it, yeah, that sounds good. We did a lot today, though, said Emily. Maybe one of our fastest summons ever. Indeed. We can tackle this new one once everyone is refreshed. While you rest, V and I will scan wherever we end up. Kess had not realized how tired she was until Dr. Snowden had yawned. Her tiredness was not just physical, but also mental. So much had been done in the span of a day, but that was not unusual when traveling with Everin. Kess was not sure if the cosmic shard in the new summons was truly related to the one they just dropped off, despite what V had said. The difference in time was immense, and she wondered what they would find when they got there. A city ship made it sound like they were going someplace advanced. She had figured there would be some action on the last summons, but she did not know if there would be one on this next one. Chapter 6 Emily had enjoyed the previous night with Jelton. She had been exhausted, but not enough not to play around. Even then, she had awoken halfway through her normal sleeping time for more action, and Jelton had been receptive and ready to go. It felt natural to have him traveling with the gang, and she loved every moment of it. She had gotten a quick workout in, then picked up breakfast with the others. Everin and V were still in the command area, and Dr. Snowden and Kess had said they had slept well. The chat was energetic, and despite getting another summons, Emily was in a good mood. The Shilkrins had been saved, and although a cosmic shard had been involved, none of the gang had died. She liked seeing everyone relaxed. That could all change depending on what the next summons was, but it was merely to go to a city ship in the far future. This made her wonder if the shard needed to be placed so that some group would make use of it. Based on the date of the new summons, it might have changed hands many times. This all assumed it was the same cosmic shard. If it was, that meant something cosmic was involved. Sometimes that was good when it was someone like Drevel, a Toravada's chosen. Other times, it was bad like Wardax, a rogue cosmic entity. She was not sure what they would encounter, but she hoped it was not crazy. She joined the others in the command area and sat next to Jelton on the left side of the room. So, what's going on? Analysis. We arrived last night outside the city ship, and the current time index is February 14th, 3,106,942,526,718 A.D., 10 o'clock a.m. Emily examined the city ship. It was as if someone had taken a chair, cut off the top part, put a thick rectangular block on top, then oriented the chair so the block faced the sun. Between each leg and at the top was shielding that covered a city, the part facing the sun was relatively thick, and along its sides were thrusters and docking bays. The legs also had thrusters at their ends. This ship could move in any direction with ease. 
The lack of ships, and other stars for that matter, intrigued her. There were a few hundred satellites scattered around, though. They were in the degenerate era, a time when stars died. She remembered when Everin had explained that the band of time in which life lived was but a fraction of the overall timeline, and they were at a point where that window was closing. Dr. Snowden shuddered. This era always makes me nervous. It seems unnatural not to detect other stars. I understand, said Everin. He gestured at the ship. That is where we are to go. It's weird looking, said Kess. Reminds me of an upside-down chair minus the back, said Dr. Snowden. Emily smirked. That's what I was thinking, too. Except this gives a new definition for a hot seat... Kess grinned. That was good. Thank you, thank you. I'll be here for the rest of the day. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Analysis. We also detected a series of timeline changes, yet the end result was no change, said V. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. You think it's related to this summons? Unknown. Everin did an arc with his finger. It is possible that we are involved in them, then resolve an underlying cause. He flattened his hand out. Thus, no change. But the timeline changes still appear as we are a part of events at this point in time. Got it, said Dr. Snowden. Everin glanced at V. Have you detected any communications so far? Analysis. They are attempting to contact us via a light beam. Jelton drew his head back. They want to do a hologram. Everin interacted with his chair console. It would seem so. Wait a minute, said Kess. How'd they detect us? Emily extended her hand toward the outside. The satellites probably noticed our shadow, or that an area wasn't transmitting light, I bet. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow. Look at you. I studied, she said, smiling. She is correct, said Everin. The denizens of this ship are advanced. Analysis. We detected a cosmic shard earlier upon arrival. You think it's the one we moved? Asked Emily. Everin examined his ARI. It has a slightly different signature but as the summonses appear to be linked, I think it is highly likely that the one detected is the same as the one we encountered. We should keep this to ourselves for the moment. He motioned at V. Let the hologram through. Acknowledged. Emily drew her head back when a female humanoid in a white one-piece suit with a blue belt popped up. Silver segmented lines crisscrossed her outfit and various golden crystal bands were on her legs and arms. Her orange skin, long blue hair and green eyes made her colorful, and she had a kind face. A small disc hovered over her shoulder. Hello. I am Tracana, delicate of the Hawkscurus. I doubt you'll understand this. The room fell silent. Emily's heartbeat ramped up. There was always a future event with the Hawkscurus, and now they were meeting with them. She was not sure what would happen, but it was a big enough event that powerful entities knew of it. Although she put on a brave front, her gut was telling her something was off. Welcome, Tricana, said Everin. He examined her. I am Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Jelton Stallrin, Kess and V. And yes, we can understand you. Tracana's eyes widened. I'm impressed. How is that possible when you've never met us before? Our ship's translator is advanced. It must be. Tracana looked around. I'm glad to meet you all and, more importantly, talk to you. You're the first alien craft we've seen in 268 years. Jelton rubbed his chin. You've been isolated for a long time. Not by choice, said Tracana. Our planetary system is isolated, and we go where our sun goes. Ah. 
Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow. Do you know a Pizarra by chance? Tricana tilted her head. Yes. She's the prime delegate and oversees Kiloton, our city. How do you know her? Dr. Snowden peeked at Everin. Just curious. It's highly unlikely that you know the name Pizarra, unless it's a quirk of your language. Has your crew been monitoring us? We have not, said Everin. We arrived recently, but we have met others who have said they are Hoxcarus. Tracana's eyes softened. Where did you meet them? Not so much where, but when. Perhaps we can land on Kiloton and meet with your delegates. We'd like that, said Tracana. We have many questions. If you send us the coordinates to land, we will head there. Tracana's hologram changed to show Kiloton with a green area highlighted, then switched back to her form. Will that work? she asked. Coordinates mapped, said V. Everin dipped his head toward him. Set us to scan profile two and deactivate stealth mode, then take us in. Acknowledged. Did you detect us by our shadow? asked Emily. Tricana peered outside. Yes. We determined it was not natural, so we sent a hologram request to the area. We also detected a series of timeline changes in rapid succession, but everything is still the same. That means that if something did change, it was most likely reverted back to its original state. Nonetheless, as you've accepted my hologram, it means you not only understood what that was, but also how to accept and display it. That is one aspect of a ship with advanced technology, although we can't see yours and didn't detect it coming in. That is on purpose, said Everin. We did not mean to show ourselves this way, but we would have reached out to Keleton. We look forward to meeting you shortly, said Tracana. Her hologram dissipated. Well, that wasn't weird at all, said Emily. She didn't seem like a Hawkscurus. You think this is before they became quasi-cosmic beings? Everin raised a finger. Perhaps. And if so, we must not let them know of their future. This is a big event, right? asked Kess. She nudged Dr. Snowden. He's mentioned it a few times. It could be. But let us not reach any hasty conclusions. This could be one event out of many. Jelton wagged a finger. That's a good point. I've only seen videos of them in their energy form. It's possible what we saw was a form that would relate to us. They might be large insects. Emily eyed him. Let's hope not. Perhaps V and I can continue alone if you are all worried, said Everin. There you go again, trying to ditch us, said Emily. We've come this far, and now I'm curious. Dr. Snowden drew his lips flat. Same. Very well, said Everin. Emily stared ahead as the Torvada continued to a docking bay. Everin was only looking out for them, but she felt like she needed to be on this summons. There was too much coincidence. Jelton was with her, and with the rest of the gang and the Torvada, she was safe. However, whenever a cosmic shard was involved, nothing was certain. You think they know what the cosmic shard really is? She asked. We will find out, said Everin. They probably understand it has power, and perhaps they have learned to interact with it. When we meet with Pizarra and the other delegates, we can see if they mention it. If not, I will broach the subject with them. You got it, boss. He eyed her. Everyone chuckled. She liked the brief moment of joking around, but she suspected things were about to get serious. Jelton sensed Emily's nervousness. He'd only heard of the Hawkscurus, and they were involved in some big event. What that meant for the gang remained unknown, but he hoped to get some answers. Even the normally calm Dr. Snowden was on edge, his continuous adjustment of his glasses, fluctuating cosmic energy, and licking of his lips indicated anxiousness. 
The Keleton docking bay was embedded in the thick base of the city, and he liked the design. The city would be able to move in any direction, and when encountering a power source like the sun, it could position itself to absorb free energy. There would be no need for a planet, as it could just go from star to star. And if they wanted to travel to a planet, they could always use the ship as a base for exploring. He made a note for the Rift Guardians on this setup. Although he did not want to admit it in front of the others, the cosmic shard still made him anxious. He had touched it and even moved it earlier, but a part of him wondered if it would go rogue and kill him, if that was even possible. It was the unknown aspects that bothered him. He preferred not to think of the shard as a living entity that had no problems with killing. Beams from the docking bay washed over the Torvada as it approached the light gray shielding that covered the entrance. Jelton recalled that the Torvada in scan profile 2 meant it would appear as a small cramped ship with minimal power. It amazed him that the Torvada could be undetectable but fall prey to physics. The only way to detect it was with an environmental factor or by having a Torvada's chosen around. He examined the drones that had flown out to escort. They had a pentagonal structure with ports on all sides. A series of segmented appendages with various endings sprouted from the top and sides. It was probably a maintenance drone, unless its arms were meant for combat. The heavy weight listed did not make sense to him, which suggested there was probably more to the drones than he could see. The Torvada passed through the docking bay's shields and landed. Query, should I come in body or orb mode? Asked V. Body, said Everin. Acknowledged. Let us go, but be prepared for anything. Always, said Emily as she hustled by him. Jelton loved her fearlessness. She had visited him on one of his campaigns and had stepped in when a Time Warden unit had breached the compound they had been in. The Time Wardens had stood no chance. She had decimated them thoroughly, and the Rava had celebrated her as a hero. He had tried to evacuate her, but she would not back down. He followed the others to the Toravada ramp. A group of Hoxkaris in one-piece suits like Tracana stood before them. However, it was the packed group behind them that caught his attention. Perhaps it was the novelty of having visitors. He was able to distinguish a pattern in that each area of the crowd had its own robe color. It was apparent that white signified delegates, and he was sure he would learn about the other colors. Blue was for security as they were out in force. Some were robots. What unnerved him was the silent pose the Hawkscurus held. Most had their hands behind their back or crossed over their chest. It was unnaturally quiet for that number of people in an enclosed space, Although robe colors differed, the gold bands were present on all of them. Each person also had a small silver disc hovering near them. Are we ready? asked Everin, peeking behind. Let's do this, said Emily. Jelton laughed. Yeah, yeah, let's. Very well. Everin strode off the ramp and outside the Toravada shielding. Jelton went after the others had, but the group froze when murmurs and gasps filled the bay. Security had stepped in front of the delegates and formed a wall. The crowd moved back some. Uh, what's going on? asked Dr. Snowden. He squinted. Is it just me, or are there a lot of cosmic energy signatures here? I sense it too, said Emily, as do I. Everin extended his hand, palm forward toward Tracana. There is no need to be alarmed. You may have sensed that we are cosmic energy beings, like yourselves. Tracana pushed past the guards. Yes, but nowhere near what you possess. What are you? I am Everin. He pointed at the rest of the gang. They have slivers of cosmic energy such as yourself, although a bit more on some. Tracana took her time in gazing at each member. I sense that. But you have far more than us. You have almost the same amount as our power crystal. Everin nodded. It is because we are from the same place. I think we have a lot to discuss, said Tracana. 
It's all so apparent you can breathe our atmosphere. Dr. Snowden grimaced. It takes some adjusting, too. He closed his helmet. I'll adjust in phases. Jelton's throat burned some from the air. He was not sure why the Torvada thought it was habitable, but a few hours of breathing would be painful. He closed up his helmet like Dr. Snowden and hoped he, too, could adjust in phases, as opposed to all at once. Emily had the same idea, but Kess had no issues. Everin and V did not breathe, so it was of no importance to them. And you have a robot, said Tricana, eyeing V's body. Analysis. I am a variable utility artificial intelligence. I see. She motioned for security to clear a path, then turned around. Please follow me. Jelton surveyed the crowd as he passed. He was not sure if his senses were dulled or not, but a third of the people in the bay were androids. The guards who were robots were obvious. They were metallic and reminded him of stick figures, but with plating and weapons. He briefly caught a glimpse of one of the drones flying in, then transforming into a robot guard that was almost four times larger than the drone. He was not sure what tech allowed that, but he figured he would learn in time. Small drones that could morph into larger forms would be very handy for defending a point of interest. His eyes widened when one of the robots opened up and a Hawkscurus guard jumped in. Once closed up, the robot had become a power suit. This would allow for great optimization depending on the combat situation. He examined the architectural style when they left the docking bay and entered a hallway. The width was wide enough for a five-person group to walk side by side, and the height could accommodate the eight-foot guards with ease. A soft gray color theme was present, with a blue strip near the ceiling. Illumination was provided from small spots on the sides, ceiling, and floor. What intrigued him were the hard holograms that worked on side panels. It would be difficult to detect that they were holograms without any form of exotic energy or advanced detection systems like with V. Thankfully, everything he observed showed up as a data label in Jelton's ARI. Tricano was flanked by two androids. Unlike the robot guards, the androids had on lighter armor with thick bands on their forearms and lower legs. Their boots were also thicker than normal. Outside of that, they were like the other Hawkscurus he had seen to this point. This was an advanced society, and it seemed they had a mix of digital and physical presences. After thirty minutes, they reached a room that had a transparent domed top that allowed a view out into space. Filtered sunlight had been redirected to shine in. Tables arranged in a hexagonal pattern filled the area, and at each table, save the one the gang were at, were seated three Hawkscurus who faced the group. They all wore white robes with a blue belt segmenting them. A woman at the table on the other side of the room signaled the group. I am Pozara, and we have much to discuss. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened as he stared at Pizarra. She looked just like she did when they had met in the past, except she was a quasi-cosmic being at the time. He did not sense that on her now, so this must be earlier in her personal time stream. The gang had first met her when they had searched for the Cregan relic known as the Archeron. She did not appear in a humanoid form, but instead as a bright, glowing ball of energy with many tentacles. The next encounter was when they had investigated Everin's origin, and she had assumed human form while on the Torvada. She had said some things that, at the time, had made no sense. One thing she had mentioned was that there was a future event where she would meet Everin, and then she would exit the plane to see his main form, but not before seeding the plane with humanoids. This must be that first meeting— why she was not an energy being intrigued him, but if she was not now, then it made sense that she might become one after this event or sometime later. The table before them vanished, and the area it had taken up became highlighted. Please advance, said Pizarra. The gang complied. I do not know if Turkana gave you our names, but I am Everin, 
and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Jelton Stallrin, Kess, and V, said Everin with his right arm across his stomach as he slightly bowed. Unusual names. And I'm glad we can communicate with each other, said Pizarra. She gestured at Tracana, who had taken a seat on the right side of the room. We have listened to the conversation Tracana had with your group. My name was mentioned. How is that possible? As you are an advanced society, and near the end of time for life in this timeline, I will explain more than I normally would. We are time travelers, and this meeting is out of sync for you, said Everin. How so? We met with a future version of yourself. The Hawkscrews murmured among each other. Pazara inspected each member of the gang. Time travel is not unknown to us. Keleton is temporally shielded, and we see the effects of timeline changes. We chose this star specifically because it was far removed from anything a timeline change would impact, although we have seen a few. That is a wise decision, said Everin. As you know of our future, then I assume you can't speak of it as that would impact things. Everin tilted his head. An astute observation. We cannot address your future, and our arrival here now may be a part of what is to come. Pizarra smiled. Time travel can complicate things. Nonetheless, you all have energy consistent with our city's power crystal. We have some aspect of the same energy both in us and in the bands across our bodies. It is called cosmic energy, and I believe your power crystal is a cosmic shard, one we had moved in the past before coming here, said Everin. The Hawkscris spoke among themselves. Pazara lifted her arm, silencing them. We didn't know it had a name, but now we do. We can sense that you have a similar power level as the crystal. V has a strong reading as well. Dr. Snowden and Emily have more than we do, as does Jelton. Kess has a different type of energy signature. I have four exotic energies, actually, but they're not cosmic, said Kess. She crooked her thumb at the rest of the gang. They're the cosmic ones. Still, what you have seems powerful, said Pizarra. Kess flung her hand in the air and snapped. Don't I know it? Pizarra grinned at her. I would hope so. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. How did you all get cosmic energy? We don't fully know, said Pizarra. Our current hypothesis is that it's due to the way we harness the power crystal. We've been doing it for so long that it became a part of us. We are in tune with it and in return we are able to use its energy to help power our city. Everin gazed around. Intriguing. Have you ever communicated with it? No. But as we can sense it, we understand when it is not in a stable state. Our goal is to keep it stable, and in exchange there are no disruptions to our energy usage. I see. Tracana tapped at her table, causing the area in front of her to light up. How do you travel in time? It is a function of my ship, the Toravada, said Everin. Pizarra's eyes narrowed. Interesting. Why did you decide to come here at this point? Everin extended his hand, causing an image of the Toravada to appear. The Torvada picks points in space and time that it wants me and the others, known as the gang, to focus on. We arrive to determine what help is needed, then assist. And what assistance do you believe we need? Unknown for the moment, but with your cooperation perhaps we can find out together. Pizarra surveyed the room as several other delegates had their table sections light up. Dr. Snowden was not sure what was going on, but it appeared like they were engaging in nonverbal communication of some type. 
It was rare for Everin to be upfront about the Toravada and time travel, but if the civilization was advanced enough, and he had a scale for that, then it was not an issue. With the unique situation of the Hawkscurus being involved, Everin most likely wanted to put out as much pertinent information as possible, minus anything that might jeopardize future knowledge. The table light shut off. We have agreed to cooperate with you, and don't deem you a threat, said Pizarra. If you were wanting to do us harm, you could have done so without us ever knowing it. As such, we offer accommodations for your stay here. I will serve as your liaison. That is acceptable, said Everin. His eyes glowed. We welcome your hospitality. There were audible gasps, and some stared at him. Dr. Snowden figured they were just as curious as the gang was, and he was eager to learn more about them. It was evident that whatever the future event that Pizarra's future self had mentioned, this was that moment in time. It made him recall a dream that involved Leverin, another one of Everin's initial plane forms, who showed him how to resurrect dead people as if he had control of cosmic energy. That would be one way to give the Hawkscurus enough to transform into quasi-cosmic beings. Leverin had said death was a transition, and he really did not want to deal with that. Chapter 7 Ciros 1 munched on a protein stick as he stared outside from his comfortable tower. The planet had been thoroughly converted to a technical one, and with thousands of versions of himself from across the timelines, there was no shortage of pet projects. Although Everin had shut off their access to a junction dimension, they could still expand in the reality they were in. It bothered him that he and the others were stranded, he had built this place to be a gathering point with him as the leader. Everin had changed all that in one fateful encounter. Outside the expansion into space, there had been a technical overhaul of everything they knew about combat. Everin had exposed their systems as inadequate. That would never happen again. A shrill beep filled the air. Ciros One tapped at the black mesh on his hand. What's going on? Someone opened our portal, said Ciro's 1866. How's that possible? I don't know, but there's something there. It has the form of a human. Ciro's 1's eyes widened. The last group to come through like that had been Everin's. I'll take it from here. Ensure our defense is activated and send in something to test him. Of course, said Ciro's 1866. Ciros One took a deep breath and then spawned his hologram. Once he was jacked into the local system, he projected himself into the portal room. The ten-foot-tall humanoid had blue skin and wore a silver one-piece suit with glowing blue lines segmenting it. His golden eyes glowed on a bald head. It was not Everin, but the eyes were similar. Who are you? And do you understand this he asked. You may call me Antion. Ciros One's eyes narrowed. So you can translate. Why are you here? I seek ones named Everin. We all do. What's your interest in them? I want to absorb them said Antion, eyes glowing brighter. I know you know of one. My absorption of Ciro's 542 shows this. Ciro's one tilted his head. Your absorption. Yes. His mind showed this place. I assume you're Ciro's one. Ciro's one drew his head back. I am. But what happened to Ciro's 542? He is no longer in possession of his mind. You killed him! Antion tilted his head. He transitioned from existence to non-existence. 
Zero's One took a moment to consider the situation. Although they could probably have worked together, the death of a Zero's version was unacceptable. He sighed and interacted with the black mesh on his hand. You know, I'm tired of powerful beings coming in and destroying things, he said. A side panel in the portal room opened, and a twenty-foot robot covered in liquid metal emerged. It moved toward Antion. The robot had been created after Everin had visited, and its strength should be comparable to what Everin had. The robot also had the ability to morph weapons as needed. In this case, it formed two spears in place of its forearms and hands. Antion dodged the first few strikes, then punched the robot away. It stood back up, then marched forward again. When it reached Antion, it struck forward, causing him to dodge, but it used its other arm to jab him. Antion stumbled back. Ciro's one was not sure how the jab did not rip a hole in Antion, but it showed that he had immense strength to take a hit like that. A powerful opponent said Antion. He evaded the next attack, then ripped the robot's arm off and proceeded to use that to lay a beat down. After a minute, all was silent. A test, I see. One eye passed, said Antion. Like your other version, you'll supply me with knowledge. Ciro's one shook his head as the doors to the room sealed. Not likely. After Everin, we added some new countermeasures, one of which you're about to experience. Antion fell to the ground. And that is a side effect of the room being ejected into space. Once there, we'll direct it to a black hole. It should reach there in 20,000 years or so. Antion forced himself to sit up. I'm impressed. You should be honored that I am so. Ciro's one shrugged. We could have worked together to go after Everin, but instead you decided to act like a brute. A sign of lesser intellect. Enjoy space. Wait, wait, said Antion. You have shown... Potential. Perhaps you can help me. And why would I trust you after you've killed one of my versions? I understand your concern, said Antion. It's obvious not all your versions are the same. If it makes you feel more secure, I'll stay in orbit in this room. I don't need food. Drink or sleep. Ciro's one smirked. So you just float up there and we trade information. That. Or I can create new portals for you. Ciro's one mulled over Antion's proposal. He had come through where the portal would have been. It would not have been the old portal opening again, but a new one. The exact location must have been taken from the mind of Ciro's 542, although Ciro's 1's desire to exact revenge from Antion simmered in his mind. He might be able to use Antion to destroy Everin, then Ciro's 1 could destroy Antion. Working with him might provide some details. I'll accept this arrangement, but you stay in the room. We'll put it back. But any betrayal will result in it being ejected again, said Ciro's one. Then we can begin, said Antion. You have my word I won't kill any of your versions. The goal is finding Everins, so I can absorb them. Ciro's one ran a finger over his hand's black mesh. The room is on its way down now. We can determine a set of steps based on our goals first, then go from there. A wise decision. Ciro's one still had doubts about Antion's sincereness, but his staying imprisoned would be a good start. 
The room had an automatic trigger that could be set if Antion got within a certain distance of the walls. Cirrus One would ensure that was set. If Antion could make the portals work again, that would be a sign of trust, and also open up the junction dimension for travel. And once Everin was found and defeated, Antion would hopefully be in a weakened state to be destroyed. Kess liked the living area set up for the gang. It was a circular hub with a large central open area and six doorways that led off to individual areas. The center had a pillar with various machines on it, and she recognized a replicator system. What surprised her was the plants, which ranged from orange to purple. They adorned the walls, pillars, and parts of the ceiling. The warm light also made the place feel cozy. Several small circular tables ringed the pillar. They could have returned to the Torvada, and Kess would have been fine with that, but it seemed the Hoxkurus wanted them to stay. Maybe they thought the gang would bolt. On the way to the living quarters, Hoxkurus of every stripe paused to smile and wave at them. It was a friendly culture, but Kess still had her guard up. Appearances could be deceiving, and Dr. Snowden had mentioned there would be an event with Hoxkurus that had a big impact. She was also unsure of what the golden bands represented and what purpose the small, disc-shaped drones served. The group walked into one of the individual areas. Pazara pointed around. There is a sleeping area, along with cleaning, communication, and general spaces. These rooms will be fine, said Everin. Dr. Snowden and Kess will use one, as will Emily and Jelton. V and I will take another. I'm happy to hear that, said Pizarra. But I suspect you want to see the power crystal. You would be correct. Let's go, said Pizarra, exiting the room. Kess liked the tour so far, and she wondered how long they would need to be there. She hoped the summons did not have anything wild in it. But that was the case with everyone she had been involved with. If she had to guess... There would be an external factor arriving to cause chaos, and the gang had come right before it. Perhaps she was just imagining the worst. The walk to the power crystal led them through a part of the city that allowed them to look out into space. It amazed her that they had data labels on ships, drones, and other stellar phenomena displayed on the inner shielding. This was a very advanced society. So what are those disc drones? asked Emily. Pizarra dipped her head toward hers. They are an extension of our bodies. Think of them as another limb, or in our case, a personal drone. They also allow us control of various things, such as power suits. You can jump into any one of those larger drones we saw in the docking bay? asked Jelton. Yes, but with our personal drones, we can interface directly with digital systems, and they serve as our sixth sense, but one that is detached from the body. Analysis. They are similar in design to my orb form. Pizarra inspected V. In a way, they are not artificial intelligences with cosmic energy like you, though. You're unique and a beautiful merger of technology and energy. These lights glowed brighter. Acknowledged. Kess examined the gold band on Pizarra's upper arm. I sense those have cosmic energy in them. They do, and they're made from a byproduct of our interaction with the power crystal. I'll show you when we get there. Definitely like to see that said Dr. Snowden. Bazara paused and raised her hand. Your ship has left. The group stopped. Do you have a visual? asked Everin. Pizarra's drone flew ahead, then projected a holographic video feed of the Torvata lifting off. There. Well, that's not good, said Dr. Snowden. It is not, said Everin. He glanced at Pizarra. We should check the docking bay. Pizarra nodded and they took off. Kess was not sure why the Toravada had left, or if something had forced it. The group's hurried pace was expected, and after fifteen minutes they reached the docking bay. It was like they had last seen it, 
but missing the Toravada. Everin scanned the area with his ring. I am not detecting anything unusual. The Toravata must have decided to leave. So it basically just dropped us off? said Emily. It would seem that way. Kess wrinkled her brow. Has it done this before? Analysis. Several times. And it always comes back. Kess relaxed. It sounded like this was not unusual. She would have been much more worried if it was something new. Dr. Snowden had mentioned to her before that the Toravada had a mind of its own, and that it had some aspect of Cyrilus, Everin's partner. Pizarra moved her hand in an arc. You're welcome here, as long as you need. Thank you, said Everin. There is nothing we can do here, so let us continue to the power crystal. As they walked, Kess observed the others. Dr. Snowden's and Emily's cosmic energy fluctuated, and their frowns showed they were troubled. Jelton was relatively calm, and like Kess, he probably trusted that with Everin and V around, there was no real issue. The Torvada would never strand them. Or so she hoped. She reached out and grabbed Dr. Snowden's hand. He smiled at her. Their relationship had grown considerably, and she had even begun to think about her longer-term goals. Whatever they were, they had to have him in it. She had debated having him come to live with her, but she did not think he would go far from Emily. Then again, she might be with Jelton at some point. The alternative was to live on Earth and stay there with him. Jelton could even do the same with Emily. Kess was sure the Earth Ward would love to employ them, it would be a step down from running a galactic group, but she could spend more time with Dr. Snowden. She gazed out through the shielding into space. Keleton felt secure to her. The plant life, mixed with highly advanced buildings, made it seem almost like they were in a big garden. The fruity smells intoxicated her, and the others enjoyed the aromas as well based on their reactions. Dr. Snowden and Emily had their helmets down, which meant their nanobots had adjusted. Although she had only been on Keleton for a short time, she could easily see herself living there. Another aspect that caught her eye was the roving bands of nanoswarms. They resembled comets swirling around, and she could sense them. They were AIs, and given the sheer size of them, most being her height, she could see how they could be useful. Several of the swarms were assisting citizens, and some had even created a platform to move others around. After a half hour of walking through more of the city, they reached the Power Crystal building. It was small and suggested the Power Crystal was in the base part of the city. There were no guards posted outside, and there was not much of a security force other than the docking bay. There were the drones that could transform into robots, but outside that, she had not seen an armed Hawkscurus. It could be that the advanced nature of their suits held surprises that were not visible. Plus, they could just hop into a power suit as needed. Her eyes widened after they entered the building. A walkway ringed the area, leaving a hole in the center of the room. Various platforms rose to be boarded as Hawkscurus moved about. Pizarra pulled a flat disc off her belt and tossed it into the open spot. A large, circular structure with rail guards materialized. Wow, said Emily. I've seen something like that, but that is a big platform. Miniaturization is commonplace here, said Pizarra. Dr. Snowden tapped his foot on the edge. Seems solid to me. Kess joined him and the others as they boarded. She studied the other platforms around them as they descended. A lot could be done with miniaturization, and it made sense now why the small drones could transform into hefty robots. They waved at Hoxgris on other units when passing them. Crystals were embedded into the walls, and unlike the topside, there was no plant life present. The ride down was quiet, and with a cool breeze, Kess relaxed. Dr. Snowden and Emily had as well, based on their posture. Kess grinned as Dr. Snowden gripped the rail guard and stared at the passing wall. That was his inquisitive nature at work, and she loved that about him. At various depths, walkways ringed the sides, similar to the one above. 
There were also some levels that had only a structure jut out. Hoxkerus moved on and off platform units with ease. Although their platform moved fast, Kess had no concern about hitting another one. The sides or the walkways. Their platform was nimble and easily dodged other platforms and nanoswarms as needed. Everin was calm as always, with his hands behind his back. Jelton had his arm around Emily's waist as they too surveyed the area. V's head tilted every which way, which was him analyzing everything, and his presence soothed her. She knew how powerful and kind he was. It surprised Kess that Pizarra had come alone, yet she stood confidently in the center of the group. After ten minutes, they reached a landing strip that jutted out. We're here, said Pizarra. Please follow me. Kess followed the others after they disembarked. Pizarra pulled the platform back onto her belt. The strip was wide enough for the group to walk side by side, and rail guards on the sides served as a base for a dome-shaped shielding. A quick peek over the railing showed there was still more depth, which made Kess wonder how deep it went. She would love to study his city layout. However, the focus for now was to visit the power crystal and determine if anything could be learned about not only the summons, but also, potentially, why the Toravada had left. Chapter 8 Jelton liked the crystals embedded at various heights. They reminded him of the Rift Guardian's headquarters aesthetic. However, the semi-transparent, cylindrical container with angled supports that cut through a lifted platform was what everyone focused on. The cosmic art inside resembled the one the gang had dealt with earlier. Glowing filaments from the crystal reached out to the sides of the container, while a beam from below hit the crystal, making it pulse. The rest of the room was mostly bare. I'm guessing someone moved the crystal, said Jelton. Yes, said Pizarra. We discovered initially that we couldn't move it. However, if you saturate it with energy, it can be moved. But as we learned painfully, you need something to absorb the energy output it gives off. Everin rubbed his chin. It would take a tremendous amount of power to be able to make the cosmic shard, what you call the power crystal, move. It would also enhance any energy sent to it. Dr. Snowden scrunched his face. Wait, you mean it puts out more than it takes in? It is merely a conduit in that regard. But yes. So you could have a self-sustaining energy source. Pizarra bobbed her head at him. And that's what we have. We used the nearby star to get to the levels we wanted, and now it just maintains itself, and we use the energy. Fascinating, said Dr. Snowden. Jelton understood it to be similar to one of the benefits of a nuclear fusion reactor, in that more energy was released than input. What he did not understand was how the cosmic shard did it, as he doubted it was fusion or fission. The shard continued to create more questions than answers, as always. Emily looked at Everin. Have you seen ships with this as a power source? Yes, but not in this plane. It is common in objects traveling the cosmic medium, said Everin. Pizarra wrinkled her brow. The cosmic medium? What's that? Everin's eyes glowed. It is the void between planes. We are on a plane, in one universal cell, in one universe, and in one timeline at a specific point in space and time. That's amazing. So if we had a way to get to this cosmic medium, we could fly through it with the shard. Indeed. Jelton was amazed at the quick thinking on Pizarra's part. She had just learned of whole new realities and had not even batted an eye. It could be that maybe there was already an explanation of multiple realities and how they interacted in their culture or history. Kess smirked. The first summons was to move the shard somewhere, and we did. Then the second summons sent us here, and we see the shard as being used as a power source. But there was nothing else on the summons. 
What does the Torvata think needs to be done here? I am not sure, said Everin. The cosmic shard seems to be in a good place. With the Torvata gone, that must mean it is not involved in the next step. I suspect something will occur now that we are here. Pizarra gestured at him. Do you think we'll come under attack or something else? Unknown for the moment. It could arrange from an incursion to the shard exploding randomly. The group went silent. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Yeah, let's hope that neither happens. I'm in agreement, my friend, said Jelton. I would plan for some entity or group arriving, maybe to try to take the cosmic shard. Pizarra's eyes narrowed. That seems the most likely, and of course we would never give it up. Is it possible that maybe the Torvata wanted you all to see where the power crystal... Excuse me. Cosmic Shard ended up. It is possible, yes, but we verified that without landing, said Everin. For our next step here, we will stay in our accommodations and learn as much as we can about Keleton and the Hoxcarus. Perhaps there is more information there. We have a lot of data if you want to sift through it. Analysis. Are there AIs here to assist with that? Asked V. Pazara shook her head. We have something else. When a Hoxcaris's physical form dies, their consciousness is transferred to a crystalline matrix. This allows them to continue to exist, and when hooked into a system, they can interact with it. So, those androids we saw were those whose former bodies perished, said Kess. Sort of. I'm not sure if the translation is right, as they aren't androids, but Hoxcarus in another form. Got it. Jelton was familiar with crystalline life, as he had been born from a rift crystal. However, he had never seen them used in the manner the Hoxcarus used theirs. That was something worth learning about, assuming it was not private. It would allow the Rift Guardians to be much more robust, and they could even have a backup in individual suits if the form factor allowed it. Although he tried not to think of things from a combat perspective, it was a part of his nature. Kess pointed at the cylinder. You mentioned that there was a byproduct you used. Yes, said Pazara. There is a light mist that forms around the tendrils the crystal creates. We capture that mist and condense it, then use it in our bands. Analysis. That would give you constant exposure to cosmic energy. Yeah, and it's also used as a food additive. Emily scrunched her face at Everin. Is it possible to get cosmic energy that way? Not through consumption he said. However, just as Kess gained exotic energy, it can soak in after a long time, but not to the same levels as you or Dr. Snowden. I would like to stay and examine the shard in detail. V could also begin analyzing your knowledge base. Perhaps the others could get lunch. Dr. Snowden rubbed his stomach. I could go for that. I take it we eat in the central area of where we're staying? Yes, said Pizarra. If you have any food patterns, we can see if they are compatible with our replicators. Analysis. I can assist in the translation. Works for me, said Emily. Jelton swatted her arm. I go where she goes. She winked at him. I don't mean to be intrusive, but what do Hoxcarus eat? Asked Dr. Snowden, adjusting his glasses. Pizarra's drone projected an image of brightly colored half-inch cubes. These are materialized for us whenever we are hungry. Oh, I guess it has enough nutrition for you for a day. Four days, three hours, ten minutes, and forty seconds, said Pizarra. I assume that translated the time correctly. Dr. Snowden repeated back the measurement to her. That's it. Wow, that is efficient. We like to think so. And the cubes have a variety of flavors. However, our unique physiology allows us to handle it. 
I don't believe it would work for you or the others. It would not, said Everin. Dr. Snowden shrugged. Jelton was not eager to try a cube, but he did appreciate its efficiency. His mind wandered to the Toravada. Although a plan was in place, he was still bothered. If the Toravada did not return, he was not sure how he would get back to the Rift Guardian headquarters. Kess would need to go home as well. Dr. Snowden and Emily surely did not want to stay longer than they needed to. It might be fun to learn about Kelaton and Torrit, but when there was no way off, it would feel like a prison. He had not realized he was hungry until he had discussed what the Hawkscurus ate. Perhaps a good meal, then maybe some fun with Emily, would help ease things, especially for her. Dr. Snowden would probably eat and nap, and Kess would join him. Hopefully, later in the day, Everin and V might find something related to the summons or the Toravada. Emily had been eager to hear what Everin and V had found. It had been five hours or so, and it was now 6.30 p.m. Earth time. She had a good lunch with everyone, then walked around outside the living quarters. It would normally be exciting to do so, but with the Toravada missing, it put a dampener on things. There had only been a handful of instances when the Toravada had been unavailable, and every time it irritated her. It was her home, and, as with Everin, also her safety blanket. She always felt safe with it near. Jelton must have noticed her mood slump, as he was more attentive than usual. Dr. Snowden had worn his troubled face. She knew it well. He was probably trying to recall any sign he might have missed that the Toravado would leave. Its absence would swirl around in his thoughts until it came back, and she related to that. Thankfully... Like Jelton with her, Kess made sure he smiled and relaxed some. Everin and V arrived at the central room in their living quarters hub. She joined Jelton at a small table, while Dr. Snowden and Kess got another. Everin and V stood in front of them. Emily appreciated having a layout where everyone had essentially hotel-like rooms with an open meeting area between them that was able to be sealed from the outside. I hope you have good news said Dr. Snowden. Everin placed his hands behind his back. I understand everyone's anxiety about the Toravada leaving us. However, I found nothing to explain why it is gone. I have concluded that it left as a security measure due to something coming. Emily drew her head back. That's what Jelton was thinking. What do you think it is? Analysis. The last hostile encounter the Hawkscurus had was with the Time Wardens. Dr. Snowden grumbled. Not them again. Kess wrinkled her brow. Even if they did come, why would the Torvada's presence be an issue? It could be captured, said Everin. They possess the technology to do so, even if they could not enter it, and that assumes they do not have someone or something that could. Jelton ran a hand over his mouth. Perhaps, uh, but that could be applied to any summons you go on. Yes, but remember the Toravada has insights all across time and space, including our future here. I do believe the Toravada will come back after whatever needs to be done is resolved. Emily sighed. He was probably right that it would return after they wrapped up the summons, which was still undefined. You said you've seen this before? She asked. I have, said Everin. He motioned at V. He was U-4 at the time, but we were on a world of snake-like aliens. The Torvada left us there, but it did come back ten years later. What? I do not think it will be as long this time with this group, said Everin. Ten years? asked Emily. What did you do during all that? Everin half smiled. U-4 and I took in their culture. We spent a lot of time with their Buad Guzran monks in the mountains, it was peaceful. They enjoyed teasing me, said V. That's because they must have liked you, said Emily, smiling at him. Acknowledged. Jelton's eyes narrowed. Was there a reason the Torvata dropped you off? None that I am aware of, said Everin. Perhaps it wanted you to relax, and the only way it knew to make that happen was to strand you somewhere quiet. Everin nodded. 
It is possible. But in our current situation, Earth would be the place to do that. We will need to be ready for what comes next here. As long as we stay together, we should be okay. Emily appreciated Everin's take. His calm and steady hand guided the gang, and even if she had to spend time on Kelleton, she was glad it was with her friends. You do not need to worry about spending the rest of your days here if the Torvada does not return, said Everin. As you may recall, I have planner-wide powers should this form perish. I would be able to send everyone to wherever they want to go. Emily frowned. Well, that's not happening. Yeah, what she said, said Dr. Snowden. Besides, I don't think it'll come to that. Jelton eyed Everin. I hope you don't try to sacrifice yourself again, my friend. I understand, said Everin. It is merely an option. Kess smirked, one I hope we don't need. I'm with Albert. I think the Torvato will come back. We just need to deal with why we're here, and everything will work out. Emily liked Kess's optimism. Hearing Everin even mention sacrificing himself made her stomach churn. She had seen a brief moment of worry on Jelton's face, and that was him probably remembering the last time Everin did that. The worst-case scenario was that the Toravada never returned. However, given Everin's ingenuity, he would find a way to get back to Earth, especially if a cosmic shard was available. Although there are several things going on, perhaps we can have a taco night, said Everin. Analysis. The Keleton matter replicators have been programmed with the patterns from the Toravata, said V. Dr. Snowden grinned. No argument from me. Emily chuckled. It did her good to see him relaxed, despite the situation. She had thought she might still be full from lunch, but the constant worrying had worked up an appetite. Maybe after this, we can check out the city, said Kess. At least we can get some insight into Keleton and the Hawkscurus. That's a good idea, said Dr. Snowden. It's not like we're going anywhere, so may as well explore the city. Everin rubbed his chin. It is a large city with many aspects. Perhaps we should go in groups of three, then meet back and discuss what we find. Works for me, said Emily. She eyed the taco meal ingredients that Jelton and Kess were getting from the replicator. But first, it's taco time. Chapter 9 Dr. Snowden had thoroughly enjoyed the taco dinner, and after some rest, he was with Kess and Everin, touring the city. Dr. Snowden had only seen glimpses of it up to this point, but now he was going to get a deeper look. He had no idea what Hawkscurus culture was like, other than that they were an advanced species. One advantage of touring without an escort was that it allowed the Hawkscurus to be free. They had stood at attention with Pizarra around. Every citizen they passed had waved and smiled, and their drones had lit up. Another aspect was the sheer number of people out and about. Some flew, others walked, while yet more casually strolled through the streets. There was no sense of a heavy work culture that he could see. With advanced robots and nanoswarms, it would seem manual labor was non-existent. Their destination excited him. Everin had secured citywide clearance to visit anywhere, and Dr. Snowden had chosen a research lab. From what he understood, the Hawkscrews worked if they wanted to, and if they did, they had all the resources to do what was needed. However, some dedicated places, like where they were going, had a waiting list of people to get in from what he had read. The lab was in the block part of the city, and a visit meant leaving topside, Dr. Snowden had thought they would need to find someone with a platform. He could have also used his PSD to form something to travel in, but Everin had navigated them to a building that had units that could take them down. The building had just one main room, and a thick pillar with vertical tracks and units on the side sat in the center. Each unit resembled Pizarra's, except these had solid domed covers. It was eerily quiet when they entered, and he suspected that everyone probably used the other approach that Pizarra had used. I'm thinking this is for visitors, like us, said Dr. Snowden. And you would be correct, 
said Everin. Although these are not employed by the Hawkesgris now for the most part, they were before miniaturization technology was adopted. It is a legacy structure, but it still functions. Kess smiled. I like it, and I'm curious as to how they used miniaturization in their newer tech. Everin glanced at Dr. Snowden. We will find out shortly. I'm looking forward to it, he said. Although it bothered him that the Torvado was missing, it was intoxicating to think of learning about how a technology had influenced a civilization. He had already seen one example where Pizarra used a large platform that was shrunk enough to fit on her belt. How it did not weigh the same remained a mystery, and he was eager to unravel that. They boarded a cylindrical transportation unit, then descended. Dr. Snowden examined the images that were displayed on the semi-transparent walls. There was a mix of text, diagrams, graphs, and pictures. I guess we made the news, he said. It would seem so, said Everin. Don't let it get to your head, said Kess, swatting his arm. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. I would have thought maybe they would have limited information about our arrival. However, I'm thinking transparency is the norm here. I concur, said Everin. After centuries together with a populace that does not change much, it would be expected that information that might impact any Hawkesgris be public. You definitely read up on them. Only to an extent. There was a lot of data and I mainly wanted the summaries on certain areas, in particular their history. Kess wrinkled her brow, hopefully nothing dangerous. We are safe here, unless you plan on doing something unexpected, said Everin. She eyed him. Dr. Snowden laughed. He was used to being on the other end of an Everin joke, but he knew Kess would have no issues with it due to her easygoing nature. That was one aspect he loved about her. I noticed a lack of children, he said. Everin half smiled. Although the Hawkesgris can procreate, it is not a driving desire for them. I suspect the infusion of cosmic energy had something to do with that. You mean it altered their reproductive drive? asked Kess. In a sense, yes. Their society is long-lived, and the prospect of a commitment at that level is daunting, it would appear. Also, as the Hawkesgris can move to another medium upon one form's death, it is not imperative they have children to sustain themselves. Kess shook her head. I can see that. But seems odd to me. I understand. Dr. Snowden wondered if he would have kids with Kess. It would take some intervention, as their species were not compatible, but with advanced technology, that would not be an issue. Having a kid while traveling with Everin was too dangerous, so it would have to be something done after having settled. He did not often think of having children, but if he decided to go through with it, he knew Kess would make a great mother. The unit came to a stop, and the doors opened. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened when he stepped into a massive room. It was like a strip of air hangers on each side as far as he could see. The main pathway was busy, with Hawkesgris moving around on nanoswarms that had formed hovering disks. Luminous pillars were interspersed between each hangar and illuminated the area. They walked over to the first place on the right. Dr. Snowden liked that people could come and go freely via the large entrance to the building. Inside was a platform that several Hawkesgris stood on, and past them was a small object hovering with a bubble around it. He joined Everin and Kess when they went to the platform. A Hawkesgris female in a silver one-piece suit, who had been interacting with something that Dr. Snowden could not see, paused, then faced the group. Hello, I'm Ordinus. I read about your arrival and hope you're finding everything to your liking, she said. So far, so good, said Dr. Snowden. Ordinus focused on him. I'm sure your ship will return. There's not much for it to fly out to. Dr. Snowden understood the Hawkesgris transparency angle, but it surprised him how far and fast the news of the Torvada leaving had traveled. Ordinus seemed genuine in her statement. 
but he still kept his guard up. I hope so, he said. He cleared his throat and waved ahead. What are you working on? Ordina smiled as she extended a hand toward the shielded object in the center of the room. We've always believed in the higher levels of condensed space. I ran a simulation in our lab, and now I wanted to see the physical aspects. Kess surveyed the surroundings. There isn't much in the way of a workstation here. Oh, said Ordinus. I worked on this from home via our digital lab. Once my simulations lined up with what I think would get us to the next condensed space level, I came here to test it with a real-world object. Ah, a virtual lab. Ordinus interacted with something only she could see, then gestured at the shielded object. We can do everything safely in the confines of our lab, but when we want to test our results or see the physical application, we come to these research bays. The bays conceal themselves if needed to prevent any impact on other ones. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. A sandbox! I love it! I'm not sure if that translated right, but if it means a testing area, then yes, Ordinus sighed. Unfortunately, my simulation failed. Only because it is not about power generation, said Everin. Ordinus stared at him. Have you worked with condensed space bubbles before? Indeed I have, said Everin. He extended his hand, and his ring projected a ship with a bubble. Imagine this is a ship in our reality. The condensed space bubble allows it to transition to condensed space, and that requires a significant amount of power. However, the shielding configuration once inside determines which level you go to. So there are more than two levels, she said. Everin dipped his head toward her. I would not normally tell you this. However, as we may be here for a long time, it could be beneficial to know this. There are ten levels. And do you know the configurations for each one? We do. Ordinus paused. Do you mind sharing? Everin's eyes glowed. While it should be left up to you to discover, we can provide you with the second configuration. Ordinus smiled big. Anything is appreciated. I'll send you my digital lab address so you can connect. It would be best to run a simulation there. Then I will learn from it. Very well. V can assist you with that. You must be from a much more advanced society than ours, she said. Kess drew her lips to the side. Everin is as unique as is his knowledge. Are you not all from the same society? I'm an Orion, and from far in your past, as well as your location. Dr. Snowden and Emily are humans from Earth, and also from the past. From our perspective, your society is very advanced. Ordinus looked at Everin. But from your view, we are less so. I would frame it more as a different perspective. What makes a society advanced or not, to me, is not solely dependent on technology. That is only one factor, said Everin. There are other important factors, ranging from treatment of denizens and other civilizations, opportunities for growth, and the like. A wise observation, said Ordinus. I'll take a look at what your proposal is later tonight. I must say that it's exciting to have visitors. Kess tilted her head. How long has it been since you had a visitor? I know Everin mentioned centuries. Sadly, two hundred and sixty-eight years, said Ordinus. She paused. Did that translate correctly? We've had to do this once, so it's not a big deal. Let me say it back to you, said Dr. Snowden. After doing so, he said, Did that come across correct? It did. Even your translator is advanced. I'd enjoy spending more time with you all while you're here. Kess poked Dr. Snowden's arm. You may have to send him back to us from time to time. He eyed her. Oh, you have humor, too, said Ordinus. Were you wanting to look at the other research bays? We had planned to, said Everin.
Yeah, and if you're offering to be a guide, then what are we waiting for? Asked Dr. Snowden, grinning. Ordinus closed down her experiment. Was there any specific area of research you were interested in? Miniaturization. We have a few going on in regard to that. The closest one is trying to miniaturize a ship. Dr. Snowden gulped. Yeah, uh, let's check that out first. He imagined that if he had to stay in Kelaton, this was where he would be most of the time, being able to research something in a digital world, then test it in a physical one with relative ease was a dream. While he could do that with the Toravada, to some degree, the hollow room could only simulate energy or effects. These bays allowed for real-world interactions. Kess squeezed his arm and winked at him. She probably knew he was loving this so far. It did take his mind off the fact that the Toravada was missing, and he was glad he could experience this learning event with her. Emily was not sure what she would find out in the city. Jelton and V were with her, and they had picked a place to visit that said it was for space jumping. She had been curious when it mentioned space suits. A part of her wanted to go with Dr. Snowden, Everin, and Kess to learn more in the research bay, but the other part was curious about the space jumping. Their destination was a large tower on the edge of the city. Per V's calculation, it was about six hours of walking, so they had opted to use a platform. All it took to get one was to walk up to a special dispensary in the shape of a cylindrical pillar and press a button. A small disc had been presented on a panel that slid out. Expanding it was as simple as pressing a button on it and tossing it out. Once it was expanded, there was a control podium with an option to miniaturize it again. The controls were straightforward, with a joystick to move in four directions and a lever to go up or down. She suspected that if she was linked to the city system or had a drone, she could probably do this with her mind, but she was okay with the physical controls. The miniaturization system was really just a nanobot or picobot swarm, but she was not clear on how it worked. While her PSD could create a flying platform that could fly, and the expanded unit could as well, the unit did not use dimensional mechanics. There were also existing nanoswarms flying around that formed platforms as needed, and she wondered if you had to be a citizen to access the nanoswarm in that manner. After thirty minutes, they arrived at one of the tower's landing strips up high. Others jutted out from every side of the tower and at various heights. Their level was not busy, and the large lit doorway in the distance made it easy to figure out where to go. It's a beautiful view up here, said Jelton, looking out. Analysis. I like it. Emily grinned. I do too. I wonder if this place is like bungee jumping. I'm not familiar with that, said Jelton. Analysis. You tie yourself to an elastic rope that is anchored, then jump off from a great height. Jelton moved his finger up and down. You would bounce around. That's the fun part, said Emily. If that's the case here, I, I bet it could be a long rope. Let's find out. It was refreshing to be out with her boyfriend and best friend. She knew how rare these times were and savored every moment she spent with them. Jelton made a relationship easy, and she could truly be herself around him. V was the same in that she never had to put on a front. They entered into a spacious room that had large doorways on the other sides. In the center of the room was a square pillar that went from the floor to the ceiling. Transportation units were encased on the pillar's sides, and she figured that was where they needed to go. The Hawkscris around them waved and smiled at them as they walked to a unit. Everyone is so friendly here, she said. I like that, said Jelton. However... I suppose if you're in a society that has unlimited power and most manual labor done by robots, people can take time to pursue what they want. Yeah, I'm excited to see what's at the top, assuming that's where we're going. Jelton swatted V's arm. Let's do this. He tilted his head. You are teasing, Emily. Jelton winked at her. Quite right, my friend. She needs that every now and then. I see, said V. He cracked Emily up. She liked that he and Jelton were friends and could be playful with each other. 
They entered the transportation unit and were whooshed to an upper layer. She surveyed the new level. The lack of walls was the first thing she noticed. But there were also thin planks spaced out around the edges that extended into open space. Jelton pointed at a large domed structure with a camera-like device above it. What is that? Emily walked up to it and scrutinized it. First time, asked a hawkscurus male that had strolled over. Yeah, she said. The man smiled. I'm bronze. I know you're among the visitors that have recently arrived. You're quite the talk of the city. Hopefully positive, said Jelton. Analysis, it is, based on the discussions I have overheard. Bronze studied V. A non-shackled artificial intelligence. Impressive. And I can sense your cosmic energy. That is what you call it. Right? Yeah, said Emily. What did you call it before? We didn't initially have a name for it, but knew we had it. So we called it Keleton Energy. But now we know that it's not Keleton Exclusive. Nonetheless, what brings you here? We wanted to try out this space jumping thing, but we're not sure how to do it. Bronze smiled. A good experience to try. To start, you grab a suit from the dispenser after being scanned. Then you walk off one of the platforms and fly around. We have some orbiting stops you can visit around the city outside the shield. Emily perked up. Are you serious? Bronze furrowed his brow. I... Yes, I am. Did I not seem so? She scrunched her face. Sorry, that was habit. I didn't mean anything by it. Okay. Analysis. Flying outside the city's protective shielding seems dangerous. Bronze ran his hand along his suit. Not with these suits. Go ahead. Step into the blue box outlined on the ground. Emily did so, and a beam scanned her. A moment later, a panel slid out with a series of bands and other equipment. She picked a few up. So how do we put this on? Bronze showed her which band went where. The belt was obvious, but the upper arm and thigh, along with the chest strap, lower forearm and legs, and neck were not. The boots she slipped on were bulky as well. The gloves extended past her hands and felt more like bowling balls than gloves. Thankfully, Bronze was a pro as he got her set up. Jelton and V also put their gear on. Now tap the circle on your belt, he said. Emily complied and a shield emanated from her bands, creating a small bubble around her chest and head. When she moved her arms outside the bubble, a thin protective shielding formed over them. Wow, that's cool, she said. She chuckled. I mean, cool as in, I like it, not the temperature. Oh, said Bronze. The fun part is about to begin. Follow me. They followed him to the edge of one of the ledges. Emily gulped as she stared out into space. So what now? Bronze raised his right foot, but kept his toes on the ground. As he did, he began to float. When he lowered his heel, he floated back down. And that's how you move, he said. Emily repeated his actions. Bronze tapped his gloves. These can also be used to orient yourself. He stepped off the platform, but instead of plunging to his death, he hovered then tilted forward and used his gloves to orient himself to move sideways. After flying out some, he came back and landed. And that's it. Don't worry about falling. The suit wouldn't allow it, and there are drones here that would catch you as well. This is fantastic, said Jelton. Where should we check out first? Bronze pointed at a platform outside the city shields. I can give you a tour if you want. Analysis. Let us do this. Emily and Jelton laughed as Bronze appeared confused. She had not planned to go flying through space with boots and glove thrusters, and it would be a new experience for her. It did not surprise her that V was the first to launch after Bronze did. V made it look effortless. She flashed a smile at Jelton, and after a countdown from three, they jumped off. Chapter 10 Time Warden Commander Zega floated around in the vast, dark emptiness of the timeline void. His gaseous form hovered in a place with no sound or light other than the occasional flare from the timeline itself. 
It was those moments when he fed and saw other time wardens. He had once been in the timeline and sampled a new reality, but due to Everin's destruction of the timeplex, Zega and all others were removed. He would only be able to get back in if a rift formed between timelines. Then he and the others could enter the rift, assimilate any matter there, then establish a timeplex once inside that would keep the rift open. The downside of having entered the timeline was that it instilled a new sense of desire, something that had not existed before. Now the Time Wardens wanted more, and Zago was no exception. He had replayed the fight with Everin and his friends over and over during his long exile from the timeline void. Zega's timeline form was that of a large sphere with strong tentacles, but it had been no match for Everin. Zega had went over what form would work against Everin, but there was no place to test his ideas. All he could do was hate where he was and Everin. A flash of light sparked in the distance. A flood of Time Wardens moved toward it, including him. As he was a commander, others deferred to him, and when they realized he was going there, they got behind him, as they should. Although their forms were gaseous as well, he had been around for a long time and had a lot more forms than they did, and he could disperse them if he so chose. The light turned out to be a rift tunnel that had formed between two timelines. Rifts were random, but whenever they formed, there were usually species trying to navigate through. Whoever that happened to be would soon know to fear the Time Wardens. The rift was a blue tunnel with a pulsating glow, and the ends were not visible. Zega and several hundred thousand Time Wardens breached the rift. The interior created an unpleasant sensation as it caused his gaseous form to clump up. Although the timelines that the tunnel connected were on either end, a portion of them extended into the rift. It was not enough to expel him or the others, though. Zega focused on a massive spherical structure. A hole was open on the bottom of it, but the structure would be enough for him and the others to gain new forms. He cruised toward it with other Time Wardens in tow. He was confident he could slaughter whatever crew was present. He just needed a short amount of time to assimilate some matter. He swarmed into the hole and assessed the environment. The interior was packed with some type of nanoparticles arranged in cubes. There was no sign of a defense, so he assimilated a cube and immediately created a rudimentary, flexible body armor in the shape of a sphere. After getting another cube, he spawned various tentacles. Other Time Wardens also began to take on form. Although there was a lot of matter to consume, Zega knew it would be nowhere near enough for the swarm. However, the ship would suffice as a transportation vehicle into the timeline. After he calculated how many Time Wardens could take on forms, he ordered the others still outside away. As he commanded others to search for how to control the structure, it moved on its own. Zega realized this could be a trap, but at worst, he would just go back to the void. This had to be something else. He surveyed the newly formed Time Wardens around him. The cubes were almost gone, and he now had an army of drones, predators, sentinels, and guards. That would be enough to establish a foothold. He assumed the structure was being pulled in by something. Perhaps it was a supply vessel. Whoever opened the sphere would have quite the surprise. He ordered the rest of the Time Wardens to grab onto the side and to enter into a low power state until they arrived wherever they were going. It was hard to track how long he had been in low power, but the transition into the timeline had a noticeable impact. It jarred him and the other Time Wardens out of their stasis. He sensed the friction from moving his tentacles around and the desire to once again see stars, planets, and other things excited him. He ordered the Time Wardens to detach from the walls. He had thought that they might float for a while, but the structure had come to a stop. There were noises outside, which in itself was an experience he had missed. Gravity was also present, and some Time Wardens crashed to the floor. The structure dissolved, leaving the Time Wardens plummeting into a pile. 
Zega had leapt to safety before the side he had been anchored to dissolved. The floor he landed on was solid, and a quick scan of the surrounding area showed them to be in a massive room. However, it was the bipedal creature that stood before them that drew Zega's gaze. It resembled an oddly dressed human. I'm Antion, said the man. And you're in a safe place. For the moment. And yes, I can understand your speech. You're not the first Time Wardens I've dealt with. A Time Warden predator rushed out and leapt at Antion. He caught one tentacle, then punched a hole in the predator's body, causing a yellow ooze to expose itself and evaporate. You're no match for me. None of you are. I've brought you here for a reason. He glanced at Zega. You're a commander. Step forward. Zega did not like being ordered around, but it was apparent Antion possessed some power. Zega moved in front of the other Time Wardens. What's your name, commander? Asked Antion. Zega. Why did you bring us here? He asked in a deep, digital voice. Antion studied the others, then bored a gaze through Zega. You'll serve me. As you're a time-aware species and know how to travel the rifts, you'll do so and find Everin, or one of his versions. Zega wiggled a tentacle. I only know of one, and he must die. Oh, he will, but by my hand. I'll allow you the pleasure of watching. And if we refuse... Antion waved dismissively. Then you go back to the void. Be thankful I don't do to you what I did to your counterparts in other timelines. They simply don't exist anymore. Zega had no way of confirming that, but Antion did not seem like the type to go through all this trouble to tell a lie. We'll need a time, Plex, he said. Antion gestured around. Where do you think you are? I use the design from your counterparts. You'll have all the resources you need. When you locate an Everin, I'm to be notified immediately. If I find any Everin before you do, I'll extinguish your bottom feeder species from this timeline. Is that understood? Zega considered attacking Antion but becoming established might give them the power to defy both Everin and Antion. We'll work with you, said Zega. Antion raised a finger. Correction. You'll work for me. As you wish, said Zega. Good. Antion turned and walked away. As he was about to exit the room, he peered back. You really don't want to disappoint me. Zago wanted to kill him for his arrogance, but the Time Wardens were not established yet. He turned to face the assembled Time Wardens and transmitted what needed to be done to get the Timeplex operational. They moved into action. There would need to be rift anchor stations on top of finding rifts in the first place. Zega had the knowledge to do both, but it might take a long time. He would personally research technology that could give the Time Wardens an edge against these powerful beings. He would play along. For now. Dr. Snowden yawned as he stretched. The previous day had been fun, and he had learned more than he had thought he would. Kess was next to him and he was still fast asleep. He placed his hands behind his head and stared at the ceiling as he contemplated miniaturization. It was really just building something small 
then adding support for it via energy and a nanobot swarm when it changed size. It was also apparently able to create a shield in its smaller form to allow it to be weightless. How they crammed enough power to perform that in addition to powering something once it was full size was remarkable. He understood why they did not do that with living things. Humans and other species had evolved their body parts to work in relation to size. It would be easy to mess that up and cause complications. Even so, it was still amazing to watch an object that could sit in your hand turn into something weighing tons. Someone's up early, said Kess with one eye open. Dr. Snowden checked his PSD, which showed it was 7.30 a.m. I don't think we have a meeting this morning. So, she winked at him and dived under the covers. An hour later, he had cleaned up and, together with Kess, they exited their living quarters into the central room. The rest of the gang were seated, and Emily and Jelton were chowing down on breakfast. You're up, said Emily. Dr. Snowden went to the replicator and got a sausage and egg plate, then took a seat. Sure am. What's going on? Analysis. A ship has been detected on the outer edges of this planetary system. Really? What's known about it? Everin extended his hand and a projection shot up. Dr. Snowden shuddered when he saw the design. It reminded him of a Time Warden ship. Is that what I think it is? he asked. I am afraid so. I assisted Pizarro with translation, and this was the conversation, said Everin. Dr. Snowden's eyes were glued to the holographic projection, a Time Warden commander which resembled a big metal ball with tentacles, was in the hologram in front of Everin, Pizarra, and some other Hawkscurus members. It was smaller than the one Dr. Snowden had fought and almost been killed by, so he suspected this was more like a Time Warden captain, but he was not up to date on what their ranks were. Everin's translation orb hovered nearby. We come, said the Time Warden commander in a deep, digitized voice. What's your intent? asked Pizarra. Your submission and knowledge, the commander growled. An Everin has been detected. Everin eyed them. We removed your timeplex. You should not be here. Dr. Snowden recalled that the timeplex was how Time Wardens entered the timeline from the timeline void, the Timeplex removal event was when he had come close to dying before Leverin, another one of Everin's initial plane forms, had given him and Emily cosmic energy. Although he knew he was safe for the moment, the mere sight of the Time Wardens gave him the chills. The commander's lights pulsed. Our search has ended. You will be apprehended for Antion. I do not believe so, said Everin. You've shown a hostile intent, said Pizarra. We haven't, but will if you interfere with the apprehension of Everin. The projection dissipated. Jelton shook his head. Time wardens are hard to kill and have a knack for showing up when you least expect it. I'm not familiar with the form that one took. It's like a smaller commander. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger at him. I was thinking that, too. How long until they're here or within fighting range? asked Kess. They will be here within six hours, said Everin. They have already fired a beam of some type, but Keleton's shields held. I thought they wanted you alive, asked Emily. They most likely know I would survive an explosion. She frowned. Well, that sucks. Indeed. I am not sure what knowledge they possess, but they knew me. We need to capture that ship. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Okay, and who's this Antion guy? It's not like the Time Wardens to work under or for someone, at least the ones we've encountered. I do not know, said Everin. Whoever it is, they must be powerful, said Jelton. The Time Wardens that the Rift Guardians fought may be from another timeline, but from what I've seen in the Torvata's archives, they're similar to the ones from this timeline. 
They would never follow someone unless that person was far beyond their strength or skills. Everin peered at him. I concur. Pizarra is letting them into range, where the Hawkscurus defense platforms can disable the ship. We will board then. Then these time wardens will know our fury, said Jelton, raising his head. Let us prepare a plan, said Everin. Dr. Snowden had not planned for a busy day, but he wrapped up breakfast, then traveled to meet Pizarra and others in a large room. A ring embedded in the center shot up an image of the Time Warden's ship. Data labels indicated the various parts, and a blinking red area showed a weak spot in the shielding. Everin rubbed his chin. This must be a scout. It has most likely relayed our conversation back to the closest rift anchor station. That means it would be known to all anchor stations at this point. Agreed, said Jelton. He faced Pizarra. Can you scan behind planets? We can. But if something was orbiting, we would have seen it, said Pizarra. Jelton grimaced. My group, the Rift Guardians, have encountered Time Wardens hiding anchor stations behind planets. When a civilization goes to investigate, their ships get attacked. Pizarra studied him, then pulled up a holographic display of several ships. We'll send scouts out. Dr. Snowden sensed the uneasiness in the room. The Time Wardens knew of Kelaton's location in space and time now, and apparently they were hunting Everin. Why Antion wanted him remained unknown, but the fact that the Time Wardens were working for him said a lot. For the next six hours, Dr. Snowden watched as everyone hustled around. There had been a brief break for lunch, but not much was eaten. Conversation was heavy, and although the rest of the gang were mostly observers, the conclusion was that they needed to board the ship to find out why the Time Wardens were there, who Antion was, and why Everin was being hunted. It made the Torvada's absence even more prominent as it could have transported a Keleton squad with ease. Once the Time Warden ship had come in range, platforms orbiting the sun fired concentrated beams that dismantled the ship's shielding. An accurate beam then took down its engines. The ship was adrift. Dr. Snowden assembled with the others in the docking bay, where a shuttle was being prepped for launch. A squad of Hawkscurus in blue one-piece suits were boarding, while the back of the ship had a series of robots in drone form being loaded. He boarded and sat in a comfortable seating area that had rows of seats on the sides. The normally friendly Hawkscurus talked among themselves, and their mood had changed. They seemed bloodthirsty to Dr. Snowden based on what he heard and their scowling faces. The Time Wardens were about to get a rough welcome. As the ship hurtled toward the Time Warden ship, Dr. Snowden steeled himself for combat. He had been able to command the Torvada in the most recent cases, and it had been a nice departure from close quarters fighting. Now he would be in the thick of it again. He squeezed Kess's hand, and she peeked over and smiled. She would be protected at all costs, but he hoped it did not come down to that. Everin and V were calm as always, and Emily and Jelton appeared eager to fight. Dr. Snowden was unsure how well the Hawkscurus would match up with the Time Wardens, but he was about to find out. Chapter 11 Emily's pulse quickened on the flight out to the Time Warden ship. The last time she had fought the Time Wardens was when she had visited Jelton on one of his campaigns. All that was needed to banish them was to pierce the container that held their timeline void form. It was a yellow goo that evaporated when exposed to the timeline, and they had been ejected back to where they had come from. The trick was to get in close, but that was not always an easy feat. She remembered being paralyzed by a Time Warden Predator, an elite version of the normal soldier. They were all robotic spiders to her, but with more legs and power. Jelton had a serious look on his face. He was an adept Time Warden Slayer, and she was glad to have helped him out once in that regard. Dr. Snowden had a permanent brow furrowing going on, and she understood that. He was not a fan of close-quarters battle situations, and even when pressed into one, he sought to create range and shoot from a distance. Kess came along for the ride this time, and her presence would motivate him. She was no slouch when it came to combat either. 
Everin and V sat silently and observed everyone. Emily wondered what they were thinking about, but she guessed they were either going over plans or assessing the strengths and weaknesses of the group. She had no doubt they were ready to go. What awaited them on the Time Warden ship was unknown, other than that there were Time Wardens there. Emily did not know how the Hawkscurus would fight, but if they used the drones as battle armor, they would be a fierce unit. She wondered if Everin would lead the assault, or if he would allow the Hawkscurus to run point. Usually it would be him, but they seemed to know what they were doing and who they were dealing with. She also contemplated why they had not brought any of the nano swarms. Maybe they were purely for city defense. After forty-five minutes, they reached the ship. The connectors between the ships did not match, so the Hawkscurus ship went to the side of the Time Warden one and extended a breaching tunnel. As each Hawkscurus stood, a drone flew over to them and expanded into a heavy suit, which the Hawkscurus stepped into. Emily joined up with the rest of the gang as the wall of heavily armored Hawkscurus moved into the breaching tunnel. The response from the medium-sized, spider-like Time Warden defenders was immediate as they fired. However, their energy beams did not penetrate the Hawkscurus armor. Emily's eyes widened as she watched the front guard of the boarding party decimate several guards. The vanguard dodged and used forearm spikes to pierce the defenders' teardropped bodies, causing goo to spill everywhere before evaporating. She now understood why the Hawkscurus did not fear the Time Wardens. It was a mismatch. She did not understand why they would even try to attack, given that they were outmatched. She paused with the rest of the gang as one of the lead Hawkscurus had their shields bypassed by an appendage from a snake-like Time Warden. The tendril spewed a green mist that caused the Hawkscurus to melt. "'What was that?' asked Dr. Snowden. "'A new type of Time Warden,' said Everin. "'Prepare yourselves.' Emily and the others rushed to help the lead group, but they had been severely damaged. It was like the Time Wardens had lured the Hawkscurus in to unveil their new attack. The new attackers focused on the gang. One of them slithered toward Everin and tried to break his energy shield. He pushed it to the side, then fired a point-blank stun blast. The Time Warden shrugged it off, then came at him. He formed a bladed spear and stabbed it through its head, causing goo to be exposed. The Time Warden stopped moving. Well, at least we know the stabbing part still works, said Emily. Everin faced the other attackers, who fled. Yes, but let us not get complacent. Let us go. Emily and the rest of the gang formed up behind him and V. The Hawkscurus were apparently content to let Everin lead. The Time Wardens had moved back to a T-junction, then went both ways. They're trying to split us up, said Jelton. Indeed, said Everin. The Hawkscurus will hold the T-junction while we go right, we need to locate their command center. When they reached the end of the hallway, a group of Hawkscurus took up position. They had adjusted their forearm blades to extend even farther, and they now had a small nanoswarm around them. She had thought they had not brought any, but it was not obvious that their suits had some. It impressed her that they had adapted, but at the cost of losing the ones who had gone first. These Hawkscurus had apparently deferred to Everin, but she was not sure how they communicated as she did not see any transmission. They hustled down the right path. The hallway was wide enough for her, Everin, and V to take up the first row of the formation. The first snake-like time warden they encountered tried to break through V's shielding, but failed. He grabbed the appendage and ripped it out, then marched forward and held the attacker. Emily slipped in and used her bladed staff to pierce the creature's head, causing goo to fall out. She liked that the gang had a strategy now. They had advanced through several more hallways while dealing with a handful of defenders. She was surprised when they breached a large circular room. Inside it was a metallic humanoid with long, spear-tipped tendrils on its back, swirling around. It registered as a time warden, but she had never seen one in this form before. However, it was the small army of duplicates that stepped out from sliding panels. She did not detect that they were time wardens, but they moved as if coordinated by one that had been detected. These were controlled robots. One of them attacked Everin, but he deflected its flurry of jabs. Another jumped over to Emily and tried to stab her. 
She blocked the attempt with her shield. The attacker dipped to the side, then used one of its tendrils to grab her ankle and pull her down. She rolled around, avoiding stabs, but was hit a few times in the leg and back. Jelton tackled the robot while taking several jabs from other enemies. Dr. Snowden fired a stun beam to assist Jelton, but it had no impact. Kess reached out and used her nano swarm to push the machine off Jelton. V charged into the mass of robots. Although he could not damage them as they easily stayed at range, they could not hurt him either. He concentrated on trying to catch them so they would not attack others. Emily's heartbeat thundered. She was angry that she had been pulled down with ease. Her eyes narrowed as she concentrated. Time slowed down. Jelton had been cleared. So she hopped over to him and helped fight off two attackers that had tried to impale him. She blocked a strike, then ducked under and moved in while spinning, cutting off the assailant's legs. As they fell, Jelton pressed the advantage and was able to tear apart another. She checked on the others. Dr. Snowden had reverted to a long blade, and although he stayed near the entrance, he assisted Kess as she slapped enemies everywhere. As powerful as she was, her nanobot swarms could not pick the robots up, only push them. Everin was a blur, disabling anything in his path as he went after the Time Warden controller. V had four robots on him, but he held their appendages and tied them into a knot. She rushed over and jabbed the attackers, causing them to crumple. Everin had reached the controller and shut it down. Silence fell. Well, that was unexpected, said Dr. Snowden. They're using robot swarms now. Jelton rubbed his side. Yeah, these were a lot tougher, and it appears they have a new strategy. Kess gestured at Emily. You're bleeding. Oh, said Emily. She checked out where Kess had pointed to. Although Emily knew she had been stabbed a few times, it had not registered. She could feel it now, though. Some of her cosmic nanobots had swirled out, but she got them back in. Jelton also had a few bruises, but everyone else appeared okay. They had only fought a small, controlled group. A larger one would pose a problem. How are the other Hawkscrews doing? asked Kess. Everin paused, then said, They are doing fine and have adjusted to the new Time Wardens, including the ones we fought. They know to go after the Controller. The Hawkscrews are clearing out any remnants. Emily breathed easier. Good. Now time to find out what they know. Indeed. Everin walked over to one of the workstations and placed his UIC on it. Emily slumped against a nearby wall with Jelton and the others. She was not sure how long it would take to retrieve or analyze the information, but this was a good moment to catch her breath. Her wounds were beginning to let themselves be known, but she was okay with that as long as everyone was safe and Jelton was with her. Jelton winced as pain shot up from his side. He had an accelerated healing factor like all cosmic beings, but he could still feel pain until his injury was healed. He had heard rumors of a new variant of Time Warden that was humanoid, but he had never seen one until now. Its ability to control a small group of robots was impressive. One thing he liked about their spider-like forms was their clunky movements. They were fast in water or in a place with low gravity, but not so much outside that. He had recorded the fight, so he would make sure that Galden and the other Rift Guardians had it on file, these new Time Wardens were tougher, and the snake-like one had shield-defeating capabilities. Both would have made previous encounters much tougher if either had been present. It pained him to see Emily grimace as she rubbed her wounds. He reached out and touched her arm. His heart warmed as she smiled at him. She had a mesmerizing effect on him. Although he would never admit it out loud, he found her combat state highly attractive while this would not be an issue in a riven culture, he understood that everything had a time and place in the human one. Dr. Snowden had a serious face as he gazed at the fallen Time Warden controller and its robots. He had almost died at the hands of the Time Wardens a while back, so it made sense that he was uneasy around them, especially new ones that proved to be a threat. Kess's presence helped him as she engaged with him. Everin and V stood like statues. 
Jelton figured they were analyzing a trove of data, and he was curious as to what they would find. Why a Time Warden ship would be visiting the Hawkscurus was unknown, but one thing he did know was that they were hunting Everin. This meant that a Timeplex had been re-established somewhere. That was a problem in itself. But their hunt posed many questions. Another thought gnawing at him was that this ship functioned like a scout. An anchor station had to be nearby, and Time Wardens were good at establishing rift anchor stations throughout a timeline. They were well equipped for tracking down a time traveler. Add on their advanced technology, and they could lay a path of destruction wherever they went. If they had a timeplex, then they must have found a rift that connected timelines. That was rare, and even if they could get one, they would have to establish themselves. Another idea was that something or someone powerful assisted them. That would be troublesome. After thirty minutes, Everin faced everyone. It seems Antion is a powerful being that allowed them entry into the timeline. A new timeplex has been established, and many rift anchor stations have been deployed throughout to find me. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Any reason why he wants you? None was found in the data. Everin projected a humanoid. However, this is Antion. Jelton studied the ten-foot blue-skinned human with glowing golden eyes. His silver suit was segmented by dim blue lines. The expressionless face reminded Jelton of Everin. He kinda resembles a larger version of you, said Dr. Snowden. Without hair, that is. Indeed so, said Everin. The Time Wardens do not have much information on him, other than that they are locating me for him. However, based on what I know of how they store information and catalog it, they are afraid of him. Emily drew her head back. It's hard to imagine them being afraid of anything. I mean, if they die, they just go to the timeline void. Jelton glanced at her. They wouldn't fear a timeline entity. But... It's possible this Antion can reach them there and wipe them out. Now that would scare them. Kess grimaced. So Antion is most likely a timeline invader of some type, one that can interact with the void somehow. Analysis. If a rift connected two timelines, perhaps Antion is using that to reach the void. These are all good points, said Everin. With that said... The Time Wardens know I am here now. I believe we can expect follow-up attacks. So what do we do then? Asked Emily. Everin rubbed his chin. This ship could have an ulterior motive. We can leave it here, but we should go back to Kelaton and analyze this data further. She stood. Works for me. Everin tilted his head. A timeline change is coming. Jelton got up along with the others. He did not sense anything coming, but Everin was far more in tune with the timeline. A few seconds later, Jelton sensed the change. It was like someone had punched him in the stomach. This ship is temporally shielded, as are all Time Warden ships, so we should be okay here, said Everin. However, we should get back to Kelaton. We do not know what impact the change will have on the sun or nearby planets, if any, assuming they are still there. Good point, said Dr. Snowden. He closed his helmet. I thought one of the reasons the Hawkscurus chose this sun was that it was far enough out of the way that timeline changes wouldn't impact it much. Everin nodded. That is correct. However, remember that the Time Wardens now know of this location. They may have done something in the past. Like what? asked Kess. They could have moved a solid sphere the size of a moon to this location. Dr. Snowden frowned. Yeah, I don't want to experience being trapped again. Kess shuddered. So we would appear in the middle of it, unable to move, and death by encapsulation. Yes, unless the Torvada came to pick us up, said Everin. Emily shook her head. This is not the time for it to be playing games. This must be one of the changes we detected when we arrived. That is correct. This is most likely one of many, based on what was registered on our arrival. Nonetheless, let us go. Jelton hustled everyone as they left the command area. They had retrieved all the data they would need, 
and now they had to contend with timeline changes. This was not a new Time Warden tactic. One of the issues the Rift Guardians had run into when establishing a colony was that the Time Wardens had gone back into history to change the planet. Although they did not control where a rift connected, they could keep it open, and they had found one that went back in time. That had caused the Rift Guardians to travel back to fight them successfully while destroying the Rift Anchor Stations. Without the Toravada, the gang was vulnerable. After twenty minutes, he had boarded along with the rest of the gang and the Hawkscurus. The timeline change had hit, but nothing had changed that he could tell. It unnerved him that, when he reached the shuttle, a second change was upon them, and as usual it was like a curtain sweeping across the area. The shuttle took off toward Keleton, which had moved away from the sun. I have contacted Pizarra, and we will meet up once we are back, said Everin. Makes sense that they would move Keleton. The Time Wardens could place a huge asteroid where it would be, assuming they could calculate it, said Jelton. Perhaps. Dr. Snowden chuckled. That always messes with my head. Emily's eyes narrowed. I remember when we stopped Salazar, a rogue AI from an altered timeline from creating temporal shielding. If he had succeeded, we would have had to deal with him despite what happened prior to that. Yes, said Everin. In that scenario, he never created it due to our efforts. In this situation, the Time Wardens cannot do that to Keleton, as it did create temporal shielding, and they would know this. Their efforts will be to capture me here and now, as my presence is guaranteed. Jelton understood the situation. The Time Wardens could mess with the past, but to no avail against a temporally shielded foe. What they did know was where Everin was at a specific point in time and space, so that would be their laser focus. Temporal mechanics gave him headaches. All he could do now was wait. He grabbed Emily's hand and smiled at her. She winked at him, then leaned into him. He put his arm around her. Despite everything going on, it was still nice to be with her, Whoever Antion was and whatever antics the Time Wardens were up to, Jelton planned to help end it. Failure was not an option. And what he had thought would be a small summons had turned out to be much more. Chapter 12 Dr. Snowden gazed around the room where they had first met Pizarra. The tables that had been arranged in a hexagonal pattern were now lined up in a V formation at the back. Where they touched the room's sides, they continued down, making a pentagonal layout. Pizarra and the rest of the delegates were in attendance, as were several other Hawkscurus he had not seen before. Although not an expert on their moods, he sensed they were nervous. They struggled to sit still as they moved around and talked among themselves. He sat with Kess, Emily and Jelton on the right side of the room, while Everin and V were in the middle of the open area. As always, Everin would be doing a presentation for the Hawkscurus. After a bit, everyone had been seated, and silence fell. "'Welcome back,' said Pizarra. She motioned at a nearby Hawkscurus. "'With us is Security Coordinator Barata.' He interfaces directly with the city's systems and is interested to hear what you have to say. We already received our reports from the Hawkscurus that traveled with you, but it appears you have more information to relay. Everin placed his hands behind his back. I do. The Time Wardens have upgraded from the last time I saw them. They have new forms, one of which is capable of penetrating your drone's shielding and melting whatever is inside. V will show this. V flew out of his body mode and hovered in the air, then displayed the gruesome scene. The Hawkscurus murmured among themselves. There was also a controller with a humanoid form. It commanded a room full of robots, said Everin. V displayed that encounter. Barata's eyes narrowed. They're evolving. Did you find anything more on why they want you? Yes. It seems there is an entity named Antion. He has ordered the Time Wardens to find me, and now that they have, every Rift Anchor station throughout the timeline will know of this place and time. V projected an image of Antion, 
And what does he want of you? asked Pizarra. Unknown, said Everin. However, if he can order the Time Wardens to hunt me, then he has great power. They know where I am now, at this specific point in time and space, and will not change Kelaton's past to affect that. But there were timeline changes detected, said Pizarra. Everin raised a finger. Yes, but whatever they changed did not seem to impact Kelaton's past. I suspect that the Time Wardens are gathering a force and use the ship to add sensors and the like to gather more information. As we do not know the ship's history, we would not know if it had been upgraded. However, with more data, they could direct all ships to a certain location away from both the Toravatas and your detection, but relatively close to sensor range, then begin moving so that they appear here soon. Barata scowled. Then we need to start defensive preparations immediately. That is what I would suggest, said Everin. To that end, I may have some suggestions in regard to the Cosmic Shard to help with defense, but I require some time to verify some aspects. Whatever you need, said Pizarra. Excellent. V will assist me in my analysis, and we will update you once we have formulated some ideas. Pizarra paused. Very well. I've activated an alert that will have everyone begin defensive preparations. Analysis. What preparations will be done? I can speak to this, said Barata, glancing at Pizarra. Every citizen has their own power suit. They'll need to ensure it's in good condition and ready to fight. Some will need to redo their combat training in the simulators. There are also specific points in the city which are more shielded than the others, and every citizen needs to know where they are, where to fall back to if needed, and the like. Outside of that, there is coordination with our outer platforms to do. There's more to defensive preparations, but those are the highlights. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden could see that defending Kelaton was nothing new for the Hawkscurus. It was not lost on him that just one of their future forms as quasi-cosmic beings could handle the Time Wardens and Antion with ease, but that would involve them messing with their personal time streams. A dark thought crossed his mind that this upcoming battle would be where the Hawkscurus died and resurrected into the forms he knew them as. Maybe that was where the Cosmic Shard would come into play. Although the meeting had not been explicitly ended, the fact that everyone was getting up and leaving or talking with others indicated it was done. I think it's going to be hectic around here, said Kess. Yeah, said Emily. With Everin and V analyzing the Cosmic Shard and the Hawkscurus preparing for battle, not much for us to do but wait around. Dr. Snowden crooked his thumb at the exit. There's a platform on top of a tower we could go to. It has a breathtaking view of Kelaton from above, and you can also see outside, at least from the image of the place I saw. Sounds good, said Jelton. Everin and V approached them. That would be ideal for you to enjoy what time there is left, said Everin. V and I will most likely work in a digital environment. We trust whatever you find, said Emily. It just sucks that there'll be a fight, and also that the Torvata still isn't back. Everin's eyes glowed. I understand. These may be difficult times, but we will persevere. Dr. Snowden appreciated his words of confidence. There had been many times when Dr. Snowden had thought they were at their lowest, only to come out on top. He believed this would be another one to add to the belt. V high-fived everyone before he and Everin left. Well, to the pavilion then, said Emily. Pizarra rushed over to them before they left. May I join you? Um, sure, said Dr. Snowden. Aren't you needed here? They'll ping me if they need my assistance. Barata is handling affairs from a defensive perspective, and for the most part, everything is automated. I can't assist individuals in learning better or training faster, and that would also be Barata's responsibility. The rest of the delegates have their duties to attend to. I'm mostly a high-level counsel at this point. Kess smiled. I fully understand the rigors of leadership and management. 
If you have the free time to be with us, then do so, because you never know when you will have that time again. A wise conclusion. Let us go, said Pizarra. As the group walked, Dr. Snowden grinned as Kess explained the galactic group she managed. Keleton, by comparison, was less to manage and had different types of situations to cover. From Kess's perspective, managing civilizations was a much larger task than a city ship, but as always, she would focus on the commonalities of leadership and management. She was diplomatic that way, and Pizarra's warm reaction to her conversation with Kess showed that. Emily held Jelton's hand as they walked. For the most part, neither seemed to be worried about the upcoming fight or the missing Torvada. Dr. Snowden chalked that up to a belief that Everin could do anything. That was a feeling shared by Dr. Snowden as well. After thirty minutes, they had reached the platform. Dr. Snowden rushed over to the guardrails and peered out. The breathtaking view was something he would never tire of. Looking down showed Keleton bustling with activity. He gazed out past the shielding at the sun. This was a peaceful place, and it bothered him that it was about to become a battleground. They found a large round table and sat. I could go for some pizza, said Emily. Pizarra tapped at the surface console, which activated an interface in front of Emily. If you wish, you can create it. Emily browsed the interface, and thanks to V putting in our food patterns, we have it. A moment later, a variety of pizzas materialized in the center. Pizarra scrutinized a pepperoni pizza, then went to touch the cheese. Wait, said Emily, you have to grab it by the crust. If you touch the cheese, it might burn you. Would it not do that to my mouth, then? Emily bobbed her head. Yeah, but if you get it by the crust, pull it out, then hold it for a moment, it should be okay. Dr. Snowden grinned at her. Oh, I remember now. Remember what? asked Pizarro. It's not important, he said. Just remember that whenever you eat pizza, don't stick your finger on the cheese right away if it looks hot. Pizarro studied him. This must be related to my future meeting with you in the past. Otherwise, there would be no need to remember it. I believe pizza will be served, and I'll know better. You're very perceptive, said Dr. Snowden. He gulped. She had nailed the exact scenario he remembered from his past. Dian, a powerful ancient being that had traveled with Everin in the cosmic medium, had burned his finger touching a hot slice of pizza in the Torvada conference room. Pizarra had not. This must be the exact moment when Pizarra had learned how to avoid burning her finger. It was probably amusing for her to see Dian do what she had almost done here. Everything was calm. He dived into a slice and enjoyed Pizarra's reaction when she tried a pineapple one. She had the same expression he had when he had first tried it. Disgust. Nonetheless, he soaked in the atmosphere, and for a brief moment... The worries of the Time Wardens and missing Torvada evaporated. A part of V wanted to go with the others, but he understood how important analyzing the Cosmic Shard and its interactions with Keleton was. It would be good for the rest of the gang to enjoy a peaceful moment. He had calculated that the Time Wardens would be back in force, and they would breach Keleton's shielding in time. Then it would be city-wide combat— a body and facial recognition analysis of Antion showed that, despite his size, there were some similarities to Everin. This upped the possibility that he was a corrupt plane form. V was not sure how that would be possible, but Leverin had been sapped in order to power the Overlord, a hadron spawn foe the gang had encountered in the past. V was in a digital space with Everin, and a real time analysis of the cosmic shard had begun. Everin's scan would capture more information than the Hawkscris could. The Shard's ability to give off energy was new, and V had only known it to absorb. The plan for the last Shard they encountered was to overload it with cosmic energy, causing it to be expelled. The side effect was that everyone would die. The solar energy that the Shard received from a bottom beam was impressive. However, it was nowhere near what cosmic energy could provide. The shard hummed as solar energy poured into it. It was the output that he focused on. Golden strands arced out to the side of the container, which collected any excess. 
Everin pulled up the city energy distribution system. There is a significant drop-off in terms of output the farther away the distribution point is. That is to be expected, as the shard's cosmic energy is temporarily added to the output, and the bond weakens the farther it goes. This shows up in the shielding's differential across the city, said V. Everin rubbed his chin. Yes. However, if parts of the shard were split off and moved to several strategic points, it would make the shielding uniform. Query. Would the Hoxgris allow this? We can suggest it, and since only those with cosmic energy at a certain level can break off a chunk, it would be up to us to implement it. But they could provide housing containers at the various sites. Those places would also need to be hooked into the existing shield system. V tilted his head. Analysis. Although optimal, that would take time. Perhaps we could try to move the chunks, but incorporate them directly into the shields. You are suggesting a direct enhancement to a distribution point, said Everin. Yes. That could work and save time. If the Hawkscurus agree, then we could split the work between our group. An efficient conclusion, said V. He stared at Everin. Your cosmic energy is fluctuating. He paused. Yes, the overall situation bothers me. You do not bother easily, said V. I do not. However, I believe the Torvata is aware of this Antion and has fled to avoid capture. That would be a reasonable action, and potentially means it knows what Antion is. V gestured at him. Analysis. He is similar to you, physically. He would also be at a power level that the Time Wardens would fear and obey, similar to you. Perhaps we are dealing with a corrupted plane form. I have thought of that, said Everin. If so, he will need to be banished. Query. Should we tell the others? Everin shook his head. We do not know for certain, and it would only worry them. There is no need to alarm them. Let us focus on what is required to integrate the cosmic shard chunk at the distribution points. Then we can visit Pizarra and others on the platform. Acknowledged. V allocated his processing to the custom container needed to house the cosmic chunk. However, another allotment went to thinking about Antion. It was apparent that his resemblance to a plane form bothered Everin. This would mean that Antion was highly intelligent and powerful. If he had subdued the Time Wardens into following him, then he also had a strong army. After another hour of research and analysis, they had the design down as well as some modifications to the city's distribution systems. There would need to be two chunks installed in each direction as repeaters to amplify the cosmic energy. The physical container would not be difficult to replicate, but it would require some of the energy output near the shard to be redirected to it. They went to the platform, where the rest of the gang relaxed. V saw the remains of several pizzas and concluded they had a pizza party. He had enjoyed those types of events in the past and wished he had been able to participate in this one. Hey, said Emily, wasn't expecting you two to be back so soon. We worked efficiently and have some suggestions, said Everin. Pizarra perked up. For what? Everin pointed out. Your shielding system. It is not as efficient as it could be. We detected weaknesses there and believe that, with some changes, it could be uniformly strong. Oh, what did you come up with? Everin extended his hand, and a projection shot up from his ring. This is a cutout side view of your city. The two lines going up and down in opposite directions from the cosmic shard are paths down which the energy outputs can be sent. Each path ends at a distribution point, where special containers have a chunk of the cosmic shard. What are those two dots on each path? asked Kess. They are repeaters. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Oh, wait a minute. Energy is neither created or destroyed. It just changes forms. That's the first law of thermodynamics. So if the energy is diminishing the farther out it gets from the shard, where is it going? Is it just being radiated out? 
Everin raised a finger. That is a good question. The answer is that it is not radiating out. There is cosmic energy in the energy output that is linked to the shard. As the output flows outward, the strength of the link diminishes, and the energy is less powerful. This is why shielding near the shard, like around the middle part of the city, is far stronger than the top or bottom shielding far away. The link still exists even then, but it is faint. Think of it as stretching taffy. Jelton's eyes narrowed. So by putting these repeaters in place, then a final chunk at the end, you have the same throughput, and the shields can take advantage of that. That is correct. Pizarro furrowed her brow. We have special containers, though. Analysis. We have designed ones for both the repeaters and integration into the final distribution points. Very impressive, said Pizarro. This should help not only in general defense, but in particular, the Time Warden's potentially coming. Indeed, said Everin. Before we can do this, we need your permission to take some chunks from the Cosmic Shard to install it. Pizarra paused. The delegates have agreed. How do you want to do this? I will break off the chunks of the Cosmic Shard while V replicates containers to house them. We do not want whoever is carrying it to be destroyed by a random thought. Usually a good thing, said Dr. Snowden. Yes, said Everin. Once we have them, we can go to the repeater locations, place the chunk in the pipeline there, then do the endpoints. Dr. Snowden, Kess, and V will deal with two repeaters and an endpoint, and Emily, Jelton, and myself will handle the other. I'd like to come said Pizarra. She glanced at Everin. I'll join you and your group. She smiled at Dr. Snowden. I think Ordinus would like to join yours. You made an impression on her. Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> What's not to like? Kess eyed him. The group laughed. V understood Kess's glance to mean that Ordinus might have a physical desire for Dr. Snowden. That would make Kess jealous. Dr. Snowden's use of a question that Kess often asked had changed how Pizarra's statement was taken. The laughter afterward confirmed it was Dr. Snowden being playful. V liked that he was getting better at understanding humans. Let us go to the Cosmic Shard, then, said Everin. V high-fived Emily when she had gotten up. He had tried to rein in when he used it, but she liked to initiate it often. She had placed her arm around him as they walked. He enjoyed her affection and any time spent with her. Hopefully, there would be more after this summons. Chapter 13 Dr. Snowden and the others had moved to the far end of the room while Everin stood next to the cosmic shard. Two hover slabs had been created with three special containers merged into the top surface. Everin was going to reach into the shard tube and break off six chunks, Two would be big enough for the endpoints, and four smaller ones for the repeaters. Dr. Snowden did not have a good feeling about Everin touching the shard, but he had assured him it would be okay. That thing still bothers me, said Jelton. I hear ya, said Dr. Snowden. I'll feel better once the breaking off a chunk part is done. The beam hitting the cosmic shard stopped, and a small section of the cylindrical container opened. Everin reached in and grabbed a piece of the shard and broke it off. He placed it into one of the slab containers. Dr. Snowden's mouth went dry. He had thought Everin might dematerialize, but that did not occur. It boggled Dr. Snowden's mind that the intent of someone's thoughts dictated what happened when touching the cosmic shard. In a previous encounter, he had wanted to save Everin at the cost of his own life, and the shard had tried to oblige. Thankfully, Everin had been able to stop that from coming to fruition. Everin moved efficiently as he took off more chunks. After a moment, all the containers had been filled, and the open section on the main cosmic shard had closed. The bottom beam started back up. That wasn't too bad, said Emily. Pizarra gazed at Everin. He interacted with the shard as if it was an ordinary object. He's truly special. Yeah, and now we can make your shielding tougher, said Dr. Snowden. 
and we are thankful for that, she said. I wish I knew why your Torvata thought it important for you all to be here at this point in space and time. I don't think it was to strengthen our shields. I suspect something worse is coming. Perhaps the Time Wardens, or this Antion. Dr. Snowden sighed. Could be. The Torvata works in mysterious ways. Everin pushed both slabs over to the group. Our groups can go now. Ordinus will be here shortly, said Pizarra, looking at Dr. Snowden. We'll be here, he said. She pulled out her transportation disc, tapped at it a few times, then tossed it out. The disc expanded into a rectangular platform, large enough for the slab and six people. It reminded Dr. Snowden of a pickup, but without a roof or doors. Emily, Jelton, and Pizarra hopped in the front, which had four seats. Everin joined them after loading the hover slab in the back. We will see you soon, said Everin. Their platform took off. Well, that was impressive, said Dr. Snowden. I bet I could make the same thing with our PSD. Analysis. I have the pattern, if need be. Dr. Snowden shrugged. I suspect Ordinus will use the same disc thing. I'm not too worried about transportation. Besides, looks like you're stuck with us. Analysis. It is good to be so. You crack me up. Acknowledged. Kess looked on with an amused look. Dr. Snowden loved that she could roll with any situation. Her presence made everything better. He also liked that he would get to group with V, who would typically be with Emily. Dr. Snowden harbored no resentment that V was closer to her than him, but he was still a best friend. After ten minutes, Ordinus arrived. Hey, said Dr. Snowden. Hello, she said. She studied the slab. So it's true, then, Everin and V found a way to enhance our shields. All it took was moving a part of the power crystal, I mean, cosmic shard. Analysis. I am sure it would have been discovered in time by your group. Ordinus smiled. Maybe. Breaking off a chunk of the cosmic shard was not something anyone was looking at. Shall we? asked Dr. Snowden, gesturing at the slab. To the first repeater point, said Ordinus. She created an identical platform to what Pizarra had done. V pushed the hover slab into the back, then took a seat. Dr. Snowden sat in one of the front seats, and he examined the hollow interface that projected in front of him. Ordinus had one as well, and interacted with it. The platform moved out. His body relaxed, and it was hard not to smile. Despite everything going on, it felt good to have something to focus on and to do it with those he cared for. Even Ordinus had grown on him in a short time. It could be his nature to try to bond with others, but he knew that was a two-way street. The trip to the elevator that took them to the first repeater was enjoyable. He surveyed various environments that they passed through. It helped that he could do some sightseeing while Ordinus drove. The city was well organized, and walking paths were large enough to accommodate platforms like the one they were on. He suspected the layout design was a common pattern. Hoxgris walked and flew around, and it struck him that there was no sense of urgency in them. They seemed unconcerned with the Time Wardens, but his experience suggested they should be. The Time Wardens had new units that had decimated a Hoxgris vanguard, although they had adapted. The platform turned into a smaller pathway, then pulled into a parking garage-like structure. Dr. Snowden had not seen this environment before, but it made sense that they would have these types of areas spread out across the city. It allowed for the platforms to be parked, which suggested they had probably been used before miniaturization had been common. Ordinus parked, and everyone got off. V got the hover slab off the platform before it shrank and flew to Ordinus's belt. It's not far, said Ordinus. Dr. Snowden followed her and the others toward a doorway in the distance. He spotted several other platforms coming and going, as well as individuals flying in, then shrinking their small platforms when they were close to the door the group was headed to. He liked the ease with which everyone could go wherever they needed to. Although the walls were featureless, 
Except for strips that provided illumination from overhead and on the sides, the place felt alive. It could have been the whitish walls, the small drones, or the traffic he had seen. I feel it too, said Kess, smiling at him. This place is peaceful. Oh yeah, he said. He eyed Ordinus. Are you not worried about the time, Warden Threat? She shrugged. Let them come. They'll be defeated if they do. Analysis. We will assist should that occur. You already are with this shield enhancement, and we're honored that you would help us. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden appreciated her bravado, and he hoped it was warranted. They boarded a wide elevator unit similar to the one they had been on before. The descent took some time, and he figured they must be going deep into the city's underside. After they exited, the walk to the energy distribution point was short. The room had a pipe in the middle, with a big metallic ball in the center. I'll need one of you to move the cosmic chunk, said Ordinus. I got it, said Dr. Snowden. He walked over and picked up the small container off the hover slab. What's next? Ordinus created a small platform to support both of them, then indicated for him to board. Dr. Snowden complied, and the platform lifted them up to the top of the pipe. Ordinus tapped on the pipe as if there was an interface there. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened when the pipe segment split, creating a square design. He was not sure where the additional material had come from, but he could have moved his hand through the opening had he wanted. It's rerouted through the left side, said Ordinus. She tapped on the newly formed right side pipe, causing a section of it to open. And you just need to put the chunk there. He complied while thinking of putting it in place. After placing the chunk, he let go, expecting it to hover in place, which it did. Ordinus interacted with the pipe, and it closed before merging back into one segment. They descended. Well, that was interesting. Can you tell if it's working? asked Dr. Snowden, stepping off the platform. Ordinus nodded. There's no drop-off from the main shard. This confirms Everin and V's simulation. Most impressive. Acknowledged, said V. We have another repeater, and then the end point. But the process should be the same. I guess we're going deeper into the city, asked Dr. Snowden. Yes, said Ordinus. Dr. Snowden followed V as he pushed the hover slab. It boggled Dr. Snowden's mind how easy it had been to install a cosmic chunk. He understood that it required someone with more cosmic energy than the Hawkscurus to break off and move chunks, but for him it had been like moving a normal rock. One more repeater, then an end point to set up, and Keleton would have a much more powerful shield defense. Emily grinned as her platform whooshed around. While she could create a flying structure, it was nowhere near as fast or nimble as what she was on. It amazed her that so much energy could be condensed into such a small form without the use of dimensional mechanics, something that would make Hawkscurus technology even more advanced. Pizarra and Everin sat in the front two seats, and Emily and Jelton sat in the back. The slab was docked behind them, and she enjoyed flying over the city. The place they needed to go to was above them. She smiled as she checked on where Dr. Snowden and the others had gone. They had traveled along a ground-based path that ended at an elevator that would take them right to the first repeater point. Emily realized they could have probably flown down one of the vertical shafts, but due to the location, they would have had to land a decent distance away. It was faster to use the elevator, which exited closer to where they needed to go. She grinned as she poked Jelton's arm. He eyed her. Someone's in a good mood. I am, actually. You don't seem too worried about the time, Wardens. Sure, but I won't let that dictate my mood, said Emily. Besides, we're here now, and we've dealt with time wardens before. Plus, Keleton is getting a much more powerful shielding system. Even if the time wardens breach that, we'll kick their asses. Pizarra peeked back. You mean defeat them, not literally kick them from behind, assuming that translates right. Emily chuckled. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I hope it doesn't come to that. Everin peered over at Pizarra. The time wardens are crafty. 
From your past, they assaulted Keleton before to no avail. They did, but their technology wasn't advanced enough to deal with us. However, they've upgraded. Emily sensed an uneasiness around Pizarra. Although she was outwardly confident, her cosmic energy was in flux, what little of it there was. It made Emily wonder if their arrival, the deaths of the Hawkscurus vanguard, and the mention of some being named Antion unsettled Pizarra. If it did, she did her best to conceal it. After thirty minutes, they arrived at the first repeater point, which was inside a large tower. They had landed on one of the platforms that jutted out, but there was still a decent walk left. It gave her a sense of how massive the tower was. They unloaded the hover slab and walked to a large doorway. I thought the Hawksgris knew of what's going on, said Emily. She gestured about. They don't seem too concerned. Jelton surveyed the environment. I noticed that as well. Pizarra picked out a few Hawksgris passing by. They know the routine and what they need to do in case of an attack, while others are checking defenses and the like. Most can be ready to fight in under ten minutes. That's impressive. Citizen soldiers, said Jelton. After a millennium of various attacks, it's how we sustain ourselves. Also, when a society is as close as ours, it feels safer knowing that everyone is in the same situation and will react if need be. Jelton dipped his head at her. I like it. They reached the repeater point after a short walk. It was as if someone had speared a ball with a metal pipe, then positioned it vertically in the middle, then placed it in the middle of the room. Emily held back with Jelton as Pizarra and Everin got onto a platform she created, then flew up to the top part of the pipe. She tapped at the pipe, causing a section of it to split into two parts. After she interacted with some type of interface on the right side, it opened. Everin moved the cosmic chunk inside, where it hovered. The pipe closed, then merged back into one piece. Everin and Pizarra descended. Well, that was... Effortless, said Emily. Pizarra paused. Yes. And even more amazing is that the shields tied to this point are as strong as the ones using the cosmic shard. She faced Everin. Your idea worked. We have one more repeater, then the end point, and Keleton will have uniform shield strength, he said. To the next one, then, said Pizarra. Emily realized that she and Jelton could have stayed behind for this trip. That would also apply to Dr. Snowden and Kess. Nonetheless, it did Emily good to come along. She would have been wondering about the status nonstop. Plus, she got to spend time with Everin. As they flew up to the next repeater point, Emily leaned forward. I've noticed only a few children out and about. Ah, you've seen our youngest, said Pizarra. They don't get hybrid, technical, and organic nanobots until they're twenty. Then, in their next five years, they receive treatments to transition into adulthood. As we are long-lived, one thing we've learned is that creating a life is a massive commitment. Not physically, but mentally. Most Hawkscurus past one hundred don't want to deal with that. An interesting culture, said Jelton. Then the children we saw were from those under one hundred. Most, yes. Some of the older Hawksgris do have children. But it's uncommon. Everin peered at her. As your death and birth rates are low, your society maintains a stable population. Yes, and we're aware it might seem like we're a harsh society in that manner to outsiders. We've been reminded of that throughout our existence, said Pizarra. I don't mean to be nosy, but when you, you know, make a kid, is it at least pleasurable? Asked Emily. Pizarra beamed. Of course. But we can do that without procreation, since we control if we are impregnated or not. We're actually quite open about pleasure. Emily drew her head back. Really? Pizarra chuckled. <laughs> if you want to learn more about that, there are... Few Hawkscurses that would partake. As an example, there are many who would like to experience Everin. Ooh, ladies' man strikes again, said Emily, swatting Everin's arm. He eyed her. I am honored, 
but fear I must pass on that. Jelton cleared his throat. So if Emily and I wanted to experience this, there are Hawksgris who would be open to that. Definitely, said Pizarra. I sense that where you two are from, this is a strange topic. Where I'm from, yes, said Jelton. He crooked a thumb at Emily. And her world, I see. If you two are interested, let me know. I'll bring a few friends. Emily gulped as she eased back into her chair. The Hawksgris were open about their sexuality and treated it as a pleasurable activity without any hang-ups. It made sense that if they were so advanced and confident in everything they did, sexuality would not carry any concerns. Her experience was that it formed strong bonds, but perhaps that was not the same with the Hawksgris. They arrived at the second repeater point after another thirty minutes. They had landed on a hanging platform several hundred feet off the ground. She got a good view of the surrounding city, and due to their recent conversation, she tried to find any children, but saw none. She had a new view of the Hawksgris and appreciated their openness. After entering the tower and reaching the second repeater room, Pizarra and Everin added another cosmic chunk. Pizarra beamed. Like the first repeater, this one is working well. I am glad to hear it, said Everin. Only one more to go, and that one powers 15% of Keleton's shielding. How much do these repeaters power? asked Jelton. Everin held up five fingers. Five percent. However, the main focus of the repeaters is to extend the cosmic energy connection from the main shard to the end point. These repeaters still benefit from that extension. Emily wrinkled her brow. So the repeaters and endpoint are 25%, and the other ones Uncle Albert's team is attending to are also the same, meaning the main cosmic shard will make up 50% of the city's shields in its area? That is correct. Prior to this, the main cosmic shard was 100%, but only for a specific distance. The rest of the shielding was not cosmic-powered. That's it exactly, Pizarra pointed up. While we are upgrading our shields here, the ones there are still powerful. Ah, said Emily. She hoped the shielding would be enough, but of more concern was that the Time Wardens would come back. They probably would, and if Antion was as strong as she thought he was, this newly upgraded shielding would be a road bump. It was times like this that she wished the Toravada was around. It could open a portal for Keleton to escape while the gang dealt with this new threat— her gut told her there would be fighting soon, and that was not uncommon to her. If the Time Wardens came, they would understand how much she had learned since their last encounter. Chapter 14 Time Warden Commander Zega analyzed the flow of data in the Timeplex's digital landscape. The Timeplex was powerful and it had been almost 4,000 years since Antion had led the Time Wardens there. Zega could view the status of thousands of rift anchor stations. Not all the data was real-time, as they were unable to transmit messages through rifts, although they could send a drone between anchor stations. Zega had a healthy respect for Antion. When the Time Wardens ran into troublesome civilizations, Antion led the assault, and very few survived him. He had become somewhat of a hero to Time Wardens, and Zega noticed a trend of lesser ones seeking Antion's command instead of his. It was a minor sample, so ultimately irrelevant. The most troublesome enemy had been a matter mage, a being who could control matter within a certain radius. The creature had disassembled a Time Warden ship as it had descended on a planet. Antion had configured a device that shot a magnetized container with antimatter inside. The mage had tried to disassemble it, and when he had, the explosion had wiped him out, leaving no trace. Antion had added a new dimension to the Time Warden's arsenal. Zega's attention focused on a long-range communication from a remote anchor station that was tied to a space-time rift. A humanoid controller appeared in the digital landscape. Report, said Zega. Everin has been found. Coordinates have been logged, said the humanoid. Why was he not captured? 
The controller extended his hand and projected a display showing a ship. Species 7321 disabled it. The Hoxcarus, said Zega. They are of no importance, but if Everin is there, he must be captured. Notify Antion immediately. I live to serve. The communication ended. The next step for Zega was to enact the Everin Containment Protocol. As he was in the future, the Time Wardens would send a probe that could track Keleton through centuries and eventually make it back through the same rift anchor station that the controller had come from. That information should already be present, assuming the probe did not run into any issues. Once Keleton's history was known, then the Time Wardens could begin to place forces throughout history so that when the time came, they could swarm Keleton. The Torvada had a range of ten light years according to the data gathered from the Ceros group, so that would need to be factored in. As there was a ship that had been detected, it could be outfitted with special sensors. That would cause a timeline change, but a minor one. Hopefully no more than two, depending on the data retrieved. An alert fired that Time Warden forces were being moved. Zega had not yet activated the protocol, and Antion was not aware of the situation. Zega summoned the humanoid, who would not be out of range of the timeplex yet. What's this? The humanoid stared at Zega. I don't understand. Who else did you tell of Everin's presence? Asked Zega. Commander Gilsus. Zega had rivals, and while he thought they would not act out without Antion's knowledge, it was still possible. The main concern was that if Gilsus struck and was defeated, it could mess up any plans that Antion had. Continue with your mission said Zega. Your will is my command. The humanoid vanished. Zega contacted another controller. Get a status report from Commander Gilsus. My life is yours to command. There was an uneasy truce between several commanders, but Zega had been chosen by Antion. This could be Gilsus's move to establish himself Given the patterns that Zega had seen, Antion would most likely reward Gilsus. That could not happen. Zega moved into motion. Gilsus had most likely anticipated interference, so Zega would plan around that. Stopping Gilsus before he could enact his plan would work, but it would take time, especially in regard to finding rifts nearby, relatively speaking. He needed to go back to the past. A timeline change would occur, but the only thing that mattered was that Gilsus was stopped so that Antion could lead the assault on Keleton. Zega bowed to no other commander, only to Antion. For the time being. Kess had enjoyed the previous day. The cosmic chunks now powered Keleton's shields to give it uniform strength. It had been fun talking with Ordinus and learning more about Hoxgris culture. Even more interesting was discussing with Emily over breakfast how they viewed pleasure. Kess had cracked up at how uncomfortable it made Dr. Snowden to talk about that in front of Emily. It was 10 o'clock a.m., and Kess did not know what the day would hold. There was the ever-present fear that the Time Wardens would attack. It was less a matter of if they would and more of when. Despite that, she had not seen too much concern from the Hawkscurus and the rest of the gang. She relaxed around the central table in the living quarters. The design of an open area with side doorways leading to living units impressed her. She wondered if something like this could be done to some place where she and Dr. Snowden, along with Emily and Jelton, could live. It could be a fun time. Uh-oh, said Dr. Snowden, standing. Emily sighed. Yep, timeline change. We won't be impacted here, though, right? Asked Kess. You are correct, said Everin. V tilted his head. Analysis. We are being summoned to the Hoxgurus chamber. I would think so. Let us go, but prepare for a potential battle. Wish I would have known that before scarfing down a burrito, 
said Dr. Snowden. Everin glanced at him. You had too. Emily laughed. <laughs> Busted. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Still delicious. I'll manage. Everyone remained calm despite a timeline change. She sometimes forgot that to the rest of the gang it was almost routine, especially if you had a tour of Vada. She did not require much gear, but Dr. Snowden and Emily would need to get their survival suits. Jelton was also outside of his body armor. Kess waited with Everin and V. Anything else on why we're being called? She asked. Nothing, said Everin. However, I suspect there are visitors approaching Keleton. Kess smirked. Then we got the shields going just in time. Could even be the time wardens. I concur said Everin. They already knew of the cosmic energy from before. I do wonder if they have adapted to that if they are here now. Let's hope not. If it was the Time Warden, she wondered if Antion would make his appearance. He was a powerful foe, yet not much was known about him other than that the Time Wardens deferred to him. After a quick walk, they reached the delegate room. Kess liked that it could change configurations. When they had first arrived, the tables had been in a hexagonal pattern. The second visit, they had been on the sides. Currently, they were arranged in a circle, or as close as they could get to one. In the middle was a large hologram that showed Keleton and a massive number of dots outside it. Pizarro waved them over. Kess's eyes narrowed, and a chill went through her as she saw that the dots were Time Warden ships. Pizarro gestured around. As you can see, the Time Wardens did come back with numbers after the timeline change. That means they changed history to have these ships present. Still, their technology does not seem to have been upgraded, at least from what we can scan. It may be a ruse, said Everin as he strolled around with his hands behind his back. By your scanner's count, there are 463 ships. Most seem to be the same type of configuration. Their spherical formation seems unusual as well. Also, as a reminder, while Keleton's shielding is much stronger, a breach can still be created with concentrated fire. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Maybe that's why they have so many ships. It is a possibility, said Everin. There may even be other measures we are unaware of. Then we will have to decimate them, said Pizarra. She pulled up a zoomed-in view of one region of the ships. Our automated defense platforms have already started attacking them, and the ones we can hit are disabled. However, there are so many that it's allowing them to fire back. We are taking losses. Everin circled his finger at the ships. They are using the outer layers of the formation to take hits, but are still accelerating as a group. They will be able to reach the shielding. Then they'll crash into it. Everin stared at the formation. Most will. However, if joined with a centralized blast, they could break through. Kess saw what Everin was pointing out. The Time Wardens were using a design that allowed them to get close at the expense of their own ships. They even had stronger shielding as a group, which meant they could block some shots from the defense platforms. However, Everin was right. Based on the speed and direction the enemies were moving, there would be multiple breaches. It would have been worse without the cosmic shielding upgrade. Pizarra paused. I've sent out a citywide alert. We'll be able to take down quite a few before they reach the shields. She highlighted three red areas around Keleton. We expect the breaches to be there. The city has already entered its defensive configuration, and every topside entrance is being sealed. Our nanoswarms will blanket the area and target anything that's not been registered within the city. Kess watched part of the city submerge into the city base once the entrances had been closed. New defensive structures popped out. Based on the data labels, they were some sort of laser cannon. Some buildings were too big to merge down, and instead, segmented armor plating formed on them. Strands of nanobots swarmed out of holes from the city's four pillars. This was obviously not the first time the Hawkscurus needed to fight inside Keleton. So what do we do? asked Emily. Everin scrutinized the projection. The surface will be a hot zone, 
and the defensive structures and other building defenses should slow the assault down. The nanoswarms should be able to fully dismantle anything that would break through. However, it is possible that some of the Time Wardens will make it through all that and reach the inside of Keleton. We will aid the Hawkscurus in battle. I wouldn't ask you to fight for us, said Pizarra. No need to, said Dr. Snowden. This invasion can't stand. Jelton nodded at him. Well said, my friend. Pizarra smiled. We are grateful for your assistance. I do think we can contain this, but there could be surprises. We'll engage them from the air and on the ground, and if they breach, they'll meet more defenders. I've already activated our robotic sentinels. Very well, said Everin. He waved forward. Let us go, then. Kess's heart pumped furiously as she followed the others. It did not look like there would be too many Time Wardens able to enter the city's base. However, she knew better than to underestimate them. They would breach the shielding and most likely infiltrate the city at some point. There were simply too many ships that had come out of nowhere due to the timeline change. She trusted the gang and had no doubt they could repel the invaders if it came to close quarters combat. Chapter 15 Jelton went through several combat scenarios in his head as the gang made their way to a large auditorium. He liked that the city had designated some entrances to be left open to funnel any Time Warden forces there. The domed interior had huge arrays of wall-mounted turrets that could hit any area under them. A small army of robot sentinels had already taken up position, with Hawkscurus in heavy armor mode among them. He appreciated that Pizarra had let the gang see the place they were going to before arriving, and he also doubted many Time Wardens would make it through the defensive nanoswarms. Time Wardens were the Rift Guardian's main enemy, and fighting them was habit at this point with Jelton. They had destroyed the first colony built in the Rift Guardian's timeline. The Time Wardens had eventually been defeated, but at a great cost. This version of them was different, and they possessed new forms and abilities. However, he suspected their internal organization was the same. A commander led this invasion, and following it would be predators, soldiers, and the new units. The platform he rode onto the auditorium was smooth, and he gazed out over the city as it continued with its defensive lockdown. Hawkscurus flew around with drones attending to them, Large platforms with cylinders and orbs hovered in various spots, and he recognized them as floating laser turrets with shielding. Those would be tough to take down. Nanoswarms blanketed the air in some areas. He admired the Hawkscurus's commitment to a society that valued being ready to fight at a moment's notice if need be. It was not common, from what he had seen, as it required a populace to be comfortable with the idea that things could get chaotic fast, and that, if not prepared, they could be wiped out. It was something his race, the Rivens, understood well, and was why they were a major force in the Rift Guardians. Everin and Pizarra chatted up front and seemed calm from what Jelton could sense. Dr. Snowden and Kess were in the second row, and were the exact opposite— Dr. Snowden's cosmic energy fluctuated, and Kess's movements indicated she was unsettled. Emily was calm, and when Jelton peeked at her, her energy had spiked as she smiled back. He took that as a good sign. V sat silently behind them. Jelton wondered what he thought about. After twenty minutes, they reached the auditorium's open entrance. Jelton appreciated the tunnel that the Time Wardens would need to enter. It created a manageable choke point. Everyone had disembarked, and Pizarra had pulled the platform back onto her belt. He followed her and the others into the entryway. On the sides were small holes, and Pizarra had mentioned that they would shoot lasers that would dice up anything that stepped through them. He was glad the beams weren't active yet. The interior of the auditorium was just like he had seen earlier. What was new was the barricades put up in various spots— it resembled someone flipping a metal table on its side, then bending each end inward at a 45-degree angle. 
then repeating that for two more tables and stacking them on top of each other with a slight indent. Per his ARI, the material could take some damage, but it gave the battlefield plenty of places to take cover. Wow, this is impressive, said Kess. I think so too, said Pizarra. She pointed at a pair of sealed doors in the back. That's our fallback position. If we lose this space, that's where we go. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. If we lose this place with everything here, that's not a good sign. Especially if we're here. Pizarra smiled. I'd like to avoid losing this space, too. The group chuckled. Jelton liked the light-hearted moment, but the feeling he got from some of the nearby Hawkscris was that of dread. That was a far cry from the steadiness he had sensed earlier from them. It was something he felt when going into battle as well, and it could be hard to tame it. He never glorified war and would prefer there to be none, but that was not the reality he knew. He followed the others to a large barricade. The inner wall had a holographic display that showed an overview of the region. It impressed him how effective the automated defense platforms orbiting the sun were. Their lasers were accurate and fired nonstop at the Time Warden group. He was not sure how they would even be able to breach Keleton's shielding at their current rate of loss. They might have numbers, but more platforms were coming into range and they would slice up the Time Warden formations with ease. His eyes widened when the Time Warden group merged into a large tunnel formation. He had never witnessed this tactic before, but it became clear what it was when a massive ship emerged in the middle, seemingly out of nowhere. What was that? asked Dr. Snowden. A Time Warden Commander Cruiser, said Jelton. I've never seen it arrive like that before. Everin raised a finger. It came from condensed space. Emily scrunched her nose. But we're by the sun. I thought condensed space would only allow you to exit a certain distance away from a large object like that. Normally, yes. However, it appears the cylindrical formation that the other Time Warden ships have formed has created a pocket for the cruiser to drop into. I was not aware they knew of this tactic. Jelton gulped when the cruiser launched a massive metallic ring forward. When the ring reached the shielding, it clamped on and cleared the interior, which then expanded. A large ball was shot through the hole, then exploded over the city. Waves from the explosion washed over everything, disabling anything they touched. Nanoswarms fell to the ground, and any Hawkscris that had been flying crashed. Thankfully, the auditorium was shielded, but Topside was now vulnerable. Uh, that's not good said Dr. Snowden. It is not, said Everin. They have detonated a massive electromagnetic pulse. We have shielding against that here and in lower parts of the city, but we're exposed now topside, said Pizarra. Emily poked her finger in the air toward the display. Look! Jelton grimaced as a swarm of ships, drones, and flying time wardens exited the cruiser and flew into the breach. Are you kidding me? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin motioned at Pizarra. Some of your heavily shielded defense platforms should be able to dislodge the ring and the cruiser. Until then, we need to hold the city and bring their attention here. Already on it, she said. Reinforcements are coming from below, but it will take some time. How long until you can mount a counteroffensive? Thirty minutes, at least, said Pizarra. A massive EMP was not expected. It will hamper our efforts below. I understand, said Everin. Jelton concentrated on the battle going on over where they were. Some internal defense platforms fired nonstop at the ring, while others retreated inside the city. Hordes of time wardens overpowered some Hawkscris. Others, who had survived the crash landing after the EMP, were firing at the attackers dropping from above. Jelton stared at the cylindrical ship that had landed with a loud thump outside the auditorium. It had clamped onto the surface and extended ramps on all sides, pulling the bottom half up. Metallic poles dropped down inside the ship, and a small army of controllers and their robot guards unfurled and exited. They burst over to the auditorium entrance. Several other containers dropped that were similar to the first one, but a variety of forms came out. 
It's about to get hot in here, said Emily, adopting a defensive stance with her bladed spear and energy shield. She moved to the right of the barricade they stood before. As always, said Dr. Snowden. He hustled to the other side with Kess and V. Jelton joined Emily, Pizarra, and Everin on the right side. He smirked when the first wave of attackers to rush through the corridor were sliced up. It was like a bright flash of light, then the sound of falling metal body parts. The next group dealt with that by destroying the laser ports, but when they reached the open area, they were demolished by the wall turrets and concentrated weapons fire. The third wave approached differently. Small orbs flew in and attacked the wall turrets. Behind them were heavily armored, spider-like time wardens, which Jelton knew as soldiers. They were tough, with heavy shielding, but not very maneuverable. Although they went down due to focused fire, there were enough to create a temporary wall that allowed controllers and their guards to slip through. Other types also came. Everin reflected a beam that sliced up one attacker. V grabbed a controller and ripped its arms off before puncturing its chest, which spewed evaporating yellow goo everywhere. Dr. Snowden shot another controller and brought it down, while Kess used large nanoswarm hands to swat away one of the heavy soldiers. A soldier attacked Emily. She whirled around it, taking off all its legs. Jelton jumped through the air and landed on top of the assailant, plunging his dual daggers into the body. The Time Warden crumpled as its goo flowed out. Jelton scrutinized the entrance. It was now overflowing. Enemies crawled along the ceiling and the walls. He stood next to Emily and puffed his chest out. It was about to get rough, but he was glad he could assist the gang in this moment. Emily growled as she battled a controller. They freaked her out, and the fact that they were linked to a small squad of robots irritated her. They swarmed as one unit, making it hard to engage them. Thankfully, she, Pizarra, Everin and Jelton had kept their fighting area clear, and Dr. Snowden, V, and Kess had done so on the other side of the barricade. Emily was impressed by how Pizarra moved and fought. She was no stranger to combat, and her small forearm blasters packed a punch. One shot had sent a Time Warden soldier back into the ranks. Another blast had sliced a controller in half. Everin was his usual self. He jumped into the middle of a large pack of Time Wardens. He reflected shots, jabbed others, and sent some sprawling away. His speed was on display as he deftly dodged everything tossed at him. That was the Everin Emily knew. Jelton had been a bowling ball with knives as he bounced around, slicing and dicing everything within range. She could tell when he was in the zone by his silence and total focus on his next move. It was something she had seen him do on one of his campaigns against the Time Wardens, she had assisted him when he had gotten mobbed, but he had returned the favor, and then some. It boggled her mind that as much as they had fought, only ten minutes had passed. This would go on for at least another twenty until the reinforcements could take the top side. The Time Warden showed no signs of slowing down and focused on breaking through. The holographic overview of the region of space continued to display inside the barricade. She had paused a few times to check it out, and while the cruiser was getting pummeled, its shielding still held. She wondered how long it could hold. The topside was packed with intense battles. She was not sure how many Time Wardens were on a cruiser, but there were more than enough to establish a foothold. The Hawkscurus had opened an entrance, and robot sentinels and heavily armored guards rushed out. They must have been shielded from the EMP and were the first to reach the surface to fight back. She eyed a predator coming toward her. The last time she had fought one, it had paralyzed her. She just had to avoid being stung, and her suit should be able to handle it. Jelton slid under it and cut off two of its supporting legs. Emily moved in and spun around while cutting off the other appendages. The predator crashed to the ground. She put her foot on the body, then speared it. It did her good to fight a predator again, as it showed how much she had grown. It also helped that she did it with Jelton. Although she wanted to rush over and kiss him, now was not the time. The next twenty minutes were brutal. Almost all the wall turrets had been disabled, and the Hawkscurus numbers had thinned considerably. Thankfully, the amount of time wardens coming in had diminished as well. She had figured they would fall back to one of the sealed doors, but Pizarra stood her ground. 
The cruiser continued to come under intense fire as more and more orbiting defense platforms came within range. But the ship did not move, almost as if it was on a suicide mission. She tracked a strange capsule that had landed outside. Her stomach churned when a Time Warden commander stepped out. It was like a huge metallic sphere with spider-like legs, and she remembered almost dying to one. Her eyes flicked to the display, which showed the cruiser shielding failing. The ship was getting torn to shreds, and the ring that had opened a hole in the shields had been destroyed. The commander had also fled his ship. Is that what I think it is coming in here? said Dr. Snowden, pointing ahead. Jelton scowled. A commander. Two Hawkscrews had engaged the commander, but it had wrapped them up, then used its other legs to decapitate them. The commander crawled toward Everin, with the remaining Time Wardens following it. Everin stepped forward and indicated for the rest of the gang to file in behind him. Emily was not sure what would happen, but she had no issues with taking the commander's legs off, then stabbing it. However, Everin had a plan, or so she hoped. The commander paused before Everin. I'm Commander Gilzus. You'll surrender to me, and your friends will be spared. Everin's eyes glowed as he extended his hand, palm forward. I do not believe so. Your refusal to submit will only harm those around you. Everin shook his head. Your ship has been destroyed, as has your ring that breached Keleton's shielding. Your army is being beaten back and reinforcements from below are arriving. You have no escape mechanism. Even if I were to surrender, you do not have the forces to enforce anything or take me away. However, I will accept you and your forces surrender. Time Wardens do not surrender or submit. I have heard you did to Antion. He is a guide, but we did not submit to him, said Gilzus. I see, said Everin. Nonetheless, you should take our final offer. Otherwise, you will be sent back to the Time Void. Gilzus paused as the other Time Wardens tried to jump on Everin. He stepped back and sent a repulsion beam that blew the controllers and small orbs away. Emily and Dr. Snowden flanked Everin and fired mist and stun beams. Gilzus surged forward and swatted Dr. Snowden away, but he was able to lift his shield in time. Jelton took the opportunity to dash in and sever one of Gilzus's appendages. Everin leapt into the air and landed on top of Gilzus. Kess flew above him and slapped away the various orbs that came her way. Emily sliced off another leg. Everin formed a spear, then jammed it straight down. Gilzus thrashed around, and the rest of the gang used that opportunity to cut off the rest of his appendages. No! said Gilzus. Everin pulled out the spear, covered in yellow goo. You... You will suffer at the hands of Antion. Perhaps, but not today, said Everin. Gilzus stopped moving. Emily kicked his shell, but there was no response. The remaining Time Wardens tried to fight, but with Gilzus dead, she noticed they did not put much effort into it. The sealed doors in the back had opened, and a new stream of robot sentinels had arrived and begun mop-up duty. Everin hopped down and signaled for the gang to assemble around him. I do not believe this threat is over. Nor do I, said Pizarra. We lost more than I expected. And although our defense platforms from the other side of the sun are here, we lost a lot of the ones nearest us. There are also dead Hawkscris and infrastructure damaged. There is much work to be done, and hopefully that's the last of the Time Wardens for a while. I do not wish to be negative, but I do not think we have seen the last of Antion or his impacts. I would expect another attack, so time is of the essence. Pazara frowned. You're probably right. That EMP really hurt us. The ones I fought have used that tactic before, but I've never seen it used by a ship on a city, said Jelton. It's new to us as well.
Our nanoswarms and topside defenses were taken down too fast. Emily studied the projection that showed parts of the cruiser drifting about. Have you considered moving? Pizarra shrugged. If the Time Wardens are causing timeline changes to appear, they just do so wherever we go. That is correct, said Everin. They could monitor your movements through history, including now. I need to attend to some things. Very well. If we can assist, let us know. She smiled at him, then took off. Emily looked around. I guess we go back to our living quarters, unless we're called upon. You four go ahead, said Everin. I wish to study the city's status in some detail. I'll need your assistance, V. Acknowledged. Emily hugged Everin, then high-fived V. Although she wanted to help out, Everin and V's analysis was something that did not require her, and their focus would be a reflection on what had happened and how to prevent that from occurring again. The Hawksgris around them were being either attended to medically or carried away on slabs. Not all of them had made it. Her heart sank when she walked outside. Dead Hawksgris were everywhere, as well as downed Time Wardens. Nanoswarms were busy dismantling the Time Warden remains, while Hawksgris rushed around picking up the dead. It was strange to see the rest of the city in such a damaged state. She smiled when Jelton held her hand. Maybe some relaxation with Jelton was all she needed to improve her mood. Chapter 16 Dr. Snowden yawned as he woke up from his nap. It was 4 o'clock p.m., about three and a half hours since the city fight. Kess was still snuggled up to him. He would never get tired of that. Everin and V were out and about, scanning and analyzing things, and Dr. Snowden did a quick check of what they had found so far. The Time Warden's EMP attack had done more damage than he had thought. He frowned at the number of dead Hawkscurus. The ones who had been flying had dropped to the ground hard, and with all that armor on them, it would have been an instant death. The automated defense platforms had been torn to shreds, and some areas were covered by dead nanoswarms making it look like a shadow had descended. The Hawkscurus's mood had also changed. Although everyone waved at Everin and V, the sadness was evident in those who engaged them. Even with cosmic shielding, the shields had been breached and the city assaulted. That was probably not something they had imagined happening. Not everything was doom and gloom. New nanoswarms were busy reconstructing things, and robot sentinels were everywhere. Hawkscurus had also come out to help in the cleanup effort. It was a communal event, and with the city coming out of lockdown, most were eager to get out. His stomach churned as a well-known feeling washed over him. Kess stirred and peered into his eyes. What's going on? Timeline change? Again? He sat up and stared at the wall. It fascinated him that, even in a city with temporal shielding, the change's semi-transparent curtain would still come through. As if on cue, it passed through him. His PSD buzzed. Then he projected a screen from it. Hey, said Emily. You see that timeline change? Sure did, said Dr. Snowden. Wonder what shenanigans the Time Wardens are up to now. Not sure, but Everin has called us to the delegate room to meet with Pizarra. Dr. Snowden glanced at Kess. We'll be there. Okay, said Emily. She waved at Kess before the projection ended. Kess pulled herself up. Looks like something else is happening. At least we got a nap in, said Dr. Snowden. And then some, she said, winking at him before crawling out of bed. Dr. Snowden gazed at her as she went to the bathroom. Despite the new situation dampening the mood, he enjoyed thoughts of what had been done prior to napping. It was a strange feeling to experience happiness and dread in such a short time window. He hopped up and joined her in the bathroom. After thirty minutes, they arrived at the delicate room. Emily and Jelton were talking with Everin, V, and Pizarra. Dr. Snowden and Kess joined them. So, what's up? asked Dr. Snowden, examining the holographic projection in the center of the tables. Analysis. The sun missing is up. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses and stared at where the sun would be. Huh, I thought it was being filtered from display. 
How would a son just disappear? Asked Emily. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. Many possible reasons. They could have altered its course in earlier history, moved more powerful objects to change its trajectory, or even blown it up by disrupting the balance of fusion and gravity. I assume with Antion, that opens a lot of doors. Everin paced around with his hands clasped behind him. Indeed. Whatever the reason, Kelatin has lost a major source of energy. Pizarus sighed. We'll need to find a new star. But there's always the chance that another timeline change will occur and the sun could come back. We know that since there were a series of timeline changes detected upon your arrival, the sun will eventually be back. While I agree with that, the timing of it would lend some weight to the notion that this is the Time Warden's doing, and we still have to experience everything in the interim. Kess drew her head back. What would they gain from doing this other than denying the Hawkscurus power? They would have to know that Kelatin can just fly to a new star. Jelton pointed at a section on the city's underside in the block. Not if the engines were damaged. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the data labels. It showed a progress bar labeled Reconstruction. What happened? Pizarra frowned. Some time wardens went on a suicide bombing run. They did significant damage to certain systems. Maybe that was the main reason for the earlier attack, said Jelton. They softened the city for the next big assault. But we can still move, right? asked Dr. Snowden. Yes, but not via condensed space, said Pizarra. All of our automated defense platforms are being pulled in. Then we will leave this area for a new location. Emily rubbed her forearm. The Time Wardens could be out of range and watching us. I'd count on it, said Jelton. Dr. Snowden growled. This would be a good time for the Torvata to come back. Silence fell. Although it had not been discussed as often, the Torvata's absence was felt. Dr. Snowden had heard it referred to as a powerful and silent member of the gang. The description was accurate to him, and without the Toravata, they had no way of leaving or investigating anything, much less taking the fight to the Time Wardens. Everin interacted with his ARI, and the holographic projection changed to a high-level universal view of the cosmic web. He highlighted a blue area that covered a massive gap between two dark matter strands packed with galaxies. This is strand space, as I call it, he said. Time wardens do not go there due to the area's unique physics. Yes, the area is very far away, but if Kelatin were to head in that direction, it would get there eventually. Strand space is also temporally shielded. Sounds like a dimension stuck in our reality, said Dr. Snowden. Everin gestured at him. That is exactly what it is, except anything can enter it from normal space. What's it look like? asked Kess. Everin changed the hologram to show a sample of it. Dr. Snowden got goosebumps as he inspected the massive, plant-like tendrils all over space with purple stars and other oddly colored phenomena. An orange and gray gas cloud shrouded a better view. It was like a cosmic briar patch. How big are those strands, oh, relatively, he asked. Everin projected a hologram from his ring. If you were to take a slice of this strand, you could fit approximately 1,300 Earths in it. And this is a small one. There are ecosystems that thrive in almost every aspect. Emily wagged her finger. The junction dimension. We ran into something like this, although not at this scale. Well, a dimension attached to the junction dimension. An apt comparison, said Everin. Pazara grimaced. That is very far away. And we would need to go into stasis for most of it, unless we could find rifts to help the journey. The alternative is to stay here and fight, or look for a closer star. Perhaps a combination of plans, then, said Jelton. Find a nearby star and go to it. If we are forced to fight again, and Kelatin might be captured, then escape and begin the journey. If there is no fight, then crisis averted. However, it would be unusual for the Time Wardens to give up. 
It took the Rift Guardians destroying their Timeplex to get them out. That is wise counsel, said Pizarra, nodding at him. I need to confer with the other delegates and determine a plan. I will present the ideas from your group. While this strand space sounds like an ultimate location, it's possible Antion could send another army not impacted by the area. His actions to this point indicate he is relentless, intelligent, and powerful. I concur, said Everin. I'll be back, said Pizarra. She took off. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheeks. Always something with the Time Wardens. I guess we just hang around. I'm curious which direction the Hawkscurus will go. Same, said Kess. And what of us? If the Toravata never returns, this becomes our new home. Jelton slid his arm around Emily's waist. Home to me is wherever we are. Emily winked at him. You still trying to score points with Everin? The group laughed. Dr. Snowden appreciated the light-hearted moment, but the situation felt different. Even the Torvato wanted no part of it. A dark thought crossed his mind that they could spend their long lives here, but if that did come to pass, at least he had the gang with him. There were a lot of unanswered questions, such as what Antion really desired— Although Dr. Snowden could only speculate as to why Everin was being hunted, there had to be something more. It could be a ploy to get more cosmic energy, but he suspected they would find out at some point. He just hoped they were still alive. Kess had followed the others to a massive room when Pizarra had returned. A hologram of the galaxy hovered in the air and filled over 80% of the available area. Pizarra referred to the place as their star lab. Kess wondered why they did not use that functionality in the delegate room, and she guessed it was due to the sheer size difference. Kess had been surprised at how quickly Pizarra finished her delegate meeting. The connection she had with the other delegates was never revealed, but they could apparently converse without being in the same place or using any verbal communication. Kess suspected it was some sort of neural implant. Pizarra moved her hand out in an arc. This is where we study our galactic standings. While we do have a virtual ability to do so as well, a lot of us prefer the physical format in case we want to multitask, like eating a snack, said Dr. Snowden, pointing at her. Yes, if within our eating cycle, or getting a drink, or a host of other things. She tossed out her platform. We can move about on this. Kess boarded it along with the others. After hovering a bit and moving to a corner, she studied the view. Kelatin was in a small planetary system on the edge of a large galaxy. Pizarra highlighted the system. This is us here. We chose this place due to its remoteness, as the nearest planetary system is 30,000 light-years away. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Yeah, that's definitely a bit away. And also, in this time period, there aren't a lot of stars around. So the galaxy would be sparse. Yes, and timeline change impacts are kept to a minimum. She zoomed out to the galactic view, which had several highlighted regions. As you can see, there are multiple civilizations. Although we have met with some of them, it's been a long time since we have, at least 20,000 years. Some may not even be around anymore if their stars are gone. Are you thinking about asking some of them for help? Asked Jelton. Pizarra nodded. It wouldn't hurt. We agreed that Strand Space is our ultimate destination, mainly due to the immunity to timeline changes. It also sounds like time-traveling races would not bother us there. They would not, said Everin. One thing to note is that if you ask these other civilizations for assistance, you will pull them into conflict with Antion. Kess frowned. I'm sure they would not appreciate that at all unless they were able to deal with it. They could also not exist after a timeline change like your star. Both good points, said Pizarra. However, we think we can strike a balance here, ask for safe passage through their territory if they still exist on our way to strand space. 
A line appeared from Keleton and went through the galaxy. This would allow us to hopefully move undercover to the other side of the galaxy. We think the Time Wardens have a time rift somewhere that allows them to communicate with the past. They find us here, report where we are, and then, in the past, the Time Wardens do what they can to appear around us after a timeline change. By taking this route through the galaxy, we become much harder to locate— We'll take advantage of the stars along the way to mask our signature, minimize contact with other civilizations unless they're in the way, and when we reach the other edge of the galaxy, we can make a straight shot to Strand space, hopefully undetected. Everin rubbed his chin. It is a bold decision to make, but it could work. If we had the Toravada, we could just open a portal for Keleton to Strand space, said Emily. That would be ideal, said Pizarra. However, we must work with what we have. I know, it just sucks you have to do this. Pizarra smiled at her. Yes, assuming sucks, translated correctly. One thing we can't do is stay around here. Our engines were damaged in the assault, but they're being repaired now. Once done, we will begin our journey. Analysis Ordinus was given a configuration for level 2 condensed space, is that still being researched? Unfortunately, we will focus on one for now, as we already support that. While we can try to configure it for level two, that is not a priority at the moment. We just need to get going, and even with our current engine state, we've already started moving towards the nearest civilization. Dr. Snowden inspected a green mass. The Horegemi! What type of aliens are they? A cyborg race, said Pizarra. They're advanced, and have many systems under their control. If the Time Wardens from our last attack had gone against them, the Horegemi would have fielded thousands of ships in response. Ah, uh, do you have any relationship with them? Pizarra grimaced. We did. But it didn't go well. They wanted our technology, and we refused them that. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Uh, did you fight over it? They killed our emissary who didn't reveal our location. That was the end of any communication with them. Jelton shook his head. They sound dangerous, then. Yes, but I think we can offer technology in exchange for safe passage, said Pizarra. Would they honor it? asked Emily. Maybe not, said Pizarra. If that's the case, then we will take the long way around their territory. Dr. Snowden frowned. This whole journey seems like it has a lot of potential issues. But that's better than fighting non-stop waves of time, Wardens. The delegates agree with you. You're all welcome to stay with us unless you want to be dropped off somewhere. Everin scrutinized the others for a moment, then focused on Pazara. We will stay with you, unless Dr. Snowden wishes for adventure within one of the civilizations. Everyone stared at him. Dr. Snowden raised a hand. Uh, yeah, no thanks. Staying here is fine. The group cracked up. Kess loved that he could roll with the teasing and play along. She knew that was a very uncommon trait, regardless of species. If she had to stay in Culleton for a while, she was glad he would be around. The trip through the galaxy would take a long time. The civilizations might not even be there. However, it would force the Time Wardens to find them in the present, to tell the past where they needed to be. They would be vulnerable until the condensed space engines were working. Dr. Snowden traced the line in the air. So, who are all these other civilizations? Assuming they're still there... Pizarra wrinkled her brow. Quite a few. I assume you want to know about them. Oh, yeah, if you have time, that is. Kess chuckled. She now knew where Dr. Snowden would be spending the next few hours. Maybe longer, as the line crossed over fifty civilizations. They would need to get dinner at some point, and the Star Lab made that possible. She settled in for a long presentation. Chapter 17 Emily had enjoyed Pizarra's description of the civilizations they might encounter, but after two hours, she was ready to relax. She was with Jelton back in the living area. 
and the tacos that she had eaten during the presentation had filled her belly. Jelton had climbed onto the couch and stretched out while she sat in a chair next to him. Although she liked what the Hawkscrews were doing, there were many points of failure. They had to do something, as she did not think they could withstand non-stop Time Warden attacks. The Rift Guardians had destroyed the Time Warden's Timeplex to stop attacks. That was not an option for the Hawkscrews. She recalled how strong they were from the past. They were quasi-cosmic beings that mopped up powerful matter mages like they were nothing. All it would take was one to deal with any Time Wardens. The Hawkscrews would transform at some point to that potent form, but she did not know how or when it would occur. A sinking feeling made her think it was this event, but even with that narrowed down, she still could not fathom what would trigger it. She was sure a lot of cosmic energy would be involved. Maybe that was where the cosmic shard came into play. The Torvada's absence irritated her. She understood that it might be a way due to how this situation played out, but it would have shortened the journey to Strand Space. The Torvada had a mind of its own, and she did not know what it was thinking or what plan it was following. She did not like being stranded. It did highlight how powerful the Torvada was. It would have provided a quick and easy solution. Then the gang could go back in time and deal with the Time Wardens. A dark thought was that the Torvada knew of Antion and wanted to ensure it was not caught by him. That almost made her think he had cosmic energy, as the Torvada would not dampen that other than to restrict a form. "'What are you pondering?' asked Jelton. "'I know that look.' She sighed. "'Just a lot going on. Torvada missing, time wardens, this journey, the prospect we may be here for a long time, things like that.' Jelton yawned. "'I get it. All we can do is handle what we can control.' She smirked. That's such a you statement. It is. And it's worked well for me. He tossed a pillow at her. She caught it, then pounced on him. And that's such a you action, he said. She grinned at him. And what are you going to do about it? Knock, knock. Emily hopped off Jelton and straightened up. Who is it? Everin. May I come in? She rushed over and opened the door. Of course. You don't need to ask. I did not want to disturb you in case you were busy with Jelton. We're good, said Jelton. Is everything all right? It is. I merely wish to speak with both of you if you have time, said Everin. Always, my friend, said Jelton, placing a hand on his arm. What he said, said Emily, gesturing at a chair opposite from the one she had initially been in. Everin took his seat while Emily and Jelton sat on the couch. So, what's going on? she asked. Everin half smiled. I wanted to check in and see how you both were doing, given the situation. Before I answer that, where's V? He is assisting in the condensed space drive repair, said Everin. Ah. Emily frowned. Well, to answer your question, I'm not going to pretend I like everything going on. I hate it, actually, it aggravates me that the Torvada is missing. I understand, said Everin. It will come back, but I am unsure when. I suspect it will do so after some future event. Yeah, and that could be centuries, maybe. Jelton shrugged. Maybe not. If I had to choose a group to be stranded with, it would be this one. Plus, Keleton is an advanced city, and there's a lot to explore here. If the Torvada does return, it can place me a minute after I left to come to Earth. A good outlook. Everin faced Emily. I had another question, and if it bothers you, you do not need to reply. You know I'll answer whatever you want to ask, said Emily. I appreciate that, he said. This is in regard to your father's death. Did you notice anything unusual in the hours before he passed? Emily drew her head back. That was an unusual question, but it was an event that was seared into her mind. There was a power outage, and the room went dark about an hour or so before he died, she said. She played with her ponytail. Um, let's see. That's about the only thing I can recall.
Why do you ask? I was curious. She eyed him. Really? He half smiled. You know me too well. I do not know how much of our past the Time Wardens are aware of, but with someone like Antion around, it is possible they may have tried to interfere in the past. Perhaps they were stopped, and the end result was a simple blackout. You never observed my dad's passing? I assumed you would have since I traveled with you. I have not, as it is personal to you, and I respect that. Emily smiled. I wouldn't have minded if you did see it. I trust you. Thank you. I did not mean to drag up old feelings, but that was a pivotal moment in your life, and as I did not witness it, I was curious. I think it's safe to say they're messing around in the past, she said. To what extent? I don't know. But it was enough to have a star disappear. I have a bad feeling we're going to keep seeing these timeline changes. Jelton rubbed his chin. If Kelaton's plan works, they'll eventually get to Strand Space. It's possible there could be more changes as the Time Wardens won't know where to look. I hate them so much, said Emily. Understandable, said Everin. He stood. I will check on Dr. Snowden and Kess next. You are free to continue your activities on the couch. Emily's eyes widened. Huh? Everin half smiled at them and exited. Jelton lay down and pulled her on top of him. He did say we were free to continue. She straddled him. I guess so. No hiding anything from him. It seems that way. Let me put you in a better mood. Dr. Snowden had enjoyed Pizarra's presentation. Although he had spent three hours asking questions and watching, he was ready for more. But Pizarra had slowed down and Kess had nudged him. Emily and Jelton had left after two hours, and Everin and V after only an hour. Dr. Snowden had thanked Pizarra, and now he was with Kess on the platform high above the city they had visited earlier. He was content, and spicy tacos had made a solid dinner earlier. The civilizations were bizarre, but their descriptions were similar to others he had seen before. There were no other human ones, but there were plenty of humanoids. The strangest race was an advanced, bioengineered race. They had high regeneration, naturally strong body armor, and enhanced senses and intellect, and they could control organic swarms. Pizarra had said they were cold and logical, and used organic-based technology. How Kelatin would navigate all that remained a mystery. He had asked why Kelatin could not just skip the galaxy and fly away from it in a curve that would put it on a path to strand space. Pizarra had answered that it was easier to track a flight path in open space as opposed to a galaxy packed with civilizations and stellar phenomena. Going through the galaxy would hopefully obscure the galactic exit point. The journey would take a long time, and Dr. Snowden wondered if this was their final stop. As much as there was to learn... He would miss Earth. Thankfully, Kess and the rest of the gang would be with him, but he suspected he would get homesick. He leaned on the guardrail and stared out. Crazy time, huh? Oh, yeah, said Kess. She smiled. I think you wore Pizarra out. That's on me. There was just so much information there... I guess I could have looked it up, but it's another thing to talk to someone who really knows the material, said Dr. Snowden. Kess winked at him. Should I be worried she grabbed your attention? No need to worry about that. You're all I want. She leaned in and kissed him on the cheek. You always know the right thing to say. Well, I try. They laughed. Dr. Snowden turned his head to the side when he sensed Everin approaching. Hey, he stood to the right of him. I hope I am not disturbing you both. Kess reached over and swatted his arm. Never. You're always welcome. Thank you. I wanted to check in and see how you two were doing. Dr. Snowden shrugged. We've been in worse situations, and I'm still holding out hope that the Torvata returns. However, I'm thinking it's waiting for something to occur. Maybe the Hawkscris transformation event, whatever that turns out to be. I see, said Everin. 
he glanced at Kess. And you? I'm good. We'll resolve whatever is needed. Then we'll all go back to a moment before we left, like we always do. I know this group. And we'll come out on top. An optimistic outlook. Kess smirked. It's better than worrying about everything. I mean, it's good to be aware of the situation, but you can't let it bring you down. Dr. Snowden dipped his head toward her while looking at Everin. And that's just one thing that I love about her. Your love for her is undeniable, said Everin. Dr. Snowden gulped. He had never said the L word to her, although he felt it. He cast a quick side glance at her, and her smile melted his heart. You're making him sweat, she said. I apologize, said Everin. I did have another question related to Sarah's death. Dr. Snowden furrowed his brow. You did? Oh, that's kinda random. Perhaps. I never witnessed her death, but know it was when Emily was born. I assume you were there. Yeah, I was. Not a good day, let me tell you. It was one of the most painful ones, actually. Why the curiosity? Everin gazed out. We know the Time Wardens under Antion have been interfering with the past. I was curious if there was anything unusual around her passing or the hours leading up to it. Dr. Snowden grimaced. He remembered the day clearly. Dan, his brother, had worn a frozen face, yet a stream of tears had run nonstop for hours. Although he had been happy to see Emily, it had been tempered by Sarah's death. It had pained Dr. Snowden to see his brother in so much pain, and Sarah was a sister-in-law with whom he had become close. Yet out of all the chaos, Emily had arrived and had been a healthy baby. His voice wavered. That day was chaotic. But there was an unusual power surge after she had been declared dead. It was only a moment, but all the machines beeped like crazy. A blackout, asked Everin. Yeah. Similar to the one when Dan died. Dr. Snowden drew his head back. Huh. I never really thought about that. But yeah. Wait. You think they're related? Everin's eyes narrowed. Antion is interfering with history, and I was curious if he did so with our personal ones. If he had tried, then the power surges might have been the after-effect of whatever they tried being resolved. That was my thought, said Everin. It is perhaps nothing, as we do not know everything about Antion or the Time Wardens and their plan. Dr. Snowden shrugged. I guess we'll find out one way or another. Antion could also have just destroyed Earth. Indeed. Everin turned to leave. I will let Kess continue to tease you. What? asked Dr. Snowden with an amused look. Everin half smiled, then left. He likes to tease you, like me, said Kess. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheeks. Yeah, he does. She eyed him. I'm getting sleepy. But maybe the teasing can happen somewhere else. He examined her. Then his eyes widened. Oh, uh, yes, let's do that. Chapter 18 Jelton stared at the ceiling. The previous night had been fun, and he felt well arrested. Emily still slept, so he got up and went to the bathroom. As he washed up... He thought about how great it was to get to spend this much time with her. Whenever this summons was wrapped up, he would see where her mind was in regard to settling someplace. She seemed to enjoy the Rift Guardian lifestyle, so maybe she would want to go there. If she wanted to stay on Earth, that was okay with him as well. If she decided to continue traveling with Everin, then he would work in some type of scheduling similar to what he had now. Another topic that had consumed him as of late was that Emily had mentioned kids in the future. Rivens were created from crystals, but she said that Everin had indicated procreation was still possible. He had never considered having something created from him, but the more he saw of Earth culture, the better he understood it. The thought of offspring intrigued him. He checked his ARI, which showed Dr. Snowden and Kess sleeping, 
Everin and V were moving around with Pizarra across the city. Jelton wondered what they were doing, and it hit him that he did not know how the Hawkscurus slept. He knew they did, just not in an earth cycle. They could control when it was day and night, and he also realized he had not seen a night in Keleton. Emily yawned as she entered the bathroom, then gave him a quick peck on the cheek. Hey, rough night. She eyed him. You asking for more? He grinned as she slapped his rear. It was these small moments that he loved. After she stepped into the sonic shower, he joined her. After thirty minutes, they were in the central area of the gang's living quarters. Emily had a sausage burrito and orange juice. Jelton had a craving for bacon, so he had a biscuit with it and cheese and downed it with some water. Jelton's brow rose when Everin appeared as a floating holographic head off to the side. Emily must have called him. I hope you two slept well, said Everin. I tried, said Jelton. He crooked a thumb at Emily. She kept kicking me in her sleep. Everin half smiled at her. She shook her head. He's being silly. We both slept well. What are you up to? V and I are with Pizarra and touring some of the new upgrades throughout the city. Emily ran a hand over her neck. Sounds exciting. I do not believe you think so. She cracked up. <laughs> you got me. Everin furrowed his brow. As it is a relatively quiet moment, we can meet for lunch later. Works for me. There's a walkway on the perimeter of the base of the city I wanted to check out. Very well. Be safe and I will see you soon. Analysis, enjoy the walk, said V. Emily smiled. You got it. You two be safe. V can get wild. V tilted his head. Emily did a high five in the air. V returned it. Then the projection ended. You like to tease them. Don't you? asked Jelton. Oh, they know I do. They're probably wondering why you're in such a good mood. Emily smirked. They've already figured that out. Come on, let's check out that walkway. Jelton appreciated the bond he had formed with the gang. Everything was easy with them, and he felt like a part of the family. While he had battle bonds with his fellow Rift Guardians, he had one with the gang as well. After ten minutes, they were on their way, and it took another half hour to reach the walkway. It was about twenty feet wide and encircled the city's base. At certain intervals, there was a small platform that jutted out. It had seating and a console that allowed for viewing distant objects. Poles scattered around provided illumination, and getting to walk with Emily while holding her hand was more relaxing than Jelton had thought it would be. It was quiet, but there were a few hawkscurus that passed by. The only other traffic they encountered were robot sentinels and the occasional nanoswarm. Looking out into deep space showed its beauty, but he knew how deadly it could be. Timeline changes could make it even worse. If one hit while a temporally shielded person resided on a non-shielded ship, they would appear floating in space without any protection. Even if they had a suit on, it still would not help. Thankfully, Keleton was temporally shielded. Several drones had flown by, and one had paused to ask if they needed anything, Emily and Jelton had said no, but he wondered if it would have gone to a matter replicator for them. There was no need, as there were replicators spaced out evenly on the walls. He had stopped at one to get a drink to carry with them. This is so peaceful, said Emily. Jelton smiled. Yes, it is. They continued to walk over the next hour. Emily had reached out to Dr. Snowden and Kess, who were in the condensed space engine room, Dr. Snowden would never miss out on an opportunity to study one up close. He had agreed to meet up with everyone in a few hours for lunch, even if it was 12.10 p.m. already. It would be late, but she was okay with that. She stopped, grimaced, and placed a hand on her stomach. What's going on? he asked. Before she could reply, he felt it too. A timeline change was coming. She had noticed it before him, most likely due to having more cosmic energy. He gazed out at the endless, semi-transparent, metallic curtain that swept toward them. Emily motioned out. That. 
The timeline change passed. Jelton's eyes widened. There were Time Warden ships as far as the eye could see. More disturbing was the handful of massive vessels that had already bored a hole through the upper city's shields. He knew what came next. Brace yourself, he said. He rushed to the nearby wall with Emily. The first electromagnetic pulse hit hard. Several drones that had been out crashed. Although he was not robotic, he still felt the electromagnetic wave. Another one's coming, said Emily, wincing. Jelton braced himself as the second wave passed. The Time Wardens were playing tough this time around. There were two more pulses, and he was sure that outside of shielded areas, there would not be much working. Looking up verified that the city's topside was being blanketed by Time Wardens of all types, coming in via the breaches. Emily pointed at a small contingent of flying spider drones that flew down the side of the city's base. Jelton pulled out his pistol and shot one when it approached. Unfortunately, that made the others home in on them. Emily fired mist and stun beams, but some of the drones got through and crashed into her and Jelton. He used his energy dagger to slice an attacker, then stabbed another that had tried to use its sharp mandibles to bite Emily's face. She hopped up and formed her bladed staff. As each drone came close, she hit it, repositioned herself, then sliced another. Jelton recognized that state of mind in her. She was in battle mode. He gestured at an entrance back into the city a bit away. We need to get inside, where we're less exposed. She nodded and they took off. They had to fight several more drones before they arrived. However, a controller and six robot guards had landed in front of them. It puzzled him how the Time Wardens had been able to reach the walkway they were on so fast. Perhaps there were just so many, and with multiple EMP blasts, there wouldn't be much in the way of a topside resistance. Emily fired a repulsion beam, which blew back several robots. Jelton leapt into action, stabbing one robot, then kicking another away. The controller used two of the six arms on its back to knock him against the wall. As he tried to stand up, the appendages pierced his leg and arm. Emily swirled around with her bladed staff and sliced off the controller's head, causing the robots to stop moving. She grabbed the body and yanked it away. Jelton grimaced as the segmented arms were pulled out. That hurts! Emily checked out the wounds. Nothing fatal, it looks like. She helped him stand. Yeah, and let's be thankful the controller's arms weren't poisonous or something, he said. She peered up. More are coming. I don't know how we're going to handle all this, but we need to get to regroup with the others. She tried to contact Everin. Nothing. Jelton rubbed his wounds. I suspect he'd go to the delegate room. Or the cosmic shard room. Maybe even our living quarters. He took a deep breath. I go where you choose. She licked her lips. Let's head to the delegate room. That's where we went the last time there was a timeline change. Plus, that's probably where the Hawkscrew's delegates will go. All right. Lead on, he said. He followed her into the city base entrance. A final peek outside made his heart beat faster. They were outnumbered by a massive amount. The EMPs had most likely crippled everything. This was a no-win situation. It was only a matter of time. Even if the Toravada came back, it might be too late. If he had to die, he was at least glad it would be alongside Emily. Emily did not like their chances. She had seen Jelton look out right before they moved into the city base. He was most likely calculating their odds, and based on what she had witnessed, they were not good. Not only was the Toravada missing, but they were also cut off from the rest of the gang. She tried to reach Everin again, but to no avail. Her mind wandered to what Dr. Snowden and Kess were doing. They had woken up, had breakfast, and contacted her and Jelton before going to the condensed space engine room where the Time Wardens had attacked before. She tapped Jelton's arm. Change of plans. Uncle Albert and Kess are in the condensed space engine room. We should go there. Makes sense. Let's go, he said. Emily checked the map in her ARI to find the most efficient route. The engine room was on the other side of the city, and flying was not ideal unless it was in a shaft. The path she chose had them sticking to the main routes with one short hop across a shaft. I like the route, said Jelton. Let's hope there aren't too many time wardens in our way. She took off with Jelton in tow. 
The first part of the trip was down a major concourse. Hawkscrews were in their heavy armor, fighting time wardens. She assisted with Jelton and was able to free up resources to attack other enemies, controllers, soldiers, predators, and the flying, spider-like time wardens were represented, but she knew how to handle each. After twenty minutes of intense battle, the concourse had been cleared. The Hawkscrews had cheered her and Jelton, but this was only a temporary victory. As much as she wanted to stay and help more, she had to get to Dr. Snowden and Kess. She talked briefly with one of the leaders in the fight and relayed tactics on how to deal with the different types of time wardens. The next leg of the trip took them through several side hallways. They were mostly empty except for a hawkscurus here and there. She admired their spirit. Every citizen she had encountered had gotten their armor, even the few children out and about. She tried to keep a positive mindset, but the numbers were against them. Her blood had chilled when she had found out there were tens of thousands of ships out there. They reached one of the large shafts that allowed for travel between levels. After forming a flying platform, they descended fourteen levels and landed on a strip. Watch out, said Jelton as he yanked her back away from a dive-bombing time warden. She had sensed it too late and realized her distracted mind was affecting her. She stunned the attacker when it crashed, then kicked it into the shaft. You all right? he asked. She grimaced. Yeah. Was just thinking about the whole situation. He pulled her in and kissed her, then stepped back. Whatever it is, we're in this together. Her eyes misted as she ran a hand along his face. He was truly the one for her, through thick and thin. He inspected the area above them. Looks like more coming. Let's go. They burst into the entrance. Emily relaxed a bit when she checked the map. Dr. Snowden and Kess were only about ten minutes away, assuming no fights on the way. There were several large rooms they needed to pass through, and she suspected they would be similar to the concourse they had been in before. After a few moments, they reached the first room. It reminded her of a big cafeteria. However, it was sensing Dr. Snowden on the edges of her senses that made her smile. If she could sense him, then he would her. There were time wardens fighting Hawkscurus, who held the upper hand. She swatted Jelton's arm. Just like before. Let's get to it, he said. She surged into the first fight between a predator and two Hawkscurus in heavy armor. One had been stung, while the other sliced off the time warden's appendage. She leapt on top of the predator and jabbed her bladed staff down, causing the attacker to flail about before yellow goo oozed out. She scanned the paralyzed Hawkscurus, then faced the other. He'll be down for a bit, but he's still alive. Thank you, said the other, moving to pick up the downed one. A commotion across the room caught her attention. Hawkscurus were being tossed around and decimated with ease by a humanoid being. Emily gulped. It was Antion, and he shrugged off energy beams like they were nothing. Any person that got near him was killed. Although there were only a few time wardens left, they did not flee, but instead moved behind him. She had to do something. She fired a mist, then a stun beam. Antion tilted his head at her. She tried a repulse beam, but he did not budge. Antion moved toward her. So there you are. Two of Everin's group. Yeah, sucks to be you, said Emily. She fired sticky globules at his face. He pawed at the mess and his hands got stuck. What is this? She charged him with her shield out. When she smashed into him, he went flying. She pointed at the entrance while looking at the Hawkscurus in the room. Get out! They wasted no time in doing so. Jelton stood by her. Antion growled as he stood. The sticky globules burned off his face. Impressive. I haven't been hit hard enough to be moved in a long time. Why are you doing this? asked Emily. He stared at her. Isn't it obvious? Not really. No. 
He sneered. I understand. Your limited intellect holds you back. You may have cosmic energy, but you don't have cosmic thinking. That much is apparent. Nonetheless, you don't need to be alive for me to absorb your energy. Jelton scoffed. Huh, that's not happening. Tough talk from a Rift Guardian. Are you surprised I know what you are? I don't really care. Antion placed his hands behind his back. Then proceed with your best attack. Emily did not like the Everin mannerisms that Antion displayed. Although she could sense his power, she and Jelton were a powerful duo. She fired sticky globules at his face again, which he used his hands to block. She then spewed a deluge of the sticky mess at his feet and legs. Jelton took the opportunity to slip in and use his dual daggers to strike Antion's upper thigh. Antion buckled. Emily's pulse quickened as she formed her bladed staff. She went in to decapitate Antion. He rolled out of the way, then shouted as he stood. The sticky globules burned away. Jelton tried to stab him in the back. Antion zipped behind him, then punched through Jelton's chest. Emily's eyes widened as adrenaline surged through her. No, no! Antion tossed Jelton's lifeless body to the side. A fire inside her ignited, and she moved faster than she ever had. Her bladed staff pierced Antion, causing him to shudder. He twisted, which caused the PSD to be ripped out of her hand. After grabbing the staff, he pulled it out and tossed it away, then charged toward her. She yelled while engaging him in a series of kicks and hits, and was able to drive him back. Impressive, said Antion. He caught one of her hits, then broke her wrist. But still, ineffective. Emily cried out in surprise, then attempted to kick him. He punched her shin, smashing it, then delivered a kick that crushed her other leg. Then he tossed her to the ground. Emily struggled to breathe. She stared at Jelton's lifeless eyes. This could not be how their lives ended. They had barely even started their life together. Antion studied Jelton, then her. Ah, you two were romantically linked. That I did not know. That just makes this worse for you, but it doesn't matter now. You fought well in your futile attempt. Everin will avenge us, she said through bloody teeth. He is welcome to try. But like this exercise, he will fail, said Antion standing over her. Do you still have faith in him? Yes. And you're going to pay for this? Her cosmic nanobots attacked him, but turned black and fell like ash when touching him. Oh, now that's intriguing. Cosmic nanobots. It appears they know power when they see it. He said. He placed his foot on her head. As for paying for this? No. I don't think I will. As she stared at Jelton, what could have been flashed before her eyes. Joyous moments from better times in the past tried to comfort her, but the increasing pressure was not stopping. This was her deathbed. There was no one to help or save her. She was going to die. Alone. Chapter 19 Cass had slept well, and she enjoyed playing around with Dr. Snowden before sleeping. Although the beds did not have a neural effect like the ones on the Toravada, she was sure that what she did with him made it easier to sleep. 
He had wanted to go to the condensed space engine room today, and she was eager to see how Kelaton engineered their engine. She yawned and slipped out of bed. Dr. Snowden was still sleeping, and she found that unusual, as it was 10.30 a.m. Normally, he would be up and having coffee by 9 a.m., but no morning alarms had been set. She did not mind that, as there was nothing pressing, and if there was, Everin and V would contact them. After thirty minutes, she sat with Dr. Snowden out in the central area. She was not sure where Emily and Jelton were, or even Everin and V, for that matter. Dr. Snowden sipped his coffee. Ah, this never gets old. Kess dipped her head at his granola bar. That's new. I don't want something heavy for our trip to the condensed space engine room. He tapped at his PSD. Speaking of which, we should check in with Everin. Everin displayed as a floating head off to the side. It appears you both slept well. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Actually, yeah. I mean, it's not as good as the Torfata's beds, but these did just fine. Where is everyone? Emily and Jelton went for a walk along the city base's perimeter. V and I are with Pizarra and touring some of the city upgrades. Kess smiled. I hope Emily and Jelton enjoy their walk. As for us, we plan to go to the condensed space engine room. She crooked a thumb at Dr. Snowden. His curiosity is insatiable. Not going to pass an opportunity like that up, he said. Very well, said Everin. I told Emily and Jelton we could meet up for a late lunch today. Works for me. I'll reach out to them before we leave said Dr. Snowden. I will see you soon. Everin's projection vanished. Dr. Snowden looked around. Despite all the craziness going on, I feel like today will be one of many days where nothing attacks. Let's hope so, said Kess. After breakfast and contacting Emily and Jelton, she walked with him to the nearest transportation unit. The route to the condensed space engine room would have them dropping down a shaft, then a lengthy trip through the city block. It would not be as picturesque as what Emily and Jelton would see, but it could still be interesting. Dr. Snowden could barely contain himself. He loved researching things and asking questions, and she hoped their presence would not be too much of a distraction. While they could pull up the specs and look at them back in the living quarters, it was something else to talk to the engineers who worked there. Ordinus was meeting them there and would serve as a liaison. They reached one of the large shafts and took a platform down. Dr. Snowden gazed out. I love these big city shafts. It's such an efficient way to travel to any level in a big area like the city base. Kess swatted his arm. You just like to people watch, or Hawkscurus watch in this case. You got me. I also like seeing the various levels. On our last adventure, we went down something similar in a city called Changkata. The shafts there were much busier. She smiled. I read the details on that a bit ago. I'm intrigued by these Pigabot systems that were mentioned. Dr. Snowden eyed her. You thinking of an upgrade? Maybe a mix. We'll see. They're quite powerful but require more power from what I understand. Add that to the Hawkscurus miniaturization technology, and that would be a powerful combination. Imagine if each of your nanobots could grow to the size of baseballs with all sorts of functionality. Kess grinned. Now that would be interesting. She made a point to read up on the details of each adventure he had gone on. The Torvada had no issue with her doing so and he had also encouraged her on this. The gang's last adventure had been wild and involved meeting two more Torvadas Chosen and a cult of Everin fanatics known as the Everinites. Crazy was normal for the gang's summonses. The platform arrived at the level they needed to go to, and they disembarked. A short thirty-minute hike later, and they entered the condensed space engine room, Emily and Jelton had reached out to check in during their walk and mentioned they were enjoying it. It was now 12 o'clock p.m., and although Kess had had a light breakfast, like Dr. Snowden, 
Her stomach grumbled some, maybe due to Emily mentioning lunch. Kess smiled when Ordinus greeted them. Glad you're here, said Ordinus. I am too, said Dr. Snowden. Kess sighed him. I am, really. He motioned at a massive elliptical object hovering in the distance. Is that it? Ordinus smiled. Sure is. Come on. Kess followed them to the object. It was like someone had taken a cylinder, held the center, then pulled on each end and manipulated them into cone shapes. Several thick bands encircled the middle, and a series of massive pipes were bolted underneath it. So this creates the condensed space bubble, said Dr. Snowden. It sure does, said Ordinus. Everin mentioned the shield configuration to reach the second level of condensed space, but it's only virtual for the moment. What we have here is enough to form the bubble with a generic shielding configuration that allows us to phase into condensed space. That's standard in my era as well, said Kess. Ordinus nodded. Now we know that the vibration pattern matters and determines which level of condensed space we phase into. If we weren't under potential attack, I'd love to try it out physically. But first, we need to get this up and running. Although we'll still use level 1 condensed space for Keleton for now, I think this is our next step. It looks fine, said Dr. Snowden. Sadly, it was damaged in the last attack, said Ordinus. The Time Wardens disrupted parts outside this room, and they caused some damage here, although it's been mostly repaired. We'll have it up and running in a few days. Then I guess we'll be moving somewhere other than here. Dr. Snowden winced as he doubled over. What happened? asked Kess, laying a hand on his back. Timeline change coming, said Dr. Snowden, straightening back up. And it just passed through. I felt it too, said Ordinus, grimacing. Kess had not felt anything, but she did not have cosmic energy. However, a blaring alarm indicated that something was off. Ordinus frowned. Communications are down, but Pizarro was able to send this message. Kess's stomach churned when she saw thousands of ships outside Keleton. Several massive cruisers had already attached to the shielding and created openings. The picture showed a series of EMP devices being tossed in. The room rumbled as the EMP waves hit. Okay, that's not good, said Dr. Snowden. Ordinus growled. And now we're under attack again. These time wardens are persistent, and I'm sure they're on their way here. Kess cracked her neck. Then we'll teach them another lesson. Dr. Snowden had been horrified at what he had seen in the image. There was no way Keleton was going to survive that. He appreciated Kess's bravado, which was one of the things he loved about her, but there were simply too many time wardens. Add in multiple EMP blasts to a city that had not recovered from the previous ones, and it was a recipe for disaster. The room burst into action. Thankfully, there was protection against the waves this far down, but outside the area was havoc. Backup systems kicked in only to shut off. The doors to the room were still broken, so they could not seal the place. Hawkscurus went to nearby pods and donned their battle armor. It impressed Dr. Snowden that even the engineers were ready to fight. He had tried to contact Everin and V, but had been unable to. At least they knew where he was, as did Emily and Jelton. Dr. Snowden briefly considered trying to reach them, but that could be even more dangerous if they moved. He suspected they would come to where he and Kess were, as it was a known point by all. He activated his energy shield. I guess we hold this area. Everin, V, Emily, and Jelton will probably come to us. It's the one place they know we're at, said Kess. My thought exactly. Dr. Snowden licked his lips at the sound emanating from outside the room. The Time Wardens were returning to cause more damage. So far, the resistance inside the city base had been solid enough to keep the enemies away from his current location. There was a steady trickle of Hoxgerus filing in as they got pushed back from outside the room. It was obvious that at some point, the outside hallway would not be controlled, and the fight would move to where he and the others were inside. There was no way they could hold out against so many. Even if Everin, V, Emily, and Jelton arrived, they'd get swarmed eventually. 
Dr. Snowden tried to push the thoughts out of his head. He always had the thought of the Torvada being available to rescue them out of bad situations as needed, but that option was gone. After thirty minutes, the Time Wardens had pushed to the room's entrance. The first ones through were controllers and their robot guards, but they fell due to focused fire on a choke point. The other attackers had fired into the room, but the erected shield barriers and shields on other objects blunted that assault. Heavier, spider-like soldiers barged in, only to get bogged down. However, the Time Wardens behind them used their bodies as natural shields and surged forward. Dr. Snowden had a workout in firing on the small drones that burst in. Kess was busy trying to push back the assailants, while the Hawkskurs fired on anything that got through and scaled the walls or tried to take down a shield barrier. After another fifteen minutes, Dr. Snowden's nerves were on edge. However, he detected Emily on the periphery of his senses. Although he could not generally sense as much as Everin, or even Dalton Kingston, with Emily it was different. Dr. Snowden's connection with her allowed him to feel her much farther away. He smiled for the first time since the Time Wardens had arrived. Her presence made everything feel like it would be okay, and they could use her in Jelton's presence. Emily and Jelton are coming, he said. Kess swatted away a predator. Good, we need them. They must have fought through a lot to get where they are. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. Whoa, sensing another powerful presence. But it's not Everin. You think it's Antion? I don't know. But if it is, Emily will probably bring him here for us to team up. Let's hope so, said Kess. We need to push these time wardens back here some. She flew to the entrance and aimed her arms forward. Two columns of nanobots speared everything in front of her. It gave the defenders a moment to catch their breath. After a minute, Dr. Snowden's nose flared. Emily's presence had gone to almost nothing. The sudden drop was not like she had moved away. It was more as if she had been downed. We got to go to them, he said, barreling out of the room. Wait, said Kess, following him. He focused and homed in on Emily's location. His heart beat furiously as he neared her diminishing presence. Although he tried to concentrate on getting there, his mind tried to make sense of what could be going on. Kess had caught up to him, and together they knocked any time wardens out of the way. After five minutes, they reached a large, cafeteria-like room. Dr. Snowden struggled to breathe when he saw Emily on the ground with her head smashed in. Emily! He said as he charged over to her. He tried to cradle her, but her head was in pieces. Looking around, he saw Jelton's lifeless body with a hole in it. Dr. Snowden's cosmic energy surged in him as he stared at the man standing casually in the middle of the room with his hands behind his back. It was Antion. If it helps, they fought well for such limited beings, said Antion. I'm going to kill you, said Dr. Snowden, jumping and charging him. Antion reached out to block the charge, but Dr. Snowden ducked under and slammed him in the chest, sending him sprawling. Kess stood next to Dr. Snowden. Albert, we need to wait for Everin. We can't win this alone. He gritted his teeth and said, he dies now. His only thought was the utter dismantling of Antion. There would be no trace of his existence. Dr. Snowden's blood boiled, and his laser focus was on how to slam into Antion at an angle that would cause his neck to snap. Antion stood, then stared at Dr. Snowden, barreling down on him. When close, Antion punched Dr. Snowden's shield, sending him flying across the room. Albert, said Kess. She formed a large hand with her nanoswarm and caught him before he smashed into the wall. Dr. Snowden shook his head. The punch had surprised him, and had Kess not caught him, he could have smashed all his bones. His breath stopped as he watched Antion rush up to Kess, who was still struggling to maintain her nanoswarm. No! Kess! She turned her head in surprise as Antion grabbed her by the legs and pulled back, then slammed her into the ground. She tried to crawl toward Dr. Snowden. He stood and rushed toward her. Antion hopped up and put a foot on her back. 
Her eyes misted as her face contorted in pain. She reached out to Dr. Snowden. I love you. Crack. Everything moved in slow motion as Antion's foot went through her back. Dr. Snowden howled as he charged over and tried to slam Antion, who had stepped out of the way. He grabbed Dr. Snowden by the neck, then lifted him. Dr. Snowden bit his tongue, then spit cosmic nanobots out. They swirled around but turned black before becoming dust when they touched Antion. Impressive, he said. She made herself vulnerable to protect you. A truly selfless act, if not efficient. You should have run, like she suggested initially. But why do you care what she wants? Dr. Stoughton tried to break Antion's grip. You killed them! Why? I wouldn't expect you to understand, and I really don't care to explain it to you. Everin and V will come, then I can move on the next step. Your cosmic energy will be a nice snack, and your death will add to the beacon to get Everin here. Dr. Snowden's head still reeled from the loss of Emily, Kess, and Jelton. This was not how everything was supposed to end. The pressure on his neck was overpowering and increasing, and there was no way to escape it. His eyes were glued to Kess's corpse. Memories of the good times they had shared and the plans they had made flashed through his mind. He had never gotten to tell her he loved her. That opportunity was gone. Forever. V had been surprised at the number of Time Warden ships that had appeared. He was with Everin and Pizarra on the far side of the city, relative to the gang's living quarters, and they were touring some recent upgrades. While they were not fully complete, the Hawkscurus had made a lot of progress. However, the timeline change came before many upgrades were complete. The sheer number of ships indicated that the first Time Warden attack had given enough information to the past in order for the Time Wardens to appear with the number he now saw. Giant rings were all over the shields, and multiple teardrop-shaped EMP bombs had flown in. He was mostly protected from EMP blasts, but these were powerful, and due to several going off, they had impacted him some. The last bomb made him seize up, and Everin whisked him away inside a protected building. It did not take long for V to get back to his normal operating state, but if he was that affected with strong shielding, then everything else that was less shielded would be devastated. Everin had tried to reach the rest of the gang, but was unable to. Usually the Torvada could act as a relay, but it was gone. It was strange that the link for translation was still active, but they could not piggyback on that. Pizarra peeked outside. There's so many. Everin stood next to her. Indeed, an evacuation to the city's base should be initiated. It is easier to defend there. I can do that. I suppose you want to go after your group. I do. And I think Emily and Jelton would be going to the condensed space engine room, where Dr. Snowden and Kess are. Pizarra laid a hand on his arm. Go to them. I'll help coordinate defenses for the city. As if on cue, several Hawkscurus rushed up to her. We will be fine, said Everin. She took off with her escort. Let us go, said Everin. The trip to the condensed space engine room would be a long one. They had to cross the city, descend down a shaft, then go a bit farther to reach the room. Flying through the air for the first part would not be possible due to the Time Wardens controlling it. Even going across the top side would slow them down. The most efficient path was to take a series of passageways inside the city block. It was a longer route, but it should be less busy. They delved deeper into the building they were in until they reached a ramp down to the first level of Keleton's base. Everin's cosmic energy pulsated, something V associated with annoyance. That manifested in the dismantling of the few controllers they came across. Everin went through them as if they were nothing. A Time Warden soldier and Predator had even shown up, but he had jumped over them while spearing them in the process. 
V had that same sense of urgency. Not knowing the status of the rest of the gang while a major assault was going on made his orb pulse. Although he respected Dr. Snowden, Emily, Kess, and Jelton's ability to fight, this battle would be much more intense than the previous Time Warden incursion. After two hours, they reached the shaft. On the way there, they had stopped to help a few pockets of the Hawkscurus defense. They were tough, and between their energy barriers, robot sentinels, heavy armor, nanoswarms, and advanced weaponry, they were holding almost every entrance without too much difficulty. Unfortunately, there was a massive army dropping in topside. Everin and V jumped into the shaft, then grappled to the level they needed to get to. The condensed space engine room was not too far away. Everin paused when his cosmic energy spiked. V could not sense as far compared to Everin, but whatever he had detected led him to make a directional change. Query, is everything okay? No. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Jelton's cosmic energy has been diminished. V hustled after Everin as he hurtled Time Wardens and dismantled the others. Diminished in what way? Death. V's orb pulsed chaotically. The probability that they would be dead was low, and now it seemed certain, unless Everin's senses were wrong, which would be highly unusual. The thought of never seeing the rest of the gang was not one he was willing to entertain. Focus, said Everin. We must go to them, said V. We will get there. V struggled to cope with his orb pulsing. He attributed it to sadness, but there was another component that wanted to get revenge on whoever was responsible for the other's deaths. This assumed they were dead. It could be something else, although a low probability it was one he wanted. After five minutes, they reached a cafeteria-like room. V recognized Antion immediately, but V's focus was on seeing Emily on the ground with her head bashed in. His orb fluctuated out of control, and even more so when he saw Dr. Snowden's corpse and Kess and Jelton with holes in them. V confirmed they were all dead. A segmented tendril came out of his shoulder and shot a stun beam at Antion. He laughed. You can stop with that. Or any of your other little beams. They have no impact on me. Everin inspected the gang's remains, then concentrated on Antion. Why did you kill them? They are of little consequence. Oh, yes. They did attack me, which was foolish. His eyes narrowed. They fought well for lesser beings, if that's of importance to you. You have crossed my line, said Everin. Antion harumped. I'm not worried about that. You're remarkably calm, outwardly, as someone of your status would be. Yet your cosmic energy tells a different story. Are you surprised I can sense it? Everin stared at him. You have cosmic energy. So no, I am not. You will be dealt with. But before that, I am curious where you got your energy from. Antion grinned big. I love this. Being able to talk to someone of almost equal power is rare for me. He wagged a finger. But I know you have an idea of where I got my energy from. It was your other form that entered the plane. V recalled that eight plane forms had entered the plane at different times. Everin was Everin Prime, the first. The gang had met Siverin, who was the sixth, and Leverin, who was the eighth. Antion only knew there were two forms, the one he had interacted with, and this one. I see, said Everin. You fought my second form. What happened? Antion scoffed. Only a fight makes it sound trivial compared to what it was. He raised his head a bit. We will battle. 
and I will triumph due to my superior strength and speed. However, I'm enjoying this banter. We can proceed to fight, or I can tell you what happened. Your decision. Everin gestured at him. As I mentioned earlier, you will answer for these deaths. However, I cannot revive them at the moment, so I would like to hear about my second form. I assumed you killed him or her. It was a him, said Antion. I already like you and pity that you'll die. Nonetheless, I was a sentient dimension, peaceful in my own limited knowledge and reality. He motioned around until a rift allowed me to experience this reality. I devoured a civilization on a planet and learned so much. Your other form arrived and fought me, although it would be better described as he closed the rift and sealed me away, but not before I grabbed him. He would have battled you to the end, said Everin. Antion smirked. That is exactly what he did. However, over a millennium, I wore him down. Enough so that I could absorb his essence. He scowled. But he played a cruel trick on me. After his absorption, I was kicked out to this reality. He ran a hand over his body. And then I was bound to this ridiculous form. I won't make that mistake with you. So you plan to absorb my cosmic energy? Yours, your friends, these beings, and yes, the cosmic shards. I will evolve and escape this physical prison all realities will open to me. Everin tilted his head. It is evident that you do not know what it means to be an Everin. Of course I don't. You're an inferior species. Why would I lower myself? Everin half smiled. I am not a species. Something you will learn more about momentarily... Antion hesitated. You have another trick. You took away one of my forms and my family. I cannot allow either, but you also left me with only one option. Everin projected as a hologram in V's ARI. I want you to know that you are my brother, and I will see you again. V's orb pulsated. Query, what are you doing? What is necessary? Antion cannot be allowed to access your cosmic energy. Do you trust me? Of course. Execute program 75ME. V knew that as a permanent system shutdown. Acknowledged. My brother. Antion rushed over and grabbed Everin by the neck and tried to lift him. What are you up to? A shifting golden aura surrounded Everin while small tendrils arced out. Something you would know if you ever had a family. Sacrifice. He hit Antion's chest, causing him to sprawl away. Antion hopped back up and dashed over. V's orb went wild when a burst of gold energy washed over Everin as he deflated like a balloon. Antion was left picking up and holding a limp suit that had nothing in it. V also sensed that Everin's energy was gone. V was alone, and although everything in him wanted to fight Antion, V would follow Everin, even into death. Antion thrashed Everin's form around. What is this? He glared at V. Speak. Analysis. You do not deserve a goodbye. Bad bye. V executed program 75 ME. 
He felt his body disconnecting from his orb and his outer layer beginning to dissipate from his nanobot swarm. Soon, his orb would crack and he would be no more. He was not sure if he would be able to reform under these circumstances, but he trusted Everin. Antion rushed toward V. Everything went black. Chapter 20 Dr. Snowden snorted as he awoke from what felt like a nap. He floated in pitch black, and he was not sure what was going on. One moment he was being choked to death. The next, he was here. He tapped his arm to ensure he could sense something, and thankfully he could. It was warm wherever he was. It was like he was in a sensory deprivation tank. Maybe he had survived, but was now blind and deaf. He figured there should be pain. But there was none. He checked his throat, and it was fine. A glimmer of light caught his eye. It started small, then began to grow around him in a sphere. Despite being alarmed, his body was relaxed. When the light had encompassed him, he closed his eyes and yelled out when he felt a crushing pressure. Relax, said Everin. Dr. Snowden opened his eyes. Hearing him or anything was comforting. He stared at his hand, which was glowing with golden energy that pulsed and moved around. When he raised his head, he saw that Everin was a being of pure energy, yet still in his humanoid form. There was a weightlessness to Dr. Snowden's body, and he felt like he could fly away. As he acclimated to the environment, his humanoid form faded away, and he morphed into a spherical shape with tentacles that he could control. It was an odd feeling. Focus on your human form, said Everin. Dr. Snowden complied, and when he examined his body, he was back in his humanoid shape. He imagined his clothing that he wore when he taught, and it replaced the light being form he had. His brown pants, white shirt with a brown vest, bow tie, and jacket covered him. He stared at Everin. What's going on? You died, said Everin. Dr. Snowden gulped. Okay, so what's all this? Everin dipped his head at Emily, who was fluctuating between a spherical form and her human one. I have stopped time for a moment. When the others have adjusted, I will explain. Dr. Snowden rushed over to her when she formed her human form. Uncle Albert, she said, embracing him when he ran over. Dr. Snowden shuddered when he held her. He did not need to imagine her corpse since it was still on the ground. A quick check showed that his body was also there. This is a strange sensation, said Jelton, stumbling over to Emily. Jelton? She hugged him tight as tears flowed down her cheek. It's an unusual situation, said V, looking around. V, said Emily, jumping over to him with a bear hug. Dr. Snowden high-fived V, then searched the surroundings until he found Kess. But only her corpse was present. What about Kess? Oh no, said Emily, rushing over to Kess's body. Dr. Snowden stared at Antion, who was frozen in place. He killed her! He rushed toward Antion. Wait, said Everin. Dr. Snowden paused but continued to glare at Antion. Everin extended his hand, palm forward. Let me explain the situation. Yes, you all died. I also sacrificed my plane form, and I'm at that point where I have planner-wide powers. However, I'm not responsible for your conversions to quasi-cosmic beings. Your APRs are currently at 28, and you'll be ejected from the plane shortly. You all touched the cosmic shard and formed a bond. Although your physical forms have perished, your cosmic energy merged with some from the shard, and you evolved. So, we're Hoxgaris? asked Emily. No, but you are quasi-cosmic beings now. The Keleton Hoxgaris are still dead. Dr. Snowden frowned. Like Kess, what can we do? Can you resurrect them? Although I am powerful in this state, I can't bring someone back from the life layer. However, he extended his arm up at a 45-degree angle. The Torvada melted its way in, 
then paused in the same orientation as his arm. A rod fell out and Everin captured it. The cosmic artifact, said Emily. Everin handed it to Dr. Snowden. With this, you will temporarily be over 40 APR, an intermediate cosmic being like myself in this form. At that point, you can do anything you want. But you could too, said Emily. Yes, but a plain denizen should make the decisions, not a celestial like myself. All right. Dr. Snowden held the cosmic artifact. He sensed the power it radiated. So, how do I bring someone back? Individually, you can't. However, with the four of you, Dr. Snowden licked his lips, then focused on the others. I think I know how we can do this. If we all touch it, then think of cosmic energy like lightning bolts. Then whoever it zaps can rise. He glanced at Everin. That's how the Hawkscrews we knew were created, right? I can't say, said Everin. Jelton pointed at him. You sound different. I don't have a Torvada communication filter. Dr. Snowden gazed around the group, then extended the cosmic artifact. Emily, Jelton, and V each placed a hand on it. Okay, said Dr. Snowden. In my dream with Leverin, long ago, I was able to bring those back who had died. Technically, their 3L is still tied to them for a short while, said Everin. Right. So I'm thinking we think of the cosmic artifact reaching out across the city and bringing back the Hawkscris and Kess. Emily beamed. Let's do this. I'm ready, my friend, said Jelton. I am as well, said V. Be aware that by doing so, you will use up most of the cosmic shard, said Everin. Dr. Snowden nodded. It's worth it. Everin dipped his head. Dr. Snowden closed his eyes. The amount of power between them and the cosmic artifact was palpable. He concentrated on an arc of cosmic energy hitting Kess, then reviving her. Then he concentrated on sending out a general strand that broke apart into smaller ones and sought out any Hawkscris it could find. It amazed him that he could see every single one. There was a strange bubble on the far side of the city he could not penetrate, and he was not sure what it was, but it had to be powerful to avoid being penetrated. It was like the bubble had absorbed the cosmic energy tendril. He hoped it was not Antion, but he was frozen in place. Albert? Dr. Snowden's eyes popped open. He peeked over at Kess, and a wave of relief swept over him. He extended his free hand, and she rushed over to grab it, then hugged him from the side. I love you, he said. She ran a hand across his face. I know. They kissed deeply. Despite the momentary switch of his focus, he was still able to sense that the cosmic strands had touched every Hawkscris. Emily, Jelton, and V removed their hands. I think we did it, said Dr. Snowden. Emily rushed over to embrace Kess, who returned it. Then Kess did the same to Everin, Jelton, and V. Kess stared at Everin. You're in a pure energy form. I am, he said. I'm at the point prior to plane ejection where I have more power. Her eyes bored a hole through Antion. And what of him? Dr. Snowden tilted his head. Oh, I have an idea. The cosmic shard may have been mostly used up, but it really just transferred cosmic energy, and this artifact still has quite a bit in it. He walked over and laid the end of the cosmic artifact on Antion's shoulder. Cosmic energy crackled everywhere on his body before rushing to the artifact. He doesn't deserve a quick death. Maybe being mortal will give him time to think, said Dr. Snowden. He handed the artifact back to Everin. It's what you would do, and I agree with it. I think we know where his cosmic energy and that of the shard ends up, and where the cosmic artifact needs to go. Wartax, said Emily. So we did give him cosmic energy. It would seem so, said Everin. 
This also means we leave the cosmic artifact to be found. An information paradox, said Dr. Snowden. We found it, used it, then we'll put it back in time so we find it. When and where was it created? Everin tilted his head toward the Toravada. I suspect it sustains the paradox. Emily scowled at it. And where were you in all this? The Torvada hung silently. The Torvada had a part to play in this, said Everin. Please don't be angry at it. Emily's nostrils flared. Then she ran up and hugged Everin. I'm just glad you're here. You sacrificed yourself for this moment. The others walked over and embraced Everin. He rubbed their backs before they stepped away. Of course I did. We're the gang, said Everin, smiling. It's so weird to hear and see you without the Toravada filter. But I like it, said Kess. I'm glad you like it, he said. I do need to speak with the Hawkscurus. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. How are you going to do that? As they are all quasi-cosmic beings such as yourselves, I can reach all of them. This'll be interesting, said Dr. Snowden. He was curious as to what Everin had to say. He was also ecstatic that Kess was back. It was a new chapter in his existence. He recalled Leverin saying death was a phase, and he understood that much better now. There would be a learning curve getting used to an energy form, and he remembered when Murukan from a previous adventure had had to undergo a similar process. Dr. Snowden stared at Antion, who would live as a mortal so that he could reflect on his crimes. Dr. Snowden figured they could drop him off at an uninhabited world with a locked-down matter replicator for basic food and water. It would be simple to kill him. Dr. Snowden knew he could flick a finger and punch a hole through Antion, but that would only give him an easy way out. For now, Dr. Snowden looked toward the future. Emily could now sense all the Hawkscurus, despite them being everywhere across Keleton. She was both physically in the cafeteria-like room where she had died, and yet also in a pitch-black space. Time was still frozen, despite the Hawkscurus and the rest of the gang being active. Every Hawkscurus was present, and to her side was the rest of the gang. All were in their pure light humanoid forms. She had seen that before when they had assisted at Everin and Leverin when dealing with matter mages and the time wardens. Pizarra flew over to her and swept her gaze across the group. You saved us! Dr. Snowden waved a finger around. It was all of us! Kess singled him, Emily, Jelton, and V out. These four, actually, with a cosmic artifact. I was part of the resurrection. We'll never forget this, said Pizarra. I hope not. And as you're already aware, I have sent each of you a knowledge primer on what you are, said Everin. Pizarra smiled. We're quasi-cosmic beings now. Yes, and the Time Wardens won't bother you ever again. However, since you are now elevated, the plane will kick you out, but my main form is awaiting you. You will travel with me, assuming you wish to do so. A cheer erupted from the other Hawkscurus. However, before you go, there are some actions that need to be performed. Everin raised a finger. First, you all will remove the Time Wardens from this timeline, including those here now. That won't be a problem, said Pizarra, scowling. He raised a second finger. Then you will use their rift portal to find others in order to spread the seed of humanity. I have already given you what you need for that. I can't tell you where or when to do, since that is a part of this time loop. He waved his finger between Dr. Snowden and Emily. However, you know what the intermediate and end results are. It has been decreed. We abide by the will of Everin, chanted the other Hawkscurus. Emily recalled them saying that from a previous adventure when Leverin had had them verify they were not going to kill matter mages. I'm guessing then that I'll see you all again in your past, asked Pizarra. Yes, you will, said Dr. Snowden. She faced Antion. He's mortal now. What's the plan for him? Everin snapped his fingers. Emily's eyes widened. They were on a prairie on some planet. 
A sun provided warmth, and she felt like she could zoom around if she wanted to. A matter replicator unit was anchored to the ground, and Antion stood frozen next to it. Where are we? she asked. Everin gazed off into the distance. One of the last few planets in the brief window of time that life exists. The nearest civilization is over 800 million light-years away. Bazara turned her head slowly to look at him. He's going to live out his life here. Without cosmic energy. Yes. Is everyone ready? asked Everin. Let's do this, said Emily. Very well. Everin snapped again. Antion shook his head, then surveyed his surroundings in confusion. What is this? Your punishment. Antion stared at Dr. Snowden, then Emily, Jelton, and Kess. I killed you all. Apparently so, said Dr. Snowden. Antion gazed at the sea of Hoxgris, then squeezed his arms. I... I can't feel my cosmic energy. What did you do to me? You were a bad steward of cosmic energy, said Everin. It's been taken away. You're mortal now, and will spend the remainder of your short life here. The matter replicator can provide you with basic food and water, and it's not programmable. You'll need to put in effort to supply it with matter to disassemble. I will not live like a mortal, said Antion, rushing toward Everin. Everin's eyes glowed, causing Antion to freeze, then step back into a pose with his arms to his side. You will. You had an opportunity to help those without your power. Instead, you chose malice. You then proceeded to attack and kill my friends and family. That can't and won't stand. Antion winced. What? What, what is this strange sensation in my stomach? Hunger, said Everin. You'll need sustenance now. Antion growled. I didn't ask for any of this. Perhaps not. But you showed who you truly are, said Everin. This is the last time you'll see anyone. Ever. He snapped his fingers and they were back in the pitch black space with the rest of the Hawksgurus. A fitting fate, said Pizarra. Do you think he'll ever be remorseful? I don't. But I have to give him the opportunity to think about it in this state. Everin gazed upon the Hawksgurus. I hope your last journey on this plane is a good one. When you exit, my main form will be there to greet you. They bowed their heads and left, except for Pizarra. She rushed over and hugged Everin. Thank you for everything. We'll abide by your will. He embraced her. I know you will, and I look forward to our future journeys together. Pizarra went around hugging the rest of the gang. You all are so important to me, and to the Hawksgris. We'll never forget you. The noble Everin, the great Dr. Snowden, the heroic Emily, and the valiant V. And you will see them again when you exit the plane, said Everin. Pizarra's eyes misted. I can't wait to travel with the gang. Your names will be whispered through time. Dr. Snowden snapped his fingers. So this is where that adjective thing came from. Indeed said Everin. He faced Pizarra. Good luck on your next step. She bowed slightly, then shimmered and dissipated. Emily frowned. Wish we could see where she and all the rest of the Hawksgris go. We can view that when we leave the plane, said Everin. So is that our next step? asked Jelton. Everin's eyes glowed. Not quite. We have some time left, and I think we should visit those that we can before then. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. That's a good idea. Are we using the Tor Vata? There's no need for that in my current state. All right. Emily furrowed her brow. So, who do we visit first? Chapter 21 
Jay Bierman kicked back in his lounge chair in the backyard of his new house. The Earth Ward had been kind to him and his family. Everett had pulled some strings, and now Jay was a district manager for the Earth Ward Transportation Division. His pay was far more generous than he could have ever imagined. He had been content to make eighty to a hundred thousand driving, but it took a lot of effort, and due to maintenance, he barely came out ahead. Not only that, but with having a kid, being gone for so long was rough for the family. Now he cleared three hundred thousand and was able to work from home for the most part. His new house had a dedicated work office, and he enjoyed making visits to field offices. Everin also ensured that if Jay really wanted anything outside his normal means, he would get it. Jay took a swig of his beer, then lit a cigar. It still boggled his mind that driving down a stretch of highway where he had been abducted along with Sanjay Chandrakar, Dr. Albert Snowden, and his niece, Emily, had resulted in his current situation. He rubbed his arm that had been lost when being rescued by Everin and V., they had regrown it over the course of a month, and it was much better than before. Most of his body was. He had had some underlying health issues that had also been resolved. He had been meaning to reach out to them to have a cookout. Dr. Snowden had become a good friend, and Jay felt like he always learned something new when talking with him. Emily had changed a lot from when he had first met her. She was tough, resilient, smart, pretty, and... Most importantly, his friend. Everin was the same as expected, and that provided a comforting thought. V, or Blue Ball as Jay called him, was becoming more human. Some of his jokes even landed. Life was good, the best he had ever known it. All he had to do was get picked up by bug-like aliens, tossed into another galaxy, and jumped forward in time, then survive a bloodthirsty mercenary group. He frowned when he thought of Sanjay, who had not made it. He had been young and had his whole life ahead of him. It still bothered Jay that he had been hard on him. Although Jay had tried to apologize, Sanjay had taken a headshot. Jay shuddered. He jumped when Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, V, Jelton, and Kess popped up in front of him. They had a slight glow to them, and the mosquitoes and other bugs cleared a path. Jay had only recently learned of Jelton and Kess, and he was glad they had relationships. Doc! Blue ball! said Jay. He hopped up and slapped hands with Dr. Snowden, then gave him a half hug before high fiving V. Emily got a swift tug, and Everin, Jelton, and Kess received handshakes. Dr. Snowden laughed. <laughs> Jay, it's good to see you. Always good to see you all, said Jay. He furrowed his brow. I didn't even hear the Torvada landing or you guys walking here. I've only had one beer. We didn't use the Torvada, said Emily. She crooked her thumb at Everin. He's just snapping us around. Huh, how are you doing that? We died, said Everin. Nonetheless, it's great to see you. I'm at a point where I have planner-wide powers, and before we go, we have this opportunity to visit friends and say goodbye. What? Jay's throat constricted. Y'all died? Yeah, and it sucked, said Emily. How'd it happen? Everin eyed the group. It's best if we don't discuss details. All right, said Jay. His heart pumped furiously as he ran a hand over his mouth. This was not the news he had ever wanted to hear but he had suspected he might someday. However, he did not think they would just appear out of nowhere to say goodbye. He frowned as he motioned at Everin. Well, shit. And you said you can't stick around? Unfortunately not, he said. Due to what everyone is, the plane will eject us. Jay's eyes misted. So, this is the last time I'll see you all. Everin and I will return in new forms, said V. His lights dimmed. Dr. Snowden, Emily, Kess, and Jelton might be able to come back on the Torvata if it allows that, but they wouldn't be able to leave it. Jay sighed. And Jelton and Kess? 
I heard so much about you two and was excited to get to know you both. I've only seen pictures. I guess that's all gone. Jelton laid a hand on Jay's shoulder. Know that although we have just met, I consider you a friend. Same, said Cass. I appreciate that, said Jay. He grimaced. Please tell me this isn't happening, man. This has to be a joke, right? I'm afraid not, said Everin. The moment hit Jay like a dump truck. He was taking his last look at his friends, which was not how he envisioned his night going. It made him realize that if he had stayed on with traveling, this might have been his fate. He sat back down. I... I wasn't expecting this tonight. Everin waved his hand out and created additional chairs. We can sit and enjoy the night while we can. Everin took their seats. Got another beer? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin motioned at a spot next to Jay. A cooler with beer materialized. Jay reached in and then tossed a cold beer at Dr. Snowden. At least we have this moment. Here, here, said Dr. Snowden, lifting a beer up. Everin waved a hand at Jay. He studied the glowing gray marble with a hole in it that appeared in his lap. What's this? A way to recognize another one of my forms. It will glow in my presence, or that of a hawksgris. You can put a string or whatever you wish through the hole. Jay rubbed the marble. I know you'll be back, like you said, but do you plan on stopping by? I'd like to, said V. As would I, said Everin. Jay swallowed hard. I'd like that. He glanced at the others. I wish you all would come back, too. It'll be rough for us, too, said Dr. Snowden. All we can do is learn, adapt, evolve. The Snowden Creed, said Jay. I may get a tattoo of that. Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> Let's not get wild now. Kess tilted her head at Jay. So I've heard about when you first met Albert, Emily, Everin, and V. I'm curious to hear your version of events. Jay grinned. How much time you got? Literally. We have enough, said Everin. Please proceed. All right. It felt good to go out on a somewhat positive note, but Jay still did not like that they had died and were leaving. There was nothing he could do about it, and he was honored that they considered him enough of a friend to visit and notify him. There would be a new Everin and V, and Jay hoped that he would get to meet them. For now, he had a story to tell. Jane Trellis grimaced when she took stock of her team's situation. She and five other United Planets Bureau of Law Enforcement agents had been assigned to investigate a science station on a remote ice world after its inhabitants had not checked in for two weeks. She was team lead, and although most of these types of investigations were due to an infrastructure issue, her team had been the closest. However, what they found was a ground base where everyone had been slaughtered. Her team had moved to the lowest levels when the Dark Stars, a ruthless mercenary crew, had landed topside. The agent assigned to watching the team's ship had been killed, but not before relaying what was coming. The Mercs had eventually discovered her group, and after seven hours of fighting, she had been able to get the team to a large room underground. The doors wouldn't seal, so she used a large metallic container and her energy shield as cover and kept the enemies at bay. Unfortunately, two of the remaining four agents were grievously wounded and were unable to even stand up. The other two had been hit, and although they could rest against the wall, they were in no position to help fight. The only thing separating her team from a complete wipe was her total focus on making sure nothing entered the long hallway to the room they were in. She had already had to shoot incoming grenades fire ricochet shots to down heavy shielders and use up almost all of her mines and grenades. There had been 67 mercs initially, and per her ARI, which tracked kills, there were still over 30 left. Another agent team would not be sent out for at least a week. She had come to grips with the fact that this might be the team's graveyard. 
The Merck Group had used new concealment technology to make the base appear abandoned, which had allowed them to infiltrate after her group had entered the facility. She was unclear on what the Dark Stars wanted, but they were known for never leaving any survivors and oftentimes playing with victims before killing them. Jane scrutinized Agent Bremick. She had formed a deep and physical relationship with him, despite that being against protocol. He would not last long without help, and the medical bay was across the base. He smiled at her. She grimaced. Everin had saved her from an aborted timeline, and although she had done well in the main one, her time was coming to an end. Although the version of her here and Chris mirrored her and her husband from her timeline, she had branched out to another group. Bremick was her chance for a new family, and that option would soon no longer be available. She could have settled down instead of re-enlisting into the United Planets Bureau of Law Enforcement, but that was not the type of person she was. Her attention focused on activity at the end of the hallway. The Mercs had brought in a heavily shielded robot with a huge front shield. She tried some ricochet shots, but they had little impact. She tossed out her last proximity mines, but she was not sure this would be enough. If it was not, the room would be breached and her team would be finished off. The robot blasted the mines, blowing them up. Jane closed her eyes and braced for impact, but everything had gone silent. She peeked over her cover and saw that the explosion had halted mid-blast. There was no sound coming from anywhere, and a quick glance at Bremick showed his eyes had widened, but he was frozen in place. I've stopped time, said a familiar voice behind her. She whirled around and gasped. Everin, V, Dr. Snowden, Emily, and two others she had never seen before had come out of nowhere. A wave of relief swept over her. Although she did not know why they were there or how they had arrived, she knew that Everin's mere presence meant safety. Everin? she asked. He nodded. I know you have questions, so I'll summarize. We've died, and I'm in a state where I have additional powers. We're traveling around and saying our goodbyes. In your case, this was the end of your personal time stream. I've decided to interfere to prevent that. And yes, there are minor ripples, but that's okay. You sound different, said Jane. No Torvada filter, said Everin. She licked her lips. I see. What killed you? We shouldn't discuss that, said Everin. Timeline impacts and all. Jane rushed over and hugged him. She then embraced Dr. Snowden. Albert, you look well. For a dead person, I do work out, he said, smiling. He gestured at Kess. This is Kess, another member of the gang and also my girlfriend. Jane hugged her. You got a good one. Doesn't he know it, she said. Jane high-fived V, then put her arms around Emily. Always good to see you too. Emily motioned at Jelton. This is Jelton Stollerin. He's my boyfriend too. Jane embraced a startled Jelton. You're a lucky man. I like to think so, my friend, he said. Jane stepped back and faced Everin. I'm guessing the freezing time thing is a part of your new powers. It is, he said. He snapped his fingers, and the mercs in the hallway, along with the explosion, vanished. The attackers are in the docking bay now, and they are handcuffed and sedated. A United Planets response force will be here within the hour. Also, your team has been fully healed. Jane's eyes misted. You did all this? For me? Of course. Consider it a gift. She gave Everin a tight bear hug. He was a force for good, and it was hard for her to imagine that he and the gang had died. Whatever had killed them must have been powerful, but it seemed they had triumphed in the end, at the cost of their lives. She rubbed her eyes and looked around. So, what are you all now? Everin smiled. Let's just say they've evolved to a different form. Got it, said Jane. I would ask where you'll go after this, but I suspect you wouldn't tell me. Emily grinned. You're right. 
It's for the best, said Everett. The last thing you want is someone coming after you for what you know of this event. He handed her a gray marble with a hole in it. With that said, you may encounter the second forms of V and me. This object will light up in our presence. Jane ran her fingers over the object. Thank you. Can I take a moment with Albert? Please do, said Everin. The rest of the gang moved off to various parts of the room, leaving Jane and Dr. Snowden alone. I'm glad you found someone, said Jane. Dr. Snowden grinned. I am, too. They laughed. She touched his arm. I forgot how nice it was to talk with you. It's so easy. Comfortable. That's better than the alternative. And you still have that same sense of humor, she said, swatting his arm. Her face turned serious. Are you happy? Dr. Snowden paused. Well, I'm not sure I'm happy that I died, but I like where I'm at now. Kess is my everything now. Good, said Jane. There were times after we last met that I had regrets, thinking that I made the wrong choice to stay. Maybe this is how everything was supposed to be. Apparently so. This last event was always going to happen with the people involved. Now my turn. Are you happy? Outside of almost dying here, she grinned. I am, actually. I think Bremick will be a good husband. Her face turned red. How? Dr. Snowden tapped his chest. Evolved being now. Remember? She gulped. I have a chance at that now. Although my other self and Chris were enough for me, I think Bremick could join our group. Also, this place went from my tomb to the second best day of my life. The first being the day I met you all back on Roeth. I get it. Do you all have to leave right away? Dr. Snowden peeked back at the others. We can extend this moment for however long we want. Jane hugged him. Then I want to know Kess and Jelton, and everything you all have been up to. That would definitely take some time, I know, and I'll savor every moment I can get. She surveyed where she and her team were supposed to die. Thanks to Everin, that would no longer happen, and she wondered what she would say to her group. They knew of Everin only via a protocol to be observed. However, it would be hard to refute being fully healed and all enemies wrapped up in the docking bay. She would need to report Everin's interference, but she suspected Everin was okay with that, or he would not have interfered. He was already tied to her, so it would not be a shock to others. Perhaps he would undo time in order for her team to meet the gang. She planned to enjoy whatever moments she had with them. Dr. James Bryson eased back into his couch in his living room. It was 12-14-2013, 7.30 p.m., Saturday night, and Dr. Snowden had contacted him around 12.30 p.m. to confirm he would be over for pizza and beer. Dr. Bryson loved that he and Dr. Snowden had returned to their usual hanging out, and it really helped Dr. Bryson decompress. Kess would be coming this time, and he was excited about that. His wife... Karen was visiting her sister, so he had the place to himself. Dr. Bryson felt close to Kess. He recalled meeting her on his initial outing on the Toravada, and she and Dr. Snowden had made a great couple. She was smart, attractive, and powerful, and although Dr. Bryson was happy with Karen, he wondered what it might have been like to marry an alien. The get-together usually started around 8 o'clock p.m., then went to 11.30 p.m. or later, Although it was only a few hours, Dr. Bryson treasured the hangout. Traveling with Everin had opened Dr. Bryson's eyes to what reality was. It made his astronomical work seem comical by comparison. He had been working on describing some peculiarities of a planetary system about 67 light years away, and Everin had taken him and Dr. Snowden out to observe it. It almost felt like cheating, but Dr. Bryson could only verify what he thought. No visual or audio feedback was allowed to return. The ability to witness not only something as it was at present, but also what it had been at the time when its light had hit Earth, was powerful. 
He verified that the pizza he was to heat up was laid out in the kitchen, and that he had several appetizers like chips and dip ready. He could have ordered out, but he found the delivery times were a hit and miss, and if it was a busy time, delivery was unreliable. He checked his watch, slid the pizzas into the oven, then went back to the couch. He closed his eyes for a moment while stretching his neck, but when he opened his eyes, he almost jumped out of his skin. Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, V., Kess, and Jelton were seated around him. He had not heard them enter, and the thought crossed his mind that he had napped so hard that he had not heard them arrive. Dr. Snowden also had a key to the house. Relax, James, said Dr. Snowden. Dr. Bryson raised his head. I'm good. I must have dozed off harder than I thought. His eyes widened. The pizzas! They're in the oven! They're okay, said Everin. However, we need to update you on our situation. We didn't come here via the Toravada or through your back door. Instead, we died, and I'm in a form that allows me to transport us anywhere, at least for a period of time. Then we are ejected out of the plane. Dr. Bryson's mouth went dry. You died. Emily frowned. Yeah. And it sucked. I... Yes. I suppose it would. If you're dead, are you like ghosts now? They're not, said Everin. They're quasi-cosmic energy beings, like the Hoxcris. Dr. Bryson pointed at Everin. APR, or Aurelian Power Rank of 20 to 30. Your reaction is not what I expected. Dr. Bryson grimaced. I don't like that you all died, but I'm glad you still exist in some capacity. You said you would be ejected out of the plane. Yes, said Everin. But you can come back and visit, asked Dr. Bryson. Only if the others stay on the Torvada. However, once they leave the plane, they will most likely move on, and the Torvada may have other ideas. Dr. Bryson's eyes misted. Are you saying that this is the last time I'll see any of you? Only Dr. Snowden, Emily, Kess, and Jelton. Everin and I will be back in new forms, said V. A tear ran down Dr. Bryson's cheek. I... I wasn't expecting this. He gazed at Kess. There was so much we were going to do and I looked forward to touring your time period with you. She wiped her eye. I know. But you probably can still go. It wouldn't be the same, he said, squinting hard. She walked over and bent over to hug him. He shuddered when she embraced him. The finality of the moment had hit him. This was the last time he would ever see his closest friends. While he was happy they were alive in a new form, it did not dull the pain that racked him. He wiped his eyes when Kess sat back down. Well, at least we'll have pizza together one last time, he said. The group chuckled. Dr. Bryson eyed Everin. So how will I know your and V's new forms? You could visit me at work and I wouldn't even know what to look for. A good observation, said Everin. He handed him a glowing gray marble with a hole in it. I am giving these out to all those we visit. This object will highlight in our presence like it is now. Dr. Bryson ran the marble around in his palm. That works. But what will you two look like? We don't know, said V. He studied him. I just noticed you and Everin speak differently. Let me guess, no more Torvata filter, right? That's correct. You're very observant. Oh, I know, he said, winking. Emily swatted his arm. You goof. He grinned at her. And how am I supposed to tease you after this? She eyed him. All right. This is emotionally draining, said Dr. Bryson. If this is to be our last meal together, are we good with it being pizza? Any food will do, my friend, said Jelton. Okay, I got beer, too. Dr. Snowden stood. I'll help you get it. Everin tapped at his utility belt. Before you go to the kitchen, I have a gift to offer you, if you so choose. Dr. Bryson tilted his head. Go on. Everin handed him a small cube. It's an information cube tied to the Torvada. 
It can project whatever you ask, similar to the hollow room. It only responds to you and will know if you are ever coerced. It also shuts down on others unless you add them as a trusted viewer. You'll need to learn and master its hollow and audio interface. Dr. Bryson fidgeted with the cube. You entrust me with this? The Torvada has allowed it. Oh, man. This is sweet, said Dr. Bryson, giving a thumbs up. You'll have plenty of time with that after we're gone. Kitchen time, said Dr. Snowden. Dr. Bryson went there with Dr. Snowden in tow. So, this is it, said Dr. Bryson. Dr. Snowden frowned. Yeah, on one hand, I'm glad to be alive still in some form, but on the other hand, I can't come back, except on the Torvata, and even then I can't leave it. That's all assuming the Torvata even allows that. I don't know all the rules. I hope you and Emily do so. I'm not opposed to cooking out in a hollow room. His lower lip quivered. Our last night together, and I'm losing my best friend. Dr. Snowden laid a hand on Dr. Bryson's shoulder. You'll be all right. At least you're now aware of what's out there. Dr. Bryson swallowed hard. I know. And we recently started hanging out together, and now that's gone. Potentially forever. He growled. How could anything take you and the others out? Trust me, dying sucks, said Dr. Snowden. I know I'm not supposed to say, uh, but it was a corrupted plain form of Everin. He literally killed me, Emily, Kess, and Jelton. In Kess's case, he put his foot through her back. Holy shit, said Dr. Bryson. Yeah, for me, it was a neck snap. And now you're some super energy being. Dr. Snowden morphed into his pure energy form, then back. Yeah, whoa, that's crazy. So what now, then? You'll be out of the plane? Do you go to other planes? I'm not sure, to be honest. I guess I'll find out. A new chapter. Dr. Bryson lowered his head. Yeah, I just wish I could be a part of it. Let's enjoy what time we have, then. Besides, you got an information cube. That makes you something rare. Works for me, said Dr. Bryson, clearing his throat. He tried to put on a brave front, but everything in him was on fire. A part of him wished he was going with them. But he had Karen, and not seeing Earth ever again was not something he could fathom. Regardless, he would try to enjoy the night, for the gang's sake. But he knew he would struggle through it. Chapter 22 Andia Kiggs relaxed in her one-piece white robe in her spacious and comfortable office aboard the Kinjaro, an advanced starship. It was fast, had good shielding, and possessed decent weapons. It had been recently built, and she loved flying in it. It was a medium-sized ship with a crew complement of 80, and whenever she needed to go somewhere, this was what was used. A squad of Fredorian rangers rounded out the crew. Rikar Hojador sat across from her desk. He was now a liaison for the Kriegan Empire, and also the Grand Master and founder of the Fedorian Rangers. She trusted him with her life, and both of them had traveled recently with Everin. That was a rare experience, and through that she came to see Rikar as a close friend. He wore his usual black tactical outfit with highlights of gray, which contrasted with his purple skin. Like all rangers, he had his assault weapon nearby, resting against the desk. It was one o'clock p.m., and there was nothing on her schedule. She had already gone over her meeting plans for when they arrived. Fredoria had a new trade agreement, and she wanted to hammer out a few points. The Kriegan Emperor had asked her and Ricard to stop by, and that was also a rare event. Don't think too hard, said Ricard. She smirked as she ran her fair-skinned hand through her hair. I try not to. This should be an easy meeting. I'm curious as to what the Emperor wants to talk about. Me too, said Andia. 
Regardless of what it is, this new trade agreement will boost Fredoria to new heights. I'll see. Fredoria will have the best one out there. She smiled. It's nice to go out in the field. I feel cooped up sometimes on Fredoria. I'm with you there. Andia sat up when Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, V, and two others she did not know appeared behind her car. He went for his rifle, but paused when he peeked back. Everin, said Andia. She gazed at the others. What's... what's going on? It's good to see you both, said Everin. V high-fived Andia and Rakar. It most certainly is. Rakar's eyes narrowed when he stood. You both sound... different. How did you get in here? It's a long story, said Everin. In summary, we died, and I'm in a position of power to go anywhere before leaving the plane. No, said Antia, frowning. She rushed over and hugged Everin, Dr. Snowden, and V. She gave Emily a deep kiss. I missed you, said Emily. She tapped Jelton's arm. This is Jelton Stoller, and he's my... boyfriend. Andia's eyes widened. Oh. Jelton grinned. It's all right. I know about you and Emily, and I'm okay with that. Next to me is Kess, another person who traveled with Everin like myself. Kess crooked a thumb at Dr. Snowden, and he's my boyfriend. Andia shook hands with both of them. Ricard ran a hand over his mouth. If you're all dead... How are you all alive? A good question, said Everin. It requires information that should not be known, but in short, Dr. Snowden and Emily are humanity's final form. You may recall when we met long ago, we mentioned the Great Selector. I do. That was actually a hawkscurus. Dr. Snowden, Emily, V, and Jelton are their progenitors, although Dr. Snowden, Emily, V, Jelton, and Kess are not hawkscurus in origin. They are now the same type of energy being, a quasi-cosmic one. Andia gasped when she stared at Emily. So, you're what we'll become. She grinned. Yep. And the Hawkscris you met was Pizarra, the leader of them. She knew us when we, including Silva, were on the roof, but Pizarra couldn't say anything. Well, she said hi to Everin with that energy being communication thing. So it's like some kind of time loop, said Rakar. It sure is, said Dr. Snowden. Kess waved her hand in the air. Don't worry, it was confusing to me too. Andia grimaced. And now that you died, it sounds like you came to say goodbye. You're observant as always, said Everin. Yes, there are a few more people we'd like to visit but you two were on the list. Andia's eyes misted. This is the last time we'll see you all. Not quite, said Everin. You'll see V and me in 2032 in an event that involves Blake Brown, but you can't say anything about this meeting. Got it, said Rakar. You can count on us to keep a secret. Indeed. However, there is another reason for our coming to this point in time. When you arrive at Kragis, Cregan authorities will take a saboteur on this ship into custody. You told them that you were saved by the grace of Everin. I checked your travel path and detected a cosmic presence on this ship at this point in time and knew that this is when we would appear to you. Rikar's eyes widened. There's a saboteur on board. Yes, and she tried to infiltrate your engine systems. I need to stop her then. There is no need. The saboteur was stunned when interacting with the console. You will receive a notification from your security team now. Ricard checked his wrist device. Yep, it's there. He tapped at it several times. I've communicated to the rangers to put her into the brig. He eyed Everin. Stunned, huh? Everin smiled. I may have assisted. Consider it a gift. No problem there. Andia frowned. So after this event, we have to pretend this never happened when we see you again in 2032. I'm afraid so, said Everin. I wish we had some time then. 
said Andia. Everin gestured around. We can spend some time here. Although we are only going to be around for a short while, there is more than enough time to say goodbye to a host of friends. Andia wiped her eyes. Okay. He extended an arm out. She went over and embraced him. V tapped her back. There, there. She giggled. Thanks, V. Acknowledged. We haven't had lunch yet. Maybe you all can join us, said Rakar. If you don't think we will interrupt your crew with our presence, said Everin. Rakar shrugged. There's a reserved room for Andia, meant for confidential meals. He paused. Wait. Do you all need to eat any more? Kess furrowed her brow. Now that you mention it, I don't think we do. I don't sense hunger, but I'm always up for eating, said Jelton. Emily swatted his arm. He always is. I wish I had more time to get to know you and Kess, said Andia, looking at them both. Likewise, said Jelton. Emily talks a lot about you two. Kess motioned at Dr. Snowden, and from him too. All right, then it's settled. Let's go, said Andia. She was not surprised Emily had a boyfriend, and Jelton was a fine specimen. It hit her hard that this was one of the last times she would see everyone. She had not even had time to meet Jelton and Kess. Not being able to see Emily again bothered Andia, but she understood their relationship was sporadic. Ricard was visibly disturbed, and she had seen him in that mode only a few times. He was probably feeling the same way she was. They would keep this meeting secret, and Andia was glad she would see Everin and V in the future. She smiled when Emily grabbed her hand and winked at her as they walked out. Sandus's squirrel-like ears twitched while he studied the screen in front of him. It had the latest data across his information empire. He liked his underwater base on Intara III in the Gyrodak system and the isolation it offered. If his identity as the information broker was ever revealed, he would be hunted nonstop. He had been able to hide it so far, but all it took was one misstep. Then it would get dangerous. Of concern to him was the rise of several new information brokers. One had been outed and had summarily been dissected and left to hang in front of a bar on a lawless planet. However, where one broker failed, another succeeded. And more importantly, that cut into Sandus's profits. He had contemplated working more with mercenaries since sometimes he needed muscle, but that drew attention. Perhaps someday he could even get a special forces type set up that operated in the shadows. They would assume all the risk of working on the outside, but would take their orders via the information broker booths scattered across many planetary systems. There was also now a race to get informants. Several of his had been approached by these new outfits, and Sanders had his informants accept to see what was going on. That was the data he was reviewing at the moment. He paused when he saw some information about a rogue AI. Memories of traveling with Everin to deal with a ruthless AI known as Salazar crept into his mind. There was an event in the future when he would see an earlier version of Everin and the gang. Sanders missed them, and traveling with them gave him a new view into how things operated. It was almost comical how little he knew about how reality worked. He thought about Draxus a wild-born conduit and someone who Sandus had traveled with along with the gang in an aborted timeline. It had been rendered, and although no longer accessible, Draxus would be able to live his life out fully. There was nothing on Sandus's schedule outside monitoring a few things, and he liked lazy days. He would nap a lot, then wake up to eat or drink, maybe exercise some, and monitor. If he wanted to get out, he would usually fly to the nearby moon, which was habitable. It was hard to breathe there, but it had lush plant life. Various sensors blinked and emitted an alert. Sandus's pulse quickened when the docking bay registered something powerful enough to disable the security cameras there. Sensors had picked up several life signs before going out. He went to a panel and, with a press, opened it and grabbed two energy pistols. There was also a powerful portable shield generator he could wear on his back. It was not practical for long-term usage, 
but it would work well for this. He interacted with his wrist device, and two wall panels slid to the side. Heavy defense robots stepped out. Systems online, they said in a deep, digital voice. Sandus had added them recently for the possibility of a base invasion. These were Kriegen-level destroyers and could take a lot of punishment while dishing it out. He had them lead the way, and he loved that he could see through their eyes via his ARI. When they reached the docking bay, he gripped his pistols tight and followed them in. His eyes widened as he had the robots stand down. Everin? Emily? That's us, she said. Everin raised a hand. There's no need to be alarmed. Yet your speech is different, said Sanders. I just saw Everin and the gang only a few months ago. Also, my system didn't detect anything coming in or breaching the shielding. The Everin and gang I know uses the Toravata, not pop in out of the blue. I know I can be irresistible at times, and that can be dangerous. Emily snickered while motioning at him. Before we go any further, you're good at reading situations. So what does our presence here tell you? Oh yeah, you're good at that, said Dr. Snowden. A challenge, assuming you're not all imposters. Sandus sized Jelton up. I've already assessed him before in the past, when you all dealt with that nasty Zika person. I assume he's still your boyfriend based on the touches I saw and his eyes coveting your rear more than once. She looked at Jelton. You got me. Good to see you again, said Sandus. He studied the woman. You control nanoswarms, since I can detect them, and they're currently organized in an intelligent manner. Let's see. Given that Jelton is Emily's boyfriend, it stands to reason that you're Dr. Snowden's girlfriend. His eye movement toward your breasts is also significant. What? asked Dr. Snowden. Sandus's furry ears twitched. Okay, the last statement was not accurate. I'm Kess, and yes, I'm also Dr. Snowden's girlfriend, said Kess, smiling. Ho, ho, the significant others, said Sanders. He focused on Emily. You're wearing new equipment, so that means you've upgraded and most likely been on one summons at least, most likely multiple. That goes for Everin, V, and Dr. Snowden as well. That's correct, said V. Sanders wagged a finger. The Toravata filters your and Everin's speech. Since you both talk different, that means the Toravata is not around to filter, or you've devised a workaround. Accurate, said Everin. Sandus rubbed his chin. Dr. Snowden's stance indicates he is more confident. You must have been through something traumatic, but got over it, and that made you stronger. He swept his gaze over everyone. You all seem more powerful. That's less an observation and more of a feeling. Dr. Snowden sighed. Traveling with Everin can be dangerous. Oh, I know, said Sanders. He examined V. Your new body seems much more resilient. With your speech filter gone, you talk more natural. Acknowledged, said V. Sanders stared at Everin. Although I can't detect exotic energies, I feel you're far more powerful with me just being in your presence. The fact that you're here in my docking bay without tripping any of my security systems and you all don't have the Toravata suggests that you came here under some other power. I'm thinking whatever your last summons was, that is where this power came from. This is all assuming you're not some powerful group of beings playing a trick on old Sanders. You're observant as always, said Everin. Yes, we came without the Toravata, and we can move around like this only because we all died and I'm at a point where I have more power than usual. We came to say goodbye. Sandus frowned. You... You died? I'm sad if that's true. But one question. He glanced at Emily. Who won the foot race on the Draven planet where we attended a Dominion ceremony? You did, of course, she said. He eyed her. She laughed. Okay, I did. I wanted to see your face. We did get to watch Everin take down a champion later, though. It is you, said Sandus. His face dropped. The robots exited the room. New defensive upgrades, I see, said Dr. Snowden. Of course, said Sandus, gulping. One can never be too careful. Sandus high-fived V. 
Always good to see you. Likewise, said V. Sanders greeted everyone, then stepped back. Now I'm curious. If you're dead, then how are you here? I figured Everin might be since he's a weird energy being, Dr. Snowden chortled. <laughs> he sure is. We're quasi-cosmic beings, meaning we're powerful enough to be ejected from the plane. For how long? Forever, said V. However, we can still visit in the Toravada, but can't step off it, and that assumes the Toravada will let us. Sandus' eyes narrowed. So these are your latest versions that I'll ever meet? Yes, said Everin. You still have the meeting with me, V, Dr. Snowden, and Emily in a few years. You'll also see me and V in 2032. But those will both be your past versions. That's correct. Sandus quivered. What if I don't want you to go? Emily moved over and gave him a big hug. It's all right. He shuddered as he soaked in her embrace. The gang was a force of good in a chaotic universe. They had personally saved him, and if he had been left on that ship in an altered timeline, he would have died. Traveling with them had been one of the highlights of his life, although he would try to put up a brave front. This situation unnerved him. The other stepped in and touched his arm or shoulder. He trusted few people, and this group was the only one he trusted with his life. While he was glad he would see them again in the future, it would not be the same. Everyone cleared the area around him. This... this is not the news I wanted to hear upon seeing you again, said Sanders. I know that Everin and V will come back in some new form, since I mention it in our future meeting, but will you four come back in some new form, too? Dr. Snowden peeked at Everin, then faced Sandus. I don't think so. Everin and V will continue dealing with summonses, and I guess us four will be outside the plane doing whatever quasi-cosmic beings do. Could I come with you? he asked with hopeful eyes. Emily pointed at him. You'd need to die first, then get converted to a new state of being. Oh, and you'd need to touch a cosmic shard which no longer exists. So there's a chance, he asked, grinning. You goof, she said, swatting his arm. He wrinkled his furry brow. On a more serious point, I hate that you all died, but I'm glad you still exist in some capacity. I know I'll see you all again at some point, well, minus Jelton and Kess, and I'll meet whatever the next version of Everin and V is. Indeed, said Everin. I already know somewhat of what my new form will be based on your comments in our future meeting. Yeah, something not stiff, said Sanders. I like you just the way you are. I do as well. The group chuckled. So, what event in 2032 has me seeing you and V? asked Sanders. Everin smiled. It's an event you won't miss and it involves Blake Brown. Sandus checked his forearm device. Never heard of him. You will, said V. I guess so, said Sandus. How long can you stay? No set time, said Everin. Then let's make this meeting as memorable as possible. A party, said Sandus. Before we do, I have a gift for you, said Everin. Oh, really? Everin extended a hand toward a box on a nearby table. Inside that is a small drone in the shape of an orb. Sandus opened the box and examined the drone. I've got quite a few of these, not like this one. Its stealth capability is beyond anything in this era, and it can be used for remote surveillance. Sandus grinned. You mean spying? Everin half smiled. If it is captured, it will dematerialize itself, and a new one will appear in the box. Sandus picked up the orb and rolled it around in his hand. How do I control it? The box has a hollow interface, but you can also pair that to any device you want, such as your goggles. Sandus eyed him. I suspect this has something to do with my future? I can't say, said Everin. Thank you, big guy. This will come in handy once I figure out the interface. I assume I can't mention this in the meeting with your past selves. Indeed. We can proceed to your party now. Sandus hated that this would be the last party ever with this version of the gang. He wished he could travel with them, 
but he would take whatever time he could get with them. He was in an exclusive group of those who traveled with Everin and knew them beyond a few meetings. Emily slipped her arm around his shoulders. Let's do this. Sandus tried hard not to break down. He would never tire of her saying that, and he felt honored that, after dying, they had taken time to come say goodbye to him. He had even gotten an amazing gift that would shake up what he could do. It showed the strength of the bonds that they had developed when traveling together. He would make this party the best one he could. Galden Cull, supreme leader of the Rift Guardians, relaxed in his office. It was a quiet day and Brayak Cutherstone sat across Galden's desk. They had been going over some statistics on their ongoing colonization of Himarachi, their first planet in the timeline their dimension was attached to. Everything seemed to be going well, mainly because the Time Warden's Timeplex, their main entry point into the timeline, had been destroyed. Himarachi was now 17% colonized, and the population had been growing at a steady rate. A Rift Guardian fleet surrounded the planet, and defense platforms had been established throughout the planetary system. There was also a sizable portion of citizens that were military. The planet was essentially a massive fortress. They were even able to bring in massive Rift Crystal Shards that circled the sun. The Shards had a structure built around them, and with the sun's power they could fire a Rift Energy Beam great distances, and he was not sure many enemies would have a defense against it. The first one that had gone online had decimated Time Warden ships. Galden had toured Everanus, the capital city of Himarachi, so named after Everin. The city was highly advanced, but also integrated with the forest it was built into. Everything had been built with balance in mind, something that Galden attributed to Everin's general philosophy. Jelton was out with Everin and the gang, and per scheduling he had the day off. There was no need for that, since Everin could return Jelton to a minute after he had left, but Jelton wanted to maintain some normalcy in regard to time off. Galden figured it was good to have a day off between traveling on the Toravada and being back at headquarters. Brayak had been arising for a while in the ranks of the Rava, a powerful division in the Rift Guardians led by Jelton. Galden suspected Brayak would continue to rise, maybe even to Galden's position over time, Brayak had the right temperament, and his battle prowess and fighting gave him high credibility amongst the rank and file. He was also one of the few that had known the gang well via Jelton and the gang's last adventure dealing with some cult. Himarachi seems to be doing good today, said Brayak. Indeed it is, said Galden. We now have full coverage of our system and can strike others if need be. Brayak rubbed his chin. We won against the Time Wardens, and the nearest civilization to us is over seventy-five light-years away. Do you think we're focusing too much on security at the moment? One can never have enough defense, said Galden. I'd like to encircle our planetary system with some type of shielding. We can starlift to get the materials we need and deploy shielding generators. Yes, it may take a long time, but we still haven't fully scouted this region of the galaxy. I get it. I would focus on making sure our timeline shielding on Himarachi is set up first. Galden shrugged. Why not do both? The sun has enough power for all that? Yes, but we're limited on workers. While we can do a lot with remote robotics, there's still a cost there. Galden eased back into his chair. You're right. Good point. However, I think if planned right, we could do both, even if it takes longer. We're under no immediate threat. He jumped when Everin and others appeared. Brayak fell out of his chair, then hopped up to face the group. Everin? asked Galden. He stared at Jelton. What's going on? Jelton smiled. We're checking in. Galden and Brayak greeted the group. Brayak studied them. How did you get in here so quietly? Jelton peeked at Everin, who nodded. It's a long story, but in short, we died. Galden's chest tightened as he stared at Jelton. Again? I'm afraid so, my old friend. Except this time I've resurrected into a very strong energy form. Same with the others. Everin, as you might expect, is a lot more powerful. Enough to let us travel anywhere with but a snap of his fingers. 
Galton shuddered. So, what happens now? Jelton exhaled. I have to leave the plane. No, said Brayak. Jelton placed a hand on his shoulder. You have the respect of the Rava, and they view you as a leader. You'll take my place. He smiled at Galden. He'll make a good second in command. Galden's throat constricted. This is unexpected. I guess it makes sense now why Sazrissa said she had only heard your name. Yes, but I prefer existing now as I am versus being truly dead, said Jelton. However, I am now too powerful to exist in the plane. Plane's rules, Galton frowned. That's unfortunate. He surveyed the others. Well, I'm glad to see you all. It sounds like this may be our last meeting. For me, Emily, Jelton, and Kess, said Dr. Snowden. He crooked a thumb at Everin and V. You'll see them again, but they'll have new forms. Galton lowered his head. So I've heard from Zazrissa. This is not a good day. Emily hugged him, followed by Kess. Dr. Snowden did his famous half-hug and handshake. Then Jelton embraced Galden. The group did the same for Brayak. V high-fived both while Everin hugged Brayak and Galden. Galden's heart hung heavy, and he struggled to contemplate going on without Jelton. Riven had long lives, and Galden and Jelton had been close friends for a large part of their lives, and now it was over. Galden understood that death in battle was always present, but not to be able to assist in preventing it aided him. Care to share any details on what could have killed you? asked Galden. Whatever or whoever it was must have been tough. Definitely. Dying sucks. But I think Everin wants to keep the details obscured, said Emily. Got it. I'm thankful not to have experienced death. He examined them. So you're some type of new energy being. Kess and Jelton transformed into energy beings, but kept their humanoid shape. Then they reverted back. Galden stepped back. I could feel that energy or whatever. It's powerful, said Kess. This is a lot to take in, said Galden. I understand, said Everin. We can spend some time together, and as a parting gift... I have enacted your planetary temporal shielding. Brayak furrowed his brow. That was projected to take a very long time. Indeed so. The projectors needed were created from the asteroid belt on the edges of your planetary system. They are hooked into your system. Then you can manage them or adjust them as needed. Brayak interacted with his ARI. They're there. You continue to surprise me, said Galden. Eyeing Everin. I never know what to expect when you arrive. He did a quick check and verified that the shield projectors were there and already linked in. It hit him just how powerful Everin was at the moment. While the others were also strong, creating a planetary bubble of shield projectors was on another level. Thank you, he said. Of course, said Everin. Brayak raised his head. If you're going to be leaving... Then we must have a feast for you. There's no need for all that, said Jelton. The Raval would want it that way. And I do too. Galden placed his fist on his chest. Same for me. This may be their last chance to see you. Jelton gazed at them both, then smiled big. Then let's have a feast. Galden appreciated the lighter mood because the thought of Jelton leaving still crushed him. Galden had plans for some events with Jelton, but those would change now. Brayak would need to get up to speed, and that would be the new focus. Jelton was one of a kind, and viewed as a demigod by the Rava and other Rift Guardians. His loss would not be taken well by most, but they would soldier up like Galden did. He gritted his teeth when everyone began to file out. Jelton stayed behind. I know this came out of nowhere. It is what it is. I know traveling with Everin is dangerous from first-hand experience, said Galden. Trust me, this adventure was much rougher than even I had planned for. 
I still remember dying. Again, of course. Galton guffawed. You have many lives. I know, old friend, said Jelton, laying a hand on Galton's shoulder. But I have you to thank for taking me under your wing and giving me a chance to be where I'm at now. Galton stifled his eyes' attempt to mist. He was not ready for him to leave. Jelton was not only a solid second-in-command, but also like family and a best friend. And now it was over. Just like that. I hope that you can still visit from time to time, said Galden. You know I'll try if I can, said Jelton. Galden stared off into the distance. The adventures you'll have now. I have no idea what I'll be doing, but I'll never forget my roots. They shared a look. Galden cleared his throat. Then let's enjoy what time we have. He followed Jelton out of the room. There would be a lot to do to get Brayak going, but Galden was confident that Brayak would adapt. The Ravah would see Jelton as having ascended to godhood. Galden's heart hurt. But he had to put on a brave front for the others, especially the Ravah. He had done so many times. But this was final for Jelton. Galden would hype him up since he was moving on to a higher existence, and a part of Galden wished he could go with Jelton. Chapter 23 Murukan, now a universal and palisan hybrid energy being, streaked down to the ground from a space station. He had been meeting with a group of regional inspectors as part of the new investigative arm that he administered, and was a part of the Morocco Galactic Federation, or MGF. His teammates, Grog, Talandra, and Zax, had gone planetside to look into a local case dealing with alien traffickers. What he had not expected was for Grog to contact him and mention that Talandra and Zax had been taken— Unfortunately, due to sensor jamming, whoever had taken them had an hour head start. Grog's voice was one of dread. He had said his final goodbye. But Murukan was not going to allow him to die alone on the forest ground. Murukan was certain he could heal him, but not if it took too long to get there. Grog had already escaped the jamming range, and the trip would have only made him weaker. When Murukan landed, he concentrated on Grog's status. Although he was tough, he had taken some heavy energy blasts. Most would have died from that. He placed his hands on Grog. Focus on breathing. Grog wheezed when he tried to comply. Murukan focused, and a stream of energy entered Grog, healing him to full health. It was one of Murukan's abilities from the universal energy side. Grog gasped. Much better. Take a moment to catch your breath. Grog waved his hand out. I'm good. We need to go after that damn ship. Slow down, said Murukan. Tell me what happened. Grog exhaled. Well, we found the ship that was trafficking. It took us a bit to find and follow the aliens out. And once we arrived, we saw that they were loading captured victims. We tried to contact you, but they had a jamming pillar somewhere, so we moved in. During the fight, Talandra was stunned, and Zax went to get her while I provided cover. That's when a big robot came out to crush me. In the confusion, Zax got incapacitated, and both were loaded. Murukan gestured at him. I assume you got video of all of this. Yep, I fought the robot while taking hits from the last traffickers. I should have died. When your redundant organs become your primary ones, that's not a good sign. Thankfully, I could regenerate those, said Murukan. He analyzed the video that Grog sent over. So we know the alien ship now and can track it. Yeah, but they're in condensed space somewhere far away by now. You know how difficult it is to track anyone with that type of head start. Murukan frowned. I do. Grog growled. Even with an alert out for a missing person or a group, they rarely find anything. Even putting a contract out for hunters is not reliable. So what do we do? Murukan tilted his head. Something is coming. Huh? 
asked Grog. Murukan indicated an area ahead of them. There. Grog's eyes widened when Talandra and Zax manifested with their hands and legs tied. They had restraints over other parts of their body, but both were on the ground. Murukan zipped over and freed them from their restraints, then healed their beaten bodies. Zax surveyed her surroundings in confusion. How did we get here? No idea, said Talandra. She grimaced as she tapped the side of her head. They took my daydrolled control bands from my head. It was horrible hearing everyone, but our torturers planned on killing me and Zax. They also hit me with an EMP, said Zax. Grog grunted when he hugged them as they stood. I'm glad you're both safe. Talandra glanced at Murukan and Grog. Like Zax said earlier, how'd we get here? Murukan motioned at an empty spot behind Talandra and Zax. The answer will be here in a moment. Everyone concentrated on the area. I don't see anything, said Grog. Give it a second, said Murukan. He smiled when Everin and the gang materialized, although he did not know two of them. What was apparent was that they were all energy beings, and Everin was on another level. Everin? asked Grog, drawing his head back. How'd you get here? Everin half smiled. I understand our appearance must be confusing, especially after Talandra and Zax appeared. In short, we died and I'm in a state where I can move around anywhere for a short while before we're all ejected from this reality. I assure you, though, it is us, and yes, I'm responsible for transporting Talandra and Zax here. Everyone greeted each other with hugs and handshakes, and a few with back slaps. Talandra squawked. You died? How are you here, then? Dr. Snowden grinned. We transitioned to an energy form. Oh, she said. It's so good to see you again, even if you've died and moved on to a new form. And Kess, your girlfriend, is here, said Zax. The one with nanoswarms, right? That's me, said Kess, smiling. Murukan examined Jelton. It's good to finally meet you. Emily had mentioned your sacrifice to save Everin with a cosmic shard, and yes, she showed me your image from before. It's good to meet you as well, said Jelton. Emily's already filled me in on the cosmic artifact. We got to use it again, actually, said Emily. Grog grunted. Really? Yep, after we used it, it was put back here in your area in the past, so that our previous adventure could occur. Zax's eyes narrowed. A time loop. That's correct, said V. She examined him. Your communications filter is gone. It is. Same with Everin. Grog scrunched his face. So Everin rescued Zax and Talandra, but what about the other captured on that ship? Everin motioned off to the side. The ship is docked, and the traffickers are restrained. The cages the aliens were in are also opened. Talandra eyed him. I'm sad to hear you died. And I'm not sure I fully understand, but why did you choose to come now? Your and Zax's personal timelines ended here. Zax looked at Talandra, then back at Everin. We... we were going to die. Talandra squawked. When the traffickers took off my headbands, I heard their thoughts. They were going to kill us, but I didn't know if they would follow through. I guess they would have. Yes said Everin. However, we're going around saying our goodbyes, so consider this a farewell gift. Talandra and Zax hugged Everin tight. Thank you, said Talandra. Of course, said Everin, rubbing her back. However, I have a few other things to offer. She and Zax stepped back. Everin placed his hand under Talandra's beak. You no longer need a device to control the range of your ability. Talandra squawked when she touched the sides of her head. How? Consider it a gift. Everin's eyes glowed as he walked over to Grog and squeezed his shoulder. You now regenerate much faster. Grog stretched. Whoa. I can feel it. 
I thought I was already at full health. You were. You're feeling the effects of aging being healed to some degree. I'll take it. Everin went over to Zax and placed a hand on her arm. You've had a lot taken from you. Now you have your wish, which, although not vocalized, I know. Zax gasped. I... I can feel more... You're mostly organic now, with a few cyborg enhancements. Zax bear-hugged Everin. Thank you. Thank you, she said through tears. Murukan had been surprised that his team had gotten gifts, but he was thankful that Everin was kind. Although these abilities were limited, it meant a lot to each member, and he was sure Everin knew what they wanted. Murukan was just happy to have everyone safe. His eyes narrowed. We're thankful you stepped in, and we appreciate the gifts. I'd like to hear more about the cosmic artifact usage, but first we should check on the ship and the freed people. How long can you stay? For this moment, as long as needed, said Everin. Let's do what's needed for the ship, then we can discuss things wherever you choose. That'll work, said Murukan. His eyes widened when Everin snapped and everyone was next to the ship. Wow, said Grog. You're definitely a lot more powerful than when we last saw you. Murukan agreed with Grog's assessment. Although Murukan already felt powerful, even more so than his fellow members in the Nine, his APR was nothing compared to Everin's. To be able to move people and ships across long distances required power Murukan could barely fathom, even in his new energy form that granted an accelerated cognitive ability. He went to the ship, where security personnel were checking out the tied-up traffickers. The people who had been captured stood around and talked with the guards. The general mood was one of confusion. Murukan cleared things up with the security lead, then went back to the gang. That's all handled now, he said. He motioned at Everin. Where do you want to chat at? You choose, said Everin. I vote for the Torvato, said Talandra. Zax smiled. I like that too. Grog grinned. Let's do it. Emily eyed him as he laughed. Very well, said Everin. Murukan did not bat an eye when the Torvata popped in next to the group. He had figured it had been nearby in some capacity. Then even if it was not, Everin could bring it. Hopefully the gang could explain more about what had happened to him since it was hard to imagine anything being able to kill them. It bothered him that Zax and Talandra were to die, and he realized that was how things were to be. Everin could rewrite reality with but a snap of his fingers in this state. Murukan suspected that Talandra and Zax did not fully understand how lucky they were yet, if anything, it was a bad situation that the group could learn from to be better prepared next time, and the new gifts would help out in that regard. Everin and V indicated for everyone to board the Toravada. Murukan smiled. At least he would have the opportunity to dig in some more. He considered this visit a gift from Everin. Emily and Grog had paired off like old buds, with Jelton nearby. Dr. Snowden walked between Talandra and Kess, Zax talked with V at the ramp entrance. A wave of nostalgia washed over Murukan. It was time to reunite with old friends. Sasrisa Mortaka relaxed on a stone outcropping high up on a mountain cliff. It was large enough for a decent-sized group, but it was just her, Dravail Zage, CC, Dravail's Cosmic Cloth, and Seer, a Toravada AI. Sazrissa had now done eight summonses across multiple Earths, and this last one had had them rescue a child prince. She did not fully understand the importance, but the Toravada thought it was needed. Thankfully, the summons was over, but she had spotted an interesting vantage point on a cliff that gave a good overview of the lands. While she could get the same view by flying, it was less taxing than seeing it from a high enough point the cool breeze wafted over her face, and she took in a deep breath. She chuckled when Seer eyed Dravail as he patted the ground and did an elaborate flourish for her to sit. He was teasing her, something that he did often, but Seer had shaken her head and stomped around on the area. They played like that a lot, 
but Sazrissa noticed that Seer hung out with her more often than not if Dravail bothered her. Seer sitting next to Sazrissa was another example of that. Dravail opened his arms wide while looking out over the valley. Such a beautiful view. I like it, said Sazrissa. I didn't care too much for the underground part of this summons. Dravail spun around. Oh, I agree. It would have been much easier to fly the prince to his destination, but that would have caused some questions. She agreed with his assessment. They had to conceal their powers or risk introducing knowledge pollution, and there had been several fights with bandits and assassins where a stun would have been easy to do, but they had had to run or hide. Their hooded robes helped obscure things, but Seer had been the star of the show. Several times she would project another group or a distraction to allow the team to proceed. She even threw voices. In one instance, she had pretended to be wasps, causing the attackers to flee. Sazrissa continued to gain respect for Seer's abilities in a non-combat situation. She was versatile and added a lot, especially when it came to reconnaissance and misdirection. Dravail plopped to the right of Seer. This is enjoyable. Hopefully we don't have another immediate summons. We don't. Which is odd, said Seer. Every summons I've been on has ended with another immediate one, said Sazrissa. I kind of like relaxing a bit. Yeah, this has been somewhat unusual for your first ones, said Dravail. He eyed her. What do you think so far? Sazrissa smiled. I like them. It's a change of pace and I like helping others and actually seeing the impact, although this last one I'm not sure what will happen. Dravail drew his lips flat. Yeah, it's... I sense it too, said Sasrissa, standing when he did. There was a massive energy spike in front of them, but she did not see the source. Her eyes widened when Everin and the gang appeared. She saw Jelton was with them, and although she had not met Kess, Sasrissa knew who she was. It was obvious they were now quasi-cosmic beings, which meant they had gone through the event where they had died and then been reformed. Whoa, said Dravail. Sazrissa extended a hand towards him. It's okay. They went through a tough event, died and reformed, and were a part of their goodbye tour. You're correct, said Everin. Emily laughed as she hugged Dravail, Sazrissa, and Seer, then high-fived C.C., of course she would know. The rest of the gang greeted Sazrissa and the others. Jelton eyed her. Galden said, It seemed like you didn't know me, and now I understand why. Your past versions would have dealt with Galden and Brayak. Yep, said Sazrissa. He also thought you and him had a special relationship, maybe. He's right. We did, she said, grinning. Ooh, said Emily. The group laughed. Dr. Snowden motioned around. There's no hiding our new energy forms. Definitely not, said Dravail. He scrutinized Kess. Nice to finally meet you. Although this is an odd way to do so. Don't I know it, she said. She wagged her finger at Sazrissa. From what I understand, you've already met the second version of Everin and others. Sazrissa nodded. I have. Dr. Snowden sighed. Now I know why you were so cautious not to let slip that we weren't around. Still, I'd rather be this than dead. Seer examined V. Even you have an energy form. I can't detect any mechanical aspects. I'm pure energy, said V. However, as Sazrissa mentioned, I will be back with Everin in a new body. I'm sure we'll meet up. Sazrissa winked at him. Your new forms will definitely be a change. Everin eyed her. It is best we don't know, lest it influence the creation of our new forms. Oh, I know. I've been through this several times now. What I can say is you have so much ahead of you both, said Sazrissa. She frowned while inspecting the others. I know it must be sad to move on. But where you're going... To the main form, there'll be a lot to experience still. Dr. Snowden ran a hand over his mouth. 
Yeah, I'm sure there will be an adjustment. Travail furrowed his brow. So to summarize, we might see a future Everin and V, but we won't see Dr. Snowden, Emily, Kess, or Jelton anymore. That's my understanding, too, said Seer. You're both right, said Sazrissa. I'm just thankful I had an opportunity to meet everyone. Travail rubbed his chin. Well, if this is the last meeting, let's make it memorable. Maybe a cookout. Everin snapped his fingers, and a large grill with food ready to be grilled materialized. A long table with condiments materialized next to it with seating for everyone. Dr. Snowden pointed at Dravail. I like the way you think. I do too, said Dravail, pretending to dust off his chest. Before we split up, I have some additional gifts to give, said Everin. He walked over and touched both Sazrissa's and Dravail's arms. I've increased your cosmic energy's detection range to 100 feet for both of you. Dravail's eyes widened. Oh, yeah. No more of that 15 feet nonsense. Thank you, said Sazrissa. That was unexpected. Everin touched Seer's arm. The full body upgrade that V and I designed is in your Torvada, and your orb has been upgraded. I can sense it, said Seer. You've added some new functionality. I have. She hugged him. Thank you. Of course. Everin touched C.C., who resided on Dravail's back in cape form. You can now communicate digitally. It will show up in Dravail's and Sazrissa's ARIs, and with Seer, a direct connection. C.C. flew off Dravail and landed on Everin for a moment before returning. Dravail jumped. Whoa, slow down, C.C. I guess he has a lot to say. He says thank you. Everin half smiled. You can always add a voice module to him, but he really just wanted to be able to communicate more efficiently. This'll work, said Sazrissa. CC flew around in the air. She laughed. Yeah, he's happy. Okay, you boys can get to work on the grill. Dravail and Dr. Snowden took off to grill some burgers. Kess, Emily, and Jelton arranged the chairs while V and Seer stood off to the side and chatted. Everin walked over to Sazrissa. You knew I would stop in and say goodbye. That never changes in your future forms. I understand. I will have the pleasure of seeing you again in my future. She locked arms with him and laid her head on his arm. You will. But it will be my past versions. Still, I get to look forward to your future versions visiting me from this point on. He glanced at her. We have an unusual relationship. She laughed. Yep, I do wish I had more time to know this version of the gang, but it is what it is. I take it you know my other groups much better. Sazrissa stepped back. Along those lines, yes. Everin gazed off into the distance. So you know, then, of what we faced in this last event. Keleton, the Hawkscur, and Antion, said Sazrissa. Don't worry. He never comes back. I wasn't worried. You forget who you're talking to. Everin half smiled. You know me better than I know myself at this point. She swatted his arm. You care about everything. And it would be unusual for you not to worry, even if you try to regulate your cosmic energy to appear you're not worrying. Then this is my last meeting with you in this form. Sazrissa frowned. Yeah. And for the others, too. Although who knows? I might visit your main form at some point. Everin placed an arm around her. Then let's enjoy this for what it is. She soaked in the moment. Everin was a constant in her life, regardless of what form he took. She had known this time would come, as this was something future Everin and the gangs did, at least for the members of the gang that died. This would be the last goodbye to this plane form for Sazrissa, since this was the first Everin. She did look forward to having the other Everins visit her, but it would be after this event, and thankfully she would now be in sync with Everin. It excited her that she might meet future companions again after this event. She appreciated the gifts, but that was Everin being himself.
Chapter 24 Draven Prater Draxus ran his blue hand across his orange mohawk. He was helping Shayla, an elder Arkara who was a tree-like being that created Dravens from birthing pods. The Arkara were stationary and used to be able to communicate through a special Draven they spawned. However, after encountering Everin, the Arkara could now speak to the outside world. And now, with the United Planets Alliance, there was new technology that allowed the Arkara to take on a humanoid, cybernetic form. Shayla was testing her new body. The United Planets had made it strong, fast, and nimble, and mixed in with the mechanical aspects were vines from her tree form that acted like muscles. Draxus smiled when she moved around and stared out over the platform they were on. He had chosen the remote outpost due to the view of the forest valley and waterfalls. It was a warm and bright day, and he wanted her first experience outside her normal shape to be a good one. Although there was a special meeting place that all Arkara could go, it was like a separate dimension. It was always dark there with a light green mist. The United Planets had configured a hookup that allowed the Arkara to exist in a galactic virtual environment, but that was not the same as experiencing reality. Shayla danced around. Oh, I love this. Draxus extended his hand toward a waterfall in the distance. You could go there and experience water falling on you. She went to the rail guard and peered out. This is so beautiful. You're right that this is much different than the virtual world. The colors. It's quite the contrast. I've always experienced things through the consumption of Draven at the end of their lives. Their experiences became mine. But they were just that. Their experiences. I can now create my own. Draven laid a hand on her back. And you have me here to guide and protect you. She caressed his face. You're a true praetor. My sisters are excited to engage this new reality with all Draven. With the virtual world, we can now also talk long distance with others. You can also fly in ships, but also here. Shayla stared at him. Fly here how? Draxus peered down. Those are flight boots. The thrusters are on the bottom and side, and your palms also have thrusters in them. You can control it like it's a part of your body. So I just focus. She flew into the air. Concentrate on controlling your thrust. Use your hands to guide you, said Draxus. Shayla hovered, then tilted forward and moved away. She laid her arms to the side and used them to turn in the air. After a minute or so, she landed. That was incredible, she said. Draxus smiled. It sure can be. You can fly out to that waterfall if you wanted. She gazed at it in the distance. I'd like that. How long can I stay in the air? Quite a while, he said. He spun around when he sensed a massive energy burst behind him. His eyes glowed purple and his aura pulsed. His hands burst into purple flames as he aimed forward. Get behind me, he said. He furrowed his brow when he saw Everin and the gang. He was not sure who two of the members were, but the rest of the gang he knew. There was a strong energy signature coming from all of them. Everin in particular. It did not line up with what he recalled of them, and they were not supposed to be able to visit an aborted timeline. Everin bowed slightly with his right arm across his stomach. There's no need for alarm. I realize our sudden appearance may seem odd but there's an explanation. Draxus eyed them. You speak differently, and I sense large amounts of cosmic energy on all of you. Also, I don't see the Torvada. Everin extended his hand. Both of you can touch this for knowledge transfer. Draxus paused, then did so, along with Shayla. A moment later, Draxus shook his head. It is you. Shayla knelt. Our star god has returned. Everin motioned at the others. We died. But in doing so, we reformed into new forms. 
For the others, they are quasi-cosmic energy beings who will need to leave the plane. For me, I'm in this heightened state for a short time. But like the others, this plane form has to leave. V and I will be back in another form after this. I'm sure you both sense all of our cosmic energies. I do, said Draxus. Emily rushed over and hugged a startled Draxus. It's so good to see you. I hope our words of wisdom are still around. Yours in particular for everyone to remember that moment in times of chaos. The words of wisdom have been enshrined, said Draxus, placing a hand on her back. Shayla stood and hugged Everin. Draxus tossed his hands to the side, then slapped his chest. The United Planets salute. Well, in this era, said Dr. Snowden. Yes. Draxus gestured at the other two members he did not know. I don't believe we've been introduced. Jelton Stallerin, I'm a deathless rift blade in the Rift Guardians, who are from another dimension. Draxus bowed slightly. And I'm Kess. I'm an Orion from far in the future in the main timeline, as I heard it described. I'm pleased to meet the both of you, said Draxus. If it's not known already, I'm Draxus, the Draven Praetor, and next to me is Shayla and Arkara, who are the lifeblood of our species. Kess smiled. Albert talked quite a bit about that summons and dealing with Salazar. Draxus scowled. I'm glad he has been dealt with. We all are, said Shayla. Jelton motioned at her, and Emily filled me in on the Dravens and our car. Your culture is fascinating. Thank you, she said. She chuckled. Oh, you're her mate. And Dr. Snowden is Kess's. How can you tell? he asked. Shayla moved her finger between Jelton and Emily. I can sense it. As an Arkara, I'm adept at detecting fluctuations, and I can see both relationships. That's awesome, said Emily. Draxus high-fived V. Don't think we've forgotten what you did for us. It's an honor to be in your presence. That goes for all of you. However, I'm curious as to what could have killed you. This is a powerful group. It is perhaps best not to know too much, said Everin. I understand, said Draxus. Dr. Snowden examined Shayla. I see you have a body now. I do, and I was testing it with Draxus, she said. You can fly, said Emily. V tilted his head. And you have an advanced integration between plant and machine. Yes, to both, said Shayla. All our Kara have bodies now, and we can move among those we have created. These bodies are meant only to communicate, but they also have the necessary parts to create a new community tree if needed. An efficient backup plan, said V. She frowned. I'm struggling to believe you all died. Yet, you are here, and now you have to leave our reality. Everin nodded. Then I would ask that you meet with the other Arkara one last time. My sisters would never forgive me if you came and I did not attempt a gathering. He smiled. We can do that. Draxus relaxed. I'm glad that it seems we have some time before you need to go. Emily swatted his arm. You didn't think we were going to drop in and then leave right away, did you? Of course not. Everin raised a finger. I wanted to give you a gift before we meet with the others. Your presence is enough for us, said Shayla. I understand. However, as this is an aborted timeline, I can alter things here. On the moment of your sister's deaths due to Salazar, I have moved them to your special meeting place. They are without body, but you can now provide that. You... You resurrected them? Not quite. I simply redirected their bond to your special meeting place in the past to now. I then allowed them to transfer there fully prior to their physical death. Shayla shuddered. My lost sisters await me? Indeed. Shayla got on bended knee alongside Draxus. You say you're not a god? Then you do this? 
Please rise, said Everin. I am not a god, but for the moment I do have powerful abilities. Shayla and Draxus complied. Everin laid a hand on Draxus's shoulder. You're a wild-born conduit with cosmic energy inside of you. You now have more cosmic energy inside of you. You are truly unique among the Dravens. Draxus performed a United Planets salute. I won't let you down. I don't think you will. Draxus had accepted he would never see the gang again, but to have them reappear ignited emotions from the last time they had left. The new gifts were powerful and would change everything for the Dravens. There was so much he wanted to discuss with them, and he would have the time to do so. He had always dreamed of what he would say if they came back, and now he could do so in a stronger body. Ambassador Hyako of the dog-like Wutan Empire inspected the city from his luxurious veranda. His day had been packed with meetings, and whenever he talked with the Cronins, the Wutan's former enslavers who were humans, it was an odd experience. They were now equals, but Yego had seen images from Earth in the past where dogs and humans lived together as best friends. He grinned when he recalled Dr. Snowden going over all the various breeds on Earth and how Yego had mentioned how many resembled his friends. It had been an enlightening experience, one that he treasured. Everin and the gang had ensured a bright future for a new galactic alliance spearheaded by the Orions, and in particular, Kess. She was one of the busiest people he knew, but when she had gone to Earth a few times, she had invited him. He loved visiting there, and it was a stark contrast to the Cronins. He wished he could spend more time with the gang, but his profile had soared since the new alliance had formed. He was trusted by many and had risen up the ranks. What surprised him was that there were other uplifted species outside the Wutan Empire that he had thought were extinct. They came out into the light when the Alliance was created, and the Cronins no longer were in charge of everything. There was a cat race called the Kritkara that he had thought were gone, yet they now had small enclaves on Wutan worlds. It was a new and exciting time. He growled when a whooshing sound erupted from behind him. He spun around with bared fangs, then froze in place. Everin and the gang had arrived out of seemingly thin air. Don't be alarmed, said Everin. I... Chess? She smiled as she walked over and hugged him. It's me. What's going on? He asked. Emily rushed over and embraced him, then scratched him behind the ears. Yago relaxed and wagged his tail. You're different, long story. Jelton Stalrin, he said, extending a hand. Yago returned the handshake. Ambassador Yago of the Wutan Empire. I'm not sure if the others have spoken of me. Jelton crooked a thumb at Kess. She has, and it's an honor to meet you, my friend. Likewise, said Yago. He greeted the others. Then they all sat on some chairs that manifested out of thin air. Yago glanced at Everin. Yes, something is definitely different. As Emily mentioned, it's a long story, he said. While we can fill you in on some details, the rest is better left unknown. I got this, said Kess. Yago's ears drooped when he learned that they had died, then reformed into some type of energy beings. He could sense their raw power, even though he had no exotic energy in him. Kess seemed like the person he had always known, and it hit him hard that she would be leaving this reality, it boggled his mind that something had been able to kill the gang. They had taken on a subverse being and come out on top, and although they did not name what had killed them, it must have been a cosmic being of supreme power. He whimpered at the thought of not seeing them again. Especially Kess. This is sad news, he said, frowning. The group went quiet as Kess held him tight. He shuddered when he thought of a future without her. While Everin and V would come back, Yago would never see Dr. Snowden or Emily again, and Yago had not even had the opportunity to know Jelton. Kess had been his mentor through trying times, and she was the face of the Alliance. While it could go on, everything would seem a bit darker without her light. I know you can handle things with me gone, 
said Cass. Perhaps, but I don't want to, he said. She pulled back and squeezed his arm. Life will go on, and I'll never forget you. He dipped his head. We live long lives, and I didn't think it would be without your presence. He moved his finger out in an arc at the others, or all of yours for that matter. I thought I would get to see Earth more and maybe even travel with you for one of your outings. Everin knelt and laid a hand on Iago's shoulder. You will see me and V again. That you can count on. Oh, I'd like that, said Iago. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. We don't have to leave right away. Yes, we can stay for a while, said V. Iago grimaced. My last opportunity to see you all. I'm glad you stopped in to say goodbye. He sighed as he looked out over the city. Then I'd appreciate it if you all could stay a while. I'd like my last moments with you all to be good ones. Of course, said Everin. He handed Iago a cube. Although Kess has some of this information in her personal data, this information cube has Earth's history up to the creation of the United Planets. You will be the only one to know of these things, and as it is historical, there is little worry of knowledge pollution. Iago studied the cube. I look forward to examining it. Thank you. Everin dipped his head. Iago eyed Kess. What about the other Orions? I'll talk to them after this, said Kess. They'll look to you as a leader. She ran her hand across the back of his neck. Waves of relaxation washed over him. It was well known that Wutans liked having their necks massaged, but only by those they trusted. It was a sign of respect to let someone do that, and Kess had more than earned that. It also strengthened their bond, and he was overcome by the thought of not seeing her again. She scratched him behind the ears when he lay against her arm. This was the last thing he had expected, and now he would need to endure this new chapter in the Alliance without one of his most influential members. While he was sure other Orions would step up, they were not Kess. Emily sat next to him and ran her hand along his back. In the short time Iago had known her, there had been an instant connection. Her misted eyes gave away how she felt, and for the moment he was in sync with her. He basked in the attention as others came over and touched his arms and shoulders. He wished everyone was like the gang. Blake Brown, an ancient vampire, gazed out over the lush jungle that Sarah Olson, a newly turned ancient vampire, hunted in. He had been through a rough event where he had thought he would die, but instead he had lived. The loss of his best friend still aided him, as did the loss of one of his crew. But he now had his first disciple after having been exiled from Earth long ago, it boggled his mind that just a month ago he had been able to meet Everin and V for the first time. Blake had even gotten to meet the daedroled Prince Drulkon, the Destroyer, the creator of the ancient vampires. It had been a day of days meeting such powerful entities, and even more exciting in that he had also gotten to meet his master and old friends for a month. Everything seemed to be going good, but he knew there was still a tough road ahead. He was already slated to become the fifth ancient vampire lord, and there was a lot of work to do to establish the ancient vampires in Fedorian space and beyond. He had been tasked with not only that, but also finding a portal. To that end, he would work with Sandus. He growled and pulled out his dual blades when a surge of energy erupted behind him. He paused when he saw Everin and V, along with four others he did not know. Everin? he asked, putting his dual blades back. Indeed. I know you will have questions, so let me summarize the situation. Before I do that, let me introduce the others. You may not know them, but they have heard much about you. Blake bared his fangs as he extended his hands to the side. All good, I hope. So everyone knows, I'm Blake Brown. Emily laughed. <laughs> Lord Vigon said you said that a lot. He is wise, said Blake. Oh, I'm Emily Snowden, 
she said, extending a hand. Blake kissed it and smiled. Nice to meet you. Blake, said Everin, eyeing him. Blake chuckled. <laughs> right. Jelton cleared his throat. Jelton Stallerin, Deathless Riftblade of the Rift Guardians. Also Emily's boyfriend. Got it, said Blake, shaking Jelton's hand. I'm Dr. Albert Snowden. I've heard so much about you from Lord Noskov. Blake nodded as he returned a half handshake and back pat. I miss him. And Earth to some degree, although out here is my new world. Cass extended her hand. I'm Cass, an Orion from the far future. I assume you'll kiss my hand, too. Blake complied. And more, if you wish. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. Oh, you're Dr. Snowden's girlfriend, I'm guessing. He's my boyfriend, she said, smiling. Blake grinned. I love the sass. He high-fived V. Always good to see you. Ada is going to be pissed she didn't get to see you. I will visit her after we leave here, said V. She'll love it. And you and Everin speak differently, said Blake. He studied the group. Your cosmic energy is off the charts. Now I'm curious how you snuck up on me. He stood entranced as Everin described dying, spawning new energy forms, and now going around on a goodbye tour. It saddened him that he would not see the first form of Everin and V again, but he was bolstered that he had gotten to meet the gang that had been described to him in the past. There were always big events going on around him, but the event Everin described was on a different level. Fighting a corrupt plane form seemed like a death sentence, and it apparently had been for Dr. Snowden, Emily, Jelton, and Kess, and they were not weak. It put into perspective where Blake stood. Holy shit. You all have been through the ringer. But you're looking good. For dead people. He said. Dr. Snowden smiled. I'm not complaining. I wouldn't either. Everin handed Blake a glowing marble. This will glow in the presence of any Everin. Blake rolled it around in his palm. I take it, then, that I'll definitely be seeing more of you and V? Most likely. To that end, I have given you some coordinates to a portal. Blake tapped at his forearm device. An alert showed that his secure database had a new entry. No one should have been able to add anything to it, but for someone like Everin in this state, that was not an issue, it seemed. The coordinates showed the portal to be in a planet about 64,000 light years away. Wasn't expecting that. Thank you. It's quite far away. Indeed, said Everin. Also of note is that it is in the ruins of a city deep inside a mountain. There are also several civilizations to pass through to get there that may not be friendly. Blake flashed his hands out. A challenge. Sounds like a party to me. But seriously, thank you. I expected it would take a few centuries to find one. It will not be easy to retrieve, and it's depowered. To that end, you will find a crate of rift crystals on the Excelsion, Make sure they stay safe. You got it. Just gearing up for a trip like this will be some effort, and it looks like a lot of unknown space is tossed in there. Everin's eyes glowed. No match for you, Blake pointed at him. Damn right. I'm honored to be a part of your goodbye tour. I really wish I had gotten to meet you on Earth more. I have observed you over your four centuries there, although I skipped most of Italy. What happened there? asked Emily. Everin raised an eyebrow. He was quite frisky. Blake guffawed. Aw, oh, come on. It was my first century as an ancient vampire. I was just sampling my new life. And then some. Dr. Snowden gestured out. Although I've never met her, I can sense Sarah out there. What's she doing? She's honing her hunting skills, said Blake. This moon has a predator the size of a dog that's quick and can move fast through the jungle. She's to bring it to me. Alive. Ah, so she's also learning restraint, said Dr. Snowden. Blake made a finger gun at him. Bingo. She'll move on to humanoids soon enough. 
His face turned serious. So, how long can you all stay? I have a million questions ranging from how everyone is doing on Earth to your new forms and what happens next. And although this is my first time meeting four of you, I'd like to hear about your experiences. We have some time, said Everin. Excellent. Oh, and you might want this, said Everin, handing Blake a stone. Is that a Daedrold stone? Everin's eyes glowed. Indeed it is. Blake puffed his cheeks. Damn, these are really rare. I've only seen one, and only for a brief moment. You just need to trust someone to use it on you, said Emily. Got it. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. And a lot of energy to activate it, if it's filled. I'll take any pointers you all might have, said Blake. Blake realized how rare this moment was. He had heard of Dr. Snowden and Emily from when Everin and V had last visited, and Lord Noskov and Lord Vigon had also mentioned them. Jelton and Kess had been mentioned as well, although not in the context of being significant others. Blake was happy he would have the opportunity to meet the full gang, but it also made him realize how much he missed out on not being on Earth. Chapter 25 Jake Melkins yawned after he woke up in his tent. The previous day, camping with Robert, his dad had been perfect. They had fished, cooked what they caught, had a few beers, and sat around a campfire and talked. Jake took every opportunity he could to spend time with his dad, and with a few days off from work, this trip was already off to a great start. His mind drifted to Kathy. Things were going well with her, and he could see marrying her some day. She was his anchor now, and although she was glad to be at college, he knew it tore her up to be far away. It did him too. His nose flared when a fresh bacon smell wafted through the tent. That meant Robert had already started making breakfast. Jake made sure he was decent, then crawled out. Robert pointed at a pot sitting on a rock. Coffee's ready. Jake smiled when he grabbed a cup, tore a packet of sugar and dumped it in, then poured in some coffee. He eyed the bacon and ham slices being cooked along with some eggs. There were also some shredded hash browns with cheese and onions. The overall odor made him salivate. He took a seat on one of the fold-out chairs next to the fire. Looks good. It better be, said Robert, laughing. We're not exactly roughing it out here, but... This is good enough. A bright flash popped up in front of them. Jake jumped up and spilled his coffee when Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V materialized. Whoa! Robert dropped his spatula. Everin, there's no need for alarm. Please, sit, said Everin. Jake eyed them, then sat along with Robert. What's going on? I can explain, said Everin. He snapped his fingers and more chairs appeared. They all sat. We died. But before we exit the plane, we wanted to stop in and say goodbye, said Everin. What? asked Jake, his pulse quickening as he stood. How? I don't want to give too many details other than to say a corrupted form of mine attacked us. We didn't survive. Emily crooked her thumb. To be fair, Uncle Albert and I were physically killed. Everin and V sacrificed themselves to resurrect us into a new form. You look the same, said Robert. Emily stood, then turned into a pure energy being before launching into the air. She flew back down and assumed her human form, then sat. Wow, said Jake. You're like pure energy. Quasi, said Dr. Snowden. Jake gulped. Uh, didn't you have any companions that helped prevent this? Everin's eyes glowed. We did. But you do not know who they are at this point in your personal timeline. What do you mean? I'm at a knowledge level that tells me this. But you knew of our fates from this point on, but not our companions. That is why they are not here. You will learn of that later. Jake wrinkled his brow. So many mysteries. Even in death. 
Everyone went silent when he walked over and bear-hugged Everin after he stood. A flood of emotions ran through Jake. It was Everin who had freed him and Kathy from Grecho, and with that given him a second chance at life on Earth. Although Robert was his real dad, Everin was like a second one. He embodied order in a world of chaos. Tears rolled down Jake's face at the thought of never seeing this Everin again. From what Jake understood, Everin and V could reform, but that did not sound like an option for Dr. Snowden and Emily. Even then, it would be a different to Everin, or maybe the same. He was not fully sure. He had only heard snippets from Emily. Everin rubbed his back. It's okay. You'll see V and me again. I can't say that of Dr. Snowden or Emily. Jake whimpered. I don't want you to go. Everin laid his hands on Jake's shoulder when he stepped away. You're one of my anchors. That means you'll always see me in one form or another. Jake wiped his eyes. I'm glad for that. He exhaled at Dr. Snowden and Emily. I don't want you guys to go either. Dr. Snowden embraced Jake and Emily joined them. May I join? asked V. Everyone laughed as he squeezed in. Jake appreciated the light-hearted moment, but his heart hurt. Dr. Snowden and Emily were family to him. They had been kind and helped him adjust, not just with advice, but by physically being there for many new events. It was like a warm blanket had been ripped off in a frozen environment. He cleared his throat after everyone disentangled. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be all emotional. It's understandable said Everin. You'll still see these versions for a while, and also, once again, soon after this moment. Really? Yes. Our last time together is not this event, but one in the future where we meet with all the ancient vampire lords. Mikhail and Robert will be with you when you fly the lords around, and then you can join them. Jake puffed his cheeks. Sounds good. You don't have to leave right away, do you? No. We can stay the night if you wish. I'd like that. Dr. Snowden grinned at Robert. We can have a good campfire tonight. Count on it, he said. I'm just happy you considered us enough to stop in and say goodbye. Of course, said Everin. I hope we didn't interrupt your breakfast too much. Robert dipped his head toward the pan he had set to the side. More than enough, if you're hungry. Dr. Snowden eyed the food. If you insist. I do. The group laughed again. Jake was eager to know more about the gang's experience. Their new forms were powerful, but they were not like he remembered them. Although they had died, being reborn as energy beings was a nice surprise. It made him thankful for what he had. Exiting the plane would have meant leaving Robert and Kathy behind. While he would still be glad to be alive... It would hurt to be without them. Thankfully, he had some time to explore the gang's new existence. Lord Vigon exited onto a grassy plain. He had met up with natives of the land for some blood drinking and fun. The two sisters had snuck out of their camp, and he had shown them pleasures he was sure they had never experienced before. It was much nicer than the few people he had had to kill due to misunderstandings. The sisters he had played around with were the ones he had saved from some men in fur clothing. Although Lord Vigon had handled them and freed the women, he was surprised they had not run away. Instead, they were curious, something he was more than happy to oblige. He scanned the planes as he thought about how everything had gone since Everin and the gang had left him and the ancient vampire lords Noskov, Scar, and Cyrus here at a nearby cave six months earlier, around 10,100 B.C. Lord Vigon had had to pretend he had not known much of what was going on when the other lords had awoken, and it had not taken long to figure things out from some of the items left behind. Lord Vigon had been surprised to learn that there had been some information on his and the other lords' wrist devices. They had a map of the world, locations of major groups, and some specific places like where certain people were. 
There was also a note from Everin telling them to be safe. Everin was known to the other lords, so they chalked the situation up to him having saved them. Lord Vigon and the others took some time figuring out what they wanted to do. Creating disciples was a high priority, and to prevent overlap, they agreed to spread out. Lord Noskov went to some place called Asia, whereas Lord Scar journeyed to South America, and Lord Cyrus traveled to Europe. These places had strange names, but each lord was eager to start their journey. Now it was just Lord Vigon alone at the cave. He had North America, and there was a lot of it to explore. Per the information on Earth, he had planned to go east first. It would be a long trip, and he needed to ensure he was always near a blood source. While the replicator in the cave could make some, it would be cumbersome to carry blood packets around. Although he tried to hide it, the thrill of the hunt excited him. He had to be careful, though, since there were many other powerful non-humans. While the humans were technologically primitive, they had weapons that could cause serious harm. They also tended to travel in groups. The natives he had encountered were afraid of him for the most part, and he avoided encounters with them if possible. He soaked in the sun as he stretched. Although he had not anticipated spending the morning making love to the sisters, he was glad he had. He had gotten his fill of blood, and he felt like he could do anything. A part of him already missed the other lords. He had a strong bond with them, and even more so since they were alone on this new and strange world. His senses went wild when he focused on a bare patch of ground in front of him. Everin and the gang appeared, but their energy levels were way off. He recognized Jelton from when the Cosmic Sapper had been built at the Rift Guardian's headquarters. He also recognized Kess from when Dr. Snowden's mind had been worked on. Hello, said Everin. Lord Vigon studied them. I would say, back so soon? But you all are energy beings of some type. Powerful ones at that. I assure you, it's us, said Everin. He gestured at him. We dropped you off here with the other three ancient vampire lords after helping you and Siverin deal with Wardax. Dr. Snowden scoffed. Oh, Wardax, glad he's been dealt with. Lord Vigon's eyes narrowed. And I'm glad I didn't die. Emily laughed. You're testing us. You did die. But we brought you back with the Daedrold Stone. It is you. She rushed over and hugged him. Of course it is, you goof. Lord Vigon relaxed. Even if they were imposters, it would be hard to distinguish that. But they had information only the gang would know. He high-fived V, embraced Kess, gave Dr. Snowden a half-shake and hug, then forearm shook with Everin and Jelton. Lord Vigon furrowed his brow. Where's Zatorvata? I didn't sense you arriving, but then again, I can't ever sense it. We didn't arrive with one, said Everin. He paused. We died and evolved. In this form, I can move us around as needed before we are ejected from the plane. Lord Vigon's throat constricted. You, you died. How? It's a long story. Although I would normally not explain it, you're one of my anchors, and as such, I will. Also, you have knowledge of our future interactions, so this would only add to it. All right, said Lord Vigon. Perhaps we can go back to my cave. We don't want to be caught out here by the natives. As they walked, Kess sidled up next to him. How have things been since you've been here? Actually good. Lord Scar is on his way to Europe. Cyrus to South America, and Noskov to Asia. And you got North America, she said. Lord Vigon grinned. So far. Although I've only explored within about ten miles or so. Emily moved to his other side. How are you handling your blood needs? The matter replicator we left behind? That helps. But the natives have been good to me. She eyed him. 
killing and taking blood? Lord Vigon smiled. No. Well, some who attacked me, but the main source is two sisters. Kess chuckled, and I'm sure you convinced them. They seem to enjoy the experience. The group laughed. As they turned a corner, Dr. Snowden motioned at Lord Vigon. Have you met with Delia Everoak yet? Not yet. But I plan to, said Lord Vigon. Me and the other lords have a plan to meet everyone. Your meetings will go well, said V. I hope so. Jelton waved around. Have you encountered other non-humans? Lord Vigon sighed. Unfortunately. One said he was a bear god, and then... He tried to fight me over the sisters. It didn't go well for him. Another was a group of vampires passing by. They attacked me and the other lords, but left quickly once they realized what they were fighting. You've had a busy time then, said Everin. Oh, yeah. But you know what? I'm happy to be alive. And these last six months have been invigorating. Emily wrinkled her brow. You must miss the other lords. Lord Vigon frowned. Yeah, but it is what it is. We have to spread out and build numbers without overlapping. Building our houses will take time. We also planned for the future. How to gain wealth and establish ourselves. It's not an easy road since there are these... Hillians to deal with, and other powerful factions, but we will learn. A wave of nostalgia washed over him at being around the gang. It was a feeling of utter safety in a new world. While he could handle himself like the other lords, there was no need at this moment. He did not care for the idea that the gang had died, and he was eager to understand more about that. It also helped that he would see them all again in the future and have more time with them. After fifteen minutes, they reached the cave. Look familiar? he asked with a grin. It sure does, said Dr. Snowden. Everin snapped his fingers, and a series of chairs and a bonfire appeared. We can discuss things here. Lord Vigon gulped. It was obvious that Everin in this form was beyond powerful, Whatever had killed the gang must have been just as strong, if not stronger. After everyone was seated, Everin glanced at him. Before we begin, know that we'll appear to you one last time in the future in these forms. At that point, you'll bring the other lords, along with three others you have not met yet, together here on 12-15-2013 at 1 o'clock p.m. A very specific date, said Lord Vigon. He wagged a finger. That must be right after you left for this recent event. You're very observant, and yes, that's correct, said Everin. And these three I have not met. How will I know to bring them? Everin smiled. You'll know who they are when the time comes, all right. Lord Vigon examined him. Your speech has changed. I'm guessing it's no longer limited by Zatorvata. You're right, said V. Even I'm affected. Lord Vigon went to wave his hand around when a glass of chilled blood materialized in it. Everyone else had a drink. I was going to offer something to drink or eat, but this works too, he said. Everyone sipped their drinks. The blood was the right consistency and had a slight tinge of pepper to it. Lord Vigon had never tried that before, but he liked it. This was going to be an interesting day, and it excited him that he would be able to watch them grow up in the future, although the thought of a final date bothered him. That was far away. Although Lord Noskov did not mind meeting up with the other ancient vampire lords at the cave where they had first arrived on Earth, he had many things to attend to. Lord Vigon had called the meeting at a very specific time. It was 12.15-2013 at 12.30 p.m., and the others had not yet arrived, 
Mikhail, Jake Melkins, and Robert, his dad, would be arriving soon with Lord Vygon. The cave was as Lord Noskov had remembered it. It was a sort of unknown meet-up spot if things went south, but he had set up safe houses all across the planet. He recalled starting with nothing but some knowledge, then expanding into the global organization he ran with an iron fist. Although it was a part of the ruling group of the Earth Ward, he ensured that his organization was top-notch. Lord Scar had also been busy. Although his group was smaller than Lord Noskov's, it was comparable in strength. Unlike Lord Noskov, Lord Scar kept to the shadows. He was a sort of information broker and had many of his disciples in the network. Lord Cyrus dealt with various groups like Lord Vygon, and they were usually who other factions talked to. Lord Noskov was fine with letting those two serve as the public face of the ancient vampires, but they deferred to him as the anchor. They all had an unshakable bond that was over 15,000 years old. Although 12,000 of those years had been on this earth, they had been close for 3,000 years on Drydus, their home planet in another universe. Lord Noskov was the first to arrive to the cave, but he sensed Lord Cyrus and Lord Scar rushing in. They had most likely parked five miles or so out and run the rest of the way. They would not be easy to track at the speeds they could move. Doing so in a chaotic pattern would also add to that. He recalled their first fight as a group long ago when a pack of fourteen blooded vampires had thought it was a good idea to take on four ancient vampire lords. He had personally killed three, while Lord Vygon had demolished two, and Lord Cyrus and Lord Scar had each crushed one. The blooded had lost half their group in less than thirty seconds before they realized what they had stumbled into. He grinned when both lords arrived. They had their typical black tactical suit hidden underneath a black robe that was more cape than anything else. It helped obscure them on their way in. It surprised him that Caleb Citrin, Lord Scar's enforcer, had not come. Or maybe he had and kept to the fringes. That would live up to his nickname as Shadow. Lord Noskov, good to see you, said Lord Cyrus. Lord Noskov forearm shook with him and Lord Scar. Always, brothers. Lord Scar surveyed the environment. Some memories here? Indeed. Lord Cyrus furrowed his brow. Any idea why we were here? This is unusual to schedule something suddenly like this and to require all of us. Lord Noskov shrugged. Our brother, Lord Vygon, is always full of surprises. Don't we know it? He kept something secret for over twelve thousand years, said Lord Cyrus. We'll know more in thirty minutes. Lord Noskov did not like surprises, but Lord Vygon was a master of secrets. When Everin and the gang had come to Lake Baikal in the past, Lord Noskov had to pretend he did not know them due to an earlier meeting with Lord Vygon. He had only said it was another version of Everin, how things were to play out, and that was it. It was not until much later that Lord Noskov found out it was the gang that had saved them and brought him and the other lords to Earth. Lord Noskov knew that Lord Vygon had more secrets into the future, a lot of them had to do with traveling with Everin and his many forms from the past. Although Lord Noskov was close with Everin and the gang, Lord Vygon was even closer. He had even traveled with Everin twice. As if on cue, Lord Noskov detected a ship landing nearby. Although he could not see it, he could hear and smell it. It was Jake's scout ship that had dropped off Lord Noskov earlier. Looks like he's here said Lord Noskov, heading off with the others in tow. When they got to a nearby field, Lord Vygon, in his light black armor, emerged out of thin air. Jake, Robert, and Mikhail followed him after Jake closed the ship's side door. Brothers, it's been a while, said Lord Vygon with his arms outstretched. Lord Noskov grinned when Lord Vygon did a handshake and back pat on everyone. That was something he had picked up from Dr. Snowden, and it seemed to be something Lord Vagon liked to do. 
Lord Noskov had seen Jake, Robert, and Mikhail only an hour or so ago, and they professed to have no idea about this meeting. Sure has, said Lord Cyrus. We've still got some time before we were to meet. Lord Scar nudged Jake. Always good to see you, little brother. And you too, he said, pushing back. Lord Vigon grinned. Let's go inside and wait. You're not even going to drop a hint, asked Lord Scar. Patience is a virtue. They all looked at him before laughing. Lord Noskov missed having time like this. With everyone dealing with their own areas, it was usually only one or two that he got to see. All four together was rare. After reaching the cave and settling in, they had some light discussion. Lord Vigon raised a hand. All right. The reason we're here. Finally, said Lord Noskov. Lord Vigon pointed at a space in front of the group. Five, four, three, two, one. Everin and the gang appeared, along with Jelton and Kess. Lord Noskov's senses flared up. The gang was far more powerful than he recalled, and the fact that they could appear without being detected was also unusual. And here they are, just like I said that they would be, said Lord Vigon. You said no such thing, said Lord Cyrus. Welcome back, said Jake, waving. Lord Scar inspected him, then the group. You're all way more powerful than I recall. Everin motioned around. It's good to see you all. We just saw Lord Vigon a few moments ago, although it was six months after you all had arrived here on Earth. Before that, we met with Jake and Robert at a time before we went off to deal with Zika. As for our current state, we died and reformed, and we wanted to stop here and see you all before we have to leave the plane. Lord Noskov's throat constricted. You died. Yeah, and it sucked, said Emily. She smiled big, but now we're quasi-cosmic beings. I'm sure you can sense that. I can, said Mikhail with wide eyes. We can for sure, said Lord Noskov. How did you die and become what you are? Emily checked with Everin, who nodded. It's a long story. But in summary, we fought a being that had taken over one of Everin's initial plane forms and was powerful enough to kill us. Everin sacrificed his plane form to become what he is now, and through the use of a cosmic shard, we were reborn. Like a dead rolled stone, except for all of you, said Lord Vigon. Lord Noskov frowned. I'm bothered that you died. But you have to leave too. Yes said V. We're too powerful to exist in this state. The plane will eject us soon. A corrupt Everin, said Mikhail, shaking his head. I can't even imagine how powerful that would be. It took us down, my friend, said Jelton. Mikhail growled. I wish you could have come and got us. Torvada disappeared on us, said Kess. Otherwise, I could have brought in a galactic fleet and Jelton, the Rift Guardians. But the Torvada had other ideas. My analysis is that it didn't want to be captured, said V. That sounds chaotic, said Mikhail. Lord Noskov scrutinized V. You and Everin sound different. You didn't start your sentence with analysis. No Torvada filter, said V. I see. Lord Noskov ran a hand over his mouth. So, this is our last meeting together. You'll see Everin and me again in new forms. However, for the others, yes, this is their last time. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. We might be able to visit in the Torvata, but we wouldn't be able to step out of it. Assuming it will let us on, even. Yeah, that part sucks, said Emily. Lord Noskov drew his lips flat at Jelton and Kess. And I was looking forward to getting to know the both of you better. It's okay, my friend, 
said Jelton. Kess furrowed her brow. I was looking at maybe staying on Earth. We would have had a lot of time to get to know each other. It took a lot for Lord Noskov to be moved, but the gravity of the event hit him hard. He considered the gang to be a part of his extended family, and that was not something he did often, and now they would be gone except for Everin and V. Lord Scar grimaced. We wouldn't even be here had you not all stepped in. We're glad everything worked out, said Everin. You all have flourished here. Lord Cyrus dipped his head. It's not quite what we had on Drydus, but this is a good start, and I'm sure you will get back to that point in the future. Lord Cyrus eyed him. You've seen it? I can't say much, but your future is bright, said Everin. We visited Blake Brown in 2032 AD, and as a part of our goodbye tour, he has been set on a path. Lord Noskov liked hearing that. He had already seen Blake Brown recently after a big event, and he was on track to be the fifth ancient vampire lord. The ancient vampires would expand beyond Earth, and when it was brought into the fold of the Galactic Empire, or Blake Brown found a controllable portal, things would really take off. There was a lot to look forward to. Lord Noskov eyed Jake and Robert. I get Lord Vigon having cigarettes. But it seems you two did as well. Even from me, said Mikhail. Jake crooked a thumb at Everin. His rules? I figured, said Lord Noskov. Lord Vigon stood. Well, it's not Lord Noskov's base, but I think we can do one last cookout. Right? Dr. Snowden snorted. Of course, even in this new form, I still crave burgers. Then that we shall have. I stockpiled everything needed just in case. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger at him. Uh, before we go, I had a question. Go ahead, said Lord Vigon. All right, uh, you were going to say something to us after we had dealt with the Overlord and were going to the Torvata in Atlantis. Lord Vigon grinned and bared his fangs. Yes, I almost broke timeline integrity and offered the information about your futures, in particular about Vordax and potentially arriving earlier to save Drydus. Emily's eyes widened. That would have had a huge impact if your world had been saved. I know, he said, looking down. Lord Noskov grimaced. A big impact for sure, but saving our race. I understand your conflict. I bit my tongue. Literally, said Lord Vigon. Appreciate the answer, said Dr. Snowden. Lord Noskov stood with the others. He had not known that Lord Vigon had almost defied the timeline to save other ancient vampires. It brought up some emotions about seeing those he considered friends, but were now long dead. Although he was happy with where the ancient vampires were now, thinking about the rest of his kind with him fired up his imagination. He focused back on the present. It seemed fitting to have one last cookout. Have you talked with Dalton? he asked. Not yet, said Everin. He is on our list to visit still. I would ask that no one here contact him until he reaches out. Not the problem here, said Lord Noskov. He followed the others outside. This was not what he had expected, and the news that Everin could be killed unsettled him. The Torvada deciding to leave was also a strange event in itself. There were many questions Lord Noskov wanted answered. Jake chased after Emily when she had swatted his arm while rushing by. Jake and Robert had been entrusted with Everin's secrets. That was a high sign of trust. Jake had been the technical guide for Lord Noskov's base after Everin had given it to Lord Noskov. Jake was far beyond any human, and despite not containing any exotic energy, he was more advanced in Lord Noskov's eyes. Dr. Snowden squeezed Lord Noskov's arm. You coming? Lord Noskov grinned, baring his fangs. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Chapter 26 
Inspector Dalton Kingston, Earth Ward, leaned on his balcony's guardrail at his base north of Columbus, Ohio. It had been a quiet day. Rick Westmoreland, Valerie Simmons, and Todd Armani were in a cabin in upstate New York. Rick was still working through having been controlled by a shadowverse being. Valerie was there to soothe him and also as his unofficial girlfriend, and Todd was Rick's best friend. Dalton figured Rick just needed time. Evot, an AI that had her base augment in Dalton and controlled two nanobot servbots housed in Dalton's upper arms, had a servbot in the air as a crow. The other was out on a date with team member Brad Washington, a wild-born who could talk to technology, and also her boyfriend. Dalton wished Aphrodite was around, but she was off in Europe at a conference. He gazed up and soaked in the starry night. The cool air was refreshing, and he enjoyed the earthy smell coming from the nearby forest. It was peaceful, and he figured he would sleep soon, although he still missed Layla, his wife, and their kids. They had moved on to the lifelink layer. He was thankful that he had been granted an opportunity to see them in the dream layer one last time thanks to Everin. It was one of Dalton's most cherished memories. The fact that he could even go to an event like that was a testament to Everin's knowledge and power. Evot landed next to him and assumed her human form. I'm back. He eyed her. I figured you would allocate all your processing to Brad. I will sync with my other servbot when they return. Dalton scrutinized her. I think you like the anticipation. She smiled. It has increased the polling on certain states in my processing. And you're happy when the states have value. And until you sync, they're not fulfilled. That equates to excitement for you. Evot stared at him. You're teasing me. Dalton laid a hand on her shoulder. Not at all. I'm happy that you're happy, and it brings me joy to see you grow. Thank you. I enjoy seeing you grow as well with Aphrodite. He pretended to inspect the ground. Yeah. She tilted her head. She's not Layla, but she is different. An opportunity for you to experience a new form of attachment. Attachment. Don't let Aphrodite hear you say that. I won't, said Evot, grinning. Dalton morphed into Scout Spectre mode when he sensed a massive surge of energy behind him. His nanoskin was now a thick armor, and he had spawned his energy shield as he spun around. Evot dissipated into a nanoswarm. Dalton and Evot morphed back when Everin and the gang appeared. Their energy signatures were off the charts, and there was only one way that could have happened— Dalton frowned. You've all died. We have, said Everin. How'd you know? asked Emily. Your APRs are high twenties, I'm guessing, said Dalton. Everin's is even higher, and that only happens if his plane form dies. If he died, then whatever killed him had done so to you and the others shortly after, and when he is in this state, he can do pretty much anything. Also, no Torvada. That means Everin is most likely teleporting you all through time and space. She hugged him, always the inspector. Dalton and Evot greeted everyone else. Evot frowned. I don't like this. It's okay, said V, walking over and putting his arm around her. Everin and I will be back in new forms, but for the others, this is their last time here. I don't want you all to go, she said looking at the group. Oh, said Kess, dashing over and hugging her. Evot had experienced a brush of mortality on their last case, and Dalton suspected she had a much better understanding of existence. This would be her first time losing those she considered close friends. He would guide her through it, but it would take some time. It would help that V would come back, but in what form Dalton did not know. He sighed. I figured this day would come, and I can't say I'm happy about it. Dr. Snowden laid a hand on his chest. Although I'm glad to be what I am now and not dead, it still hurts that we won't really be able to visit often, if at all. 
The Torvata will be here and not where we're at. There is always the off chance that whatever Everin's next version is will allow us to stop in, but I suspect whoever it is will be wrapped up. Indeed, said Everin. I can make no promises in that regard. You don't need to. I understand. But like Evot, I don't like it, said Dalton. That, and as Dr. Snowden mentioned, if the Torvada is here, it's not wherever you all are. While he put on a brave face, it killed him to know that he would not see the others outside of Everin and V, and even then they would be different versions. Dr. Snowden and Emily were his closest friends, along with Evot. He gestured at Jelton and Kess. I wish I had more time to get to know you two. It's all right, my friend. I've heard a lot more about you than you might know, said Jelton. Dalton eyed Emily. You telling secrets? She winked at him. Maybe. Kess smiled. Albert only said good things about you. I'm honored to have met you, though. Likewise, said Dalton. Evot scrutinized the group. Could Dalton and I visit you wherever you go if the Toravata allows it? A good question, said Everin. I would suspect the Toravata would do whatever its chosen wanted if they were together. Dalton perked up. Then maybe this isn't the final goodbye. Dr. Snowden grinned. We can have a cookout in the cosmic medium. Cosmic burgers. Works for me, said Dalton. The group chuckled. He felt a bit better in thinking that he could visit the others. While it would not quite be the same as having them around on Earth, it made it seem like this was not a final send-off. He glanced at Everin and V. So what can we expect with your new forms? I'm not sure, said Everin. Typically, a new plane form has its own personality. While still an Everin underneath, it may present itself very differently from the previous plane form. V tilted his head. As for me, my orb will be the same, but I'll have a new AI interface and preferences. Eva tilted her head. You'll still have memories in your data storage to call upon. Yes, but they won't be tied directly to the orb anymore. They'll be indirect references that I can use to simulate what my reaction would have been, though. She went over and stood next to him. I will assist your new form in whatever way I can. Thank you, said V, high-fiving her. Their lights glowed. Dalton's face went serious. I'd like to know what is out there that caused this. We will sink later tonight, and you can see firsthand what happened, said Everin. As a Torvata's chosen, you are entrusted to know such things. Did you already talk with Dravail and Sazrissa? I have and synced with them after our initial appearance. Sazrissa already knows my upcoming forms. Emily smiled. She still didn't tell us what they would look like. That's Sazrissa, said Dalton. He took a deep breath, then motioned into his room. Let's hang out in the lounge area. We can catch up more there. Everin touched his arm. Before we do so, know that I have given you and your team members various gifts. Really? asked Dalton. Yes, and I already met with them individually, and they accepted these gifts. Rick's Cargis Tech conditioning that surfaced in your last case is gone. Todd has been biologically altered to be faster and stronger. Valerie's regeneration has been enhanced. I've also increased the range that Brad can use when dealing with technology. He placed his hand on Evot's cheek. And the AI upgrade that V and I gave you has itself been upgraded. You can sense things better now. Evot paused. I... I can. She hugged Everin tight. Dalton cocked his head. You mean like emotions? Yes. What she has now is more sensitive, so she will have a better clarification on emotions. I appreciate you giving them gifts, and I'm sure the rest of the team did too. Everin's eyes glowed. I have not forgotten to give you something. Your Everin sense range has been doubled. A fire erupted in Dalton, causing him to wince. Once it had passed, he picked up on things around 100 feet away. Whoa, he said. He scrunched his face as he examined things nearby. I can sense things in the forest. Emily winked at him. You're like a human radar. 
I guess I am. I won't complain. Let's go inside, said Everin. Dalton struggled to maintain a cool facade as everyone followed him. The gifts were a surprise, and although they were powerful, they weren't overpowered. The next team meeting would be interesting. Evot had a whole new world to open to her, and Dalton was excited to assist her on that. Rick would be able to come back, and Todd would have more confidence. Valerie would be more resilient, and Brad's new range would unveil new tactics. His excitement was tempered by the fact that this was probably the last time he would see everyone. There were a lot of unknowns to figure out, and it was that uncertainty that unsettled him. He hoped the Toravada, or the second Everin, would let him travel to visit the others. But that might impact things. All he could do now was embrace what little time he had left with them. Q examined the Karis' systems as Everin sat in the command area that was in the middle of the ship. The Karis had undergone many upgrades after an event with Everin Prime and his crew. The Karis was no Torvada, but it could travel much faster and easier now. External sensors allowed for the walls to show what was outside and made it seem like they were floating on a platform in space. Q enjoyed his inner orb with cosmic energy. It provided new sensations that he equated to emotions. Experiencing it had been illuminating, and he could not get enough of laughing, sometimes to Everin's chagrin. There was a balance that Q strived to uphold, but he viewed everything differently since the upgrade. They had just finished visiting an ice world where a ship had crashed. All survivors had been rescued when Everin and Q had helped provide power, food, and drinks until a rescue ship could come. Q had been able to practice his updated conversational skills, and he felt a new emotion when helping others. It was a calm hum that made him want more. "'Your smiling makes me think you're having happy thoughts,' said Everin. "'An accurate observation,' said Q. "'I was processing the new sensation from my inner orb.' "'You're content because you helped others.' "'Yes, I like that feeling.' Everin smiled. Now you get to feel how I do when we do things like that. It's a great sensation. I look forward to helping others. Everin pointed at him. Now you're getting it. Q had a new appreciation for when Everin decided to interfere in events. It was not always something done, especially when it involved war. While Everin might step in if there was a severe injustice, there were not usually enough resources to handle fighting fleets with hundreds of thousands of ships. Q appreciated that they still tried, but oftentimes they had only a small impact. Another goal was to find long-lived companions. Although several had come and gone, their mortality meant that Everin had to say goodbye more times than he preferred. To resolve this, one of the criteria for a new companion or two was that they were immortal to some degree, like a matter mage. There were also those with exotic energies that would suffice as well. Q analyzed a burst of energy that appeared before them. It was Everin Prime and his crew. Q understood that when Everin Prime was around, Everin was called Siverin in reference to being the sixth out of eight plane forms to initially enter the plane. Siverin jumped up, then studied the gang. Oh, you've died. Indeed, said Everin. He raised his hand. Siverin stepped forward, and they synced. As they did so, Q greeted the others. I'm happy to see you all, although I don't understand how you died, but are here. V high-fived Q. It's a long story, but we met a corrupted Everin. So you did, said Siverin, retracting his hand from the sink. You all have had quite the journey. That we did, my friend. It's good to see you again, said Jelton. Siverin embraced him, then the others. We're just glad to still be around, said Cass. Dr. Snowden crooked a thumb at her. What she said? Siverin grinned. Quasi-cosmic beings. Look at you. That's us, said Emily. I look forward to seeing you in our main form. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. So, when you die, you'll go to your main form, right? Hopefully, said Siverin. 
and if I do, it won't be hard to look you all up. I assume you'll be traveling with our main form, who will have an avatar that appears as ever in prime to you. Of course, you'll see all the other iterations in our form. Emily drew her head back. What do you mean? Everin eyed Siverin. It's best they learn this when the time comes. Siverin laughed. All right, all right. You don't seem too down, said Kess, eyeing him. Of course not. I now know that if I die, I'll get to see you all again in our main form. I'd be down if you had not been reformed. But you have. I'm confused, said Jelton. I guess we'll find out more once we leave the plane. Siverin waved a finger between himself and Q. You will. And Q and I will see you at some point after this, and we'll have all of eternity to sort things out. Everin smiled. Indeed. I see the Karis has held up. Q processed the new information he heard as Siverin told the others of his and Q's last adventure. Q had wondered what would happen if he perished, and now he knew that since he had an inner orb with cosmic energy, he would exist in some form, perhaps similar to V. The thought of still existing after physical death provided a sense of relief, and his inner orb hummed. Although Q knew of the main form, he was not sure what it meant that the others would see all the iterations, but also see it as ever in prime. That would imply that the main form was many things at once, which was evident in that there were eight plane forms sent into the plane initially. He was not eager to leave his current form, but it did provide some comfort to know he would be around in one way or another. After Siverin finished his tale, he frowned. I'm sad that our second form's journey ended with Antion corrupting and possessing him. As am I, said Everin. However, it's been dealt with. Also, I did not fully sink with you. Siverin tilted his head. Everin smiled. I wanted to give you a gift. Although we have a method of communicating already, the Karis now has the same dimensional power source that the Toravada has. That means it can portal anywhere as needed. Oh, you're sneaky. I like it, said Siverin. Dr. Snowden waved a finger between them. You basically gave yourself a gift. Indeed, said Everin and Siverin in sync. Siverin grinned. It'll make things much easier for sure. And more importantly, I can pop in and see the ancient vampire lords now. I'll also be able to see whatever new form Everin and V take, although we already have a communication system for that. Q tilted his head at V. I look forward to seeing your new incarnation. As do I, he said. Siverin extended his hands to the side. Well, there's no rush for you to leave right away. I want to hear everything about your journeys. While I may have Everin's view, it's fun for me to hear it from other perspectives. Emily smiled. I want to hear more of what you've been up to. Oh, we can do that. She eyed Q. I also want to hear about your adjustments to your inner orb. I'd like to hear that too, said V. Q nodded. I would be happy to share. His inner orb pulsed in an orderly manner, which was new to him. He had experienced a lesser form of that and had mapped that to pleasure. This was one step beyond that. All it took was both being around Everins and having close friends to share experiences with, it gave him a better context of the bonding effect organics had. With the thought of seeing them, even after his physical death, everything was perfect for the moment. Edith flew around the clearing where Everin, or Leverin as Edith had come to call her, had parked the Toravada. Dr. James Bryson, Dan Snowden, and his two kids, Albert and Emily, roamed the nearby woods to take in the planet with no civilization on it. They were taking a break before dealing with a hadron spawn known as the Overlord. Leverin seemed worried about something which was not a good sign. The last time Edith had seen this was a few decades prior when traveling with another version of Everin. This was also around the same time that Edith had come into existence. Leverin had reformed into her current form. A lot had happened since, including the birth of twins Albert and Emily, who were both 18 now and Sarah's death only eight years later on a summons gone wrong. Despite the ups and downs, Edith had learned much, and she treasured her existence. 
However, something was off about this summons. The gang had finally discovered where the Overlord was, a heavily fortified base in another dimension. Leverin acted as if it would be their last outing together. Taking a prolonged break before the final assault was an unusual choice. I can hear you worrying above me, said Leverin. Edith analyzed her tough suit. A long black ponytail sat on her fair-skinned head, and a thin metal band stretched across her forehead and extended down the sides. Two flat, circular, metallic pieces stood out near each shoulder and attached to a cape that flowed down her back to her calves. Taking a long break before a big fight is new, said Edith, flying down and projecting her human form. Leverin walked over next to her. It'll be a tough one. It's good to go in mentally ready. Edith looked around. The others are worried about this upcoming battle. You are too. I've calculated you know something more and haven't shared it. You know me too well, but I can't say anything. Timeline thing. Edith frowned. That's an unsettling sensation for me. Leverin peered into her eyes. What's coming must happen. A bright flash caused Edith to dim her sensors. She focused on the first Everin and his gang, along with two others she did not know as they appeared out of thin air. Leverin and Edith, said Everin, bowing slightly with his right arm across his stomach. It's good to see you both. Leverin tilted her head. You've died. Yes, let us sink while Edith is caught up by the others. Edith walked over to the rest of the gang as Everin and Leverin extended their hands, palm forward, and touched. I don't have enough data to determine what's going on. V high-fived her. We can update you. Dr. Snowden and Emily hugged Edith. It's so good to see you, said Dr. Snowden with misted eyes. Is everything okay outside the dying aspect? Asked Edith. As you are all here, it would seem your deaths have created something new. Emily smiled. You got it. Oh, with us are Jelton Stollerin and Kess. They traveled with us on this last summons. Edith shook hands with both. Pleased to meet you. What are you all now? Quasi-cosmic beings, said Dr. Snowden. APR of high twenties. Intriguing. I have many questions. Leverin's eyes glowed as she stepped back from the sink, and I have answers now. Edith listened intently as everyone discussed the situation. It was a lot of information to process, but she organized it effortlessly in her memory. Their deaths were unexpected, and it was not something Edith had contemplated with Leverin and her gang. Dr. Snowden and Emily appeared to exhibit a sadness, despite Jelton and Kess not showing signs of that. I'm sorry to hear all of this, but I'm glad you still live on, said Edith after hearing everything. There is one piece of information that was not mentioned. It goes along with a gift, said Everin. She faced him. A gift? Leverin frowned. Yes, and a powerful one at that. You surmised that I was uneasy with this upcoming fight. I did. Your processing was correct. We die. However, I make sure that the Torvada does not fall into enemy hands, and yes, I know how the Overlord is defeated, but it is not by us. Edith tilted her head. This is a suicide mission. Yes. Edith had not considered not existing. She felt like she had just started a journey and had a lot of time to experience things. The news that she would no longer exist caused her inner orb to pulse erratically. I don't want to die, she said, frowning. Emily rushed over and hugged her. And you won't, said Leverin. Dr. Snowden drew his head back. I thought it always happened. Leverin grinned. It does. Due to a bad summons, I lost some cosmic energy, enough that I won't be able to leave the plane. I wasn't sure how I could do the things I was destined to do after my death if I was fully absorbed. The answer to that is that Everin has given me extra cosmic energy, the amount that I gave to you and Emily. 
Dr. Snowden's eyes lit up. So there's enough for you to leave, and Edith joins you. Yes. Dr. Snowden went over and embraced Leverin. I felt so guilty that by saving us, you would fall fighting the overlord. She rubbed his back. Know that Edith and I will see you in the cosmic medium. What about your group? asked Emily. They will be saved thanks to the boost in power, including Sarah, said Leverin. Wardax didn't get all that extra cosmic energy. You could just skip the fight, Leverin grimaced. That's not what happened. We all die and are absorbed. However, before we do so, I am able to use this extra energy to leave with the others at the point of physical death. We'll be absorbed still, but only a residue of what's left behind. Dr. Snowden stepped back and wiped his eyes. Don't they need a cosmic energy boost to transform them into quasi-cosmic beings? I handled that, said Everin. You did? Yes. And the how will be apparent once we exit the plane. Dr. Snowden snorted. It seems, despite being an evolved being, there are still mysteries abound. Leverin laid a hand on his shoulder and smiled big. Big ones. Ones you will love. Trust me on this. I trust you with my life, he said, raising his head. And you have a long journey ahead of you. Know that we will be there for you. You'd have noted Dr. Snowden's facial and body cues. Despite being a powerful being now, he exhibited human traits. He carried the guilt of believing his and Emily's infusion of cosmic energy had doomed Leverin. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. If you had kept the Torvata, you could have reformed. It would have allowed a Hadron spawn access to it. That would only lead to a very dangerous situation for everything, said Leverin. Emily frowned. You sacrificed your Torvada and your plane form to save your group. Yes, and although it hasn't happened yet, I know what needs to be done. Kess chuckled. Everins always have a plan. Indeed, said Everin and Leverin in sync as their eyes glowed. I'm not sure I fully follow, but I look forward to knowing both of you and your gang, my friends, said Jelton. Leverin gestured at him and Kess, and I know you from my sink, but I look forward to spending time with you both. As do I, said Edith. She was glad that she would exist after this fight, although she had little information on an existence as a quasi-cosmic being, or even how she would transition to one. Dan, Sarah, and Dr. Bryson being saved intrigued her. And although Edith did not have all the facts, and she had assigned a high priority to learning more after the upcoming event, despite the fact she and the others would need to die first. Chapter 27 Dr. Snowden eased back into the couch in his living quarters aboard the Torvada. Kess sat next to him and had curled up into his left arm. The whirlwind goodbye tour had been emotionally draining, but he did not feel physically or mentally weak. It was a new sensation to him, and he thought he would be sleepy, but sleeping was not something quasi-cosmic beings did. Memories were not affected, though, as he still felt sad thinking of everyone they had visited. Everin and V had taken off to deal with things for a few hours. Emily was with Jelton in her room. It did not initially make much sense why Everin and V would be gone for any time since they could just pop back a second after they had left. However, Dr. Snowden suspected that Everin wanted him and the others to take a moment to absorb everything before leaving the plane. One thing he had noticed was that there was a slight pressure on his new form. As they were saying goodbye to everyone, the pressure grew. Everin said it was the plane starting the ejection process, Thankfully, all that had gone away when they had stepped into the Toravada. The next step would be exiting the plane and starting a new chapter in his life. He had only had to die to get to this point. His mind drifted to those he had said goodbye to. Jay had brought back memories of being abducted together aboard a Crotovore ship. Dr. Snowden remembered thinking of him as a wild man. But he had instead become a good friend. It had been amazing to watch his transformation into a strong father and also his success at his job. 
Dr. Bryson's sadness pained Dr. Snowden. He wanted him to have it all, but hanging out would not really be an option anymore. Despite not knowing what lay ahead, Dr. Snowden suspected it would involve not being in the plane at all. It still did him good to see his best friend, and he had had a lot of fun with the impromptu pizza and beer party. Jane had made Dr. Snowden's heart beat faster. Although he was fully dedicated to Kess, Jane elicited strong emotions. It surprised him that he and the gang had arrived when she was supposed to die. Nonetheless, he was glad she had been able to live, and she had found another romantic interest in Bremick. Dr. Snowden missed discussing things with Andia and Rakar. They had been around for the first adventure, when Dr. Snowden and Emily had become Everin's traveling companions. This had opened Dr. Snowden's eyes to where Earth stood in relation to the rest of the galaxy, at least for their region. Like Jane, the gang had arrived at the end of Andia's and Rakar's personal timelines. Thankfully, their survival always happened and was a part of a stable timeline. He was glad they were doing well. Sandus always made Dr. Snowden laugh. His past was Sandus's future. Time travel was weird that way, and Sandus would have multiple opportunities to interact with the gang. Dr. Snowden's heart hurt watching a usually happy Sandus be down. He was more restrained, and although he tried to keep a smile, Dr. Snowden had caught a few frowns interspersed. It was as if it took everything in Sandus not to break down. Galden had kept a stoic face throughout the large feast that had been prepared. Jelton, Galden, and Brayak had led the assembled Rava in song. It was the first time Dr. Snowden had heard Everin sing, and he was pitch perfect with the other Rift Guardians. Although most of the songs were of glory, it was the farewell one that had brought Dr. Snowden to tears. It had a lot of humming while Galden and Brayak sang the words slowly and drawn out in a deep voice, similar to when Jelton had died the first time. Talandra and Zax would have died, leaving only Murukan and Grog on Murukan's team. As powerful as Murukan was, he could not be everywhere, similar to Everin. The gifts given were strong, and Dr. Snowden was delighted to see all of them, especially Talandra. Hanging out in the Torvada afterward was like old times, and despite the situation, everyone had been in a great mood. The trip to see Dravail, Sazrissa, Cece, and Seer had been rough. It felt like Dr. Snowden had just seen them, and then to meet them again to tell them a final goodbye crushed him. Sazrissa had cried hard when the gang had left on the summons to bring her to Dravail's Torvada, and now Dr. Snowden understood why. She had known they were going to die and she had been relieved that they had survived physical death. Dravail had been saddened, and Cece had flown around landing on people's backs or touching their arms. Seer acted like she loved her new upgrades, and Sasrissa had fluctuated from sad to happy several times. She knew the next Everin and V, and whatever gang that would be. Dr. Snowden wished he had more time to hang out with Dravail, Sasrissa, Cece, and Seer. It had been good to see Draxus, and Dr. Snowden felt a strong bond with him since he had gotten his cosmic energy from Dr. Snowden. It did surprise him that they could visit an aborted timeline, but apparently that was not out of reach for Everin in his current state. The restoration of the Arkara and Draxus's cosmic energy boost had been generous, and it would have no impact on the main timeline. Ambassador Yego had been emotionally charged and spent as much time as possible discussing things. He had eventually fallen asleep with his head in Kess's lap, then Emily's. That was not planned, it just happened, but it showed the complete trust he had in everyone around him. It was one of the few times Dr. Snowden had seen Kess show concern about not being able to return. Although the Torvato was always an option, he did not believe they would be back at all. Jake and Robert Melkins were welcome visits, but like the others Dr. Snowden had seen before, it hurt to know he would most likely never see them again. Jelton and Kess had not been on that meeting due to timeline integrity. Dr. Snowden had a better understanding now of some moments with Jake where he had acted off. He had known of their impending deaths and subsequent conversion to a new form. Robert had known as well, but both of them had kept the secret well. Lord Vigon's encounter had hit hard. 
While Dr. Snowden considered others close, Lord Vigon was special, having traveled with the gang twice and being a close friend. Timeline integrity had to be observed, leading to two meetings with him. He was a person of secrets, and Dr. Snowden would miss him. It intrigued Dr. Snowden that Lord Vigon had almost broken timeline integrity on the off chance it might save the rest of his kind from annihilation. Lord Noskoff and Mikhail had also been a tough meeting. It surprised Dr. Snowden that Everin had not given a gift to Jake, Robert, Lord Noskoff, Lord Vigon, or Mikhail. That was most likely due to being closer in regard to the timeline impact. Lord Noskoff's base had been the site of many a cookout, and that was one thing Dr. Snowden would really miss. Dalton Kingston had quickly become one of Dr. Snowden's closest friends. He had felt Dalton's cosmic energy increase when Everin had enhanced him. Although a Torvada's chosen, Dalton was also an Everin's chosen in some regard. Evot's sadness tugged at Dr. Snowden's heartstrings. She was still a new AI, an eager one at that, and this would have been her first time experiencing the loss of friends. Dalton and Evot had each other, but they now had a future with new Everin and V forms as well as with their close friends gone. Siverin's visit had gone as expected. As in Everin, he had already known what would happen, and Dr. Snowden was eager to see him and Q later on. There had been some hints as to the next step, and Dr. Snowden's curiosity ignited. Leverin had been much more emotional than he would have thought. Everything made sense now and it saddened him that it had taken his death to reach that point. Like Siverin, he would get to see her and Edith in whatever the next step was. Edith had seemed comforted, as much as an AI could appear so, in that she would be around even after a physical death. Many would be if they knew they would exist as a powerful cosmic being. Kess stirred. You're awfully quiet. Just going through all the goodbyes, he said. She sighed. Yeah, I feel like I should be exhausted, but I'm not. He glanced at her. Ambassador Yago's visit hit you hard. It did, she said. We worked closely together, and he was a great friend. I met his family, and he was openly embraced by the other Orions. He's going to be an amazing leader, and I won't get to see it. Dr. Snowden grimaced. I don't know if we can revert back at this point. Kess laid a hand on his cheek. I go where you go. Always. They shared a deep kiss. I'm okay with that. I know you are. I mean, what's not to like? She said, raising her hand in the air and snapping. They laughed. He enjoyed the moment for what it was. Although his curiosity was on fire about what came next, he would do it with Kess. He would miss those he had said goodbye to, but he also understood how lucky he was not to be truly dead. His new form had taken some getting used to, but now he did not even think about it. That might be a part of being a quasi-cosmic being and the beginning of a new part of his life. Emily stared at herself in her living quarters mirror. Jelton was stretched out on the couch, and she would normally be with him, but she wanted to test some things. With a minor focus, her eyes glowed a bright gold. Then she concentrated on her hand, making it turn into pure energy while maintaining form. All she had to do was think it, and it happened immediately. It would take some time to master all the intricacies of this new form. The Torvada clamped down on pure energy beings, but she could fly outside of it. There was also a sense of weightlessness, and based on looking at a timer earlier, she sensed and responded to things way faster than before. On top of adjusting to her new form, she also had to deal with saying goodbye to everyone. Her emotions were like a roller coaster, yet she felt calm throughout, despite her mind telling her she should be one way or another. Everin and V would be back in a few hours, but she knew that was them giving her and the other some time to reflect on things before the next big step. It had been good to see Jay. She had a strong bond with him from when they had been rescued by Everin long ago. His growth into his new job, while dealing with his family, had been fun to watch. 
He used to come over and visit from time to time, and they always had an impromptu cookout. She and Dr. Snowden also went over to his new house every now and then. Dr. Bryson had been a tough meeting. She could sense his sadness, despite him trying to joke around. Dr. Snowden's energy fluctuated all over the place, but that would not be unusual when saying goodbye to your best friend. Emily had hugged Dr. Bryson a few times, and she sensed he was close to breaking down. She would miss him and his teasing. It had been good to see Jane Trellis. Emily had been curious how Kess would respond, but she had been nothing but friendly. Jealousy was not something that fazed her. Emily had discussed Bremick with Jane and the future she had planned, and it saddened Emily some that she might never know if it came to fruition. When the gang had visited Andia and Rakar, it had a special kind of hurt. Emily did get to spend some time alone with Andia that progressed to something more romantic, and knowing it was the last time made it special. Although Emily did not get to see Andia often, she enjoyed any chance she had with her. Rakar had been stoic, but even his eyes missed it when she had hugged him. Sanders could not hide his emotions well. He had a strong bond with her, and it made sense that the hug he gave her in his future was genuine. She had not known who he was at that point in the timeline, but he had already gone through all this by then. His perspective was very interesting. During the visit, he had slapped her leg to race, but she had merely blinked and was at the end of the hallway before he even advanced a foot. She had not wanted to let him go when doing a final hug. Galden's feast had been a fun event. She liked the deep singing, and Jelton got a good send-off. There was much less sadness than she had thought there would be, probably due to their warrior culture, where loss was common. She caught Galden several times, struggling to look strong. Jelton was like his son, although Riven did not have children. She had provided him with as much moral support as possible, but Jelton had also put on a brave face throughout it all. Seeing Grog again had been exciting. Although he would have survived, Talandra and Zax would have been dead if Everin had not interfered. The gifts given to them were powerful, but that was Everin's generous nature, and he most likely understood the impact of giving them gifts and had decided to do it. It felt normal to be around Grog, and he had been a ball of energy due to his enhanced regeneration. Her heart broke when they left, and although he struggled to keep from getting misty eyes... He did. Dravail, Sazrissa, Seer, and CC had been startled when the gang appeared. Emily had a deep bond with Dravail due to him saving her life, and had she died then, she would not have reformed into what she was now. Even his team got new gifts from Everin, and she loved that CC could communicate via digital means now. Draxus and Shayla had been a surprising visit, but they were doing well and it made Emily happy to see Shayla's expression about her lost sisters coming back. It would only enhance the Arkara's perception of Everin as a star god. Given what Emily had seen up to that point, it was hard to refute. Ambassador Yego's visit was a tad longer than the others, and he had fallen asleep with his head in Emily's lap. She had scratched him behind the ears and softly petted him. He was not a dog, but he had a lot of the characteristics of one and he had been obsessed with human and dog relations ever since seeing the dog park on Earth. He had also slept some on Kess's lap, and it felt natural. Diego's drooping ears, slight frown, and confused eyes when they left tore her to pieces, and Kess even more so by her saddened reaction. It was hard to say goodbye to Jake and Robert. Between summonses, she had become close friends with Jake, and even advised him on some relationship issues— he was in a good place with Kathy, and Emily had a hand in that. Robert was a kind and caring dad to Jake, and treated Emily like a daughter when she visited. She had teared up several times, and it pained her to know she would not hang out with them, Brad Washington or Evot together anymore. Lord Vigon had known of the goodbye visit since before her first meeting with him. He was a close friend, and he had helped rescue her when she was on the prison planet, his wildly fluctuating daydrolled energy was easy to detect. It made sense now why she had detected his sadness getting deeper leading up to the future meeting. He could have told them not to go on this last summons, or to find some way to leash the Toravada, but he had been strong enough to keep the secret and let things play out. It must have been maddening. 
Lord Noskov and Mikhail had brought back a lot of memories. Lord Noskov's base had been the site of many meetings of both old and new friends. She considered it a second home outside the Toravada. She had not realized how much she was going to miss both of them until they had arrived. It was one of the few times she had seen either of them struggle to stay composed. Even Lord Scar and Cyrus had been moved. She had a deep connection to the ancient vampires, and they considered her family. The trip to see Dalton and Evot had also been emotionally charged. Although he put on a brave face, his cosmic energy told a different story. Evot had been all over, almost as if she had been overloaded. Her sadness was evident, and Emily reciprocated that. The gang had met Dalton's family in the dream lair, and they were the last link to that. Dalton and Evot had become fast friends with the gang, and although Everin and V would come back in new forms, Emily suspected the gang's leaving would hit both of them hard. It had been difficult to say goodbye to them. Siverin's meeting had been informative. Emily smiled at the thought that she would see him and Q again. It was a breath of fresh air after all the other goodbyes. The mood had been upbeat, and although she wanted them to fully explore their time in the plane, she was eager to meet them outside of it. Seeing Leverin had made Emily recall when she and Dr. Snowden had almost died. Leverin saved them, and it always hurt Emily to know Leverin would die. Armed with new information, though, Emily looked forward to seeing both her and Edith in the cosmic medium. Dr. Snowden's embrace of Leverin made Emily tear up. He had been through a lot and had a special bond with her. Thinking hard over there, asked Jelton, peeking over at her. Maybe, she said. Jelton sat up, then tapped an area in front of him. You can always think over here. She complied and smiled when he wrapped her arms around him. Like this? Oh, yeah. Emily exhaled. Sounds to me like you're still thinking about saying goodbye to everyone. I am, she said, also excited about our next step. She turned her head to the side. I'm sure you're going over everything, too. Seeing Galden and the other Rift Guardians had to have been hard for you. It was. But it is what it is. They'll be fine without me. But I'll miss their camaraderie. Emily sensed the sadness in his voice, despite it sounding optimistic. He also could not hide his cosmic energy from her. Jelton hugged her tight. Whatever the future holds, we do it together. She spun around to face him, then kissed him. Oh, we can do more of that, he said. She smiled. Whatever their next step was, she was ready. And more importantly... She had the gang with her. Chapter 28 Dr. Snowden gulped as he took a seat in the right half of the command center. Kess was next to him, and Emily and Jelton were in the other seating area. Everin was in his usual chair, and V was at the front podium. Dr. Snowden was glad to see Everin and V back, and they were in good moods, at least based on their cosmic energy. So, where do you two go? asked Dr. Snowden. We visited others to say goodbye, said Everin. Emily played with her ponytail. How many? 6,432, said V. Emily drew her head back. That must have taken some time. Everin shook his head. We visited them all simultaneously. Kess chuckled. Efficient and I would say it would probably be hard to concentrate, but not with you two. I'm glad you had the opportunity to visit them, said Jelton. Thank you. However, what's important now is that we move on to the next step. Is everyone ready? asked Everin. Yeah, but one question before we do, said Emily. Did those others get marbles like the friends we visited? Yes. Emily wrinkled her brow. Surprised, then, we didn't run into any before this event. The Torvado would have known and kept us away from them, said Everin. Got it. Okay. Ready now? Very well. V. Take us to my main form. Acknowledged. 
Dr. Snowden stared at the blue beam that generated a black-bordered portal with a rippling white surface. The colors verified that they were going outside the plane. It hit him that this might be their last few seconds in the plane in any capacity. The thought filled him with dread, but he was tempered by his excitement at seeing what was next. The Torvada flew through and exited into the cosmic medium. It was pitch black, except for other planes that looked like molecules connected to each other, like the type you might see in a chemistry lab. Dr. Snowden focused on a massive white cloud. As the Torvada streaked toward it, he caught a glimpse of a huge, low-tech village nestled among a valley with sparse trees, a large body of water in the middle, and sunlight seemingly coming from above. Yet he did not see a sun. What's that? asked Kess. Everin smiled. It's where my plane form resides once they assimilate back into my main form. Dr. Snowden pointed at the area. So your main form is not only the forms you take, but also a big village? You're only seeing one level. There are hundreds of thousands of others with various environments. You're seeing this as it is one of the more Earth-like and is pleasant from a human perspective. Emily furrowed her brow. How many plane forms are we talking? Millions. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Really? And you're one more to that list? That's correct, said Everin. Dr. Snowden began to understand the scope of just how powerful Everin was. That many forms indicated that he had traveled to many places. The Torvada landed in a patch of dirt on the edge of the environment. Dr. Snowden hopped up and stared outside. Is that Leverin and Ediv? And next to them are Dan, Dr. Bryson, Sarah, Albert, and Emily, said V. Kess eyed Everin. You said you saved them. I'm curious to know the how. As am I, my friend, said Jelton. Everin nodded. Follow me. Dr. Snowden shared a quizzical look with the others before following him out. The thought of millions of plane forms in hundreds of thousands of environments was fantastical, but when compared against how ancient Everin was, it made more sense. Dr. Snowden was glad to have met three plane forms, and he was attached to all of them, but mainly the one he had traveled with. Emily rushed out to hug Leverin and Edith. Dr. Snowden went right after her. It was confirmation that Leverin was alive and had survived. The guilt at having made her weak was gone, and his heart sang as he held her tight with Emily. The others had gone silent. Dr. Snowden and Emily stepped back and hugged Edith. After that, they moved away. I'm so glad you two are here, said Dr. Snowden. I am too, said Edith, smiling. Dr. Snowden walked over and gave his famous half-hug and handshake with Dan. Good to see you two again. Well, hell, said Dan. I still don't fully understand what's happening. One minute the Overlord is killing me, the next I'm here with the others and Sarah is alive. His eyes misted. I'll take it. I much prefer this to being dead, said Dr. Bryson, smirking. Dr. Snowden embraced him. I'm glad you made it. Emily hugged Dr. Bryson, then faced Sarah. This must be confusing for you. It is, she said, but I remember you well. She stared at Albert and Emily, and it seems my kids are eighteen now, not eight. I don't know how that happened. Dr. Snowden's eyes softened when Sarah rushed over and held Emily tight. He recalled when they had first met when helping Leverin. It was the first time Sarah and Emily had seen each other, but he had sensed the bond that had formed. He moved over to stand next to Emily, then gestured at the twins. So they gave you our names, Albert greeted Dr. Snowden and Emily. Yep, sure did. It's good to finally meet my namesake. He glanced at Dan. I can see the family resemblance. Emily winked at the other Emily, and it won't be confusing at all with two Emilies. Everyone laughed. And now we can know how they're here, said Kess, eyeing Everin. Everyone stared at him. Very well, he said. As you may recall from Kelleton, 
When Dr. Snowden, Emily, V, and Jelton touched the cosmic artifact and sent out cosmic energy arcs, there was something sensed that neither of you could explore. Yeah, it was like a dome that I couldn't see into, said Dr. Snowden. Yes. Inside that dome were Dan, Sarah, Albert, Emily, Edith, and Leverin. I had created a pocket to bring them so that they, except for Leverin, would be converted into quasi-cosmic energy beings. Dan furrowed his brow. You saved us. Again. Everin motioned at Leverin. We did. We thank you, said Edith. Of course. Jelton swept his arm out in an arc. And now we have a lot of plane forms to meet together. Emily surveyed the surroundings. This is where we'll stay from now on? Not quite, said Everin. This is my main form here. It also exists outside many other planes, so we can travel to those, then to those planes. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed, but only to planes where its rules allow us entry. That's correct. Your form will be clamped down to a plane form, although doing so can be dangerous. I get that, but it's that risk that can make things interesting if this situation ever got stagnant. Leverin laughed. Humans are always so curious and willing to risk things for it. Dr. Snowden grinned. You know us well. Jelton rubbed his chin. So this main form we're on now is Everin, Leverin, this cloud, that village in the distance, and hundreds of thousands of other environments all at the same time. Yes, said Everin. While the forms themselves may have differing personalities and the environments seem static, it's all from me. And me, said Leverin as her and Everin's eyes glowed. We're all Everin. We're inside you, basically, said Jelton. That's one way of interpreting it. Everin examined the group. Once we do enter an environment, you are all free to determine what you want to do. However, there are a few things left to show you before we do go. You mean there's more? asked Dr. Snowden. Of course. And now that you understand some things, these next few will make more sense. Emily did not know what was left to show, but she was ecstatic about the new situation. Meeting so many plane forms would be a treat, and exploring the different environments sounded fun. She could also pop over to other planes and check them out. Astoria was at the top of her list. She held Jelton's hand when V walked into the Toravada. As much as she had learned already, it boggled her mind that there could be even more. It was hard not to be excited. She had the gang with her, a chance to bond more with Leverin's group, and a ton of adventure ahead of her. V exited the Toravado with someone. Emily's heart fluttered as her eyes nearly burst out of her head. Tiger? asked the man, looking at her with a confused look. Emily rushed over and hugged Dan her father. She was not sure how he had come to be where he was, but she knew who he was immediately. With her new form, it was trivial to determine who was what, and this was definitely her dad. She stepped back. Dad, how are you here? I'd like to know that too, he said. Dr. Snowden dashed over and embraced him, then moved back. Albert, you're here too, asked Dan. What the hell is going on? The others joined Dr. Snowden and Emily. Dan stared at the other Dan. Is that... me? The other Dan smiled. From another universe. Someone care to fill me in? One moment I was dying, the next time in a room aboard... Whatever that is, he said, crooking a thumb at the Toravada. Everin stepped forward. I will explain. Yes, you did die. Temporarily. I stopped time and swapped your body with a replica. Then I took you to a place called Keliton, where you were transformed into a quasi-cosmic energy being. The transformation took some effort and left you unconscious. You were then put inside the Toravada, then brought here. Dan stared at Everin. Are you kidding me? I'm not. He stared at Dr. Snowden. You buying this? Oh, yeah. Definitely he said. There's a lot to explain, and we'll have plenty of time to do that. For the moment, 
You've been transformed into a powerful energy being with eternal life. Dan furrowed his brow. My cancer is gone, then? Emily grinned. Yep. And I get to spend eternity with you all? He asked, his voice quivering. Emily wrapped her arms around him and whispered, Yeah. Dr. Snowden wiped a tear off his face and joined in a three-way hug. Emily had not expected this, and her emotions ran wild. Although she had been bummed about never seeing the plane again, having her dad alive made everything better. There was so much she wanted to tell him, and now she had time to do so. There's more, said Everin. Emily and Dr. Snowden stepped back from Dan. Really? asked Kess. Yes. V? asked Everin. Acknowledged. He went back into the Toravata and came out with another person. Sarah? asked Dan, trembling. Dan? she said. She rushed over and kissed him as he held her. Emily gasped as Dr. Snowden put an arm around her. Having her dad back was one thing, but also her mom was something else. She looked over at the other Sarah, whose agape mouth showed what she was thinking. Sarah surveyed the others. What's going on? She stared at Emily. You look familiar. Dan licked his lips. You never met her. But that's Emily, all grown up. It is? She asked, moving closer. Emily nodded as tears covered her cheeks. My sweet baby. You're so beautiful. Thanks, said Emily, lurching forward and holding her mom. Emily never fathomed she would have her family back, and here it was in front of her. Although she had died to get there, she was okay with that. Sarah wiped Emily's tears away, then turned toward Dr. Snowden. Albert? He extended his arms out, and she bolted over to him. I'm so glad you're here. She laid her head on his chest. I am too, but I don't understand why or how I'm here. Everin dipped his head. I can explain, and some of this won't make sense until you've had some time to digest everything. You will not recall this, but you died giving birth to Emily. Like Dan, I swapped your body out and took it to Kelaton, where you were transformed into a quasi-cosmic being, then took you to the Toravada since you were unconscious. That has led to this moment. Sarah scrunched her face. You're right. I don't fully understand but I guess I will at some point. I'm in the same boat as you, said Dan. I won't question being alive, though. She smiled. As long as I have you, Emily and Albert, I'm okay with that. As a part of your abilities as a quasi-cosmic being, you can change your form, such as a younger version of yourself, said Everin. Dan's eyes widened. I can. How? Focus on what your younger self was, and your form will respond. All right. Dan closed his eyes, and a moment later opened them to a mid-twenties version of himself. Wow, said Sarah. This is incredible, said Dan. Sarah touched his face, just like you were at the hospital. He kissed her hard. Sarah stepped back and gazed around at the others, then raised an eyebrow at the other Sarah. Is that another version of me? The other, Sarah, smiled. We went through this with Dan. I'm from another universe. Oh my, I have a lot to learn, said Sarah. And we'll have plenty of time for it, said Dr. Snowden. And to my right is Kess. Hi, said Sarah. Kess waved at her, then dipped her head toward Dr. Snowden. I think you already know my boyfriend. Oh, Jelton walked next to Emily and slid his arm around her waist. And I'm Jelton Stallerin. He's my boyfriend, said Emily, chuckling. V went in for a high five. And I'm V. Sarah high-fived him. You were the first face I saw when waking up. Yes, I'm glad I didn't frighten you. She beamed at him. You were a calm and friendly presence. Acknowledged. And I'm Everin. The one who pulled you here. Sarah took a deep breath, then hugged him. Thank you. He rubbed her back. You're most welcome. 
There is a lot ahead for you. Emily swallowed hard. I get to spend the rest of time with my family. I couldn't have asked for more. I'm with her, said Dr. Snowden. And I go where Emily goes, said Jelton. And me with Albert, said Kess. Well, hell, said Dan. The other Dan looked at him and they shared a laugh. Dan snorted. This is so crazy. Perhaps so. But there is one more introduction left, said Everin. Emily stared at the two people that exited the Toravada. Based on their cosmic energy readings, she knew it was another version of Everin and V due to their energy signatures being slightly off, and they looked different. The other Everin had fair skin with a slight tan. His black hair was combed back and puffed up some, and he had blue eyes and a chiseled chin. He wore a thin black mesh over his body with dark gray segments with a gold border over major muscle areas. His boots, forearms, and shoulders up to a neck guard were white armor. His belt was a lighter gray, and on it were segmented blocks with a utility handle hanging off the side. The stubble from the ears to chin stood out to her. The other had a metallic, humanoid robot body that made him appear as an android without human skin. Emily was not sure what other capabilities were present, but it was not like V's hologram mode or even body mode, which was definitely more robotic-looking. Hello, I'm Everin, he said, bowing slightly with his left arm across his stomach. And I'm M, he said, dipping his head. Dr. Snowden furrowed his brow. Is that your and V's second forms? The other Everin smiled. It sure is. M looked around. This is intriguing. Everin glanced at Dr. Snowden and Emily while gesturing at the other Everin and M. This Everin is the physical form that you both traveled with, and I'm a projection of the form you traveled with. The same goes with V for M. Emily walked up to the other Everin. And you remember everything? The other Everin smiled. I remember a feisty Dr. Snowden not believing the situation on the Crotovore ship, and your outburst at the Merc who was devoured by a sliven. It is you, she said, rushing over and hugging the other Everin. M patted her back. There, there. Emily laughed as she high-fived M. Dr. Snowden did the same and gave the other Everin a half-handshake and hug. So what happens with you two now? We go back to the plane. It's Cyrilus in another form, after all, said the other Everin. And you'll get new companions? asked Emily. The other Everin grimaced. I don't know yet. Emily tilted her head. You're afraid you might lose them, like Sivrin and his five previous groups, and, well, I guess, us. Yes. She placed a hand on his shoulder. I think you're better with a human perspective around, and if you do, we'll be here to greet them if they come, said Dr. Snowden. The other, Everin, frowned. I'm going to miss you both, as well as Kess and Jelton. I will too, said M. You can always pop up here to visit, said Dr. Snowden. He eyed Everin, unless we're going somewhere where we can't be reached. Everin's eyes glowed. Should my new form come back? We will be here to meet him and M and whoever they are traveling with. Emily smiled at the other Everin. See? You're set? The other Everin smiled. I won't be forming new memories with you in the plane, but I will hear, and I look forward to assimilation when the time comes. As do I, said M. You don't have to go right away, do you? asked Emily. The other Everin shook his head. Then spend some time with us before you go. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Yeah, I have a ton of questions for you both, and I'm sure the others do too. The other Everin smiled big. I'd like that. Everin raised a finger and swept his gaze across everyone. It seems there's one last thing to do. Gather around. Everyone complied. Oh, I get it, said Kess. My first one. Me too, said Jelton. Sarah looked at Dan, who shrugged. Dr. Snowden put his arm around Kess's waist. Then let's enjoy it. Yep, said Emily, holding Jelton's hand. V put his arms around Dr. Snowden's and Emily's shoulders. 
Hopefully there will be more, said Everin. On the count of three. One, two, three. Everything is as it should be, said everyone who knew what to say. The End This has been The Final Evolution, Book 15 of the Everin Chronicles, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Wolf, copyright 2023 by Adair Hart, production copyright by Adair Hart.